Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 271 Looking at the Jedi, Deja realized General Kenobi had a bandage on his shoulder, and that his clothes and appearance, usually very tidy, were a mess. Clearly, the battle hadn't been hard only to Hell Squad. General, sir. Relax, Dager. You deserve it. The Separatists retreated, and we are dealing with the few that were left behind. We won. Did they get their hands on one of the samples? I wouldn't be here if they had. But it was close. They sent Ventress to the South facility. Deep Squad wasn't able to hold her, and lost a few members. Luckily, Anakin was able to stop her, although she and Grievous slipped away once more. Dejer shrugged. He would let the Jedis handle Ventress. She was a Sith, whatever that meant, and he knew no clone, almost no clone, could stand on her way. Uff. You have to get patched up, Commander. This was a hard battle, and we have lost many soldiers. I know you are wounded and tired, but I need a casualties and damage report as soon as possible. Dejer nodded, and called a medic to bandage his wounds. After a short while, he stood up, using his DC-15A as a crutch. One of the medics offered to help him, but there were more critically injured soldiers who needed medical attention more than him. Following General Kenobi, he left the facility, and a gruesome sight greeted him. He was more than used to the aftermatch of a battle, but few were as brutal as this one had been. It had raged on for a day and a half straight, which was little compared to most battles, but just by looking at it, he knew it was one of the worst the Republic had ever been through. Buildings were half destroyed, and several platforms and bridges were missing pieces of it, or were even completely gone. The burning remains of ships and starfighters, as well as of the weird squid-like ships, laid in several places, and even the drizzle that was falling wasn't enough to extinguish the fires. Of course, the most impacting sign were the bodies. It always pained him to see the lifeless corpses of his brothers. In a somewhat small battlefield, like the bridges of Kamino, the dead clones and droids didn't spread, but piled up. He was sure many even fell on the ocean, and would be reported as missing in action. Stepping over the bodies, many of which he knew, Dager found an officer, a captain, and ordered him to do a report. The captain would order his lieutenants to do the same, the lieutenants would order the sergeants, and so on. Soon, he would receive a detailed report, although, even without it, he could already tell that casualties were as high as 40%. He estimated the droids had lost about the same, which explained their retreat. The more he walked, the fewer bodies and less destruction Dager saw, at least until they got to the south facility. Clearly, the Sepis had focused all their efforts at the three facilities, and didn't care much for the rest of the planet. Once they got to the south, though, the scenario was very similar to the west. Half jumping, half skidding across the arm of one of the squid-like droids, which Dager now knew were called Trident-class assault ship, he and General Kenobi entered a building, Dager grimacing in pain. They soon found the bodies of Arc Trooper Colt, and over a dozen members of Ranker Battalion. All of them had lightsaber wounds, Colt having been pierced in the heart, and several were dismembered. Looking at how his brothers had been eliminated, Dager clenched his fist in anger. He knew only Ventress would do that. Next, they found Deep Squad. Of the eleven members, only six had survived, Brody included. The commander was tidying up the facility, sometimes looking at his fallen brothers. When he saw General Kenobi, his expression was of shame and anger, but he quickly hid it. Clones didn't show emotions to their superiors. Of course, that wouldn't work on a Jedi. General, I am sorry. I let those damn seppies take. No need to apologize, Commander Brody. You fought against a Sith. No one expected her, and the fact that you survived is already impressive on itself. I understand, sir. Thank you, sir. General Kenobi turned around to leave, and Dager followed him after tapping Brody's shoulder. He knew it wasn't easy to lose someone from your squad, special unit or not. Looking at General Kenobi's back, all the while barking orders to the troopers around him, Dager wondered what had happened to Commander Cody. 
why would the Jedi ask him to do a report, and not the commander of his own legion? His question was answered soon. Commander Cody, General Skywalker, and General Shock T were all looking at a room. Troopers formed a perimeter around them, to keep others away. Not that it was necessary, because no clone would enter the room once they were given the order not to. Bastards! How could they do that? When he and General Kenobi looked inside, Dajer couldn't help but let out a curse. Three dozen cadets were dead in the room, as well as a single B-2 super battle droid. The cadets were only teenagers, and probably didn't have time to evacuate before the battle started. One of them, responsible for the dead droid, was still holding a blaster, but that was all. The droids had executed the others, even though they were defenseless. This is too much, even for the Separatist. Indeed. However, the best we can do now is give them a proper resting place, with the other clones. I will deal with them. General Shock T spoke with a very low voice, barely audible. She was responsible for overseeing the training of the clone army, so her relationship with the cadets was almost as strong as the relationship between the clones. Their bodies would be cremated, and their ashes spread through the Sea of Kamino. Every clone, in death, returned to their home. All right. Commanders, once the reports are done, send them to me. As soon as our dead are taken care of, order the troops to rest. They deserve it. The Kaminoans will deal with the droids and the infrastructure. Yes, General. Understood, sir. Both clones nodded. They too were tired, and Dajer was wounded, but none of them uttered a complaint. Even if they didn't need to do anything, they would still only rest after all their brothers had been taken proper care of. That was one of the responsibilities a commander had. It took almost a week for Kamino to return to a semi-normal life. In total, almost 200,000 clones had given their lives to protect their home planet. About double that amount of droids had been eliminated. Those numbers were comparable to battles such as the First Battle of Felucia, or the Second Battle of Dantuan. The difference was that while those battles had lasted weeks and months, the battle that had come to be called Third Battle of Kamino had lasted less than two days. That went to show just how brutal and intense it was. Chapter 272 In a dark cell, at the lower levels of the Coruscant Maximum Security Prison, a huge Mon Calamari suddenly knocked the cell's door. The member of the Coruscant guard outside, knowing that he was mute, looked at two other clones, and, after warning his commanding officer, opened the door, his blaster ready, set to stun mode. The prisoners here were amongst the worst in the galaxy, so he could never be too careful. However, the precautions weren't enough. The Mon Calamari seemed to disappear, and suddenly appear in front of him. A hand grabbed his head, and, with strength much bigger than his body seemed to have, the Mon Calamari lifted him, and threw him against the two other guards, knocking them out. When the other guards, having received the alarm, came to contain him, they discovered the Mon Calamari hadn't tried to escape, but was sitting on top of one of the clones. The Coruscant guard members, knowing he was dangerous, stunned him immediately, and brought him to an interrogation room. After a week, most of the clones wounded in the Third Battle of Kamino were completely healed, and only those critically injured were still undergoing treatment. Whether or not they will survive, was still impossible to know. The Kaminoans were the best at their job, but there were some wounds not even them could cure. Hell Squad, however, wasn't one of those clones. Even Metal's broken leg had recovered rapidly, and, although he was still using a cast and a crutch, he would only need a few more days to be back to his peak. Deja was currently sleeping, but when a trooper opened the door of Hell Squad's quarters, he instantly woke up, and reached for his weapons. When he realized there was no threat, he relaxed, and got up. What is it, soldier? General Shock T requested your presence, commander. All right. Dismissed. Yes, sir. After the clone left, Dajer turned to Hell Squad, who had questioning gazes, and shrugged. He had no idea what the Jedi wanted. Before putting on his armor, he took off the bandages on his shoulder, revealing two new, and slightly red, scars. Compared to the dozens of other scars in his body, it wasn't much. After making sure they wouldn't open, he put on his battered armor, which had a dozen new scratches on it 
and went to meet the Jedi. As he walked the corridors of Kamino, Dajer incited respect from the clones he met. He was a legendary figure amongst the clone army, and his status was equal to any commander, if not above them. Leader of Hell Squad, the best special unit the Republic had, a group of normal clones who had risen above ARC troopers and clone commandos. The commander of the 303rd Attack Legion, which gave everything they had, including their lives, to protect Ryloth. The clone who was said to have fought Separatist leaders like Asajj Ventress and General Grievous, and survived. At that moment, that famous person was heading to the center of Topoka City, absent-mindedly returning salutes. After the battle of last week, several of his closest brothers had died. It was always painful to lose a clone, but the truth was that he didn't know most of them. There were millions spread to the galaxy, and more were created every day. However, Dajer was acquainted with many of the older troopers, those who had been there since the start. Ninety-nine had been one of those. The clone was deformed, defective, and weak, but for Dajer, he had been as valuable as any of his brothers. Ninety-nine had died a hero, fighting for his home, but that didn't change the fact that he was dead. Shaking his head, he entered a room, and found General Shock T waiting for him in front of a hologram table. On it were Commander Fox, and a small Jedi Dajer had seen only once, but for whom he had the utmost respect. Fox, General Shock T, General Peel. Um. I have to say, Commander Dajer, I never thought I would see you in such position, considering the first time I saw you, you were just a soldier. Very good. Thank you, General Peel. The small and pale Jedi was largely responsible for many of the decisions Dajer made. Not only had he saved his life, but also given Dajer something that, at the time, few clones had. A name. Gentlemen, should we move on to what brought us here? Of course, Master Shock T. Commander Fox, go ahead. The leader of the Coruscant Guard, stern as always, nodded. Yesterday, a prisoner named Heige, who you are very familiar with, Dajer, got our attention. He did that by simulating an escape attempt, and broke a guard's neck on the process. As you know, Heige is a mute, for unknown reasons. However, we think he overheard someone talking about the Separatist leader General Grievous. He was very emphatic, and emotional when we finally arrived at the conclusion that it was Grievous he was talking about. Dajer nodded slowly. Heige was an old enemy. Dajer would have preferred to eliminate him long ago, but that was not the Jedi's way, and they ordered him to be captured. Unfortunately, we couldn't get anything else from him, no matter our. No matter what we did. The two Jedis frowned when they saw Commander Fox hesitate. They were very clear about what the clone was talking about. The Republic was by no means as respectable and righteous as they tried to pass as, and the Jedi Order knew that, but there was little it could do. Putting aside the daily schemes and intrigues in the Senate, it was easy to imagine how things worked in the darkness of the prisons, since they were in the hands of the politicians. And, one thing the Jedis had long realized, was that the genetic of the clones didn't make them do what was right, but what it was needed. I think I know what you want, generals, but I probably am not the best person to get Heige to talk. Every occasion I saw him, he tried to eliminate me. Hell Squad eliminated most of his men on Scarif, so he hates us. We understand that, Commander. However, Heige showed such hatred against Grievous that we think he might be willing to reveal something. The fact that you know him could help. Dajer wasn't sure about that plan of action, and he wasn't looking forward to being in the same room as Heige, but orders were orders, even if they were very subtle. Keeping a straight face, he put his hands behind his back, and nodded. Yes, sir. Chapter 273 Dajer was proved wrong. Heige didn't try to eliminate him, although his eyes flashed with resentment. However, Dajer also wasn't able to get anything from him. Clearly, the Mon Calamari's hatred for the clones, or, more specifically, for Hell Squad, ran deep. The feeling was mutual. Heige had given painful deaths to many of their brothers, and they wouldn't forget that. Even after a few hours, the Mon Calamari refused to write anything that might be useful, and only kept growling whenever the name, Grievous, was mentioned. He looked more like an animal than an intelligent species. 
whatever made him lose his voice, also made him lose part of his sanity, and that made him even more dangerous. After being released from duty, Hell Squad went to the Revanter, as they usually did. Since they were on Coruscant, they might as well enjoy it. In the end, only General Yoda himself was able to make Heige talk. The Jedi wouldn't talk to just anyone, since he was leading a war, but every small clue they had on General Grievous' whereabouts was too important to be ignored. To the outer rim, go you must. Kessel, there Grievous is. Careful, however, you have to be. A home to thieves and robbers, the planet is. General Peel nodded to General Yoda, and ended the transmission. The law Nick was very direct and decisive, not hesitating to cut off General Yoda. He also wasn't very patient for a Jedi. The moment he received the intel, he departed to Kessel, and Hell Squad went with him, of course. That was exactly the type of mission a special unit was good at. Commander Dager, I understand you have some experience dealing with Grievous? Dager looked at the human admiral that was under General Peel, and shrugged. He didn't like Tarkin. The man looked like he always had a plan, or was always hiding something. Still, he was loyal to the Republic, or so it seemed. We met him in battle a couple times, Admiral Tarkin. He is dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Elaborate, please. He fought against General Secura and General PLO Kuhn, and pushed them back easily. And when we fought him on the dreadnought above Falin, he was unstoppable. Even Hell Squad couldn't do anything. We almost lost a member. Seeing how you survived all those encounters, I am not sure that General Grievous really is so. That is enough, Tarkin. Commander Dager, give us all the intel you have on him. Spare nothing. Glaring at Tarkin, who doubted Hell Squad's capabilities, Dager started explaining in detail all his encounters with General Grievous. Clones were very disciplined, and rarely showed emotions in front of others, but Tarkin almost crossed the line. Dager was a commander, and Hell Squad a special unit. They didn't need to report anything to Tarkin. Admirals commanded ships, not troops. Usually, Dager wouldn't mind, because up till now, all the admirals he met were worthy of his respect, but Tarkin clearly despised the clones. After two hours, Dager left the command bridge of the cruiser, leaving a General Peel and a Tarkin in deep thought. The law Nick couldn't help but frown when he looked at his admiral. You shouldn't look down on clones, Tarkin. Especially on Hell Squad. The Admiral scoffed, but didn't disagree. That wasn't because he changed his mind, but because he couldn't go against the Jedi's words. Do you know anything about Hell Squad and Dager, Tarkin? They are the best special unit the Republic has. That means they are the best clones the Republic has. And that is not all. They are the one and only special unit formed by normal clones. Not commandos, not arc troopers, but normal clones. That is enough to show how good they are. Still, General Peel, I have seen you and other Jedis in battle. If Grievous and that other Ventress they fought again are so deadly, I find it hard to believe they could survive without losses. Luck played its role, that is for sure. But pay attention to them, Tarkin. Have you ever seen a clone carrying a vibroblade? Or that giant blaster one of them had? I know you have been an admiral since the Old Republic, but I guarantee you don't have nearly as much battle experience as they have. The admiral kept his silence. When he thought about everything that General Peel said, it struck him that maybe he really had underestimated Hell Squad. Obviously, that wasn't enough to make him change his mind about clones, but he wasn't stupid either. He would be more careful when dealing with Hell Squad in the future. General Peel, one more thing. What is it? Something on Dager had caught Tarkin's attention, the same thing that made every non-clone who met him curious. The markings on Commander Dager's armor. Are they confirmed kills? Hearing that, the Law Nick gave Tarkin one of his rare smiles. Yes. But according to Dager, only the ones he wishes to remember. Clones don't like to talk about that, but if I am not wrong, only droid captains and above make it to his armor. And not all of them. General Peel had a reason to praise Hell Squad so much, and it wasn't just because he liked Dager, although that was true. 
The real reason was that Tarkin thought too highly of himself. Confidence in oneself was good, but not when it blinded caution and rational thought. After a few victories, Tarkin was starting to become too bold, and thought of himself as better than anyone else. If General Peel didn't burst this bubble of pride, odds were that the Admiral would get himself eliminated. Hell Squad just so happened to be the perfect opportunity. If Tarkin thought that he was worse than some clones, that would make him more cautious, and help him improve. General. Separatist ships approaching. The Jedi had barely left the command bridge when alarms went off, and a trooper came running to bring him back. At the same time, the cruiser swayed from one side to another as lasers hit its shields. How? They came out of hyperspace, sir. Their tractor beam is already on us. We can't escape. How did they know? The chances of them coincidentally meeting a separatist fleet in the outer rim was almost zero. As such, even as he asked that question, General Peel already knew the answer. There was a traitor. Chapter 274 There was a traitor. Maybe not here on the ship, but somewhere, there was a traitor. And it had to be someone of a high position. Few people knew of General Peel and Hell Squad's departure, and even fewer people knew their course. To get their hands in those pieces of information, and that quickly, the traitor had to be someone powerful, and whom the Jedi trusted. But now wasn't the time to think about that. Their cruiser had already been pulled by the tractor beam, and was locked in place. Soon, they would have enemies to fight. Attention all troopers. We are about to be boarded. I repeat, we are about to be boarded. To your positions. Tarkin's voice could be heard in the loudspeakers, and General Peel, instead of returning to the command bridge, ran towards the docking area where the Separatist would come from. Dozens of clones were also running there, and taking defensive positions, including Hell Squad. Deja nodded at him, and knelt on the ground, aiming his blaster at the door. When it opened, it would be a mess. It didn't take long. After a few transmissions asking for surrender, which the Republic didn't answer, the Sepi started boarding the cruiser. They came as they always did, blowing up the door, and coming through the smoke. Several fell before even crossing the door, but as more came pouring in, their sheer number, and the firepower they had, started to overwhelm the clones. As more and more of his brothers died, Dajer ordered them to retreat. He knew they had no hope of winning that battle, so they could only make the clankers pay a hefty price for their lives. It was at that moment that they saw General Grievous himself entering the cruiser. He had his hands behind his back, as if he was taking a stroll, and not entering a battle. His cold eyes lingered on Dajer and Hell Squad for a moment before fixating onto General Peel. The Jedi returned the stare, and used the force to push away a group of B-1 units. Commander Dajer, take care of the droids. I will deal with Grievous. Yes, General. Stay out of my way. Cough. Cough. I will deal with the Jedi. In a silent agreement, the battle moved away to the other parts of the cruiser, leaving the two powerful beings staring at each other, surrounded by bodies. Jedi, surrender now, or face the consequences. I was about to say the same to you, Grievous. Kakaka. Cough. I will enjoy killing you. Catching General Peel by surprise, the clanker jumped forward mid-sentence, for lightsabers aiming at the Jedi. However, General Peel was experienced, and was already expecting that. As such, he deflected the lightsabers using his own, and pushed General Grievous with the force, sending him staggering backward. Immediately after, General Peel jumped to the left, against the wall, and used it to propel himself forward, bringing his weapon to strike a fatal blow against General Grievous. The clanker wasn't to be outdone, and defended himself with two arms, while attacking with the other two. A terrifying battle had just begun. Brain rolled two droid poppers, making a group of six B-1 units turn off, and opening a small window of opportunity for metal. Needless to say, the heavy machine gunner was ready to take advantage of it. In a few minutes, Hell Squad cleared the corridor, and didn't see any more droids. After General Peel gave the order to leave General Grievous to him, the battle had taken over the entire cruiser, and the combatants had split up. 
Hell Squad was able to deal with their enemies, about 30 sepis, pretty quickly, but the other clones might not fare as well as them. That was proved true in the next few seconds, when they received a transmission from Tarkin. The command bridge is being attacked. Requesting help immediately. Hearing that, Dager pulled his vibroblade from a clanker's body, and put it on his back. Gesturing with his head, he started running, and Hell Squad followed him. Using a blaster pistol, Tarkin eliminated a droid, and hid behind the hologram table just in time to dodge a volley of red lasers. To his left, a crewman wasn't fast enough, and died. The command bridge had only been under attack for less than five minutes, but they already had heavy casualties. The crewmen were clones, and, as such, had been trained to battle, however, they never entered direct combat. Because of that, they were rusty, and weren't able to defend themselves against an enemy that already was bigger than them. Exposing part of his body again, Tarkin was about to press the trigger when he noticed the droid he had targeted falling forward. The clankers nearby also fell one after another, hit in the back. The seppis turned around to face the new threat, but that was a grave mistake. Seeing their exposed backs, the crewmen spared no efforts to take down as many of them as they could. Caught between two fires, in less than ten minutes, the group of over fifty B-1 and B-2 units was entirely dead. Getting out of their hiding spaces, the seventeen surviving crewmen, and Tarkin, looked at their saviors, Hell Squad. The seven clones weren't even hurt, and their leader, Dager, just nodded and left, as if killing fifty droids was nothing. Tarkin hesitated for a moment, startled, then ordered the crewmen to get back to work. They had to free themselves from the tractor beam as soon as they could. Die, Jedi scum. Off. Grunting with the effort, General Peel did a backflip, and exited General Grievous' attack range. The Separatist had cut his tight, hindering his movements. He also wasn't so young anymore, so after twenty minutes he was already slowing down, while the clanker was only getting faster. General Grievous wasn't a force user, but that also had its advantages. The mental drain a Jedi faced when using the force was enormous, and, if they were careless, they could faint in the middle of a fight. How did you know we were here, Grievous? And how did you know we were coming after you? Kaka Kaka. Do you think I am an idiot? Cough. Jedi. Stay quiet, and I will make your death painless. Cough. General Peel frowned, and dodged a swing from General Grievous' lightsabers. He was almost certain that there was a spy, but he couldn't confirm that. Just when he was about to attack General Grievous, the Separatist heard something on his communicator, and jumped back. I will find you again, Jedi. And when I do, you will regret not. Cough. Not dying today. Leaving a confused Jedi behind, General Grievous switched to his spider-like form, and crawled away. General Peel was about to follow him, but his wound prevented him. Instead, he let the clanker go, and ran as fast as he could towards the command bridge, cutting down any retreating droids on his way. Something had made General Grievous give up on his prey, and fall back. He didn't know what or who, but the Republic cruiser had to take this chance to escape, before the laser cannons on the Separatist ships torn them apart. Chapter 275 Dager found it weird when the droid's hell squad was fighting suddenly started running. Cell, Metal, and a few other clones wanted to follow them, but the commander ordered them to hold their position. The Separatist had suffered casualties, that was for sure, but not nearly as many as the Republic. The number of bodies was about equal for both sides. For the clankers, who usually fought to the last man, to retreat for no apparent reason, it was very weird. Wait. This might be a trap. I don't think so, sir. They were crushing us, why would they need a trap? Deja reflected on what Brain said for a few moments, and then nodded. It didn't make sense for the droids to prepare a trap now. Cell, Tech, you two go. If everything is all right, signal us. Roger that, Commander. The two clones soon returned, saying that the droids had retreated to their own ship. Instead of making Dager happy, that only made him worry even more. There was no rhyme or reason for this move. And when something didn't make sense, he didn't like it. Ordering the other troopers to stay on guard, 
Deja ran towards the command bridge with the intention of leaving the Separatist fleet's range as soon as possible. Midway, he found General Peel, who had the same objective. They had not even entered the command bridge yet when they discovered why the Seppis ran away. A Republic fleet, twice the size of the Separatists, had appeared in space, and was currently engaging the fleeing enemy ships. When they got closer, Deja recognized the colors of General Fisto. Several lots left the Venator-class cruiser that was his flagship, and flew towards General Peel's cruiser, which was currently badly damaged. General. I am not too sure myself, Deja. However, this ship is lost. Get everyone on the gunships that Master Fisto sent. After we are safe, we will discover what happened. Yes, General. Admiral Tarkin, give the order to evacuate the ship. Of course, General Peel. Soon, alarms started ringing again, warning all personnel to proceed towards the upper hangar, where they would be picked up. Several corridors of the cruiser had collapsed under the barrage from the Separatist ships, and flames burst out here and there. Soon, the cruiser would break in two. Go, go, go. Let's move, lads. Wounded first. I want three men here. Lift it up. Come on, faster. Deja carefully watched the troopers running around, and commanded them to enter the gunships orderly. He didn't know how many had died, and even if some had survived but were trapped. The best he could do was make sure those who were there left the cruiser. As for any survivors that might be left behind. He pushed those thoughts to the back of his mind. It was useless to think about that, because there was nothing he could do. It took less than fifteen minutes for the lots to become full and take off. Before they even got to General Fisto's capital ship, the cruiser behind them blew up from the inside out, creating an enormous ball of fire that lasted for less than two seconds before being extinguished by the vacuum. Looking at the remains of their cruiser, both Tarkin and General Peel frowned. A ship was just a ship, but after you spent a long time on it, it started to held certain significance. When the lots landed on the Venator-class cruiser, a group of clones, and General Fisto, were already waiting for them. Master Peel, I am glad we arrived in time to help you. The Law Nick glanced at the wounded being moved to the infirmary with the corner of his eyes, and sighed. Not all of us, unfortunately. But if it wasn't for you, we would all be dead. You have my thanks, Master Fisto. The two Jedis exchanged polite greetings. It was clear they didn't know each other very well, but all the Jedis seemed to be on friendly terms. Dajer saluted the Nautilin, and nodded to Commander Monk. The scuba trooper was wearing normal clone armor, since they weren't in a water planet. Follow me. Dajer gestured for Hell Squad to help the wounded, and walked behind the two Jedis. Monk tapped his shoulder. Welcome, brother. Thanks, Monk. You came right on time. Ha <laughs> ha. How did you know we were being attacked? The Force made our paths cross. We were heading to Naboo when we intercepted a transmission from the Separatist, ordering them to move one of their fleets to this sector. We decided to come see what it was, and received your distress signal. Dajer and General Peel exchanged a glance. They had been extremely lucky. Now, that left the second most worrying thing to deal with. How did the Seppis know about their mission? General Peel quickly explained to the other two why they were going to Kessel, and how they had been intercepted, which caused them to furrow their eyebrows. We won't discuss that now. Monk, I will leave Naboo to you. Master Peel, we have to return to Coruscant as soon as possible. Yes. Dajer, Hell Squad 2. The commander felt that his squad would be more useful somewhere else in the galaxy, fighting. However, he didn't dare to disobey a direct order from a superior, so he could only nod. Copy that, General. When he left the command bridge, Dajer could feel the stares the two Jedis were exchanging. He was being left in the dark about something, but as much as that bothered him, he knew it was normal. He was just a clone, nothing more, nothing less. Three people stood in a room, looking at each other. Dajer had his helmet under his arm, and his back straight. In front of him were General Yoda and General Windu. It had been three days since he was back in Coruscant, on which he had been organizing troops and devising battle plans most of the time. 
In the middle of one of those meetings, he had been summoned by the two Jedis. Unsure of what they wanted, he just stood there, waiting. Ten minutes went by, on which none of them said anything. Finally, Dajer couldn't hold back anymore. Generals. Why do you need me? The two Jedis closed their eyes, and General Wind sighed, while General Yoda shook his head. We have a difficult task for you, Commander. Very difficult, indeed. Um. Know our moves, the Separatists have, for a long time. Not understanding exactly what the Jedis meant, Dajer stood quiet. He knew there was a spy, or even more than just one, but he wasn't sure what that had to do with him. After a few more minutes of silence, General Windu stared Dajer straight in the eyes, his face more serious than normal. Commander Dajer, we need you to betray the Republic. Chapter 276 Commander Dajer, we need you to betray the Republic. In an instant, Dajer was shocked beyond describing. General Windu and General Yoda, the most powerful members of the Jedi Order, and important figures in the entire galaxy, just asked him to betray the Republic. The same Republic he had been created to fight and die for. After a few dumbstruck seconds, he did the most logical thing, and aimed his blaster at the two Jedis. Generals, if you move, I will open fire. The Jedis exchanged glances, surprised. They hadn't expected this outcome. However, what did they think it would happen when they asked a clone to betray the Republic? Calm down, you must, Commander. Explain what we mean, I will. General Yoda's voice brought a wave of calmness to Dajer, and he almost lowered his weapon. However, he quickly understood that the Jedi was using the Force to control him, which only made him more suspicious. What you ask is treason against the Republic, General Yoda. That is punishable by death. Don't move. He knew he had no chances of winning against those two Jedis. He wouldn't even be able to contact reinforcements to arrest the two, so all he could do was aim his blaster at them, and wait. There is a spy, who has been reporting all our movements and battle plans to the Separatist. We can't discover who. What we need from you, Commander, is that you go undercover, fake a betrayal, and find out who that person is. Frowning, Dajer analyzed General Windu's face, trying to discover if he was telling the truth. He wasn't stupid, so it didn't take long for him to realize that even if the Jedis planned on betraying the Republic, they wouldn't ask him to do the same. Clones were extremely loyal, and not afraid of dying for the Republic. Money and status didn't have any meaning for them. All they cared about was protecting their brothers and their home, the Republic. Slowly, he lowered his blaster. Although it still was aiming at the Jedis, it wasn't as threatening as before. Not that they had looked worried at any moment. They knew Dajer was powerless against them. Explain it, General. He was being extremely rude and disrespectful towards the Jedis, but, considering the situation, he couldn't let his guard down. As I said, there is a spy giving the Separatist important intel in our operations. We need you to discover who it is, and the best way is by looking like you betrayed the Republic. Why not a Jedi? I am a clone. No one will ever believe I betrayed the Republic. I was born to fight for it. General Yoda and General Windu exchanged worried glances, as if they knew Dajer wouldn't like what they were about to say. You might be a clone, but you have all the reasons to become a traitor, and I don't mean that, Commander, otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you. However, one of the biggest reasons for betrayal isn't money, but anger. You lost your legion, including your general and commander. You have been captured, tortured, and the Republic couldn't help you. The resentment alone is reason enough. On top of that, you have disobeyed orders before, which means you can do it again. Dajer tensed up. He didn't like the fact that General Windu made it seem normal, and likely, that he would betray the Republic. Worse, they didn't like the fact that all his dead brothers were being used as a reason for that. More importantly, Commander, the traitor is a clone. Those words were like lightning striking Dajer. His first reaction was to raise his blaster again, and shake his head. That is impossible. No clone would ever betray the Republic. Never. He was panicking. Even when he faced certain death, he was always calm and cold-blooded. 
But now, he couldn't think straight. Millions of my brothers died already, General, and millions more will die. No clone would side with the culprits behind all those deaths. Um. Right, I wish you were. But happened twice, this already have. Unfortunately, Deja knew General Yoda was right. As a commander, and leader of a special unit, he had access to information that most clones didn't. Sighing, he put down his blaster. They were examined, and proved to be defective. It pained Deja to talk about his brothers as if they were broken machines, but that was the only way the loyalty of the clone army as a whole couldn't be questioned. But it happened. As such, it won't be unbelievable for it to happen again. Deja took a deep breath, and he felt a headache coming. The smallest thought of becoming a traitor, even if it was just a fake one, went against everything his genetic code said. He was created to follow orders. And, in some way, that was an order. What do I need to do, generals? You will have to become a spy. You will give the separatists some crucial piece of information. That is the only way they will trust you. Dager immediately shook his head, disagreeing. Usually, he wouldn't defy an order like that, but the lives of his brothers were in the line. I can't do that, sir. I won't give the Seppis even more means to eliminate my brothers. Dager had already prepared his mind to fake a betrayal, and even leave the Republic. However, what the Jedis asked was that he leaked battle plans, which could lead to the death of thousands of his brothers. Commander, this is war. Sacrifices have to be made. If we don't discover who the spy is, the losses will be much greater. Sacrifices I am not willing to make, General. I know my brothers better than anyone. If one of them is a traitor, I will find out. My way. General Windu was ruthless compared to the other Jedi's Dajer knew. This war had brought out the worst in everyone, including the Jedi Order. Not for the first time, Dajer thought they weren't the best choice to lead but he would never dare to say that. He stared at the two Jedis, waiting for their answer. General Windu was glaring at him angrily, while General Yoda had his eyes closed, and seemed pained, for some reason. After a long while, the small, green being, opened his eyes. Too much, we are asking, understand that I do. However, important it is. Very important indeed. Hear your idea, we will, Commander. It is simple, General Yoda. I need to see who knew of our plans every time we suspect intel was leaked. Then, we will put all those troopers in a meeting, somehow, and bait the traitor with information on one of our plans, which later we can use to ambush the Seppis. Catch them on their own game. We already thought of that. There are too many people involved, and we can't keep an eye on them at all times. You won't need to. If. If one of my brothers really is a spy, I will discover on that meeting. If not, you will have to look somewhere else, generals. General Windu looked at General Yoda, waiting for an answer. When the Jedi nodded, he glanced at Dajer. We will do as you say, Commander. And may the Force be on our side. Chapter 277 In a room at the headquarters of the Clone Army on Coruscant, an important meeting was happening. What was being discussed in this meeting was at the same time huge, and secretive. Clones from the Coruscant Guard, the 501st Legion, the 212th Legion, the 187th Attack Legion, the 91st Reconnaissance Corps, the 327th Star Corps, the 84th Legion, and their respective Jedi Generals were all there. Currently, General Kenobi was explaining their plan to attack Fonder. Of course, they wouldn't use that many legions to attack just one planet, but using the excuse that they needed to discuss their strategies for a number of systems, a large group of over 90 clones had been put together. On the surface, they were all there because of the meeting, however, the truth was that they were all there so Dajer could look at the faces of his brothers, and discover which one of them was a spy. He and Hell Squad were standing against a wall, overseeing the meeting. With their status as a special unit, and considering how their missions were mostly top secret, they rarely said anything on this kind of meetings. So, now Dajer was scrutinizing the faces of his brothers, watching their reactions. 
most of the clones in the room had access to the information which led to some of the most humiliating and painful defeats the Republic had. And it was Dager's job to discover who amongst them was a traitor. He knew almost every single clone in the room. He had trained with them, fought by their side, and faced death with them. They had been to countless battles together, and he knew them as well as he knew any clone. They were all brothers. But no matter how hard he wanted to believe otherwise, one of them was a spy. He couldn't describe how painful it was, and he still hoped to prove the Jedi's wrong. He hoped that there were no spies, and that the Republic only lost because they fought poorly. But, as the meeting went on, he caught sign of one clone in particular. Under his helmet, his expression grew serious, and he couldn't help but clench his fists. Taking deep breaths, he concentrated on that brother of his, and his suspicions grew stronger. As soon as the meeting ended, and they were dismissed, Dager left the room, followed by Hell Squad. He found a quiet spot, from where he could keep an eye on the communications center, and waited. Hell Squad, behind him, was confused, but they knew when Dager was angry, and they didn't want to provoke him, so they said nothing. Inside the communications room, a clone typed a series of codes as fast as he could without alarming the other troopers. He had to get this intel to the Separatist quickly, otherwise they would suffer a major defeat. Ever since that day, he had realized that the Republic was corrupted, and didn't care about its own army. To the powerful people who spent their days safely on the Senate, clones were no more than numbers. But he endured it. For weeks and months, he endured it. He saw even more of his brothers die, lost in foreign planets, and saw their names be erased, substituted by numbers that the clones had long left behind. He understood that they meant nothing, and that they were just tools, but still, he fought. He fought, and he fought again, and he fought again, and again, and again. He was hurt, he almost died several times, but that didn't bother him. He had been created and trained for that. He could withstand the pain. He could withstand being disposable. What he couldn't withstand was watch his brothers die to protect a man who, on that very same day, had pushed two clones to their certain deaths. And so, one day, he decided it was enough. The Republic didn't deserve to win this war. They were corrupt bastards that would never give the clones the freedom that they had been promised. For him, the way the Republic treated the clones was no different than slavery. He found a way to contact the Separatist through a Rodian Separatist captain he and his unit had captured, but were forced to let go. He waited days, regretting his decision, thinking that he had been too harsh. His nightmares grew worse and worse, and he felt dizzy all day. He couldn't look at his brothers without feeling ashamed. However, he received an answer. More importantly, he received a promise. A promise that when this war was over, and the Separatist won, the clones would be truly free. No more orders, no more needless sacrifices, no more deaths. True freedom. The price of that freedom was steep, and he knew that. He hesitated to take on the offer, but not for long. He started gathering classified intel, and sending it to the Separatist through a special means. To be sure he wouldn't be caught, he made it look like normal communications being sent to somewhere in the galaxy. It worked quite well. Soon, he started seeing the results of his treason. The Republic lost battle after battle, system after system. Their support around the galaxy was undermined, and more planets joined the Separatist. He took pleasure in seeing all that. He knew he was on the right path to free all his brothers from the tyranny of the Republic. But with each news of a defeat, came the number of his brothers that lost their lives because of him. The nightmares were now unbearable. He barely slept, and the voices in his head kept screaming for him to eliminate. Eliminate the Jedi, eliminate the Republic, eliminate the people that made his brothers suffer. And so, he closed his mind to those numbers. He told himself that it wasn't him who caused the death of his brothers, but the Republic. That helped to ease the pain, even if just a little. Today he was weirdly happy. He knew that by sending the battle plans made today to the Separatist, the Republic would suffer another crushing defeat, one that would put it a step closer to its end. He was so focused on what he was doing that he didn't notice seven clones stop right in front of him. Only when all the noise in the communications center died down, 
and all the troopers that were looking at his direction, did he notice something. Looking up, he almost stepped back in surprise and fear, but he controlled himself, and said in his head that there was no way Dager and Hell Squad knew what he was doing. Quickly, he saluted his old commander. Commander, sir. What do you need? Dager looked deep into his eyes, and saw the proof that he needed. The spy, on the other hand, could only see the black of Dager's visor, so he had no idea of the dilemma that was going on the commander's mind. He saw Dager's chest go up, and fall down as the clone sighed, and, to his surprise, he saw a blaster being aimed at him. He wasn't the only one shocked by the words that left Dager's mouth in the next seconds. Lieutenant Shield, you are under arrest for treason against the Republic. Chapter 278 Lieutenant Shield, you are under arrest for treason against the Republic. The moment those words left Dager's mouth, every clone, including Hell Squad, looked at him dumbfounded. Accusations of treason couldn't be made lightly, because the penalty was death. However, that wasn't what shocked them. The fact that Dager was accusing a fellow clone, a brother, of treason was unbelievable. Even Hell Squad, who knew nothing about the conversation Dager had with General Windu and General Yoda, couldn't help but hesitate and look at him. When they saw his straight back, and that he wouldn't go back on his words, they finally lifted their blasters, and aimed them at Lieutenant Shield, albeit hesitantly. See Commander. What do you mean? I don't understand. Dager took a deep breath, but his hands remained steady on the trigger. If his brother tried to run or resist prison, he would fire. Of course, his blaster was set to stun only. Without taking his eyes of Lieutenant Shield, he called a trooper. Get General Windu and General Yoda here immediately. Go. He couldn't help but yell the last word, scaring the clone with the intensity. The trooper didn't hesitate anymore, and left the communications center already talking on his comlink. Commander, sir. Can. Can you tell us what is happening? More and more troopers entered the room, and stared confusedly at the scene. A clone holding another clone at gunpoint was something that had never happened before. They couldn't understand it. They were all brothers, so what was happening? Treason. How could a clone commit treason? That was impossible. Ignoring the crowd that was being formed, Dager stood a few more seconds without saying anything. Then, with a shaking hand, he took off his helmet, and put it on top of a panel. Looking at the expression Dager had, Lieutenant Shield understood he had been caught, and that there was no way he could escape punishment. But that didn't worry him. At the moment, all he could think of was the feeling of betrayal that he could see in Dager's eyes. Why, Shield? Why? I am sorry, Commander. But it wasn't I who betrayed the Republic. They betrayed us. They created us to die for their selfish reasons. When he yelled, his entire face contorted in one of pain. He didn't try to hide anything, because he believed he was right. However, for the other clones, who heard his confession, it was as if the ground had been pulled from under their feet. One of their brothers, blood of their blood, had betrayed the Republic. Had betrayed them. They weren't idiots. Even though they didn't know the extension of Lieutenant Shield's betrayal, they could imagine it cost a lot of lives. And to think that a clone would knowingly cause the death of his brothers. It was too much. Shield. Listen to yourself, brother. When did it start? Ha ha ha. When the Republic abandoned us, Commander. They left us to die in Ryloth. They knew we were going against an enemy ten times our size, and that we had no chance of winning, and what they did. Nothing. All the clones around, especially those who knew what happened to the 303rd, were shaken. They would never admit it, but deep down, they agreed with Lieutenant Shield. However, they would never go as far as he did. Our entire legion, all our brothers, were slaughtered for a single planet. They were your brothers too, Commander. Don't you feel anything? The lieutenant almost spat those words, but, before Dager could rebuke, he was already talking again. His eyes showed a madness that clones shouldn't have. And you know what we got, sir, after all those sacrifices? More battles, more deaths. 
I saw one of the Chwileks we fought for use our brothers as meat shields. He pushed them in front of lasers so he could run faster. Face it, Dager. We are disposable. Maybe. That was the reason why we were born. However, S.H.I.E.L.D., no matter how many grievances you have with the Republic, how could you betray your brothers? I didn't betray you or anyone. I just don't want to be a Republic slave anymore. When the Separatists win, they will set us free. Dager closed his eyes in pain. To see a brother of his fall to such pitiful state was terrible. The clones watching, who now already included Captain Rex, Commander Cody, Commander Bly, and dozens of others, stood quiet. They already understood that Lieutenant Shield had lost his mind. I don't know what the Separatist promised you, Shield, but was it really worthy the lives of thousands of your own brothers? Or are you so crazy that you can't see your actions cause the deaths of so many? Dager's words echoed inside the communication center. Even if the troopers didn't know what Lieutenant Shield's actions were, it was obvious that they led to losses. As much as they were shocked, they couldn't feel anger, only sadness. The spy, on the other hand, had a different reaction. As if realizing for the first time what he had done, Lieutenant Shield fell to the floor, holding his head. I I. I didn't. Shield. Brother. Where did you send that message to? Stay on our side this one last time. You can save thousands. The clone stared at Dager for a long time, long enough for the Jedis to arrive. They wanted to intervene, but General Yoda blocked their path with his cane, and shook his head. All General Windu and the other could do was stay put. A relay station on Karo's system. They control it. Dager looked at Lieutenant Shield's eyes, and nodded slowly. He had no doubt the clone was telling the truth. I am sorry, Shield. You know what awaits you. The spy took a deep breath, and got up. Dager nodded for two troopers to hold him, and take him away. He didn't want to see what came next. Commander. Dager. I see them. The General and Commander Keeley, and all the others. They are in the nightmares. Th they look at me. Will. Will it finally end? All the pain. All the dreams. Dager had turned around, trying not to look at his old brother. However, when he heard that, he still clenched his fists in agony. He knew far too well what Lieutenant Shield meant. Every clone saw their dead brothers in their dreams, and Dager was no exception. Yes, brother. It will. You can finally rest. He could almost hear the sigh of relief that the lieutenant let out. Turning around, he left the room, and ignored the Jedis, even though General Windu tried to get his attention. He needed to be alone right now. Two days later, CT-7034, known as Lieutenant Shield, former member of the 303rd Attack Legion and of the 212th Legion, was executed without trial by a firing squad. The execution was performed by members of the Coruscant police after the Coruscant guard refused to do it. The Republic relay station the Separatists had taken over, and were using to gather intel from all their spies was destroyed by the 327th fleet, and the Separatists there were all eliminated. The battle plans for Fonder were changed, resulting in a crushing victory for the Republic, and with minimal losses. For the clones who knew the circumstances of their victory, the cost was far too great. Chapter 279 Several months went by, and the Clone Wars had already been raging on for over two years. The galaxy was in tatters, torn between a war that seemed to never end. Millions had died on both sides, and innocents suffered. Everything pointed out that this war was far from over. For the people in the galaxy, it was a period of fear and terror. You never knew when your planet would be subjected to an invasion, no matter from which side. For the combatants, on the other hand, it was routine. Dager hid behind a rock, trying to escape the onslaught of lasers leaving the Separatists' barricades. Next to him, a trooper screamed in pain and fell into a puddle of boiling water, which quickly started to melt his helmet. Luckily for him, he was already dead when that happened. How are we doing, Dager? Not too good, General. Their positions are holding strong, and anyone who gets close is eliminated. What do you think? 
We should call for air support, sir. As long as we can get two Y-wings to blast those double-barrel repeating blasters, we will have a shot at entering their positions. The Jedi Dager was talking to looked over their cover for a second, then turned around and smiled. Let's do it. Down. Take cover. As soon as they heard the order, every clone ducked behind rocks, containers, or whatever they could find. Two Y-wings flew over their heads, low enough to create air currents, throwing some troopers off their feet. The lines of trenches and barricades that the clankers had set up disappeared in an instant, leaving a scenery of destruction. Boiling water and lava flew over ten meters high, and showered the few droids who were still alive, melting their bodies. Smoke and toxic gases filled the air, forcing the clones to activate the filters in their helmets, that was another innovation the Phase II armor had. As soon as the ground stopped shaking, the clones left their hiding spots, and started advancing. The bombardment had eliminated most of the sepis in the area, but a few were still alive, and fighting. Dager and Brain took care of six clankers, while Dab used his sniper to eliminate the ones farther away. Cell and 3-4 advanced, entering what remained of the barricades, and made sure all the droids inside were dead. Meanwhile, Metal and Tech provided covering fire for them. After that, Dager stopped, and held his comlink, talking to Commander Cody. After a few seconds, he nodded to himself, and turned off the communicator. General. We have to move to Quadrant EX-3. The Seppis have a bunch of turrets there, and are wrecking our starfighters. All right. Captain Orion, you heard him. Let's go. A clone wearing the 212th armor dodged a laser, and acknowledged his new orders. Roger that, General Ragu. Jumping over a stream of flowing lava, Ragu arrived next to Dager. The commander was occupied giving orders to the troopers around them, so he only slightly nodded at the Jedi. They had known each other for a long time, and been through a lot together, so Dager would only salute him when necessary. The Jedi was very different from when he was a Padawan. Tigrudas had two protuberances on their heads, which went down to their shoulders, very much like hair. Ragu, however, had lost a third of his left protuberance in a battle against Asajj Ventress on Felucia. If Hell Squad hadn't emptied all their magazines on the Sith assassin, forcing him to flee, Ragu probably would be dead. Now, he had a vicious look all the time, quite weird when compared to his calm disposition as a Jedi. Ragu wasn't the only one who changed. Hell Squad had been to almost every battlefield in the galaxy, and fought side by side with countless Jedis. Each one of them had become more ruthless, and didn't hesitate in battle. War changed everyone, mostly for the worst, and the Jedis were no exception. After over two years, the Clone Wars were finally reaching its peak, and anyone with a little bit of experience could see that. The battles were becoming increasingly brutal, and there wasn't a single corner of the galaxy that hadn't been burned by the flames of war. Now, every little planet would be subjected to a merciless campaign, coming from both sides. It was normal for entire fleets to be destroyed, and bases to be annihilated. Hell Squad had taken part in more than one mission that resulted in dozens of thousands of casualties for the Separatist. It was almost impossible to say who was winning. The Separatist would take over a planet, and the Republic would respond by taking it back. That cycle went on for months without end. Planets like Felucia, Maijito, Mon Cala, and Kashyyyk had been on constant battle for the entirety of the Clone Wars, and no side could claim superiority. Sullust, where Hell Squad and Ragu were now, was another example. Three weeks ago, the 212th and 501st fleets had destroyed the enemy blockade around the planet, and initiated the ground assault. However, almost a month had passed, and they hadn't even conquered a fourth of the planet. The planet itself didn't help. Sullust was full of extremely valuable minerals, used to make weapons and ships, however, the surface of the planet was a raging inferno. Lava flowed freely, volcanoes erupted randomly, and toxic gases filled the atmosphere. For the Republic was worst, but that wasn't to say for the Clankers wasn't bad too. The heat and gases melt their bodies without them even noticing. How are we doing over here, Dager? As good as it can be, General. We took over Quadrants EX-3 to JP-11, 
and lots of new troops arrived, but the tin cans also made a comeback in other quadrants. All in all, we are faring a little bit better than them, but if we continue like that, we will spend months here. The Jedi shook his head helplessly. There was nothing they could do. Sullust had a difficult terrain, and, while it favored the ATES of the Republic over the AATs of the Separatist, it also meant that it was very easy to break the vehicles, leaving them defenseless against ambushes by the Sepis. Several natives had also joined the Separatist, giving the enemy very competent guides, who could point out the best defensive positions, the best places for ambushes, and what else. Of course, the Republic also had Celestins with them, but somehow the Sepis still had an advantage. We will think of that later, Dager. We have to try and take the next quadrant before the night comes. Understood, sir. I will tell the men to move. Not Hell Squad. I need you well rested for tonight. Air. May I know why, General? We will attack their advanced command center. Hearing that, the clone almost stumbled. The target Ragu had in mind was one of the best defended in the Separatist frontlines. To try and attack it with just Hell Squad would be. However, he knew Ragu well, and he was sure the Jedi wasn't that harsh Padawan anymore, so he said nothing, and only hoped he had a backup plan. Got it, General. Chapter 280 In the darkness, eight shadows crawled forward. The streams of lava served as a source of light, even if there was no moon around Celest. One would have expected that to bother Hell Squad and Ragu, but the air was so hot that the thermal sensors of the Separatists didn't work, and the droids had to rely on their eyes. That made them easier to fool. And the Clankers weren't known for their intelligence either. Hell Squad, from here on, complete silence. If we make a single noise, they can discover us. Captain Dice, when I contact you, initiate the attack. Understood, General. Hell Squad just nodded, and turned off their comm links. They couldn't risk making any sort of noise. After that, they slowly entered enemy territory, moving from cover to cover carefully, and, when there was none, crawling with their bellies touching the ground. Droid patrols walked mere meters from them, but didn't notice the group. If it was any other planet, that would have been impossible, but Sullust messed with the Clanker's sensors more than they thought initially. The few times they were discovered, a quick green flash put an end to the patrols. Once again, Dager admired what the Padawan had grown into. He now knew how to use his powers perfectly, and was much more skilled. Like them or not, Dager was sure the Jedi Order now had one of the best generations of fighters in their history. Few things could make people improve like putting their life on the line at every moment. Still, not everything went perfectly according to plan. Although they got pretty close to the Separatist Command Center, they could only go so far without being discovered. A radius of 200 meters around the enemy camp was illuminated, and the group stopped at the threshold between light and darkness. Ragu ordered for them to stop, and Hell Squad dropped to the ground. They hadn't expected the Separatists to be so cautious, and now they had no idea of what they could do. Luckily, they didn't have to worry about the sun rising, because the nights on Sullust lasted about twenty hours. Suddenly, the sound of a battle reached their ears. Sirens blasted in the Separatist camp, and battalions of B-1 and B-2 units started to march out of it. Hell Squad and their general looked at each other, confused. It was normal for battles to break out, even at night. This was a real war, not children's play. Be it the Republic or the Separatist, if they saw a chance to deal a blow to the enemy, they took it. And, whatever the reason for the battle, it benefited Hell Squad. Ragu made a gesture using one finger, and Dab nodded, acknowledging it. He would stay there to provide support. The others started moving forward, and into the illuminated area, trying to get as far as they could before being discovered. They actually moved a hundred meters forward before the clankers were alerted to their presence, and started firing. The advanced command center the Separatist had was nothing more than a camp surrounded by dwarf spider droids. Those units were basically mobile turrets, which could tear apart an entire battalion in a matter of minutes. Usually, four of them would be enough to keep the Republic forces away, but not Hell Squad. One hundred meters were easily covered by Ragu, 
and the Jedi cut the legs of two dwarf spider droids before finishing them off. Dab took care of another one, hitting it right in the eye, and the other clones quickly destroyed the last one. In less than twenty seconds, the main defense of the Seppis had crumbled. Fighting as they got closer, Deja quickly contacted Captain Dice, and ordered him to start the attack. The clankers already know they were there, so there was no use in hiding anymore. Besides, their main target, the dwarf spider droids, had already been taken care of. The Republic forces that had been waiting about a kilometer away started to move, and suddenly, blue lasers cut the night, hitting the unaware droids. In a matter of seconds, a giant battle broke out, spreading for kilometers. In less than an hour, the entirety of the southeast front was burning with the flames of war as the Republic launched an all-out offensive in the middle of the night. Meanwhile, Hell Squad and their Jedi General, Ragu, were cutting through the clankers inside the command center as if they were nothing. Brain threw two thermal detonators, which blew a group of B-2 units to pieces. Tech and 3-4 climbed up an AAT and opened the hatch before executing the droids inside it. Outside the enemy camp, Dab was picking off the Seppis on the outskirts, confusing them. With so many blue lasers coming from the Republic side, they couldn't identify which one was causing them so many losses. Dajer looked at Ragu, and used his blaster to gesture to some kind of metal tent in the middle of the command center. If they were to find a tactical droid, it would be there. The Jedi nodded, and started running, with Tzjir, Metal, and Cell right behind him. Using his lightsaber, he cut the doors open, revealing the clanker they were looking for. With a simple slash, the droid's torso was separated from the rest of its body. All Republic troops, now is our chance. The voice of the Tigruta resounded in every communicator, and the clones doubled their efforts, pushing the droids back. Dajer smiled under his helmet, while using his DC-17 to put an end to a group of approaching B-1 units. You heard the general, lads. Let's show the tin cans what the clone army can do. In a single night, the separatists were forced to give up over 300 kilometers of ground, while the clones pushed them back with relentless efforts. It was only three days later that the battle slowed down again, as the Seppis reinforced their defenses, and Sullust entered a stalemate. He didn't make it. Dajer and Commander Cody glanced at Captain Dice's body, and acknowledged the medical droid's words with a nod. After a few seconds, they moved on, to see the other injured troopers. Every victory had its price, and the number of wounded soldiers that couldn't resist was sometimes even bigger than the number of clones that died in battle. Commander Dajer, General Ragu requested your presence. A trooper ran up to them, and Dajer nodded. He tapped Commander Cody's shoulder before leaving the infirmary. Okay. Where is he? On the front lines. If one were to say that the clone army was unstoppable, then the Jedi's simply weren't human. They could spend days without stop on the battlefield, only having small periods of rest and meditation every now and again. The clones, on the other hand, could only go for two days of uninterrupted battle before they passed out of exhaustion. Being constantly on the edge, with your life on the line, and seeing your brothers die, took a toll. The fact that they only slept four or five hours, because of the nightmares, didn't help. The more they battled, the more they saw deaths, the worse the dreams became. Watching the Jedi waving his lightsaber, Dajer pushed those thoughts to the back of his mind, and approached Ragu. General. The higher-ups have a new assignment for us, Dajer. Prepare Hell Squad to leave we are going hunting. Chapter 281 What will happen to the clones when this war ends, Dajer? The commander looked at Ragu stunned. The question had come out of nowhere, and he truly had no idea of how he could answer it. Turning back to the window, and the hyperspace outside, he didn't say anything for a long time. Ragu had asked to speak with him alone, and he had supposed it had something to do with the reason why they left Sullust before the planet was conquered, but he was wrong. Permission to speak freely, sir. Of course. I don't know. Clones. We were created for this war, and this war only. We were promised a real life after it is over. But I am not sure what that means. The Jedi waited. He knew Dajer wasn't paying attention to him anymore, but was lost in thought. 
He had asked the question with the single purpose of seeing what the clone had in mind. For him, a Jedi, the creation of the clones was cruelty. Making copies of the same being, just to use it as soldiers. He had never thought of that until a few months before, when Lieutenant Shield, a clone he fought side by side before, had said that by himself. Maybe. Maybe he had been lying to himself, saying the clones had chosen their own destiny, and only when a clone, even though he was a traitor, said that, he realized what the truth was. That clones had never made a choice in their life, because they had never been asked a single question, only given orders. A normal life. All the life I have known is war, sir. I grew up preparing for it. I saw so many go. My sergeant, my original squad. There isn't a day I didn't lose a brother. I hate all this. Dejer took a deep breath, knowing that he was overstepping his bounds, but Regu only gave an encouraging nod. Clones. We don't know what to feel regarding the war. Without it, I wouldn't even exist. None of us would. But the very same thing that is the cause of my existence, took so many from me. The 303rd, Commander Keeley, and General D. Shield, Barrow, Fonder, all of them. The Jedi said nothing. There was nothing to say. They were, and are, my brothers, General. Uff. I don't know what we, clones, will do after this war is over. Dager touched all the lines in his armor. They went from his shoulder to almost his elbow, and covered part of his chest. That was a reflex he had every time he remembered those who had died. But I know that while I have brothers fighting in the galaxy, I won't stop. I will make the Seppis pay for every clone they eliminated. Ragu looked at the commander, pensive. He had known Dager for a long time, and he had learned a lot from him. Even if he didn't agree with the feelings the clone had, he wouldn't say anything for now. Are we sure they went to Felucia? Yeah. Our ships were on their heels, and they headed to the nearest planet. The Chancellor said that usually he would let Master Undulai and the 41st deal with them, but since Hell Squad and Heige have a history. Dager shook his head. Five days ago, Ragu had received a transmission from the Jedi Order. Asking him and Hell Squad to take part in a manhunt for several prisoners that escaped the Coruscant Maximum Security Prison during an attempt to escape by the Separatist leader Moralo Eval and associates. They were still on the run, and, while most of the other prisoners had been caught, a group of six of them had managed to leave Coruscant, including Heige. Chancellor Palpatine himself had requested that Hell Squad took part on the mission, although no reasons had been given, at least not to Dager. The Chancellor showed a lot of interest in the special units, especially on Hell Squad and Delta Squad. Although Dager found it weird, he didn't think too much of it. Heige closed his eyes, and listened. As a Mon Calamari, he was used to feeling the vibrations in the water, and listening to every little sound, since he couldn't rely on his eyes in the deep waters. That was now working to his favor, as he stood on a branch of a gigantic tree, waiting. When the patrol of clones passed under him, he suddenly opened his eyes, and jumped. The first trooper, wearing the camouflaged armor of the 41st Legion, didn't even see what hit him before his neck was snapped. Heige grabbed the blaster the clone had been holding, and used it to shoot two other soldiers on the back. The last clone had time to turn around, but before he could do anything, a hand grabbed his neck, and lifted him. He tried to free himself, but the hand was like a metal claw. His world turned as Heige smashed him against a tree, making it shake, and causing leaves to fall. The Mon Calamari didn't even check if the clone was alive before moving on. That was already the fourth patrol he eliminated. Now, what he needed to do was find somewhere to hide for a while, and then, a way out of Felucia. A lot hovered above the jungle, waiting. Dejer, Ragu, and Hell Squad looked out of the open doors, to the ground, hidden by foliage, eighty meters below them. It was impossible to land on most of Felucia. Weirdly shaped trees and bushes covered the planet, and gigantic predators, like the Rankers, roamed in packs. Metal and 3-4 kicked a roll of cables out of the gunship, and they fell between the branches. With the calmness of someone who had done that many times, Hell Squad slid down the cables, landing softly on the ground, already alert to their surroundings. 
not only did they have to worry about the escaped prisoners, but also about the separatist. The entire planet was a battleground, and they could never be too careful, even if they were on friendly territory. Dejo gave Ragu a quick confirmation that the area was secure, and a few seconds later, the Tigruta joined them by dropping down and ignoring the cables. The Jedi did a flip in midair and used the trees to slow down his fall, before landing safe and sound. None of the clones were too impressed, since they were quite used to scenes like that. For the last few months, Hell Squad and Ragu had partnered most of the time, going on special assignments. They had been to Felucia more than once too. The last area any of the prisoners was seen was 11 kilometers from here. The 41st already captured one of them, and eliminated another, so we only have to worry about four. They are all extremely dangerous, especially Heige, so be careful. Roger that, General. Come on, lads, let's move. Chapter 282 Critty ran as fast as he could, jumping over fallen trees and rocks, but came to a sudden stop when an opening appeared. Looking around him, the human grabbed the piece of wood he had in his hands tightly. Ever since his ship had crashed in Felucia, and the group of escaped prisoners split up, that was the only weapon he had. He had been lucky enough not to meet any Republic troops for the past days, and he had grabbed enough supplies from the ship for him to survive many days. It appeared everything was going well to him, and the only downside was that the frightening Mon Calamari had taken all the weapons. However, when he thought he just might really get away, a group of clones, as well as one of the damned Jedis had appeared, and started chasing him. All he could do was run, but now he had no idea of what to do. Hearing the sound of leaves moving, he looked around, and saw two clones appear. Turning to the opposite direction, he prepared to run, but two other troopers appeared. Spinning in place, unsure of what his next course of action should be, he saw three other clones. All of them, seven in total, had different designs on their armors, designs he had never seen before. Especially the one right in front of him, who had lines on his right arm. Experience taught him that no normal clone would have this kind of liberty with their armor, and his instincts told him that if he wasn't careful, they wouldn't hesitate to shoot him. The entire squad exhaled a dangerous feeling, as if they were a pack of Nexus, waiting to pounce onto him. Put down that. Weapon, and surrender, Critty. You have no way out. Glaring full of hatred at the young Jedi, the ex-prisoner hesitated for a few seconds, before dropping the piece of wood. He didn't want to go back to prison, but he wasn't stupid enough to try and fight. He escaped once, he could do it again, but only if he was alive. The leading clone gestured with his head, and one of the troopers walked to Critty while the others kept their aim on him. Without putting up any resistance, he let the clone handcuff him. With him, only Heige is left, General. The most dangerous of them. Dajer and Ragu talked while Critty, tied up, was pushed into a lot. Hell Squad couldn't possibly bring all the captured fugitives with them, so each time they got one, a gunship from the 41st came to pick them up. They had already gotten two others, one of which preferred to die than surrender, and go back to prison, before Critty, and now, only Heidi, Hell Squad's old enemy, remained on the run. We have to catch him as soon as possible, sir. He already eliminated 28 soldiers. Ragu patted Dejer's shoulder, calming down the clone using a wave of the force. He knew that Dejer blamed himself for those deaths, because he had a chance to eliminate Heige before, but didn't take it. Don't worry, Dejer. It won't take long. Master Undulai has every trooper that isn't on the battlefield searching for him, and we already blocked his way to the Separatist's side of the planet. The circle is shrinking, and we will get him soon. Dejer nodded, and gestured for Hell Squad to gather around him. They had their helmets off, and sweat trickling down their faces. Felucia was hot and humid, with constant rains. The armors made it worse, but they would rather have it on than not have it at all. Only when they were sure there weren't any enemies around that they took off the helmets. We will move out soon, lads. We will have to go through the territory of a ranker, so be careful. Understood, commander. Rankers, hum. A few dozen kilometers away, Heige was dragging a dead creature, which looked like a lizard, but with four giant wings. 
The animal had twice his size, but the Mon Calamari didn't seem to face trouble with lifting it. When he got in front of a cave, Heige stopped, and let the dead creature on the ground before retreating a few dozen meters, and hiding. Over two hours went by, and night started to fall, but Heige was still waiting patiently. He was a hunter, and was used to stay still for hours, waiting for the prey to move. He had always liked the feeling of control over his target, but now, the Republic had twisted the roles, and he was the one being hunted. He didn't like that, even more after he discovered, when he was spying on a patrol, that Hell Squad was amongst the people searching for him. But he had an idea to make the prey become the hunter once again. Suddenly, he felt the earth under his feet tremble when a gigantic creature left the cave, and grabbed the corpse he had left outside, and started munching on it. The being was over fifteen meters tall, and had small, black eyes. Its arms had several sharp claws, and fangs appeared on his open mouth, each one the size of a person. Drool dripped out of its mouth when it finished eating, and it looked around for more food. Suddenly, a blue flash left the trees, hitting it right under the left eye. The rancor, one of the deadliest predators in the entirety of Felucia, growled in pain, and looked at where the laser had come from. All it saw was someone running away, and that triggered its anger. Rankers were territorial, violent, and very proud. It couldn't accept the fact that it had been challenged, and that it was now being ignored. Smashing the ground in fury, the creature smashed Tress aside as it started pursuing Heige. The direction they were going was none other than where one of the Republic camps was. Deja was talking with Commander Gree when he heard alarms going off. Both clones got out of the command post they were in, and found the reason for the turmoil without much trouble. A rancor was attacking the Republic base. The enraged beast slapped a clone with his giant hand, sending the poor soldier flying with a broken body. Another trooper was captured by the rancor, and thrown on its mouth. His screams rang out, making the clones burst in anger, and empty their magazines on the creature. However, the skin of the rancor was too thick, so the lasers did little to hurt him, only making it angrier. Deja and Hell Squad also joined on the fray, even as the rancor destroyed the buildings, and slaughtered more clones. Deja. Look past it. On the trees. Ragu and General Undulai appeared, looking surprised at the rampaging creature. What surprised them even more, though, was the figure looking at the base from the outskirts. Heige. The Mon Calamari was glaring straight at Deja, hatred burning in his eyes. The commander looked back, but he had bigger problems. Generals, you go after him. We will take care of the rancor. The two Jedis only hesitated for a slight moment before nodding, and skipping past the rancor. Both Hell Squad and the 41st had experience in dealing with rancors. When he saw them, Heige turned around and ran. He knew he wasn't match for a Jedi, even more too. Chapter 283 Dager and Dab hit the left eye of the rancor at the same time, making the creature screech in pain, and stomp the ground, leveling two tents. Another two unfortunate troopers were caught by its giant hands, and thrown over a hundred meters away, crashing and rolling in the ground, long dead. The death toll was now already at over ten clones. Gree. We need the cannons. Dejer kept firing at the rancor, trying to blind it completely, but the creature wasn't stupid, and was covering its good eyes with its hand. While the clones tried to keep their distance, the rancor was quick, and another soldier was eaten in the few seconds that Dager turned to yell at Commander Gree. On it! Razor, King, GYTS, with me! The three clones the commander had chosen followed him, but the rancor picked one of them before he could move, the sharp claws piercing him through his back. Trying his hardest to ignore the screams of his brothers, Dager, the closest one to Commander Gree, put Brain in charge of Hell Squad, and followed the commander. I will be the gunner. Come on, move, move, move. Commander Gree nodded, and they ran towards the nearest at TE. It was the only one in optimal firing position, while the others would have to be moved. Climbing the ladder on one of the front legs of the vehicle, Dager sat at the enormous mass drive laser cannon on top of it. An at TE needed a crew of six troopers if one wanted it to function properly, but four were enough to just fire the cannon. The gunner, Dager, had to press the trigger,
but two clone, King and GYTS, had to control the vehicle, and power it up, while a spotter, Commander Gree, aimed. The number of clones necessary to man an AT-TE was one of the reasons why the Separatist and the Republic were evenly matched, even though an AT-TE could take out multiple AATs before going down. Feeling the cannon move, and turn around, Dajer got ready to press the trigger. He was only a few dozen meters away, and the rancor was a big target, so he could hardly miss. The creature, however, had sensed the danger, and was glaring at him with a murderous glint in its remaining eye. Ignoring the other soldiers, the rancor ran towards the AT-TE, almost crushing metal and cell under its feet. The two clones had to jump to the side, barely dodging their deaths. Gree. Almost there. Come on. Almost, almost. Ready. The rancor was just twenty meters away, its hand stretched to grab Dager, or the AT-TE, when the commander pressed the trigger. A blue laser with a diameter of almost two meters left the cannon's barrel, hitting the open hand. The arm of the creature, up to its elbow, disappeared, and pieces of flesh fell from the sky, covering a wide area. Black blood showered the AT-TE, and Dager, who was on top of it. The creature held what was left of its right arm with his other hand, letting out guttural noises of pain. The anger in its face disappeared, replaced by fear, and it turned around and ran away. It had faced many enemies before, and defeated all of them, but it had never seen anything like this. Its instincts told it that it was no match for the cannon, and even the pain it was feeling subsided, since all it could do now was fear for its life. The clone only bothered about wiping the blood off his helmet, before preparing to fire again. The recharge time, however, was long enough for the rancor to escape, and he missed, only hitting trees, and creating a small crater. Sliding down from the AT-TE, Dager grabbed his DC-15A, and shook his body, cleaning himself of most of the black substance. The base was a scenery of destruction, with destroyed buildings, dead troopers, craters on the ground, and pieces of the rancor. Remembering who was responsible for this, Dager clenched his fists in fury. This time, he wouldn't make the mistake of leaving Heige alive. Gree. Put the camp in order, I will go help the Jedis. Brain, Tech, 3-4, Dab, Metal, Cell, with me. Running towards the forest, Dager only now realized that the rancor fled in the same direction that Heige, General Undulai, and Ragu had gone. Quickening his pace, he ordered Hell Squad to move faster, throwing caution to the wind. Without the ATS, even the two Jedis would have trouble dealing with a rancor. Heidi was running through the forest, pushing aside a group of jelly-like bushes, when suddenly his feet left the ground. He started levitating, and, no matter how much he struggled, he couldn't free himself. He felt his body being turned around for a force he couldn't control, and was put face to face with the two Jedis. One of them, the woman, had her arms stretched, and her palms faced up. Clearly, she was the one holding him, using the Force. The other Jedi, a Tigruta, pointed his lightsaber at him. Come with us without resisting. Heige only looked at him, without saying a word, an expression of despise on his face. Suddenly, he heard something, and his gaze fixated in the air behind the Jedis. They probably noticed that, or maybe they felt the creature, because they turned around, but it was too late. A giant hand grabbed the woman, lifting her up, and threatening to crush her. With her distracted, Heidi was freed from his invisible shackles, and fell to the ground. Quickly getting up, he got away from the rancor and the Jedis, although he stood near to see how it would play out. Ragu saw his fellow Jedi being grabbed, and witnessed the rancor pull her close to his mouth, and howl, covering her in saliva. He also noticed that one of the arms of the monster was missing, probably because of the explosions they hear a few minutes prior. Master Undulai. Ack. He jumped up, on the ranker's leg, and used it as a trampoline to propel himself higher. Then, he slashed with his lightsaber, cutting a gash on the creature's hand, making it drop General Undulai. The Miriolan fell down, holding her right side, and panting in pain. Her lightsaber was on the ground a few meters away from her, but before she could reach it with the force, the rancor trampled over it. All that was left was a crushed metal stick and sparks. Ragu landed next to her, doing a backflip, and helped her get up, to escape the injured monster. 
He could see Heige looking at the battle, but if he stopped paying attention to the creature, he would probably die. That is, if it was just him and General Undulai. Suddenly, blue lasers flew from the trees, most heading towards the rancor, catching its attention. Two of the lasers, however, were sent after Heige, hitting the Mon Calamari on the legs, and making him fall face first on the ground. Danger. Go after Heige. I will keep the rancor occupied. After seeing that he hit the target, Dager led Hell Squad out of the cover of the trees, and onto the area that was being trampled by the rancor. The clones spread out, keeping as much distance between them and the creature as possible. 3-4, go help General Unduli. The others, help General Ragu fight that thing. Got it, sir. Understood, Commander. Running towards the Mon Calamari, Dager saw the familiar hatred burning on Heige's eyes. Chapter 284 If you move, I will shoot you. Stay down, Heige. Dager would have no qualms with executing the Mon Calamari for all the crimes he had done against the Republic, and, especially, as revenge for all the clones he had eliminated, but he knew the Jedis wouldn't approve of that. As such, he only ordered Heige to stay down, which the Mon Calamari disobeyed. As soon as Dager got near, Heige ignored the two burning holes in his legs, and jumped at the clone, trying to catch him by surprise. Dager, however, was prepared, and fired his blaster, hitting Heige on the left side of his body. The Mon Calamari fell to the ground again, panting in pain, and holding his new wound. The hatred in his eyes burned stronger, and he wished for nothing to eliminate the clone before him, but he was impotent. Dark shadows covered his mind, and Heige could think of nothing but to eliminate the clone before him. He was the cause of so much suffering, and so much pain. Before this war had started, Heige didn't have any problems with the Republic. He had a good life back in Mon Cala. He had friends, a family, and everything he could wish for. Even if his father and the royal family had their problems, it never affected him. But one day, something changed. A war started, and his planet was torn between which side to choose. His father wanted to side with the Separatist, and, although Heige didn't agree with him entirely, he still followed him. And then, he saw his world shaken as he faced the horrors of war. He saw friends die, and he eliminated many himself. He didn't know for what he was fighting, and why so many had to die. He argued with his father every single day, and their relationship deteriorated. All he wanted to do was go back to Mon Cala, and to how life was before. But now he was a soldier in an army. He couldn't leave. And so, he got used to it, because it was the only way to survive. He became a cold, merciless killer. His friends, and the Mon Calamari under his father, became famous as one of the elite groups of the Separatist army. And, because of that, they were chosen to attack Kamino, with his father as the commander. The result was utter defeat. Out of shame, despair, anger, and craziness, his father piloted his ship into the planet, trying to destroy the clone facilities, but failed. Heige saw his father die, and wanted to die too, but he still had men under his command. So he promised to himself that he would avenge his father later. His damaged ship went to Scarif, where he planned to start his vengeance, but who could have imagined that Hell Squad would wipe out his crew? Fueled by sadness and anger, he had followed Count Dooku's advice, and went to train under General Grievous. And, while that did make him much stronger, it had its price. In a short two years, his life had been turned upside down, and now, about to be arrested again, all Heige could think was of how much he hated everyone. His father, the Republic, the Separatist, the Jedi, Count Dooku, General Grievous, Hell Squad, Dager, and himself. He hated the galaxy, he hated his life, he hated everything. His mind clouded by hatred, Heige suddenly felt something inside of him. He reached for it, and heard a voice whispering in his head, telling him to let his emotions loose, to do what he wanted. To hate everything, and eliminate everyone. Without him realizing it, his mind was drowned by all the hatred he felt, and that thing took control. An explosion of invisible energy left his body, sending Dager flying, and stunning the Jedis and Hell Squad. Heige got up as if his wounds didn't exist, 
even as blood dripped down his side, and kicked Dager. He enjoyed the feeling of bones breaking under his feet. That invisible force grabbed the viper blade the clone was carrying, and gave it to Heige. The Mon Calamari analyzing it for a moment, before a smile crept its way to his face for the first time in years, and he prepared to stab Dager. He finally would have his revenge. General Unguli and Ragu stared in shock at Haihi, feeling the dark side of the force grow stronger in him. Soon, it was so dense they could actually see a black and red mist appear, and throw Dager away before dissipating. Ragu had never seen anything like that before. He had fought against Ventress, and other Force users, but none had been as powerful as Heidi. He lost himself. Ragu, we have to deal with him quickly. His mind is gone. General Undulai yelled at the young Jedi. Clearly, she had seen that happen before, and it wasn't anything good. But before they could get to Heidi, the Mon Calamari already had grabbed Dager's Viberblade, using the Force, and was preparing to eliminate the clone with it. And then Heige was gone. It was all too fast for even the Jedis to react. The Rancor, recognizing Heige as the one who first shot him, and the one who led him to all the pain he was feeling, swiped his hand at the Mon Calamari, grabbing him. Even the Force wasn't powerful enough to go against the creature, at least not in the hands of the untrained Heige. He let out a silent scream of anger, his mouth open, but no sound coming out, and stabbed the hand holding him repeatedly. That, however, only made the rancor angrier. It tightened its grip, and the sound of bones breaking could be heard as Heige lost all his strength, and collapsed. His eyes, still full of hatred, never left Dager, even as the rancor threw him on its mouth. Hell Squad and the Jedis watched, powerless, as the Mon Calamari was eaten in an eerie silence. For a few seconds, Hell Squad stopped firing at the creature, and the only sound that could be heard was the rancor swallowing. They had no sympathy for Heidi, but that was a gruesome way to go. After eating the Mon Calamari, the Rancor glared at the Republic forces, and growled. Since the Atte wasn't there, he wasn't afraid anymore. Smashing down with his remaining hand, he tried to capture 3-4, but the medic was faster, and dodged. Hell Squad resumed firing at the creature, while Ragu awakened from his stupor, and slashed the Rancor's ankle, making it kneel. Using that chance, Metal and Dab focused their fire at the creature's right eye, and finally were able to blind it. The Tigruta then jumped on top of the raging creature, and used his lightsaber to cut its neck open, before doing a backflip, and pushing both his hands forward. Pushed by a wave of force, the Rancor stumbled backwards, and fell to the ground, the impact big enough to make Cell, who was close, fall. Taking advantage of the situation the Rancor was in, Ragu ran forward once again, and sent his lightsaber straight through its right eye. The Rancor twitched for a few seconds before quieting down. Exhausted, the Jedi sat on the ground. The hunt for the escaped prisoners was over, and in a way they had never imagined it would end. Chapter 285 Dager looked at the dead Rancor, quite shocked. He had known Heige for a long time, and the Mon Calamari had tried to eliminate him over and over again. Somehow, it was hard to accept that he was gone just like that, but the bits of flesh on the creature's mouth left no doubt that Heige was truly dead. Sighing, he picked up his vibroblade, dropped by Heige when the Rancor had grabbed him, and made another marking on his armor. As cruel of an enemy as the Mon Calamari might have been, Dager didn't think it was fair to forget him. When 3-4 finished treating General Unguli, she had broken a rib, and fractured an arm, he approached Dager. How bad is it, Commander? Not too much. One or two broken ribs. Any problems to breathe? No. My lungs are good. All right, let me take a look. With the major concern of a broken rib piercing a lung out of the way, 3-4 was much calmer, and quickly bandaged Dager. While the medic was doing that, Hell Squad, General Unguli, and Ragu joined them, so Dager wouldn't have to move. That puts an end to your mission, Ragu. Yes, it does. I never thought I would see a Sith being born, only to meet its end so quickly. He had so much hatred. I wonder what led to that. Hearing the Jedi's talking, Dager knew he should stay quiet. But he could see Hell Squad shuffling uncomfortably, and he himself wasn't feeling too good. 
As such, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. We did, General. General Undulai looked at Dajer curiously. She could feel that the clone was both relieved and sad. Pardon me, Commander. What does that mean? We were the cause of his hatred. Hell Squad in special. We eliminated his entire crew back in Scarif, and Heige never gave up on trying to get revenge. Weird. The Separatists usually don't show any empathy, even to their own. The Clankers don't. But. With all due respect, General, I can understand him. Heige deserved to die, for all the clones he eliminated, but in a way, he wasn't too different from us. He too saw his friends die, and wanted to avenge them. Ragu wasn't surprised by what Deja was saying, since it wasn't the first time he heard the clones' thoughts on the war and everything related to it. General Undulai, however, had never expected a clone to say something so. Deep. She was used to them just following orders. Not that she didn't notice all the pain they felt, or their emotions, but she rarely, or more accurately, never, heard one of them express those thoughts in words. General Undulai, are you okay? A group of clones led by Commander Gree suddenly appeared, and glanced surprised at the ranker's body for a moment before proceeding to join the group that was already there. Yes, Commander. 3-4 already took care of my wounds, you don't have to worry. And the fugitive? The ranker got him. Commander Gree looked at the creature once again, and slowly nodded. He had no sympathy for an enemy of the Republic. We should get back to the base, generals. You are right. Let's go. That little apprentice of your died, General. Who would have thought that he actually had power within the force? Kaka Kaka. If he couldn't survive, that means he wasn't strong enough. He would be of no use to you, Master. Useless insect. Kakaka. The tree next to Dajer collapsed, and a trooper got stuck under it. Putting his blaster aside, Dajer tried to lift the tree, but it was too heavy. Metal. Come give me a hand. Together, the two clones pushed the tree aside, and the trooper crawled away from it, bruised, but alive. He thanked Dajer, but the commander had already turned around and was firing at the Seppis. Two droids fell victim of his lasers, and Dajer hid behind an Atte's legs to reload. Felucia was a tricky planet to fight in, where behind every tree and rock, an enemy could be hiding. Of course, that was true for both sides, and there weren't only a few occasions where the Republic had ambushed the Separatist. Just like now. Like many other battlefields, such as Sullust, Mygido, Geonosis, and many more, Felucia was locked in a battle of attrition. The side that could withstand the most would win. And, for that, supplies were extremely important. As such, the Republic was attacking a Separatist convoy that carried batteries and ammunition, but they had underestimated the escort that the Seppis had prepared. Dajer had advised that they held on to the attack, and waited for a better opportunity, but General Undulai's Padawan, Baris Afi, was the one leading the ambush, and she insisted on following their original plan. Dajer disagreed, but he followed his orders all the same. He had long understood that Jedis, especially Padawans, weren't used to leading a war, and that they needed a defeat to learn to be better leaders. The fact that many clones had to pay with their lives for the recklessness of the Padawan was a fatality Dajer couldn't avoid. He could only hope that she would learn of her mistakes, just like Regu did. Back to the present, Dajer showed half of his body, and saw the convoy in the valley below. The ambushing forces were thirty meters above the Separatist, giving them a height advantage, but the AAT still could aim and fire at them. Firing his blaster at the clankers below, Dajer looked to the side, and saw Barris too occupied with deflecting lasers to do anything else. Glancing back at the sides of the valley, he decided it would be bumpy to go down, but not impossible. Hell Squad, on me. The six clones quickly surrounded him, taking cover behind a tree, and waited for his orders. Those two AATs are slaughtering us. Seventy meters to our left, there is a place where the inclination is slightly subtler. We will go down through there. Tech and metal, you take care of the tank to the left, 3-4, and cell, you get the other one. Dab, you take care of the staps, and I will get the dwarf spiders. Brain, 
Do you still have detonators? Yeah. Pass them around, and use the ones that are left to blow up the convoy. General Afi wanted the convoy intact. Not going to happen, and she knows that. He looked at their helmets for a moment, knowing that under them were determined expressions, and nodded. Let's go, then. As soon as he said that, Dajer got out from behind the tree, and ran towards the area he had seen before. Dodging two lasers, he jumped, landing on his back. Almost instantly, mud, earth, and pebbles started following, and he slid down faster than he expected. He knew by the noise that Hell Squad was on the same path as him. Firing his blaster without much aim, he fell the last two meters to the ground, right on top of a B-2 unit. The clanker was thrown to the ground by his momentum, and Dager finished him off before turning to eliminate three other seppies. His brothers by his side, he ran forward, towards the dwarf spider droids. Now came the complicated part. Chapter 286 As if sliding thirty meters amongst rocks and dirt was nothing, Hell Squad got to their feet with weapons ready and firing. A group of twenty battle droids was destroyed before they even understood how the clones had gotten to them. Immediately after, Hell Squad split up, each member doing their part. Dajer jumped over a separatist vehicle, and landed on top of a dwarf spider droid. Putting his blaster against the clanker's head, he kept pressing the trigger until the outer layer of the dwarf spider droid had melted, and its circuits were destroyed. As the droid's legs lost power, and it crumbled to the ground, Dajer took cover behind its body, and pulled out a thermal detonator. He threw it over his shoulder, and it landed just under the next dwarf spider droid, destroying it immediately. A few B-1 units, and a droidica, were also caught in the blast, and became scrap metal. A few meters away from him, Dab pressed the trigger on his DC-15X four times. The first two lasers hit the stabilizers of two staps, sending them, and the droids using it, to the ground. The other two lasers hit the pilots of another two staps directly, and the two vehicles crashed on one another, creating a small explosion. Not too far away, Tech and Metal ran forward, using the clankers they eliminated as shields, until they got to the AATs. Metal climbed on it, and rolled two detonators into the barrel before jumping off. A few seconds later, a big explosion happened, shaking the ground, as the tank disappeared in a cloud of smoke and debris. 3-4 and Cell opted for a different approach. The scout got on top of the AAT, and opened the hatch, before unloading an entire magazine into the crew. His next step was to grab the medic's arm, and pull the clone inside the AAT. Soon, the Separatists' own weapon was being used against them, blowing up a group of droidikas, two dwarf spider droids, and a whole bunch of B-1 and B-2 units. When they finally got out of the AAT, having rigged the tank with thermal detonators, a radius of about 50 meters around them was a scene of complete chaos and destruction. All the while Hell Squad was wreaking havoc amongst the droids, Brain hadn't fired a single shot. He was fully focused only on putting explosives in every ammo crate and battery he could find. Ready, Commander. Roger that. Hell Squad, fall back. Instantly, Hell Squad disengaged, and, while Dab gave cover, taking down five more staps, hid behind the carcass of one of the AATs. Have fun, brain. Ha ha ha. Dajer's second in command laughed out loud as he pressed a switch, and a chain of explosions sent a heatwave over them, blowing up a cloud of dust, mud, soil, and pieces of droids. Metal cursed as half a B-2 super battle droid almost hit him. Filters on. Turning on the filtering function on his helmet, Tabana gas could be highly toxic, and the ammo crates had been full of it, in its raw form, Dajer looked at the damage they had done. The convoy was gone, and its escort was mostly in shreds, but there were still about 200 clankers alive. General Afi, we might need help down here. Got it. 41st, attack. With the AATs and dwarf spider droids gone, more soldiers showed themselves, and started firing at the seppies. Once again, the height advantage proved to be important, and the remaining clankers were quickly eliminated. From the moment Hell Squad took action, to the end of the battle, only twelve minutes had passed. Barris was too concentrated on the lasers in front of her to notice Hell Squad's crazy stunt as the unit slid straight into the bulk of the enemy forces. 
However, she would have to be blind and deaf not to see the dwarf spider droids, AATs, Staps, and Droidikas that had been slaughtering the troops under her, disappear. Just a few minutes after that, the 41st only had to deal with normal B-1 units. A few more minutes, and a gigantic explosion shook the ground as the convoy was destroyed. General Afi, we might need help down here. The Padawan heard Dager's voice through her communicator, and realized that only Hell Squad would be as crazy, and capable enough, as to do what they just did. Got it. 41st, Attack. The camouflaged clones came out from behind the trees and rocks, and showered the seppis in blue lasers. They didn't last too long. Good job, Commander Dager. We would have taken a lot more losses if it wasn't for your squad. The Padawan thanked Dager, but the commander just acknowledged it with a slight nod, and, after confirming there was nothing else, went to talk with the wounded troopers. It was a commander's job to be with his men not only in battle, but also out of it. Looking at Dager's back, Barris shook her head. She had never expected a squad of seven men to do what 300 of the 41st were having trouble doing. Not for the first time, the Padawan understood that Hell Squad was truly the best the Grand Army of the Republic had. They were elite soldiers, and they were good at their job. Did it all go well, Barris? Yes, Master. Thanks to Hell Squad, we didn't suffer many casualties. General Undulai nodded at her Padawan, and was happy to see so many troopers return unharmed. They had only lost about twenty clones, which was excellent. They had expected about a hundred deaths. Hell Squad, on the other hand, went to their quarters, a simple room, with many bunk beds, and started taking off their armors. They were full of bruises, from sliding down the valley, but, apart from that, were unharmed. All of them, without exception, had several scars on their bodies, mostly from lasers. After putting simple, brownish-red clothes on, the clones started cleaning their weapons. They were always on the edge, ready to jump into a battle at any moment, so they took the chance to take care of their blasters whenever they could. After all, a weapon was the same as a soldier's life. With it, they might die. Without it, they die, for sure. They were still doing that when Ragu entered the room. Promptly, Hell Squad got up and saluted him. At ease. You can continue what you were doing. The seven men nodded, and sat down again. They were too used to Ragu's presence to care when he was there. That didn't mean they were disrespectful, just that they could ignore his presence, and do their duties without being nervous about a superior officer. Seeing the focused clones, Ragu decided not to interrupt them, and sat down on a bed, his legs crossed and eyes closed. He felt more comfortable in Hell Squad's presence than with the other Jedis. Dajer saw that his general didn't seem intent in saying anything, and finished checking his blaster before picking up his armor. He used a piece of cloth to wipe out the laser marks, but left the dust and mud. It didn't bother him, and helped the camouflage. His eyes ran through the scratches on the shoulder pad, and he touched them. He didn't need their help to remind all the brothers he had lost, but whatever the dead went, he wanted them to know that he had avenged them. Chapter 287 A Battlefield Rocks and red soil Small and shriveled trees and bodies. A stretch of over 10 kilometers, all of it covered in bodies. The majority of them were yellowish droids or big, silver ones. They were in pieces, and full of holes. Their carcass toppled over one another, sometimes piling up to half a meter high. Here and there, something different appeared. Something white and brownish red. The deeper one went inside the battlefield, the more they would see those bodies. Each of them had a blaster in their hands, and dozens of dead droids around them. Clearly, they put up quite the fight. But the enemy was too overwhelming. At the center of the battlefield, laid twenty or so of those soldiers wearing white armor. Under their helmets, they all had the same face. Around them were hundreds of droids. A broken helmet, with a peculiar design, was next to one of the dead bodies. It was broken in the middle, the visor cracked, and pieces of it were missing. In the few parts of it that were still intact, an image appeared. The pitch-black visor reflected flames that weren't there. Suddenly, an overwhelming amount of noise appeared. 
weapons being fired, explosions, and screams. Many, many screams. Of pain, of rage, of hatred. The source of those screams was a different body. Brown skin, rough like scales. Small bone thorns on the face. Weirdly enough, even though the screams were coming from it, the body had a smile on its face. The smile grew wider, and the body got up. The ones clad into white armor also started to rise, even though they were clearly dead. We suffered a lot. We suffered too much. Put an end to it. Put an end to it. Avenge us. Eliminate. Avenge us. The screams, filled with anger, seemed to come from everywhere, and nowhere at the same time. But the target of all this pain was calm. A voice filled with sadness, but also a bit of happiness, spoke. Sorry, master, brothers. I will always remember you, but. Revenge is not my path. As if it was made of dust, the entire battlefield crumbled and disappeared. The dead bodies, including the one the voice called master, also started to become particles that flew away. The angry scream stopped, replaced by a voice filled with pride. You have grown, my Padawan. Follow your own path, for it is an important one. And remember to take care of those who follow you on that path. They will need it. May the force be with you. Ragu opened his eyes, and, for a moment, saw his master in front of him, in a translucent, almost spectral form. General D was smiling warmly, and his words resonated inside Ragu's head, filling the Jedi with happiness. Thanks, Master. For everything. As he murmured those words, General D's smile grew wider, and he disappeared. His Padawan was on the right path. Now, he could rest knowing that he had done everything he could to prepare Ragu. Did you say something, General? Ragu shook his head slightly, awakened from his stupor, and looked at the spot where General D had just been. He didn't know if it was a dream or a vision from the Force, or even just his subconscious showing him what he wanted to see, but he was happy anyway. After a few seconds, he looked at Hell Squad, who, in turn, were staring at him. They were used to the Jedi's weird actions, but Ragu staring at nothing confused them. Nothing important. I was just. Talking to myself. The clones shrugged, and returned to what they were doing. A few minutes later, Dajer got up, and told his brothers to follow him to the canteen. We were going to grab something to eat, General. Wanna come? Ragu declined the offer. After the vision he just had, all he wanted was to meditate. Dajer just nodded, his scar moving along with his frown. He could feel that something had happened to his general, but whatever it was, Ragu seemed almost happy with it. Watching Hell Squad walk away, Ragu felt Dajer's doubt, and grinned. The vision he had was a Jedi's matter, and he couldn't tell that to anyone but his fellow Jedis. Dajer hadn't even started eating when a trooper ran up to him, saying that his presence was requested at the command center. Looking at his men, Dajer shrugged, and put down his tray. He was more than used to being called without any prior notice, and it seemed to happen even more when he was trying to eat or sleep. He walked to the command center, his helmet under his arm, and met Commander Gree on the way. Do you know what this is about, Dajer? No idea. This is weird. Why wouldn't they contact us through our comlinks? Commander Gree shook his head, unsure. He knew from experience that if something couldn't be discussed over comlinks, it was because it was extremely important, and top secret. He was proved right when they entered the command center, and saw a projection of Chancellor Palpatine, General Windu, and General Kenobi, talking to General Unduli. Aside from them, the room was empty. Commanders, please, come over here. The two clones exchanged surprised glances, and, after greeting the Chancellor and the Jedis, stood quietly by General Unduli's side. All right, everyone is here now. Dajer, Gree, the mission you are about to receive is extremely important. The fewer people who know about it, the better, so don't tell your men any details. Understood, General. Roger that. The two clones weren't too surprised, especially Dajer. It was normal to hide critical information from their men, after all, many were captured and tortured. The less they knew, 
the better for the Republic. It was cruel, but it was the reality. Just like when Brain had been captured. He knew more than normal clones, but still, the information he had was of little value to the Separatist, so they sent him to the prison above Sullust, where he was later rescued. Chancellor, if you could explain what is this all about. Of course, Master Kenobi. In a few days, Senator Padme Amidala will go to Ordo Plutonia, to negotiate a peace treaty between the natives, called Tals, and the Pantorans. The Pantorans live in one of the moons around Ordo Plutonia, and, up till now, didn't know that the planet had natives. Since the Tals aren't an advanced species, Pantora's senator hoped to resolve their dispute by killing them. Luckily, Master Skywalker was able to stop that attempt, and initiate peace negotiations. Unfortunately, the Pantoran senator died during their first encounter with the Tals, while the 501st and the Pantoran army lost many troops. The Tals also didn't come out unscathed. As such, tensions are high, and we fear that Senator Amidala might encounter problems during the negotiations. We can't send a legion to accompany her, otherwise the Tals might back off. Dager, I believe Hell Squad is well suited for this mission, right? Yes, General. Leave it to us. General Kenobi nodded, and, for the next half an hour, he and General Windu laid out the details of the mission, while General Unduli and Chancellor Palpatine added something here and there. Two days later, Hell Squad left Felucia, headed to a medical station near Pantora, where they would meet Senator Amidala. Ragu stayed in Felucia to continue fighting. Author's Note What's up? I hope you are all staying safe, and enjoying the novel. Unfortunately, I have a bit of a rant today. Recently, some people have been getting very political on their comments. Some of those I don't even know what they are supposed to mean, since I'm not American or British I googled who those people were. However, I can tell they are being extremely rude, not to say something else. As such, I deleted them as soon as I saw them. I don't want my comments section to turn into a war or a debate about real-life politics. Few of you probably read those comments, because I receive a notification every time someone comments something, so I was able to delete them quickly. For those of you who did read, or even posted, them, please, remember this is a fanfic about Star Wars. None of what is written here is real, and even when I try to represent politics in the novel, I do it as neutrally as I can, showing both sides. I know I can't do anything to change your mind, and I don't want to do so. Everyone has their own opinions, and that is great. That's how we make the world a better place. But please, don't bring this in my novel. I write it because I have fun doing it, and I feel proud whenever I see you guys like it too. As you know, it's totally free. You don't have to use coins, neither there is privilege. So, together with this rant, I want to bring a official warning. If your comment is in any way political or offensive, I will delete it. I know that this might make me lose a few readers, but I prefer that than to watch my comment section become a forum for you all to curse at one another this happened before, also deleted. Again, I accept any criticism, of any kind, and any ideas, suggestions, or thoughts, as long as you are polite to me and others when you do so. If you really want to discuss politics, there are thousands of other places you can do so, including our Discord cheeky advertisement, again, don't be rude. Sorry for the long message rant, but I know you understand why I did it. So, again, I hope you enjoyed the chapter, and may the force be with you. Chapter 288 Senator Amidala, I am Commander Dager, and this is Hell Squad. We will be escorting you during these negotiations. His helmet under his arm, Hell Squad standing behind him, Dager presented himself to a human female. Senator Amidala had long, brown hair, tied up in a unique hairstyle. She wore long and fancy robes, and looked exactly like what one would imagine a politician looked like. However, on her hip, Dager recognized the volume of a blaster pistol, hidden beneath the clothes. That surprised him. Politicians usually relied on their bodyguards for safety, but Senator Amidala seemed to be very independent. And she was also sharp. Her dark brown eyes stared at him, unperturbed by his scar, and she noticed the glance he gave at the weapon. Didn't think you would see a Republic senator carrying a blaster, did you, Commander? 
Dejer kept a straight face, but inside, he was surprised. Senator Amidala was quite blunt, but a clone preferred that to the usual mind games politicians liked to use. No, ma'am. Well, you don't need to worry, if everything goes okay, I won't need to use it. Let's hope those negotiations go on peacefully. I would hate to resort to aggressive negotiations again. Deja was confused as to what the senator meant, but she just grinned. The clone couldn't help but feel surprised once again. He liked Senator Amidala. She wasn't one of those politicians who stayed their entire lives in their rooms, talking about a war they knew nothing about. She looked like she didn't mind getting her hands dirty. What Deja didn't know, was that he made a wrong judgment of her personality. He didn't pay attention to politics, no clone did, otherwise he would know that Senator Padme Amidala of Naboo was one of the leaders of the pacifist section of the Senate. They wanted the end of the war without any more conflicts. And she was a member of this faction because of the same reason why she carried a blaster. She had seen death and war before, and she hated it. Commander, unless something happens, keep your calm, and don't make any provocative moves. Aboriginal species like the Tals can be quite expressive when they are talking. Dejer only nodded. He had met, and fought against and with, primitive species more than once, and he knew that they tended to make gestures when communicating, many of which could look very hostile. You don't like to talk much, do you? The clones were taken aback by the unexpected question, especially Dejer. Senator Amidala once again surprised him, the third time in the short few minutes they had talked. With all due respect, Senator, it's just that. Clones in general aren't used to talking to someone aside from our brothers. We don't have many chances to interact with others, especially civilians. Ha <laughs> ha. That is understandable. Created for war, hum. Such a cruel destiny. Senator Amidala chuckled, but she seemed incomparably sad while she did so, and her last words confirmed that she only laughed out of politeness. Commander Dager, I would like to talk to you, if that isn't a problem. Not at all, ma'am. Brain, I will leave the final arrangements to you. Yes, sir. In about sixteen hours, we will arrive at Pantora. Hell Squad dispersed, leaving Dager and the human senator alone. He wasn't sure of what she wanted, but Senator Amidala started walking around the ship, so he followed her. What are your thoughts on this war, Commander? What are the thoughts of the men under you? Dejer hesitated for a moment. That was the second time in a short while that someone had asked him that. First it was Ragu, and now Senator Amidala. He might not know a lot about politics, but he knew that it couldn't be just a coincidence. Everything pointed out that there was some kind of movement in the Senate to end this war peacefully. In the end, he told Senator Amidala almost the same he told Ragu. His thoughts hadn't changed. She was pensive for a long while after he finished, thinking. I asked several commanders and troopers the same question, Commander Dager, and none gave me a clear answer, and certainly none gave me an answer as satisfactory as yours. Why? The clone stopped, and looked at the young senator. He didn't like the direction the conversation was going but he had an instinct that he could trust Senator Amidala. General Ragu asked me something similar, some time ago. General Ragu. Is he a Jedi? Yes. Former apprentice of General Imagundi. Senator Amidala frowned for a moment, probably trying to remember who General D was, after which her expression turned to one of surprise. Wasn't Master D the general of the 303rd Attack Legion? Then. Dejer grinned, sadness and bad memories flooding him. It was normal that Senator Amidala didn't know about Ragu's and General D relationship. Jedis rarely disclosed their secrets, even if they weren't necessarily secret. Yeah. Hell Squad was part of the 303rd. After Ryloth, General Ragu went to finish his training, while the survivors were sent to other legions. The Senator looked at Dejer while he explained with a nonchalant expression, but she wasn't fooled. She talked to a lot of clones during the two years of war, trying to discover their thoughts, so she could use them as an argument to end it. She might not have been successful, but one thing she learned was that clones cared for their brothers above all else. I am sorry to hear that. 
But. You said the survivors were sent to other legions. You and your squad don't use the colors of any legion I know. Hell Squad is an exception. We are a special unit, so it's quite normal you never heard about us. And our colors are the color of the 303rd. We still belong there. Special unit? So you do what other clones can't do? Dejer shook his head. He wasn't dumb, and already understood that Senator Amidala wanted him to talk more, so she could use it in her discussions in the Senate. Once a politician, always a politician. Even a simple soldier like him understood that. No. We are clones all the same. Hell Squad does what otherwise would cost hundreds or even thousands of our brothers' lives. That's why we exist. When Dejer stepped out of the ship, his legs sank deep into the snow, to knee height. Besides him, he heard 3-4 curse. I hate snow planets. It's way too difficult to fight on. Dejer had to agree. It slowed their movement speed, and many times, that meant death. But he couldn't let his men scare Senator Amidala, although the woman seemed pretty unperturbed by the way clones behaved. Hopefully we won't have to fight at all. Now, take out the BRC speeders. The meeting point is 20 kilometers from here, and it seems like there is a blizzard coming. While Hell Squad started unloading the speeders, the meeting point was at a plateau, protected from the snow and wind, and where no one could plan an ambush. But ships were unable to land because of its size, Senator Amidala walked out of the ship, having changed her robes for tight white clothes and a coat. Clones didn't need any of that, because their armors isolated the coldness outside. Do you think we will face any problems to get to the plateau, Commander Dejer? If the weather here is any similar to my Jido, no. But I don't know about the natives. As Dejer said that, he pointed towards a cliff half a kilometer away. He had long noticed the white creatures watching them. Chapter 289 Even though he had noticed the furry creatures, which he supposed were the talls, the moment the ship landed, Dejer also saw that all they had were spears. Without blasters, they couldn't harm the clones even if they wanted to. As such, he decided it was safe to let his men unload the speeders. And he also knew that Dab had the talls on his scope. 500 meters were enough for the sniper to eliminate at least 20 of them before the natives could even get close. They are probably just observing us. This is their planet after all. Senator Amidala looked towards where Dejer had pointed, but all she could see were white dots that stood out a little more. However, she trusted Dejer when he said the talls were there. You should get on your speeder, ma'am. Cell and Brain, you two go ahead. We will give you two minutes of advantage. Report as soon as possible. Understood, sir. The two clones hopped onto their BRC speeders, and flew away. With the speed of the vehicles, it took less than a minute for them to disappear behind the cliff where the talls were. The natives didn't move, only looking at the speeders as they went by. Dejer waited two minutes before jumping on his own speeder, and setting off at a much slower speed than cell and brain. He showed his left fist to Hell Squad, and they acknowledged the gesture, creating a formation around Senator Amidala's vehicle. It's all clear, Commander. The Pantorans and the Talls are already here. They are watching us, but they didn't do anything. However, you and the Senator better get him quickly. After a few minutes, Brain's voice came through the comlink, and Dejer speed up. The others followed him. What greeted them when they got up the plateau was a tense sight. On one side were the Pantorans, short beings, with pale blue skin, and white hair. There were about thirty of them, all wearing dark blue clothes, and carrying blasters, with the exception of two, a woman and a man. On the other side of the plateau, facing the Pantorans, were tall creatures, with long white fur, and several small black eyes. They only carried spears and bows, but there were about ninety of them. Dejer couldn't identify who their leader was. And, forming a barrier between those two groups, putting an end to the tensions before they even started, were Cell and Brain, still on top of their speeders. By the hostile glares that one side was giving to the other, Dejer could guess that if the Republic Party had arrived just a little later, a fight would have broken out. Getting down from the BRC speeder, Dejer held his blaster high. 
He wanted both sides, Pantoran and Tals, to see that Hell Squad was there to maintain balance, and that they had the power to do it. That strategy worked mainly on the Tals, since Dager had long learned that primitive species respected the strong. Please, may the representatives come here. Senator Amidala raised her voice loud enough for everyone to hear her, not that it was necessary, because there hasn't been a sound since the Republic group had arrived. The two civilians from Pantora were the first to approach, also bringing a translator droid with them. The Tals probably didn't understand what Senator Amidala said, but when they saw the Pantorans walking towards the middle of the plateau, two of them stepped forward. One of them was small and had a hunched back, while the other was over two meters tall, and clearly muscular. It's good to see you again, Padme. This is Tokoy Arlent, my advisor. Senator Chu Chi. The Pantoran woman smiled friendly to Senator Amidala. The senator, on the other hand returned a smile, but in a contained way. Clearly, she knew the Pantoran, but didn't want to show any sides any favors. YGH. Atiliai Jiso. The smaller talls uttered words in a language Dager didn't understand. The droid the Pantorans brought with them started translating. I am Atiliai. This is Jiso. I am honored to meet you. My name is Padme Amidala. The senator gave a courteous bow to the two talls, and they used their left hand to touch their foreheads in a greeting. The man next to Senator Chu Chi scoffed, but was quickly silenced by a stern stare from his partner. Senator Amidala looked at the two opposing parties, and signaled for them to approach. Knowing that they would now engage in a long discussion, Dager gestured for Hell Squad to step back. They were there only to protect the senator, and had no need to hear what they were talking about. Still, it was clear by the angry faces of the Pantorans, the gestures of the Talls, and the frustrated expression on Senator Amidala's face, that things weren't going well. The peace talks went on for over five hours, during which Hell Squad stood unmoving, watching the Pantorans and Talls. No side made any hostile movement, although there were some angry gestures whenever one of the representatives raised their voices. When night started falling, Senator Amidala returned to where the BRC speeders were, and mounted one of them. Hell Squad followed suit, and, in a few seconds, they left the plateau, headed for their ship. How did it go, Senator? Not too well. Both Talls and Pantorans recused to share the planet. The Pantorans want the Talls to limit themselves to certain areas, while the Talls want the Pantorans out of Ordo Plutonia. It will take a few more days before we can arrive at any solution. Senator Amidala seemed exhausted and exasperated. It was pretty obvious the negotiations weren't good. Has Senator Amidala arrived on Ordo Plutonia? Yes, my lord. Good. Order the attack then. And remember to leave no clues that it was us. Of course. When a Republic senator is eliminated, and no culprit is found, the Pantorans and Tals will enter a civil war. When we step in, they will gladly join the CIS. In a dark room in the underworld of Coruscant, Count Dooku and a hooded figure talked. No one would have ever thought that the Separatist leader was so bold as to go to Coruscant, the heart of the Republic. And yet, here he was, talking to the hooded person in a deferential manner. That person was the one he feared the most in the galaxy, and also the one who gave him everything he had. His master. Ha ha ha. Soon, very soon, my precious apprentice, I will rule this galaxy, with you by my side. The Jedi Order is getting weaker by the day, and their pathetic efforts can't stand on our way. The seeds of chaos I threw amongst them are starting to grow, and when they do, the Republic will fall. A glorious new era shall begin. A new empire shall reign. Ha ha ha. Chapter 290 in the moon of Alave, not too far away from Ordo Plutonia and Pantora, there was a Republic outpost, responsible for overlooking the entire system. Usually, the base had two dozen clones, but at the moment, they were all dead, eliminated by a group of commando droids. As such, no one was warned when a single separatist frigate appeared out of hyperspace, heading for Ordo Plutonia. Two C-9979 landing crafts left the ship, and landed on the planet, while the frigate jumped to lightspeed once again, disappearing. For the next week, 
Hell Squad and Senator Amid Allah kept going to the plateau, to continue the negotiations. Over the course of their days, the Tals and Pantorans had several fights, but with Hell Squad's intervention, none resulted in death. Curiously enough, though, those fights brought the two species closer together, and, by the end of the week, a peace treaty was almost done. Now, Hell Squad and the Senator were making their way back to their ship. Contrarily to most other times, Senator Amidala had a happy smile on her face. Tomorrow, they will sign the treaty. After that, we can return to Coruscant, and your squad will have completed your mission, Commander. Deja nodded, and was about to answer when he looked over the horizon, and a bad feeling hit him. He immediately slowed down, and Brain did the same. You felt it too, Commander. Stop. The clones stopped their speeders immediately, sending snow flying in the air. Senator Amidala almost crashed into Cell's BRC speeder. WH what? What is happening, Commander Dager? Felt what? Hell Squad took position, their weapons ready to fire at any threat, but they didn't know what it was, nor could they see anything. However, they trusted Dager. His instincts had saved them multiple times. What is wrong? I don't know. Just a feeling. 3-4, Tech, take the Senator back to the plateau. The Talls and the Pantorans should still be there. The others, assume defensive positions. Nothing gets past US, understood. Roger that. Yes, sir. Got it. Come on, ma'am. The clones immediately moved after receiving their orders, and Tech dragged Senator Amidala to her speeder. She had a shocked expression on her face, but she was clear that Hell Squad had orders to protect her, even if that meant going against her will. Also, she was a smart person, with powerful friends. Hell Squad wouldn't be sent to escort her if they weren't good, so she decided to trust Dager's instincts. The commander looked at the snow around them with watchful eyes. There were rock walls and piles of snow everywhere, enough to hide a small army. Maybe that was what triggered his instincts. But they had done the same path for the past week, and at no time, had he felt anything. No. Something was very, very wrong. He only had to find out what. It didn't take long. As soon as the three speeders carrying Tech, 3-4, and Senator Amidala started to move, a laser left the snow about 300 meters to their left, hitting the medic speeder, and sending 3-4 flying. Luckily, the snow softened his fall. Immediately, Dager turned to where the red laser came from, and lowered his macro binoculars. The figure of a commando droid, wielding a sniper blaster rifle, became clear. Dab. Aim low. Got it. Using his own speeder to keep his DC-15X steady, Dab looked at the clanker through his scope, and fired. Good hit. The clones kept looking for new threats, but, for a moment, not one appeared. Instead of appeasing Dager, that only made him more worried. A single commando droid made no sense. What are the Seppis doing here? How would I know? Commander, what do we do about Senator Amidala? To her credit, the politician was behaving remarkably well, a blaster pistol in her hand. She and Tech were still on their speeders, waiting for Dager's next commands. Nothing. They surrounded us. Hundreds of B-1 units appeared from all directions, coming out from behind the rocks, or from under the snow. Leading the small army were a dozen commando clankers. For a moment, Dager wondered how they hadn't seen them before, and then he realized that even now, it was difficult to distinguish them from the background. They were camouflaged. This. This was a well-planned ambush. Who? The tin cans are getting smarter, Senator. Crouch behind the speeders, and let us deal with them. The droids were painted with a dirty white color, not only the commandos, but even the standard B-1 units. They had laid down on the snow, and kept out of sight. It was more than clear that they were there for Hell Squad and Senator Amidala, and them only. This wasn't an invasion or anything of the like. It was a trap. I won't hide while you fight for me, Commander. Besides, it isn't as if you can save me. As she said that, Senator Amidala got up, blaster in hand. 
Dejer looked at the determined expression on her face, and shrugged. She was right. Surrounded by hundreds of sepis, in a planet where Republic presence was non-existent, their chances of surviving were null. I am sorry, ma'am, but Hell Squad will be unable to complete our mission to protect you. That's all right, Commander Dejer. But, if we are going to die, let's take some of them with us. When they heard that, Hell Squad was stunned for a moment, before Metal broke the silence by laughing. Ha! The Senator is right, Commander. It isn't like we are afraid to die or anything like that. Dejer smiled under his helmet. No clone was afraid to die. To fall in battle, having taken down some enemies, was their purpose, and their pride. We should have died a long time ago, back in Ryloth, with Commander Keeley and the others. To survive up till now. We have already avenged them. Having said that, Dejer put a mad grin on his face, and lifted his blaster. Eight people against hundreds of droids, and yet, it were the clones who made the first move. Instantly, the once quiet land, covered in snow, burst into action, as blue and red lasers flew. War arrived in Ordo Plutonia. Chapter 291 Dejer grunted in pain as a laser hit his left shoulder, but he ignored the wound, and continued firing his blaster. Two commando droids fell when he hit them, but one got up shortly after. Even with Dejer's precision, it was difficult to eliminate the commando droids in a single hit, even more in the middle of a battle of the proportions of the one they were in. They are getting closer, sir. I can see that, Cell. Shut up and keep firing. Usually, Dejer wouldn't be so harsh on his words, but they were in a life-threatening situation. And, to make matters worse, they were running low on ammunition. After all, they didn't expect to be ambushed, so they didn't carry a lot of it with them. Taking cover behind the BRC speeders, which they had created a circle with, Hell Squad kept firing at the droids. By now, almost fifty clankers had already fallen, but the others just kept advancing, emotionless. I'm almost out, sir. Me too. Cursing, Dejer dropped to the ground, getting half buried in the snow, and threw his last two magazines to sell and three four. At the same time, the speeder he was hiding behind was hit in the energy cell, and started smoking. Knowing that the vehicle wouldn't take long to blow up, Dejer kicked it, and the speeder floated away. The explosion didn't hurt any of the clones thanks to Dejer's quick reactions, but it opened a hole on their already precarious defenses. Red lasers flew in their direction, hitting metal on his left forearm, and Senator Amidala on her right thigh. The clones were able to mostly ignore the pain, but the senator wasn't a battle-hardened combatant like them. She screamed in pain, and fell down. Curiously enough, looking at Senator Amidala clutching her wound and groaning, gave Dejer an idea. Boys, listen up. Starting by you, Brain, next time a laser comes close, fall down, and stay quiet. The troopers paused for a second, confused, before realization dawned upon them, and they understood what Dejer meant. Just like Dantuin. Just like Dantuin. Play dead, and when the Seppis get closer, we surprise them. Let's take a few more of the tin cans with us before we go down. Hell Squad nodded. After a few seconds, Brain yelled, and laid on the ground, his hand still clutching his blaster. If Dejer didn't know any better, he would have thought his brother really died. Senator, you will have to do the same. However, Seppi's check for dead. When they approach us to confirm, you will have a small opening to escape. The downside of ambushing us is that they don't have any vehicles. As long as you get on one of the speeders, and flee, they won't be able to catch up. Dejer spilled his entire plan in one breath. No matter what, Hell Squad had to protect Senator Amidala, even if that meant gambling everything, including their lives, in one last move. That was their mission, and they would complete it, or die trying. Commander, that is unaccept. That is Hell Squad's duty, Senator. If you die here, the peace treaty will be torn apart, and all your efforts will be for naught. Do as I say. And don't worry about Hell Squad. We have been in worse situations, and yet, we are still alive. It was a terrible lie, and both Dejer and Senator Amidala knew that. However, 
it was all it was needed to convince the senator. She might be brave and kind, but she wasn't ready to give up on her life so easily. Also faking death, Dager was the last one to fall to the ground. Laying on the snow, with his back to the sky, he made sure his pistol and vibroblade were easily accessible. Silence fell on the snowy plains, and the droid army stopped firing. Merciless machines, they didn't show any pity for their fallen companions, and stepped over them to arrive at the small defense circle Hell Squad had created. It was standard protocol to check if the enemy was really dead, and, if there were any survivors, eliminate them. TA-077 kicked one of the BRC speeders aside, and looked at the seven dead clones, and the human woman besides them. He respected them, in some weird way. As his serial number showed, he was one of the oldest commando droids, and one of the few which survived many battles. He had eliminated countless clones and Republic scum, and knew when to recognize a true soldier. He might not be a living being, but he had a lot of battle experience, all processed in his circuits, and he knew few clones were as fierce and deadly as that small squad had been. TA-077 was in command of 1400 B-1 battle droids, and came to Ordo Plutonia with the simple objective of killing the Republic delegation, and sowing chaos. He sent 600 units to attack some of the Tall's villages and Pantoran settlements on the planet, and used the remaining 800 droids to attack Senator Amidala and Hell Squad. It should have been an overwhelming force, able to crush the eight targets in a matter of seconds. It wasn't. 70 B-1 units, and 12 commando droids had been destroyed. So, TA-077, who had seen more action than most of his fellow droids, respected the clones. They had fought bravely. Using his feet to turn over the clone next to him, TA-077 crouched to confirm he was dead. The moment he did that, he knew something was wrong. Apart from a scorched spot on his shoulder, the front of the clone's armor was intact. No fatal wounds. His hand quickly tried to grab the vibroblade in his back, but before he reached it, the dead clone came back to life, wielding a vibroblade of his own. It pierced TA-077's neck from the side, immediately cutting off his sensors and energy cords. Nice try, scrap metal. Before he fell down, all TA-077 could feel was surprise. That wasn't in his programming. He had learned every Republic tactic the Separatists knew about, and even some tricks the clones used on the battlefield, but that wasn't one of them. Once again, the lack of consciousness and thoughts of the droids proved to be a major, and fatal, flaw in their design. Dager let himself be turned over by the clanker, and, when the chance came, he eliminated the white commando droid. Around him, the other six members of Hell Squad also bumped into motion, using their blasters to tear off the heads of six B-1 units, and holding them as shields. Senator. The clone didn't need to say anything else. Senator Amidala, who was still on the ground, jumped on top of one of the few remaining speeders, and zoomed away. The Seppis wanted to fire at her, but, because they had all gathered together, thinking they had already won the battle, not only did they block each other's line of sight, but Hell Squad also made a wall between her, and them. Dejo grinned when he saw that in all but a few seconds, Senator Amidala was already out of range from the clanker's blasters. Besides him, he heard his brothers chuckle. They were about to die, but they had foiled the Separatists' plans. Knowing that put a smile on their faces. Growl. Suddenly, a loud growling sound shook the battlefield. Blue lasers hit the droids, and spears pierced their bodies as if they were made of paper. While the enemy was thrown in disarray, Dager saw Tals and Pantorans coming to Hell Squad's rescue, fighting side by side. Chapter 292 Hell Squad was almost as surprised as the Clankers and they saw Tals and Pantorans fighting together. But they were used to improvising, and a bunch of confused droids was an opportunity they wouldn't let go. Dager pushed the body he was holding, making two B-1 units stumble, and pierced them with his vibroblade. His left hand used his DC-17 to fire at the nearby Seppis, dropping three of them before they even had a chance to react. By his side, Hell Squad also got into the fray, killing almost twenty droids in a matter of seconds. The once deadly, and seemingly impossible to survive, situation changed in an instant. 
The group that came to Hell Squad's rescue numbered over a thousand, composed mainly of Talls. The planet was their home, after all, so it was easy for them to gather more warriors. Caught by surprise, the droids were quickly exterminated, but not before causing some casualties amongst the Talls and Pantorans. Hell Squad also didn't make it through intact. Hold on, brother. We just need to get you to the ship. Ignoring their own wounds and injuries, all of Hell Squad was gathered around Dab. The sniper was clutching his stomach in pain, and a small fillet of blood made its way down his armor, painting the snow red. 3-4 was kneeling next to him, applying pressure on the wound while the other members of Hell Squad moved him into a BRC speeder. Ignoring the crowd of Pantorans and Talls, Dager gestured for Brain and 3-4 to take Dab to their cruiser. Watching the three clones speed away, only then did Dager notice that Senator Amidala was by his side. He greeted her with a nod. Thank you, ma'am. If it wasn't for the reinforcements you brought, Hell Squad would be gone. I didn't bring them. I think they were already on their way to help us, although I am not sure how they knew we were in trouble. The commander was slightly surprised, but Dager wasn't one to dwell in needless thoughts. Hell Squad, and, more importantly, Senator Amidala, were alive, which meant they hadn't failed their mission. Regardless of the circumstances of their survival, the most important was that the peace negotiations could go on. Padme, are you hurt? Are you all right? I assure you I am okay, Senator Chu Chi. I only received a scratch, nothing much, thanks to you. And also to you, Atiliai. Thank you very much. Dager had to admire Senator Amidala's professionalism. He had escorted and protected other civilians and politicians before, and most of them were scared and fearing for their lives. They could barely maintain a logical line of thought after being attacked. Not that human senator, though. Even after being shot and surviving such a traumatic experience, she still was able to maintain an impartial posture, not showing favor to either side. May I ask how you knew we had been ambushed by the separatist, Senator Chu Chi? The Pantoran scratched her head, somewhat hesitant, before looking at the Tall's leader. His sentries saw separatist droids killing a group of Tall's. He thought they might have also attacked you, so he came to us, and here we are. Once again, I have to say I am grateful for your help. I hope that despite that incident, we can restart the negotiations tomorrow. Bergui Ishii. Aye aye. Tall's J. E. Pantorans Terry. He said, that won't be necessary. Tall's and Pantorans fought together, so they are friends now. Senator Amidala and Senator Chuchi looked at the translator droid for a few seconds, stunned, before turning to the Tall's. It was clear he was laughing, and happy. The human senator stealthily elbowed Senator Chuchi, and the young Pantoran quickly bowed to Atilii, showing her respect. It's our honor to be able to live alongside your noble people, Great Atilii. Seeing how respectfully Senator Chu Chi was behaving now, opposed to her angry speeches a few days ago, Dager once again felt that politics were too much of a headache. He much preferred the battles and fights of the war. Painful as they might be, at least he didn't have to think too much. How am I looking, 3-4? Not too good, Dab, I have to say. But you will pull through it, although it's going to leave a nasty scar. Ha ha. Another for the collection. What about you, Commander? Did you mark the clanker that hit me? The entirety of Hell Squad was grouped around a bed in the medbay in their cruiser. The medical droid and 3-4 had already patched up the sniper. Thanks to the painkillers, Dab had slept over 30 hours at once, only waking up not long ago. Now, with the peace treaty signed, they were returning to Coruscant, where he would receive proper care. Ha! How could I not? Tapping lightly on his shoulder pad, Dager grinned, before ordering Hell Squad to disperse, and let Dab rest. Only the medical droid stayed with him. Is he going to survive, Commander Dager? Senator. Dab has been through worse. He will make it. All he needs is a couple days in a back to tank, and he will be back into the fight. Worse than that battle. We all had our close calls, and near-death experiences. This time, we had supplies and a medical droid. Sometimes, we don't even have that. 
you are talking about Ryloth. Dajer only nodded. There wasn't much to say. It must have been horrible. I can't imagine what you went through. Senator Amidala looked at him with a troubled expression when she heard Dajer. The clone already knew that she had something else on her mind, but she didn't want, or didn't know how, to say it. He wouldn't be the one to pressure her. Commander. Anakin. I mean, Master Skywalker, asked me to give you a message. The clone kept his silence, and waited. He wasn't surprised that General Skywalker sent a message to him, although it was weird he did it through Senator Amidala. However, the Jedi had always been close to the clones, treating them more like family than subordinates. He asked me to tell you that. Jedi Master even Peel died, and that he is sorry. He knows you and Master Peel had a special relationship. Shocked, surprised, and sad, Dajer's steps faltered for a moment before he straightened his back once again. He had fought a few battles alongside General Peel, but the truth was he didn't know the Jedi that well. However, he would never forget who gave him his name, who was the first person to look at him not as a clone, but as something else. As someone who deserved more than just a number. Thanks for telling me, ma'am. Senator Amidala just nodded. She might not be a soldier, but she was good at reading the feelings of the people around her, and she could tell Dajer wasn't doing too well. Still, nothing that she could say would change that, and she figured that for a soldier like him, who was used to death, saying anything would be meaningless. We are arriving at Coruscant, Commander, Senator. Good. Then, I shall take my leave soon, Commander Dajer. If it weren't for Hell Squad, I would probably be dead. You have my gratitude. Just doing our job, Senator Amidala. Just doing our job. Chapter 293 Three weeks after their mission in Ordo Plutonia, Hell Squad was once again on a cruiser, this time leaving Mon Cala. The old king, Yos Kalina, whom Hell Squad knew from the start of the war, had been assassinated by the Separatist, resulting in a major battle, which Hell Squad took part in. The Republic had won, after a costly and drawn-out battle, which would guarantee them the control of the planet for now. However, as it happened twice before, the Separatists would soon organize another attack. The truth was that this war would only end and Count Dooku and the other Separatist leaders were captured or eliminated. Dajer preferred the second option. What does the seat warmers have for us, sir? Dajer raised an eyebrow when he heard Metal's question, but he didn't complain. They might be clones, but they could still think whatever they wanted of their superiors. They just couldn't say it in front of them. Since Hell Squad was alone, Dajer didn't care about how Metal called the higher-ups. Relief mission to Aline. I will tell more when we get to the others. Together, the two clones went to a room, where they found the rest of Hell Squad, and, to their surprise, Ragu. The Jedi and the clones were chatting freely, like old friends who met again after a long time. There were none of the formalities that usually existed between superiors and subordinates. Dajer. Metal. How are you? The young Tigruta greeted them happily. It had been a few months since he last fought with Hell Squad, and he was quite happy to meet them again. His connection with this unit was no less than the one he had with his master. If it wasn't for them, he would have died countless times already, and he had learned a lot with the clones. And the clones had learned a lot from him. In their minds, Ragu was the last mission that General D had left them. They would die for him without a second thought. General. I didn't know you would be coming with us. I also didn't, until a few hours ago. However, I was meditating when the ship came to pick Hell Squad up, so I only got the chance to talk to you now. Dajer nodded. It made sense that Ragu was the Jedi general sent to accompany them, considering that they had experience in fighting together. And the relief mission was, by no means, a tranquil one, so a Jedi could make quite a difference. Since you are all here, let me debrief you on our mission. Ragu picked up a hologram projector, and showed a small being, which barely reached a clone's waist, and with two bulging eyes. This is an Alina. Their home planet, Aline, on Bright Jewel System, is under a separatist blockade, much like the one Ryloth was after our fleet was gone. We are tasked with delivering essential supplies for them. 
he received several nods of acknowledgement. It was a pretty standard mission. Just us. Do we have troops on the ground? No, and no. The Alinas are putting up a resistance by themselves. Us delivering help is simply a humanitarian act. And, it will, of course, bring them closer to the Republic. And we will have the support of six more CR-90 Corvettes, as well as a new stealth ship. Stealth ship. It was designed by our scientist, and Master Skywalker tested it in battle. It can become invisible, and evade most of the conventional detection mechanisms the Seppis have. Deja raised an eyebrow, while Hell Squad looked at each other surprised. A ship like that was most certainly expensive to make, but it could change the course of a battle if used correctly. Captain Flair will command the stealth ship to distract the blockade, while we rush in, and deliver our cargo before escaping through the other side of the planet. Hell Squad exchanged glances. The plan was good, but they didn't see their part in it. Tech was the one to say what was on their minds. With all due respect, General, but this isn't exactly the kind of mission we specialize in. Hell Squad would do more good by staying in Mon Cala, and chasing off the remaining clankers. Contrarily to their expectations, Ragu wasn't surprised, angry, or disappointed by what Tatch said. Instead, he was grinning. I know that. But we got reliable information that Count Dooku is on Aline. We are going to drop with the supplies, and end this war right now. So, that's how it is. Commander. Yes, my lord. Some Republic blockade runners will come in a few days. Let them through, without them noticing. My lord. This will set back our efforts to convince the natives by weeks. It doesn't matter. Do as I say. Yes, my lord. And prepare a shuttle. I will be descending to the planet. The servant nodded hurriedly, and bowed before leaving the room. Count Dooku looked out of the window, to the Lukerhulk class battleships forming the blockade, and grinned. Come on, my little Jedi. I am ready to receive you. When the corvettes dropped their cargo, in capsules very similar to escape pods, they also dropped Hell Squad and Ragu. The group stepped out of the pod, and on the swamp that made up most of Aline. Water and black mud stained their armors, but the clones didn't care. In fact, they scooped up mud, and splashed it in their body. Not only would it confuse the heat sensors of the droids, but it would also act as camouflage. Where to now, General Ragu? The other capsules, which carried supplies, had been delivered to spots near the Alina's resistance groups. However, the Alinas had refused to take the Republic's side, so, if the group was found, that would cause problems. Ragu might still get away, because he was a Jedi, and his kind roamed the galaxy, but Hell Squad, being clones, would certainly be attacked, be it by the droids or the natives. Our spies said Dooku came down to Aline today. He should be at Red Stone, the capital city. It's built on one of the few areas of the planet that aren't a marsh. Dejer nodded. Considering they were trying to be sneaky, going at the capital city wasn't the best course of action, but they didn't have other options. It would be even worse if Count Dooku left Aline. They would deal with any complications that may appear, when they appeared. Well, you heard the general, lads. Get moving. Chapter 294 Unbeknown to them, Hell Squad and Ragu were being watched by a small, black, floating ball. A probe droid. BZTTZZ. BZZ. TT. The probe let out a series of weird noises, before floating after the group quietly. The data it was sending traveled quickly, arriving in a dark room on red stone. Count Dooku looked at the images on the screen in front of him, and frowned. He had expected the Republic to send two or more Jedis. He wanted to eliminate them, and deal a suffocating blow to the Republic and the Jedi Order. He had never imagined that only one Jedi, and an ordinary one, considering he didn't recognize the Tegruta, and a squad of clones would be the ones to come. It seemed they were underestimating him. Um. Staring at the video for a while, he saw one of the clones turning his head back. He looked straight at the probe droid, but then looked forward again, as if he hadn't seen anything. He probably hadn't. 
The probes were designed to be almost undetectable, even when being looked directly upon. But even if it had been discovered, the white-bearded Sith Lord wouldn't care. The Republic force was already in his claws, and couldn't escape his trap. What surprised him, however, was the design of the clone's helmet. A single brownish-red horn adorned the right side of the helmet. A drawing he had seen very recently. He quickly flipped through the intel the Separatist had, easily finding an image of Dager, and from the other members of Hell Squad. The CIS had acquired those from the invasion, and consequent escape, of the prison orbiting Sullust. Count Dooku had never heard of Hell Squad before that, but when the Separatists dug deep, they found many occasions that they were probably involved. That made them put Hell Squad on the same threat level as Delta Squad. Interesting. Someone even Asajj couldn't eliminate. So, this must be Regu. He faced so much pain. Half an hour later, three speeders left the city. One of them carried Count Dooku, while the other two were piloted by Magna Guards. They only stopped a couple hundred kilometers away from the city, and Count Dooku sat on the ground, eyes closed, meditating. Now, all he had to do was wait. And he was patient. He had waited ten years for the Clone Wars to start, and even now, he still had to make any big moves. Waiting a couple more hours to start his big plan was nothing. But when he did, he would destroy the Jedi Order. He would tear it apart, piece by piece. General, we are being followed. A Separatist probe droid. Hearing Dager's whisper, Ragu resisted the urge to turn around and look for their stalker. Instead, he continued walking normally. Don't look back. Let's wait to see if it does anything else. If not, then we will just ignore it. The clones glanced at each other, somewhat unwilling. They didn't like the idea of having their every move observed. Sir. We could be walking into a trap. We most certainly are. The fact that we are already being watched means that Dooku knew we were coming. Whatever trap he prepared for us, it has been set in motion a long time ago. But now we know that. This gives us an advantage. Dajer looked at his general, and shrugged inwardly. He didn't like the idea of knowingly going into an ambush, but he knew Ragu would do that anyway. And he wouldn't be anywhere other than by the Jedi's side. You heard the general, men. Stay sharp, and weapons ready. Let's see what the Seppis have in stock for us. Dajer could see Count Dooku long before they got close to the Separatist leader. He wasn't making any effort to hide, and just sat on the ground, eyes closed, and legs crossed. The Magna Guards by his side turned on their electrostaffs, making purple sparks fly, but even then, Count Dooku stood in the same position. Count Dooku. I see you were expecting us. Not surprised, Ragu signals Hell Squad to stop when they were a few dozen meters away from Count Dooku. I thought the Jedi Order respected me more than to send a Padawan and a bunch of clones after me. The Sith didn't even open his eyes, or move, as he said that. However, he was somewhat stunned by the lack of reaction by Ragu or the clones. Apart from a slight chuckle, he couldn't sense anything else from them. Their minds were calm. I'm not a Padawan, Dooku. Don't try to play games with me. Now, surrender, and we can end this war now. No more fight, no more death. Ragu, right? You know, I met your master. I helped train him. He told me. He told me that you were a great Jedi once. But you lost yourself, Dooku. You gave in to the dark side. However, it's not too late. Too late for what? To become another pawn in that rotten being you call a republic? Or to become one of the feared Jedi? to say I fight for the people of the galaxy, when the truth is you are all drunk by the power and position you have. As he said that, the bearded Sith Lord got up, smiling. I prefer to steer clear from all that corruption, young one. The Confederacy of Independent Systems never wanted to start a war. But you all couldn't give up control. You were too used to it. If the only way for us to be truly free is war, so be it. War is never the answer, Dooku. You should know that better than anyone. Humph. Eliminate them. Hearing him, the two Magna Guards stepped forward, 
and spun their electrostaffs threateningly. But before they could get any closer, three shots rang out. The heads of the two droids disappeared from their shoulders, and they walked a few more steps before collapsing. The third laser aimed for Count Dooku, but the Separatist dodged by turning his body slightly, and raised an eyebrow. I was wondering where the last member of your unit was, Commander Dager. So you know you were being followed? Smart move. That must be Dab, I presume. Dager said nothing. Ever since Brain had been captured, they had known that the enemy would acquire intel on them. I was acquainted with a clone too, Commander. You might have known him. CT-7034 Shield Dager clenched his fist, and Hell Squad tensed up. Even Ragu felt anger when he heard it. You. It was you who made Shield betray us. I didn't make him betray anyone, Commander. I only helped him by showing what the Republic does to the clones every single day. You feel the same. It was as if Count Dooku wasn't solely speaking to them, but whispering something deep into their minds. Dager wanted to believe him. No, he believed him. He started to lower his blaster, while his brothers did the same. But suddenly, an image came to his mind. An old, broken, scarred helmet. The screams of his brothers. He would never forget. Hell Squad wouldn't forget. He lifted his blaster again, aiming directly at the Sith. Your tricks don't work on us, Dooku. Chapter 295 Your tricks don't work on us, Dooku. Seeing Dager and the other members of Hell Squad shake off the confusion and control he was imposing almost immediately, Count Dooku was truly surprised by the first time since he met them. Interesting. So what my apprentice said was true. You really can resist the force. Impressive. That's enough, Dooku. Ragu stepped forward, and pulled his lightsaber out of his robes. The green glow reflected on the dead Magna guards. You know, young one, I originally didn't plan on killing you. I was hoping for Obi-Wan, Skywalker, or even that old master of mine, Yoda. I hoped I would be able to fight a real Jedi, not a young Banta who just learned how to battle. Your attempts to anger me are useless. As if by magic, a curved lightsaber appeared in Count Dooku's hand. A red blade extended from it. Immediately, he disappeared from his previous position, faster than any human should have been. But Ragu was ready. The two force users clashed, lifting a small cloud of dust. Ragu stretched his fingers, and the Sith stumbled a few steps back. At the same time, Hell Squad fired, forcing Count Dooku to disengage. With a single downward swing, the blue lasers were all deflected or dodged, two of them almost hitting back the clones. Taking advantage of the distraction, Ragu advanced once again, holding his lightsaber backward, and cutting up, forcing Count Dooku to block. Before the Sith could retaliate, Ragu swept his right leg, throwing the Separatist off his feet, and onto the ground. However, Count Dooku wasn't so easy to beat. Showing strength and agility a man of his age shouldn't have, he twerked his body out of the way of Ragu's lightsaber, and the weapon pierced the ground beside him. Now, the one who was at a disadvantage was the Jedi, and he received a kick to the chest, powered by the Force. Doing a backflip, Count Dooku got up, and threw his lightsaber. The red light spun, almost cutting Ragu's throat, but he was able to deflect it. Controlled by an invisible hand, the lightsaber returned to Count Dooku's hand. Fully concentrated in Ragu, the Separatist seemed to have forgotten about Hell Squad. Maybe he thought they weren't a threat. He was mistaken. Several dozen blue lasers flew towards him, many not even aiming at his body, but at the air around him. If he moved to dodge a laser, he would put himself in the way of another. As such, all he could do was block with his lightsaber, revealing an opening. Ragu jumped forward, and his weapon cut the flesh of Count Dooku's left arm. The wound wasn't deep nor life-threatening, but it forced him to take the fight seriously. Ugh. That was a cowardly strike, Jedi. Examining the cut, Count Dooku frowned, showing anger. Ragu, on the other hand, maintained a stone-cold expression. Others may call me a coward, Dooku, but not a traitor such as you. Ha. 
so you are still stuck on the illusion that the Jedi Order is righteous. So naive. As he said that, the Sith used the Force to pull Ragu, making the Jedi stagger forward, directly in the path of the red lightsaber. Ragu tried to lift his own lightsaber to parry, but he knew he was too slow. All he could do was try to wriggle his body out of the way, but Count Dooku's weapon still pierced all the way through his right shoulder, and Ragu let out a yell of pain. The Sith Lord grinned maliciously, preparing to shake his hand, and tear Ragu in half, but suddenly a clone appeared between them. Instead of a blaster, Dajer carried a vibroblade, and used the handle to pummel Count Dooku's head. He would have preferred to use the blade, and end the Separatists' life at once, but Ragu was on the way, so he could only opt for this more awkward approach. Count Dooku fell to the ground, dizzy, and Ragu retreated, holding his shoulder. There was a hole on it, about three centimeters in diameter. More surprisingly, it was possible to see through it. Only lightsabers could leave this kind of wound, basically evaporating the flesh. Seeing his general and friend wounded, Dajer grunted in anger, and kicked Count Dooku's lightsaber out of his hand. The weapon spun on the ground before falling inside a puddle in the surrounding marsh. Then, the commander aimed his blaster pistol at the fallen Sith, preparing to finish him off. Dajer, no. We need him alive. General. He is too dangerous. Glancing back at the Jedi, Dajer furrowed his eyebrows. Count Dooku was a force user. He could, at any moment, use this mysterious power to do almost anything. To a soldier like Dajer, that meant he had no control over him as a prisoner. He didn't like that. He is defenseless. I can't let you eliminate him. Defenseless? You think that because I don't have my lightsaber, I am done. You underestimate my power, young one. Shut up. In an impulse, Dajer kicked Count Dooku on the face. Ragu frowned at the clone, but said nothing. He was a Jedi, and was against needless violence, but he was also a Jedi trained in the war. He had long grown used to violence and death, and he wasn't dumb or hypocritical enough to treat Count Dooku like a prisoner who had given up. His words proved that he still had fight in him. Get up, Dooku, and don't resist. You shall be judged by the Republic Senate. Ha ha ha. I don't think so. Suddenly, Count Dooku extended his arms, palms facing Dajer and Ragu. And then, something impossible happened. Blue lightning left Count Dooku's fingers, hitting Dajer and the Jedi, and inflicting immense pain. The lightning coursed through their bodies, scorching Dajer's armor, and Ragu's clothes. The lighting then made a bridge between them and Hell Squad, sending the clones in the same extremely painful torture. If it wasn't for Dab, they would have all died there. But the sniper, who was almost a kilometer away, and had the high ground, fired his charged shot, throwing Count Dooku, who thought it was a normal laser, away. Seeing Hell Squad and Ragu get up on their feet again, although shaken, the Sith decided it was time to go. He had never expected the Jedi to be so powerful, or the clones beside him to be so good. It was a mistake he wouldn't make again. Jumping on his speeder, he started speeding towards the capital city, where he would have battalions of droids as support. At the same time, he used the force to pull his lightsaber out of the swamp. Dab! Stop him! Ragu hadn't even finished talking when a laser was already flying at Count Dooku, hitting the speeder's engine. The Separatist jumped off before the vehicle crashed, and shot a venomous glance at the Republic group. Republic dogs! Having uttered that last curse, Count Dooku ran to the depths of the marsh, disappearing amidst the trees. Get up! We have to go after him. Using the force to lift Dajer and the other from the ground, Ragu started pursuing Count Dooku. Without any hesitation, the clones followed him. Chapter 296 Count Dooku saw the clones before they saw him. The sniper, Dab, had also joined them. But he wasn't worried about the clones. He would admit that he underestimated them, and his swollen face was a reminder of that. But he would get his vengeance very, very soon. Unlike the Jedi scum, who despised revenge, the Siths adored it. It was anger, pain, and rage that gave them their power. He could already envision his next course of action. 
since he was on top of a tree, he would wait for the clones to pass by him, and then jump down and split the one carrying a gigantic blaster in half. Then, he would cut off the head of the one with an almost entirely brown armor. And the Jedi. Count Dooku turned his eyes to the Tigruta leading the clones. He would get what he deserved. He thought back to the words the Jedi had said to him, about him being the cause of this war, and sneered. He wanted nothing but to eliminate his old master, but the green midget was right when he said there were no culprits in a war. A war didn't start for nothing, neither did it start because someone decided to do so. Wars took a long, long time, and a huge amount of pent-up aggression, to commence. No one and everyone was to blame. Dooku, I know you are here. Show yourself. Startled, the Sith almost jumped down from the tree, and gave himself away. However, he wasn't someone who would fall for old tricks, and noticed right away that Ragu had no idea where he was. The Jedi probably could feel his presence through the Force, but not pinpoint his exact location. That, however, instead of putting Count Dooku at ease, worried him even more. He was also a Force user, and an extremely powerful one on top of that, so he obviously knew how to shield himself from a Force scan. If Ragu was still able to sense him, that meant the Tigruta was incredibly powerful. And that led Count Dooku to another thought, and a very simple one. He couldn't allow the Jedi Order to grow stronger. Ragu had to die. Deja heard Ragu speaking confidently, but he could tell by his posture that he didn't know where Count Dooku was. Still, he believed the Jedi had a plan. Stay sharp, boys. The Setpai is here somewhere. Roger that, Commander. If he appears in front of us, we will give him what he deserves. Metal had barely finished bragging when Dajer saw a shadow move in the corner of his eyes. Without thinking, he pushed his brother, but the tip of the red lightsaber still made contact, cutting a gash two centimeters deep and half a meter long in the clone's back. It wasn't a life-threatening wound, but it was very, very painful. Screaming in pain, Metal fell face first into the muddy water, and Count Dooku spun his lightsaber, preparing to finish him off, but Regu was faster. The Jedi parried the attack, and Dajer took the opportunity to pull Metal away from the two Force users. After getting his brother out of immediate danger, he turned around to help Ragu, but found himself in a similar predicament to his squad. Each of them was able to hit a moving target from hundreds of meters, but the Jedi and the Sith battled in speeds impossible for the clones. Their lightsabers clashed time and time again, and their movement was faster than their eyes could follow. If they fired, they risked hitting their general. First, I am going to eliminate you, Jedi scum. Then, it will be the turn of your men. My apprentice has a special interest in them. I am sure she will appreciate torturing those clones until their deaths. Ragu wasn't shaken by the Separatists' words, but he glanced briefly at Hell Squad, and frowned. He had saved them this time, but for how long could he keep doing that? Count Dooku was as powerful as him, probably more. One single mistake by Ragu's part would be enough for the Sith to wipe them all out. Knowing that, the Jedi did a backflip, putting some distance between him and his opponent, and spun his lightsaber provocatively. Count Dooku grinned, knowing that he was being baited, but went along with it. Soon, both figures had disappeared into the swamp. What do we do, Commander? Dajer looked at Metal, who had fallen into unconsciousness. He couldn't leave his brother behind, but he also couldn't let his general fight Count Dooku alone. 3-4, take care of Metal. Dab, you stay here too. Cell, Tech, Brain, you follow me. We have to help General Ragu. Understood. Roger that. Several heads nodded, and Hell Squad got up. They split up silently, each member knowing their job. The three Dajer called followed him, and went after Count Dooku and Ragu. They hadn't gotten far when a weird noise filled the swamp, getting louder by the second. In the distance, they could see trees falling and toppling over. Damn it. That's bad news. 3-4, do you copy? What is that? The Seppis brought out the big toys. Fall back with metal. We are going to meet you at our mark. What about General Ragu? He is a Jedi, he will manage it. 
We won't be able to help him if we are dead. Let's move. Immediately, the four clones turned around to regroup with 3-4, Dab, and Metal. After giving a quick glance at the giant machines destroying the marsh, going towards Regu's position, Dajer followed them. Ragu brought his lightsaber crashing down onto Count Dooku's head, but the Separatist stepped to the side, dodging and counterattacking with a swing of his own. The two of them had been fighting for almost half an hour now, but a winner had yet to be decided. Even with his shoulder brutality wounded, Ragu had been able to cut a gash on Count Dooku's right side, evening the odds. Now, it was all down to a battle of attrition. Unfortunately, Force users could fight for hours without getting tired. Surrender, Dooku. I won't ask again. You asked three times already, my answer won't change, young one. But, unfortunately, our playtime is over. Ragu was somewhat stunned when he heard Count Dooku. What did the Separatist mean? General, there are two MTTs going your way. He had been so focused on the battle, that it took Dager screaming in the comlink to make him notice the weird, unnatural sounds coming from the swamp. He hurriedly turned to his opponent, enraged. You called for backup. Couldn't handle me on your own, Dooku. Ha! Why would I waste my time on a duel with a wannabe Jedi? I have more important plans, and a war to lead. I thought you still had some honor in you, Sith, but it appears I was wrong. What is the use of honor in war? Where did honor take your master? It's just a pathetic excuse the Jedi's give to themselves to justify their ego and selfishness. I don't need honor. Having said that, Count Dooku turned off his lightsaber, and ran away. Ragu, instead of following him, turned to face his new opponents, the gigantic vehicles, and the hundreds of droids they carried. Chapter 297 Deja was firing at the B-1 units running after Hell Squad when he saw a shadow with the corner of his eyes. Blaster ready, he turned around and prepared to fire, but was surprised to see a Tigruta. General Ragu. How did you get here? I stole one of their staps, but they shot me down before I could get to the rendezvous point. Since you also got stuck here, it doesn't make much of a difference. What about Dooku? Did he escape? Unfortunately. Where are the others? 3-4, Metal, and Dab are holed up a few clicks from here. They managed to find a good defensive position, and were waiting for us. But the Seppis got here first. How is Metal? Holding on. He will get another scar, but he will survive. Dajer left unsaid that Metal would only survive if they could escape. And now their chances weren't looking too good. The MTTs were slow, but if they didn't move soon, the vehicles would get there eventually. And even a Jedi wouldn't withstand a chance against the two rotatable twin blaster cannons it had. We can't stay here. The swamp will slow the clankers down, especially the MTTs. I'm going to create a distraction, and we run towards the others. We will be slowed down too, General. Not as much as them. Ready? Dajer shot a quick glance at Brain, Cell, and Tech, and, when he saw them nodding, gave an affirmative signal to Ragu. Seeing that, the Jedi unhesitatingly got up, exposing himself to the incoming lasers. Suppressing a sigh, Hell Squad did the same, and fired back, to cover Ragu while he used his Jedi powers. It didn't take long. A huge curtain of water was raised up from the marsh, right between the two groups. When they saw that, Hell Squad turned around and retreated without the need for an order. They had fought with and against Force users before, so they knew it was taxing on Ragu to maintain such a huge amount of water in the air. The distraction lasted for about 10 seconds before Ragu couldn't maintain it anymore, and the water fell. It wasn't much, but it was enough for the clones to get a few dozen meters away. The next few hours were frenetic, with the Republic group, after meeting up with 3-4 and the others, doing their best to escape, and killing a few dozen droids which were on their trail. Ragu was right when he said they would lose the MTTs on the swamp, but even so, the B-1 units were relentless. Still, things were looking better now. Sure, Count Dooku had escaped, and they had no means to leave Aline. But they were alive, and mostly unharmed, except for metal. I think we have finally shaken them off, General. 
Good. Metal, how are you? Can you keep moving? The machine gunner laughed, albeit weakly. He used a rock to stand up, grunting in pain, but doing his best to hide it. They have yet to build the set pie that is going to take me down, sir. Don't worry, we can keep going. Ragu nodded, and Hell Squad stood up. And then Dager got shot. Sir. Commander. It all happened in a second. Dager had just gotten up when a laser left the trees, and hit the back of his head. He fell down without a sound, smoke rising from the spot where he was hit. In one single movement, Hell Squad turned around, and fired at the direction the laser came from. A commando droid fell on the water, and sank. Then everything quieted down. After a few seconds of silence, the clones dropped their blasters, took off their helmets, and knelt beside Stager. 3-4 had already turned him around, and was examining him with a grave look on his face. However, no matter what he did, Dager had no reaction. 3-4. Is he? The clone didn't answer. Instead, he told Brain to hold Dager, and carefully took off his helmet. When he did that, he weaved a sigh of relief. He is alive. But he won't be for long if we don't get him proper medical care soon. Ragu and Hell Squad all slumped to the ground, relieved. Even if it was just for a few seconds, believing Dager was dead had been terrible. Hell Squad would be completely lost without him. He had always been the cornerstone of the unit, always there for them. They knew they could rely on him for anything. As for Ragu, he wasn't feeling much different. In his heart, Dager had a position close to his masters. Ragu carefully picked up Dager. The clone still showed no signs of waking up. Let's go. Dager didn't feel anything. One moment he was getting up, and the other, everything suddenly went dark. And, in the darkness, he saw his dead brothers. He couldn't be more familiar with what was happening. He was having a nightmare, the same he had every time he closed his eyes. Thousands of clones, each one a friend and brother he cherished, but who were all dead now. Their mouths were open in silent screams, their faces contorted in pain. Then, everything slowly started dissolving in red and black lights, creating a gigantic, hooded figure. Eliminate. Eliminate. Eliminate the Jedi. 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 The same grave, old voice, repeated these words intermittently. Usually, that was when clones woke up, sweating and confused. They also couldn't remember exactly what the voice had said, only that it terrified them. But this time, Dager didn't wake up. He struggled, knowing that it was just a dream, but being horrified all the same. The voice got louder, until it was like a blaster cannon being fired next to his ears. The words were imprinted in his head, and yet, he could do nothing. He didn't notice that he started to mumble and repeat them unconsciously. And suddenly, it was all gone. Everything returned to the darkness, but somehow, it was even worse than before. Because now he was alone with his thoughts, and all he could think was of the voice, and Ragu. And those weren't good thoughts. He didn't know for how long he was unconscious, but suddenly, without any warning, he was pulled from the darkness, and opened his eyes. The first thing Dager noticed was that he was submerged in a blue, viscous liquid, and had a tube attached to his mouth, so he could breathe. A back to tank. And that was all he had time to look at before an immense wave of pain spread through his body, coming from his head. He couldn't control himself, and started shaking. Warning. Warning. Patient CT-4063 destabilizing. Warning. Patient CT-4063 destabilizing. Activating secure protocols. Something cool was injected into him, and his eyelids became heavy. However, it also made the pain go away. Before he entered unconsciousness once more, he saw a familiar face before him, as a soothing voice reached him. Even in his current state, he could feel the force attached to it, calming him down, helping him fall asleep. Calm down, Dager. You are between friends. You are home. Chapter 298 How is he, Swanta? Ragu looked at Dager, worry in his eyes. 
The spasms that the clone had just moments ago only added to his concerns. Deja was floating in the back to tank, almost naked. His entire body was filled with scars, from small circles, from lasers, to long lines, like the one covering his right eye. Ragu had been present when many of those scars were made, but he couldn't help but wonder how Dager had made it this far. Even when hit in a vital spot, like the head, the commander had been lucky. The laser had grazed the back of his neck, miraculously missing any major arteries, or his spine. The heat had cauterized the wound immediately, so the same laser that almost eliminated him saved his life. It was as if something had protected Dager. When this thought crossed his mind, Ragu thought back to what his master told him a long time ago. Something about a force-sensitive being on Iktach saying Dager was surrounded by the force. Ragu had dismissed this when General D talked to him, thinking that the Iktachi had been senile, but maybe there was some truth in it. He used the force to scan the commander, but didn't feel anything. If Dager had any connection with the force, it was very weak. And, above all else, it was impossible. Clones couldn't use the force. Master Jedi. Are you listening? Sorry, Swanta. Can you repeat, please? The tall Kaminoan looked at Ragu curiously, but didn't ask anything. She was far too fascinated with Dager to pay attention to details. I don't know what woke him up, Master Ragu. Our sedative should have been enough to keep him asleep for weeks. It was sheer willpower. Impressive. Not willpower. Anger. I could feel it. It isn't a secret clones don't sleep well. It certainly has something to do with this. You are correct, of course. Unfortunately, we were never able to figure out the reason behind the nightmares. War. That is the cause. Brutal, unending, war. Santa turned around without saying anything, a small smile on her face. If only the poor Jedi knew the truth. You can leave him to our care, Master Ragu. In five or six days, we will take him out of the tank. However, it will take at least two months before he can rejoin the combat. Ragu said nothing, only acknowledging her words with a slight nod. Glancing at Dager one last time, he turned around to leave the medical bay. He had to talk to Hell Squad. With or without a commander, a special unit couldn't stay still for two months. Like he said to the Kaminoan, this was an unending war. Every trooper was needed. One month passed quickly. Hell Squad and Ragu helped take over the planet of Umbera, the natives had allied with the Separatist, and a Jedi Master had betrayed the Republic, causing troopers of the 501st and the 212th to eliminate each other. The traitor had eventually been eliminated by a clone, but the battle went down as one of the costliest victories of the entire Clone Wars. Dager, on the other hand, waited in Kamino. He had completely recovered, and the previous two months of rehabilitation had become one. Every now and then, he would give the Shine some advice, but they spent most of the time anxiously waiting for the ship that would bring Hell Squad to Kamino. He didn't like being separated from his squad, and, above all else, he didn't like doing nothing while his brothers died around the galaxy. Thinking of that, Dager left his quarters, and went outside, to watch the endless waves of Kamino. Facing the slight drizzle, he put on his helmet, and just stood there, hands behind his back. He didn't know for how long he stood there, thinking of all the battles he had gone through, before a trooper called him, saying that General Shock T wanted to see him. Understood. At ease. Before Dager moved, however, he was surprised by Brain. At some moment, the clone had appeared behind him, and was giving him a salute, helmet under the arm. The commander instantly noticed a new scorch on the grenadier's armor, but Brain didn't see to be hurt. Those weeks of rest made you softer, sir. Didn't see me arrive. Ha! We are home, there is no need to be so cautious. Where are the others? I sent them to clean up their armors. We hadn't had the chance since Umbera. The general had to go to Coruscant. Jedi matters. Dager's right hand anticipated the commander's next question, knowing that Dager cared a lot for Ragu. They all did. Any wounds? A few, none too serious. The 501st and the 212th had it worse. 
what they went through. Deja nodded. He couldn't imagine what it had been like for them, to eliminate their own brothers. The fact that they did it following the orders of a traitor only made it worse. Come on. Together, the two walked to General Shock T.I.'s command center. It didn't come as a surprise when they found the Jedi talking to a hologram of General Yoda. Hell Squad had long grown used to having the old Jedi Master give them their assignments. After all, their missions were usually top secret. Even the members of Hell Squad wouldn't know the details until just before the mission. That way, even if one of them was captured, like Brain once was, it wouldn't compromise the Republic's plans. Dager was an exception, of course. He had already proven that even a Sith couldn't get anything of him. Generals. Commander Dager, Brain. I have something I need Hell Squad to do. Master Yoda agreed to my request. Dager waited for the Jedis to say what they wanted. Orders were orders, so he would follow them anyway. Train a group of clones, I want you to, Commander. Needless to say, Dager and Brain were stunned when they heard General Yoda. They had expected everything, from fighting a normal battle to going after Count Dooku himself, but not training new troopers. General Yoda, with all due respect, but Hell Squad would be better used somewhere else in the galaxy. General Shock T is already in charge of the training. Dager left unsaid that soldiers could only learn so much through training. Only real battles, where one put their life on the line, could teach the troopers more. Indeed I am, Dager. But what I want Hell Squad to do isn't stay here for the rest of the war. We have a unique unit that needs training. The kind that only a special unit like yours can give. Dager frowned, but said nothing. Even if he had been ordered to train new cadets, he would still do it without complaining. Orders were orders. The fact that they wanted Hell Squad to take charge of a unique unit meant that they were more than normal clones. That piqued his curiosity. Delta Squad is in Kamino too. I trust you can see the importance the Republic is putting on this new unit. The commander nodded slowly. Boss's unit was only behind Hell Squad. If both of them were being taken away from a battlefield just to train a squad of clones, they had to be something special. Who are they? For clones they are. Very difficult to work with, but special still. Call themselves the Bad Batch, they do. Chapter 299 Call themselves the Bad Batch, they do. When they heard the Jedi, the two members of Hell Squad exchanged a glance. They had been through almost three years of war, and had heard the troopers give nicknames for themselves, their brothers, their units, and even their legions. But Bad Batch was new. Clearly, the Jedis noticed their surprise, because as soon as General Yoda disconnected, General Shock T gave Dager a data pad. Everything you will need to know about Clone Force 99 is here. Clone Force 99. As in. Brain couldn't refrain from asking. After all the number 99 was all too familiar to him. But the Jedi just shook her head. Go through it on your way to Training Bay 812. And take your whole squad, Commander. Delta Squad will be there too. As you will discover, the Bad Batch can be quite difficult to deal with. That's why we chose Hell Squad to take over their training. Dager stared at the Tigruta. As soon as she said the name of this unit, something has clicked inside his head. This has to do with the Third Battle of Kamino, doesn't it? General Shock T nodded. How long will this training take? Hell Squad is needed outside. There is a war still going on. The Jedi frowned ever so slightly. Few, or no clones, in the entire Republic army would dare to make as many questions as Dager was. His squad members were slightly more disciplined than him, but they too always questioned their orders. That said, they never disobeyed them, or at least not in a way that jeopardized the Republic's plans. Maybe that was a consequence of everything Hell Squad went through, she thought. They already completed their basic training. Hell Squad will need to show them what they can't learn here. After all, our instructors haven't seen battle in many years. As for the time. A month. That was the time you would stay here recovering. Understood. 
the two clones turned around to leave when General Shock T stopped them, and glared straight at their eyes. Commander Dager, remember something. I know why you want to get back into the war so quickly. And the Republic knows everything you and your men have done for us, and what you still have to do. But it's for those same reasons that we need more units like Hell Squad. So Ryloth doesn't happen again, and so this war can end sooner. Looking at the backs of the two soldiers, General Shock T frowned harder. She didn't like Hell Squad. In her opinion, they were too unstable after the Battle of Ryloth. They questioned orders, or followed them not in the way they were supposed to do. A survivor of the 303rd Attack Legion had betrayed the Republic, and several others showed signs of losing control over their emotions. For clones breed to battle, this wasn't normal. But, above all else, she didn't like them because of Ragu. She liked the young Jedi very much. She had taught him a thing or two back in the Jedi Temple, when he was just a youngling. And she had been very good friends with his master. She and General D had been Padawans at the same time, and their masters were close too. She didn't like seeing the apprentice of her oldest friend being so attached to a group of clones. More than once, when Hell Squad had been brought up by the Jedi Council, and that happened a lot, especially during military meetings, Ragu defended the unit to the point of creating disagreements with his fellow Jedi Masters. Special units had a very high death rate, for obvious reasons. They were always in the fiercest of battles, or alone behind enemy lines. Few units survived more than a few months, and only two had been alive since the start of the Clone Wars, Hell Squad and Delta Squad. Ragu was too emotionally close to Hell Squad, who could die at any time in some obscure corner of the galaxy. He would surely suffer deeply if and when that happened. And pain and anger were dangerous companions, very close to the dark side. Sighing, General Shock T turned back to the hologram table, and to all the documents she had to go through. She might dislike Hell Squad, but she had to admit that the Republic needed them. It was incredible that seven men, insignificant before the millions that composed the clone army, could make such a difference. I have the information you wanted, your highness. About Hell Squad. Tell me. It is as you predicted, my lord. They are a lot more independent than normal clones. The emotional impact of the fall of their legion seems to have overridden their inhibitor chips, but the Kaminoans guarantee that there is no way for them to break away from your control. The most that will happen is that they might disobey orders from others, but not you, my lord. Um. Interesting. Should we bring them in and fix their chips? Or deal with them? I am curious to see how they will develop. Tell the cloners to keep them under their watch. The data could be useful. Meanwhile, have you already chosen who will test the command? Yes, my lord. We are ready to implement it. Good, good. Puny Jedi Order, your time is coming. Ha 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 ha. Who are they, sir? Dager? Did the Jedi tell you the same she told me? Dager and Brain soon joined the rest of Hell Squad, as well as Delta Squad, outside Training Bay A-12. Boss frowned when he saw the data pad in Dager's hands. Clearly, he didn't like the idea of becoming an instructor. The commander only nodded, still focused on the data pad. Brain, Tech, Metal, Dab, Cell, 3-4, Scorch, Fixer, and Sev all looked at the two of them, impatiently. Up till now, only Dager and Boss knew what was going on. Who are they, sir? Dager looked at Boss, and his brother gave a small nod of encouragement. Clone Force 99. Named after 99. You all knew him. He died during the Third Battle of Kamino. During the battle, several of our installations here were damaged or destroyed, and one of the core pieces of the clone production was stolen by Ventress, although General Skywalker got it back. However, the small time the sample was out of the machines, a batch of embryos died. Only four of them survived. Deformed and defective, but with some special abilities. He spit it all out in one breath, frowning all the time, especially when he called them defective. He didn't like to refer to his brothers with those words, but that was what it said in the datapad General Shock T gave him. 
the troopers around him were all looking stern, having understood why their two squads had been chosen to train the Bad Batch. What abilities? You will see. Dajer didn't want to get into more details. He and Boss had already read the files of the Bad Batch, and knew that the squad was undisciplined, disrespectful, and arrogant. However, the two made a silent agreement of letting their men decide what they thought of the Bad Batch after they had talked with them. After all, that would affect how the training would progress. Seeing several heads nodding, Dajer opened the doors of the training bay to find the weirdest group of clones he had ever seen. Chapter 300 For men were scattered around the training bay, each one doing their own thing. Closest to the entrance was one that had what looked like a small data pad on his arm, from which several cables appeared, and were connected to the back of half a dozen target droids, rewired B1 units. From time to time, the clone would mutter something to himself, and tap something into the data pad. What was surprising about him, though, wasn't what he was doing, but how he looked. Clones were all the same. Same height, same weight, same eyes, same genes, same everything. Only tattoos or how they cut their hair could tell them apart from each other, for normal folks, that is. Amongst themselves, clones knew who the others were even if they looked all the same. It was instinctive. But the trooper crouching behind the clankers wasn't anything like that. He was much smaller and thinner. His face was also much slimmer, and he had huge glasses, which he seemed to be able to use to zoom in or out. He also used what appeared to be a heavily modified ARC trooper armor, with a huge backpack. According to Dager's intel, he was called Tech, and had enhanced mental capacities. Looking at how both he and Hell Squad's tech liked technology, Dager was sure his name wasn't just a coincidence. A few dozen meters away from Bad Batch's tech, was a clone that could only be described as old. He had white and gray hair, was taller than normal clones, and his cheekbones stuck out, making him look as if there was only skin attached to his skull, and no muscles. Around his right eye, there was a weird tattoo. It was a circle with four lines sticking out of it, on the left, right, top, and bottom. It looked very much like the crosshair one would find in a sniper blaster rifle scope, which was also his name, Crosshair. The desirable mutation, as the reports referred to it, he had was incredible eyesight. He could use his own eye as if it was a scope, giving him high accuracy at long distances, which obviously put his role as a sniper. At the moment, Crosshair was shooting at the training droids a few dozen meters away. If one looked closely, they would realize that he wasn't aiming at the clankers, but at the walls behind them. The lasers would reflect on the walls, and hit the droids in the back of the head. Even at a close distance, that was an incredible feat. Standing in the middle of the room, lifting B2 units and throwing them meters away, was a gigantic clone. There was at least half a meter taller than normal troopers, and clearly much stronger. His left eye was completely white, and he had dozens of scars on the left side of his head. The scars appeared to be from burns, but considering how the other members of Clone Force 99 had turned out to be, Dager wasn't sure if it wasn't just something he was born with. His name was Wrecker. Lastly, there was Sergeant Hunter. Off all the clones of Bad Batch, he was the one who resembled a normal clone the most. He had long hair, and half of his face was covered by a tattoo that resembled a skull. He also had a red bandana wrapped around his head, which certainly wasn't standard equipment. However, there was nothing normal about the unique abilities he had. While the other three had super strength, enhanced eyesight, and mental capacities, Hunter had enhanced senses. He could feel the magnetic field of the planet, and was able to tell the enemy positions, speed, manpower, and a number of other valuable pieces information before they even got close. He was also the only one who paid attention when Hell Squad entered. With a lot of calm, he put away the two pistols he had been playing with, and whistled to get Bad Batch's attention. Yo, boys. We got company. The normies are here. Dajer frowned once again, an expression that didn't see to leave his face for the last months. Hunter and his men were showing no respect for their superiors. And be it in experience or rank, anyone on Hell Squad or Delta Squad was vastly superior to them. Slowly, Wrecker, Tech, and Crosshair abandoned what they were doing, and stopped in a disorganized line, without saluting. 
It was very clear they were bored, and even disinterested in their new instructors. Dager would have none of that. Sergeant Hunter. In position. Now. Yes, sir. Dager's yell was enough to startle them into position. Laid back or not, they were still clones, and discipline was ingrained in their bones. Are they really clones? Dager exchanged glances with Boss. They could see that the first impression the four clones had left on their men wasn't good. To tell the truth, even though they had already been expecting Bad Batch's behavior, they were also quite unhappy. For soldiers who hadn't even fought a battle to be this confident, it wasn't healthy. Overconfidence led to quick deaths. Hunter, Wrecker, Tech, and Crosshair. Clone Force 99, huh? Sure thing, Commander. What's up? Wrecker yelled at what Dager supposed was his normal voice volume. The sniper by his side snickered a little before elbowing his squad member, who in turn tried to pick up him. Hunter had to interfere to make them shut up. Quiet, you two. It's us, sir. What can we help you with? General Shock T thinks very highly of your unit, Sergeant. She thinks you have the potential to become one of the best the Republic has. I and Boss are here to make sure that happens. What can a normie teach us? Crosshair whispered loud enough for everyone to hear him. It was the second time one of Bad Batch's members had used the term normie to refer to Hell Squad. What's that supposed to mean? Sorry, Commander Dager. Crosshair didn't mean to be disrespectful. It's just that we aren't exactly like the others. We aren't normal clones, you see. I know, Sergeant. I read all the reports about Bad Batch. That doesn't mean anything for me, boss, or any other clone. We are brothers all the same. So, show me what you can do, and I will decide whether your unit is worth teaching something or not. Hunter looked at the eleven clones standing before him. All of them had stone-cold expressions, and their backs straight. They looked at Bad Batch as if they weren't there. He could understand why. He knew his men hadn't left the best first impression. But that didn't mean he had to like it. He and his brothers weren't normal clones. They were better. Way, way better. They were being bred to be clone commandos before, and after the attack that caused them to become deformed, they had become something else. They had skills and abilities no clone could compete with. Glaring at the one in front, Commander Dager, Hunter started thinking. He couldn't, and didn't want to, be disrespectful. Dager was his superior. In fact, all the clones in both squads were. However, he would show them that Bad Batch wasn't to be underestimated. And there was no way better than to show that they were better than Dager. After all, even Delta Squad seemed to follow the commander's order, even though he was just a normal clone. All right, sir. You want us to show what we can do. How should we do that? Chapter 301 Dager designed a training course for Bad Batch to run. He put the four of them against 60 B-1 units, 20 B-2 super battle droids, and three droidicas. Two of the clankers were even manning an E-Web turret. Bad Batch cleared it easily. Even though they hadn't seen where Dager programmed the droids to be, Hunter could easily detect them, and warn his squad. Wrecker would pick up droids, including droidicas, and throw them away. Their cohesion was impressive, almost comparable to veterans. Just almost though. They still lacked experience, and made too many unnecessary moves, which would get them eliminated in a real battle. But they certainly could back up a little of their arrogance. So. What do you think, sir? Bad Batch stood proudly before Dager, only to find out he didn't seem impressed. In fact, none of the men behind him looked like they were impressed either. It's quite good for some shinies. We are not shinies. We are soldiers. Air. Sir. Wrecker complained before realizing he was being disrespectful. Dager didn't pay him any heed, because he knew this brother of his might be strong, but it was also more. Emotional. Until you go through your first battle, you are little more than cadets. Dab and Sev, you take Crosshair. Show him some tricks. Metal and Scorch, Wrecker. Tech, you get our tech, 
fixer, and sell. Boss, you and I will train Hunter. Brain and 3-4, you sit out for this one. Both Hell Squad and Delta Squad members nodded. Even the clone commandos had no qualms following Dager's arrangement. But Bad Batch had. Sir, Commander, Air. Commander Dager. For the first time, Bad Batch's tech spoke, so fast that it was almost difficult to understand what he was saying. Yes. We showed you what we can do. But you haven't shown us. I mean. Like, don't want to. I'm not saying you aren't good. It's just that you only rated us good enough. And we are a lot better than the normies. Dager looked at Bad Batch, and saw they all had the same feelings as their brother. They were hard to convince. You may be better than cadets, but you are nowhere near the level of skill a special unit needs. Besides, you think too highly of yourselves. That will get you eliminated in your first battle. Hell Squad and Delta Squad have been through thousands of battles. After a month, we will see how prepared you are. But. Wrecker and Bad Batch's tech were about to complain again when their sergeant put his hands on their shoulders, and forced them to stand down. We understand that, sir. But could you show us a little of what you can do? We heard a lot about your two units during training, but never had the chance to see them in action. Ha! Huh. Before Dager could answer, he heard Boss laughing. The commando didn't even try to hide it. The others also had grins on their faces, while Clone Force 99 was looking at them confused. They didn't know why their brothers had found Hunter's words so funny. I don't think they will be convinced until you show them, sir. Metal is right. Do you need help? Stand down, brain. The commander can handle them on his own. Dager looked at his men, and sighed, before turning around to face Bad Batch. In the same movement, he kicked Hunter, pulled out his DC-17, and his vibroblade. To the sergeant's credit, he noticed Dager's sudden move, and put his hands in from of his stomach to block, but still had to take a few steps back. He tried to reach for his own pistols, but found that the vibroblade was resting on his neck, threatening to eliminate him if he moved. Meanwhile, Dager held his blaster in his left hand, and aimed it at Crosshair, Tech, and Wrecker. Dead, 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 and dead. Clone Force 99 is gone, Sergeant Hunter. It all was over in a second. Bad Batch barely had any time to react, and had startled expressions on their faces. The other clones weren't surprised at all. Putting his weapons away, Dager just stared at Hunter, waiting to see what he was going to say. The sergeant stood quiet. He finally seemed to have understood why Hell Squad and Delta Squad looked down on his unit's confidence. The one to speak first was obviously Wrecker. Hey. That wasn't fair. You caught us by surprise. The one to answer him was Boss, as he stepped forward, to stand by Dager's side. Who told you the Seppis are going to play fair? They are very similar to us in this. We will do everything it takes to win, and so will they. Their droid factories build dozens of thousands of clankers every day. No matter where you fight, you will be outnumbered and outgunned. You are good, I won't deny that, but I could pick any trooper at random, and he could deal with you as easily as Dager did. Still. If we. Shut up, Wrecker. Commander Boss is right. Hunter stepped forward, without taking his eyes off Dager and Boss. Wrecker mumbled a little, but obeyed. Crosshair and Bad Batch's tech had yet to say a word. It appeared they had understood the same as their sergeant. That they were nowhere near ready. Yes, he is. Some reflexes and instincts will only come from experience. After you fight your first battle, you will understand. For now, we will teach you all the tricks a special unit needs to know. The tricks they don't show you when you are cadets. First lesson, never underestimate your enemy. Too many of our brothers fell because of that. Second lesson, you won't only be fighting against normal tin cans. What I did to you, sergeant, is a standard move used by commando droids. But they won't stop their blades. Dager stopped to see if his speech was having the desired effect. 
He had been a commander for long enough to know that even amongst clones, it was necessary to earn their full trust, otherwise they might falter during a key moment. And mistakes led to death. You were named at 99. Maybe you think it is because you are defective like he was, or because you were a mistake. The real reason only the higher-ups know. What any clone knows is that 99 was a soldier just like the rest of us. He died to save his home and his brothers. We were here when that happened. So, we will make sure you are worthy of his name. Understood? Yes, sir. We will follow what I said before. You will have a month of training before receiving your first mission, whether you are prepared or not. Boss? Got it. All right, start moving. You were showing off before, now I want to see what you can really do. Let's go. The clone started moving. Dager and Boss had been training Hunter for about an hour, the clone showed a lot of interest in Dager's Viberblade, when Brain called his commander. By the look on his face, he had bad news. When Dager heard what he had to say, his expression turned grave, and his eyes flicked with worry. Telling Boss to keep training Hunter, Dager left the room, and rushed to meet General Shock T. Chapter 302 Sir, can I ask you something? Boss put away his blaster, and stepped back. Hunter did the same. Say it. When we were cadets, we always heard of Delta Squad. We always looked up to you, because you are commandos just like us, and we were told you are the best unit of the clone army. But we listened to Dager, even though he is just a... What did you call him? A normie? Well. Your squad training was mostly separated from the others, right? Ours was too. After all, commandos have different battles to fight. But you gotta remember something, kid. We are all clones. Commandos, ARC troopers, normal clones, we are all brothers. I would listen to a cadet, if what he said made sense. No matter what your rank, unit, or legion is, we are a family. I understand. I know you do. You are one of us, after all. Hunter nodded firmly. The sense of belonging he had amongst other clones like him was stronger than anything. But Boss hadn't answered his question. And if there was one thing Bad Batch didn't know, was how to be subtle. Who is better? Your unit or Hell Squad? Hell Squad. He was surprised by the lack of hesitation. He thought Boss would have more difficulty to admit it, even though it was quite obvious what he thought. Delta Squad was better than Hell Squad once, that's true. But that was when they didn't have all of their members, and had just been created. You heard the stories. Normal troopers, transformed in a special unit during the first battle of Geonosis. That alone is enough to show their capabilities. They faced and eliminated enemies that even the Jedis ran from. If only we had more like them, maybe we wouldn't be losing so badly. Losing. I thought we were winning. That's what they tell the cadets. We can't have you thinking that all the training is worthless. But you will see it by yourself soon. We are fighting in dozens of systems, and losing in most of them. The clankers are too many for us. Sometimes we have to make cruel decisions. Like what? Like Ryloth. Hell Squad promised that they would only stop when they have avenged their legion. One of the many reasons why they are so good, unfortunately. Hunter looked at Boss without fully understanding what he meant. Delta Squad's leader sighed, and made him go back to training. Like all shinies, Hunter would only know how brutal the war was when he saw a brother of his die by his side. Before that, he would still believe everything he was told in Kamino. Thinking of this, Boss exchanged glances with Brain. By the expression on the clone's face, he knew something serious had happened. Something serious enough to make Dager leave the training without warning. He hoped it was just another planet lost, and not something worse. General Shock T heard the blast doors opening, and looked up from the hologram table to find Dager. Frowning, she told the two clones who were with her to continue what they were doing, and went up to the commander. She could feel a lot of anxiety emanating from him. Something wrong with Clone Force 99's training, Commander Dager? No, General. They are doing fine. 
as long as they can survive their first battle, they will be on par with Delta Squad. Then what is wrong? General Ragu was captured. General Shock T was stunned. She herself had only just received this piece of news, and only because she was a Jedi. How do you know that, Commander? Every clone knows how important Ragu is for Hell Squad, General. We made a promise a long time ago that we would never let anything happen to him. The Jedi opened her mouth, startled, and closed it again. She looked around, and discovered that the clones were avoiding her gaze. It was a severe breach of security, but she couldn't bring herself to be angry at them. If they changed places, she would have done the same. A promise to who? To General D. The same day we left him to die, while we escaped. You had no choice, Commander. You were given an order, and you followed it. And I will live with it forever, General Shock T. But Ragu is all that is left of the 303rd, General. Of all the brothers that died on Ryloth. A sacrifice was needed so Ryloth would have a chance of escaping the Separatists' grasp. It should have been us. Not him. We are clones. This is our job. You are people, Commander. You are not worth anything less than anyone in the galaxy. Master D made a choice. And because of his choice, Ryloth is still ours. If you have died there, many of the battles you won for us would have ended differently. Dajer shook his head. The past was the past, and no matter how much he wanted to change it, he knew it was impossible. It was useless to discuss that now. He already saw General D and his dead brothers every night. A rescue operation will be mounted. Hell Squad took part in several ones before, let us take part in this one. Please. I'm not sure your unit is emotionally prepared to such a mission, Commander Dajer. We saved many Jedi generals before. We will save ours. No matter the cost. Having said that, Dajer turned around and left. There was someone he needed to talk with. The Jedi, on the other hand, stood still for a long time. She knew that if Hell Squad was ordered to stay in Kamino, they would. But she wasn't sure if that was the right decision. One didn't need to be a Jedi to notice that Dajer and his men were prepared to die for Ragu. They would be a valuable asset to the rescue mission that was sure to be organized. How many of the original troopers of the 303rd Attack Legion are still alive? She turned to one of the clones around the hologram table, although she already knew the answer to her question. Seven, ma'am. We will get him back, Commander. I don't care about Ryloth, and I know you didn't too. I won't let it all be in vain. A lot of things happened since you died. Many more died. Shield betrayed us. Only Hell Squad is left. And Ragu. You always liked him, even though he was just a kid when we first met. The 303rd lives on him. All of our brothers do. We won't let him die too. For us. His eyes closed, Dajer saw countless similar faces flash through his mind. Every night, when the nightmares came, he wished he had died at Ryloth, so he wouldn't have to carry the burden of being a coward who ran when he should have stayed. Who obeyed orders when he shouldn't have. But when he opened his eyes, he would remember the promises he had made to General D and to Commander Keeley. Hell Squad would only die when every clanker had become scrap metal. Until then, they would continue fighting. He would continue fighting. Glancing at the old, broken helmet in his hands, Dajer got up determined. Carefully, he laid the helmet on the shelf above his bed, where it had been for the last two years, and put on his own helmet. I promise. Chapter 303 Where is Dajer? He is talking to Commander Keeley. With furrowed eyebrows, Boss looked at Brain. The grenadier wasn't joking. And, by the looks of it, he wasn't surprised either. He probably was used to it. That was when a door opened, and Dajer got out of his quarters. The clone commando was able to catch a glimpse of a battered Phase II helmet, with two brownish-red painted horns. The helmet was almost cracked in half, the visor broken. It was Commander Keeley's helmet. What is it, boss? For a few seconds, boss didn't answer, and only looked at Dajer. 
The commander had an unreadable expression on his face, the scar over his eye slightly red. He had worked with Dager long enough to know that meant he was nervous. General Shock T wants you in the command center. She called a meeting to discuss General Ragu's situation. That was quick. Brain, get the others. Boss, see what you can do to keep Bad Batch's training going. Okay. And good luck, Dager. Thanks. Maybe Delta Squad will be together with us on this one. Who knows? Boss nodded, and saluted Dager. After doing the same, the commander, followed by Brain, went to meet General Shock T. Commander Doom had been through many battles, and seen death multiple times. He knew war brought out the worst in everyone, and clones were no exception. Still, when he saw the clone wearing brownish-red armor, and with a scar on his face, he was surprised by the intensity in his brother's gaze. He knew that the clone before him was a man willing to do anything to complete his objective. He knew that because he once had the same fire on his eyes. The lot that he was on was shot down as soon as it left its cruiser, during the Second Battle of Felicia. He was the sole survivor, lost behind enemy lines, over 200 kilometers away from the nearest Republic base. It took almost three months for him to get back to the Republic side of the planet. He had long been declared dead. He rarely talked about what happened in these months, but it was a fact that he came back with many new scars, and parts of his armor were missing, and broken. And he had with him a tactical droid's head, the same he had been sent to get when his gunship was shot down. So, he easily recognized Dager's intentions. He would rescue the Jedi, General Ragu, or he would die trying. He had never worked with Hell Squad before, but just like any other clone, he had heard of them. In fact, as a commander, he had access to more information than normal troopers, so he knew about some of their missions that weren't disclosed to low-ranking officers. And yet, not even him could get intel on over half of their operations. Dager saluted him, and he acknowledged it with one of his own. Then, Commander Doom returned his attention back to the meeting. As soon as Hell Squad entered the room, they saw General Shock T, Broody, two Jedis they had never seen before, and a clone in dark green and yellow armor, whom they recognized as Commander Doom. The hologram table, on the other hand, showed General Kenobi, General Skywalker, Captain Rex, and Commander Cody. Too many people for a simple rescue mission. Since Hell Squad is here, let's start. General Shock T called everyone's attention, before doing the introductions. Since they would be working together, it was important that they knew each other. Master Kenobi, Master Skywalker, you already know Hell Squad and Commander Brody. Commander Doom, and Masters Tip Lee and Tip Lar, you should have heard of Hell Squad before. The two women bowed slightly to Dager, and he returned a salute to them. One had red skin, while the other was green, but their facial features looked very similar. They were probably sisters, Dager concluded. He couldn't say which species they were from, but if he had to guess, they were from the Outer Rim. As you already know, Master Ragu was captured during his return to Coruscant after the Battle of Umbera. His ship was attacked by a fleet led by Separatist Admiral Trench. After which, he was brought to Geonosis. She paused, and looked up to see if everyone was following. They were. We have to rescue Ragu. To do so, we will be sending two teams to Geonosis. Master Skywalker, that part of the plan is yours. The young Jedi nodded, and his projection grew bigger. Meanwhile, Dager was thinking rapidly. Geonosis was the core of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The droid factories and foundries were there, and it was the most well-guarded planet of the Separatist. Even entire fleets would have problems breaking through the blockade around the planet. But sometimes, it was better to have quality over quantity. And Jedi certainly had that. I know a smuggle. I mean, a captain, that can get us the clearance codes needed to pass through the blockade. We will need a separatist ship for that. Once on surface, we will split up. One team will rescue Ragu, while the other will rig as many factories as it can. There was the reason why so many people, especially Jedis, were involved in this mission. They would only save Ragu, but take the opportunity to destroy, or at least damage, as many foundries and factories as they could. Still, 
Deja could already see at least half a dozen flaws with the plan, and so could the others. Assuming we can get to Geonosis without being discovered, and that they won't suspect one of their ships not landing where it was supposed to, how are we going to know where Master Regu is? And what about bombing the factories? They extended for dozens of kilometers underground, and are hundreds apart from each other. If we can partially disable one, it will already be impressive. And useless for the war effort. That was what General Tiplar meant, although she didn't say it out loud. Luckily, it seemed that General Skywalker had an answer for both questions, although not very reassuring. My droid, R2-D2, will control the ship after dropping us. Don't worry, he did it before. The Seppis won't suspect. As for the factories, it's a little more complicated. We will need to split up again, but if we are too little, it will be dangerous. What about? While the Jedi's discussed, the clones stood quiet. Deja was analyzing the plan carefully, and, crazy as it seemed, Hell Squad had gone through worse before. It was possible. He was deep in thought when General Shock T called him. With just one look, he understood what she wanted. They only had a day's worth of training, General. They are not ready. You said it yourself, Commander. No amount of training will replace real experience. Still, it's too soon. We would need at least a week. That's how long our preparations should take. Deja nodded slowly, acknowledging that the Jedi was right. Sorry to interrupt, Master Shock T, but about who exactly are you talking about? Their short conversation left the others confused. General Kenobi asked after they were done talking, while the others looked at them curiously. Hell Squad is training a new unit. It's time to take them on a field trip. Chapter 304 Tech, go get Hunter. And Boss 2. Delta Squad will be happy to have a new mission. Without the need of being told, Dager ordered Tech to fetch the two clones. Then, he turned back to the meeting. General Skywalker and General Kenobi were discussing something with Captain Rex and Commander Cody, after which both clones disappeared from the hologram table. The two Jedis, General Tip Lee, and General Tiplar, were talking to General Shock T and Brody. Seeing that his attention wasn't needed at the moment, Dager ordered Hell Squad to stay at ease, and pulled up a projection of Geonosis on his data pad. He had taken part in both the first and the second battle of Geonosis, but the planet was a nightmare for logistics, with all the underground caves. Even if they knew where exactly Ragu was, and they didn't, they would have a lot of problems to save him. Commander Dager, how good is this new unit? The clone turned around to find Commander Doom looking at him, hands behind his back. Dager knew why he was asking about Clone Force 99. The Jedis didn't pay much attention to the fact that they were shinies because they usually charged forward in battle, and didn't see the newbies dying in droves. As clones and officers, Dager and Commander Doom were far too used to that, and knew that sometimes inexperienced soldiers were more dangerous to have than not to. They are green, but they are good. I still have to talk with the Jedis, but as long as we keep an eye on them, they will learn pretty quickly. I will tell Boss to do so. Commander Doom nodded, slightly surprised by how Dager could apparently order a clone commando around, but didn't let it show on his face. If Dager didn't even have this ability, he wouldn't be the leader of the best special unit. When Boss and Hunter arrived, the meeting resumed. General Skywalker started explaining his idea of getting in contact with someone who could get the needed access codes. However, that someone was difficult to trust. Eventually, Dager had to interrupt the Jedi, and question if it was really a good idea. A pirate, General Skywalker? Can we trust him? I fought against a few before, and they wouldn't hesitate to sell us out. The young Jedi, however, smiled. Dager had fought with him enough to know that he had a plan, and probably a really bad one, or a mad one, more accurately. Of course we can't trust him. Hondo will try to eliminate us as soon as he sees me or Obi-Wan. But once we convince him he will win something, he won't betray us. He has some weird kind of honor. Everyone looked at General Kenobi, the bearded Jedi knew his old Padawan better than anyone, and could tell if he was being serious, only to see him sighing with his hand over his head, and shaking his head. 
Anakin is right. Hondo is cunning, but once he gives his word, he will go through with it. Once we land, we will have to split up. Commander Dager, I imagine Hell Squad will like to go after Master Ragu. Yes, General Tip Lee. You know Geonosis better than all of us, Commander. How should we separate? Dager stepped forward, and put a string of codes in the hologram table, pulling up a projection of Geonosis. Of all the people present, including the Jedis, only Delta Squad probably had as much experience as Hell Squad. If the Sepis behave like they usually do, General Ragu will be locked up on one of their main facilities, at the South Hemisphere. As long as we can get inside them, Tech will discover where he is. Boss and Hunter, your units will cover these two areas. General Kenobi and General Skywalker, you go with them. General Tip Lee, General Tiplar, Doom, and your men, you get the other side. Hell Squad will go get Ragu. In a single breath, Dager split up all their forces into three groups. Since they didn't know the actual layout of the factories, all he could do was give them a general direction. The rest they would have to figure out on their own, once they were on Geonosis. Are you sure you can do that on your own, Commander Dager? After Dager had explained his simple plan, there was a pause of a few seconds, before the others started discussing the details. General Tip Lee and General Tiplar were surprised to see the others, including Jedis, so unconcerned that Hell Squad would be responsible for the most difficult and dangerous part of the mission all by themselves. Finally, the latter had to interrupt the conversation, and ask. To that, however, Dager flashed one of his rare grins, before running his fingers through his helmet. I won't be on my own, General. Hell Squad will be with me. Hondo was a male weakway, with coarse brown skin, and several bone thorns on his face. He was sitting in his bar, having a drink, and laughing with his crew, when he was warned that a Republic ship was entering the atmosphere. Like all good pirates, he laughed, and told his crew to get ready to have some fun. They were captured immediately. As soon as they boarded the ship, which hadn't posed any resistance, they found themselves surrounded by clones and Jedis. Lots of them. Amongst which, were some familiar faces. Hey, hey, hey. Take it easy, oh mighty Jedis. What's up Skywalker? And you, Kenobi. Look at you. It's so good to see you again. While he talked, Hondo started slowly backing away, prepared to jump back into his ship, and abandon his men, after all, he could always get more, but two clones, with red and brown armor, put their blasters against his back. No need for violence, my friends. I was just passing by to see how you all were doing. Good, I see. Now, I will be going. Is this the man who is supposed to take us, Master Skywalker? One of the Jedis, a young Mickian, said something that caught Hondo's attention. The old pirate turned to General Skywalker with a look of utter surprise on his face, which made the Jedi shake his head, resigned to another long and needless talk. Oh my! Oh my! You need me, Master Skywalker. A powerful Jedi such as yourself needs an old pirate like me. I am honored. What is in it for me? Be serious, Hondo. I have a business proposition for you. Of course. What do you say about going to my small home? We can discuss it between a drink or two. Or many, aha. Uh -huh. What do you say, Jedi? The Jedis looked at themselves, and reached a silent agreement before ordering the clones to stay down. Hondo smiled as if he was already expecting that. Soon, the two ships landed on the surface of the planet, and the pirate crew, as well as the Jedis, and a group of clones, followed Hondo inside his den, where dozens of pirates from all species around the galaxy could be seen, talking, drinking, and laughing. They all stopped what they were doing when they saw the Republic group, until Hondo made a gesture, and the noise returned. The only one who kept looking at them was a tall woman, with white skin, and carrying a cycler rifle. Hondo was quick to introduce her. Ladies and gentlemen of the Republic, this is my beautiful friend, Aura Singh. I believe some of you already know her. Chapter 305 Dager had been on guard since they entered the pirate's den. When he saw the bounty hunter, Aura Singh, 
he had to exert a lot of self-control not to lift his blaster and eliminate her. She had eliminated many of his brothers. Dear Hondo, I didn't know you were bringing me a present. What? A present? I ain't. Oh, oh, oh. Ora, what are you doing? Hondo had been smiling the entire time, exchanging pleasantries with General Kenobi and General Skywalker, and already had a drink in his hand, so it took him a few seconds to notice something wrong with Singh's words. When he did, he turned around to find her with an old watchman pistol on her hand, aiming it, curiously enough, at one of the clones, who had a horn painted on his helmet. That prompted the clones and Jedis to pull out their own weapons, followed by the pirates and bounty hunters. In a second, the entire bar was in a standoff. Wait, wait, wait. Calm down, everyone. Put down your weapons. Now. Albeit hesitantly, the outlaws obeyed him, except for Singh. Hondo was bold, but not stupid. If it was one or two Jedis, they could handle it, with heavy casualties. Four of them, plus half a dozen clones, was. Although scum like his crew was easy to find, it still took effort and credits, and he didn't want to bother. You too, Aura. Now. That idiot put me in prison twice, Hondo. And you escaped like always. Now, remember this is my turf. Either you put that blaster down immediately, or I will make you. Aura Singh looked at Hondo, and knew he was being serious. They might have some kind of relationship, but business came first. Gur. You get to live for now, clone. But someday I will find you. Hell Squad will be waiting, bounty hunter. Dajer didn't say anything, but Cell, like always, couldn't keep his mouth shut. All he received was a curse from Singh, as the woman left the building, and the planet. The Jedis looked at Dajer curiously but he just shrugged, his body language saying, I will tell you later. I am sorry about that, Jedis. Aura told me many times about how she hated a few clones, I just never imagined we would have such a coincidence. Such a small galaxy, right? Cut the small talk, Hondo. We need you to get us somewhere. Oh. And what might be that place? Somewhere. Putting on his business face, the pirate tried to extract as much information as he could from General Skywalker, but the Jedi was short and cold. They couldn't risk being heard by a separatist spy. Hondo also had done many shady dealings before, and he knew that discretion was a must. But he had other worries. I can discuss the job later, Skywalker. But I have to know if it is even worthy of my time. I am a very busy man, you know. We can see that. General Tiplar raised an eyebrow, and looked around to the drunk outlaws, and the dirty bar. She muttered something under her breath, which Hondo ignored. So, what is in it for me? I love the Republic, but I don't work for free. Fifty thousand credits. Bwahaha. You are funny, Jedi. A hundred. The pirate exploded in laughter, taking a few seconds to calm down, and faked whipping a tear of laughter. Fifty thousand. You will take it. Moving his hand in front of Hondo, General Skywalker used the force to influence the pirate's mind, but he was unsuccessful. You should know your tricks don't work on me, Jedi. You tried it last time, remember? When you and this one over there were my prisoners. He used a finger to point at General Kenobi, but General Skywalker's old master didn't see to be offended. In fact, he smiled. Sixty thousand, and we will forget that you sent people to rob and dismantle our ship while we are here, Hondo. Air. It was just a joke, O oh powerful Jedi Knights. Sixty thousand it is. Half here, and half after you get us where we need to be. Of course. And. As a sign of good faith, can you return my men? They were just curious about your cruiser. It's a warship, after all. General Kenobi stared at Hondo for a whole minute, saying nothing, until the pirate broke in cold sweat. Finally, he nodded at Dajer, who turned on his comlink. Doom, boss, let them go. Roger that, Dajer. Come on, scram. Soon, a mixed group of Wheatays, Niktos, and humans entered the bar in a sorry state. 
Before they left the ship, General Skywalker had already predicted something like this would happen, so he had given orders for the clones who stayed inside it to only eliminate the pirates if necessary. He didn't want to have Hondo asking for compensation for his crew's death. What were you thinking, idiots? That a Jedi would let their ship unguarded? Sorry, boss. Get out of my face. You are in charge of the Sarlacc for the next two rotations. Now, go away. I have important guests. General Tiplar raised an eyebrow at General Skywalker, but the Jedi just shrugged. When Hondo turned to them again, he had a huge grin on his face. Now, about that first payment. You are out of your mind, Jedi. I am not taking you to Geonosis. The Separatist would tear us into pieces in an instant. Hondo was yelling at the four Jedis, still thinking they were suicidal by trying to enter Geonosis. However, he was ignored, and a Doom Legion clone stepped forward to talk with the Jedis. All he could do was listen and complain. Twenty hours, generals. Wait, wait, wait. Twenty hours for what? General Tiplar flashed him a smile, making the pirate shudder. He didn't like happy Jedis. They were too unpredictable. To our arrival on Geonosis, of course. We already entered hyperspace, pirate. There is no turning back now. You better hope your access codes work. Hondo could only look at the Jedis hopelessly. He had put himself in this position when he found an old maxillipede shuttle and working security codes. If he had known what they were planning, he would have rather loose the money he was promised than go with them. But now was too late to regret. I swear, Jedis, especially you two. If we get out of this alive, not even your force will be able to stop me from killing you. Don't lie, Hondo. You like us. Otherwise, why would you have captured instead of killing us last time? I wanted to ask for ransom, Skywalker. Instead, I got nothing but a bunch of my crew eliminated. Damn you. Can you two stop bickering like two gungans, please? That isn't appropriate even for a pirate, whatsoever a Jedi, my old Padawan. Dager had the feeling the two men could argue until they landed on Geonosis. General Kenobi apparently felt the same, so he told both of them to go to their quarters. Dager waited to see if there was anything else, and when a clone from Doom Legion relieved him from duty, he went to meet Hell and Delta Squad, as well as Commander Doom and Bad Batch. A huge mission was just a few hours away from starting, and clones always liked to spend that time together. You never knew when it could the last time. Chapter 306 Shuttle OME-05, send your BZZ Clearance codes Sending them through now BZZ General Tiplar face palmed behind General Skywalker as the Jedi transferred the codes that Hondo had given them to the Lukerhol class battleship before them. Several dozen of them, and many smaller ships, orbited around Geonosis, ready to fend off any attacks. They had learned their lesson after the Republic almost conquered the planet two times. OME-05, stand by. Inside the one of the battle spheres on the surface of Geonosis, Count Dooku listened to a green-skinned Nimodian. The Jedi scum came to rescue their kind, just as you said they would, my lord. Jedis. So predictable. What do the scans indicate? Twenty-nine life forms. If our spies in the Chancellor's office are correct, for Jedis recently left the Jedi Temple, for a secret mission. Who? Master Skywalker, Kenobi, Tiplar, and Tip Lee. And the others aboard the shuttle? Probably clones, my lord. The tactical droids estimate a 92% probability of special units Hell and Delta squads being part of it. Count Dooku's eyes shone if a glint if pleasure and cruelty when he heard his subordinates' words. Many of his personal enemies were on that ship. Should we destroy the shuttle, my lord? I will deal with them myself. And tell my apprentice that the prey she has been waiting arrived. Right away. We are going to die. For the fifth time, Hondo repeated this sentence. The Jedis all had frowns on their faces while they waited for the answer from the Separatist blockade. In a small shuttle, they had no chance of escaping, or even surviving, in case the Sepis discovered them. 
It all depended on the codes that the outlaw had provided. I am inclined to agree with our pirate friend, Anakin. You two need to have a little more faith, Obi-Wan. It will work, don't worry. The droids just are a little slow. OME-05, you are clear to land. Go to your designated. Station. Everyone let out a sigh of relief when they heard the clanker's voice through the speakers. Even the clones, who had stone-cold faces, relaxed their tense muscles. See? I told you it would work. General Kenobi spoke faster than his old Padawan could, already knowing what he would say. The three other Jedis, and Hondo, looked at him, and laughed nervously. The few minutes that it took for the access codes to go through felt like hours. Now, however, they could land safely. They entered the atmosphere, and went towards the surface. Opening the lower ramp, they dropped down cables, so they could get off without the Seppi suspecting something was wrong. R2, you are the captain now. And you, Hondo, don't even think of trying to go without us, or R2 will fry you. Before he slid down the cables, Dejer saw General Skywalker talking to his droid, and small blue and white astromech unit. The droid chirped and whistled happily, showing that he understood, before extending a metal claw that let out blue sparks. The clone heard the scream of the pirate even though he was already touching the orange sand. Soon, four figures jumped out of the ship, ignoring the help the cables provided. The Jedis landed softly, using the force to slow down. Everyone knows your tasks. According to the map we have, there is an entrance to one of the many tunnel systems two clicks southeast from here. We will get there and then split up. Any questions? General Kenobi looked around, and saw several shaking heads. They had rehearsed the plan over and over again before coming to Geonosis. Now, they were on the point of no return. Then, let's go, and may the force be with us. They all nodded, and started running. Dejer exchanged a glance with Boss, Hunter, and Doom, before sending Cell, Sev, and Bad Batch's tech ahead. He didn't trust the Force as much as the Jedi did, and preferred to have first-hand intel, provided by his brothers. It didn't take long for them to contact him. We found the entrance, sir. There are bugs guarding it. Stay out of sight. How many? Only three. Want us to take care of them? Stand by, and wait for us. We can't let them know we are here until we find General Ragu. Dajer passed on what Cell told him to the Jedis, and they sped up. The group found the three clones they sent to scout ahead laying down behind a small elevation on the ground. Where are they? Two have their back turned away from us, General Tiplar. The other one is on top of those rocks. I will take him down. Master Skywalker, Tip Lee, can you take the other two? The two Jedi were nodding when Dajer thought of something, and looked at Bad Batch. The four clones were clearly tense, and the commander couldn't blame them. He was also like that when he first stepped on Geonosis, three years ago. It seemed a lifetime away. Generals, permission to take care of the two bugs. We need to show Clone Force 99 how clones deal with Geonosians. Are you sure now is the best time, Dajer? Remember what is on the line. Hell Squad has done that many times, sir. There will be plenty of seppies for you to deal with later, General Skywalker. After hesitating for a fraction of a second, the young Jedi nodded. He had faith in Hell Squad's ability. The two Jedi sisters looked slightly worried, but seeing how neither General Skywalker nor General Kenobi, or Delta Squad and Doom Legion, for what matters, were giving it a second thought, they didn't say anything. General Tiplar crawled her way over to the rock where the Geonosian was positioned, taking several minutes, and a long way around. They couldn't risk it. Even Wrecker was extremely quiet, while Bad Batch watched carefully as Dajer and Brain sneaked forward, until they were just behind the Seppies. When General Tiplar used the force to boost herself up, and slashed the bug in half with her lightsaber, the two clones also got into action. Brain put his DC-15S around one of the Geonosian's neck, and twisted it hard. A crack was heard, as if a dried-up twig was breaking. The second Geonosian probably heard or sensed something, because he tried to turn around, but Dajer's vibroblade was already cutting down on him. 
With almost no resistance, his head was severed from its body. All in all, it took a few seconds for the three seppies to be eliminated, and without a sound. That small demonstration was all that Bad Batch needed to understand why Dager said they made too many unnecessary moves. The two clones, and the Jedi, had been lethal and efficient. The way is clear, generals. We will follow our previous arrangement. Commander Dager, their main foundries are that way. You will find a control panel there somewhere, and hopefully it will tell you where Master Ragu is being held. Roger that, General Tipley. Hell Squad, let's move. And may the Force be with you, generals. The Jedis grinned when they heard Dager, and watched as the seven clones disappeared inside the tunnels. With a nod, the Jedis, Delta Squad, Doom Legion members, and Bad Batch went the other direction. May the Force be with all of us. Chapter 307 Hunter walked quietly after Boss. Up till now, Bad Batch hadn't gotten the chance to experience any action. The two Jedis, General Kenobi, and General Skywalker, had been doing everything. Even if they understood that discretion was a must in this kind of mission, the four shinies, especially Wrecker, were starting to grow restless. Hey, sir. When are we gonna get to smash some droid heads? Shush. Be quieter, Wrecker, or we are going to have their entire army after us. Sorry, General. I got excited. We won't be able to maintain our secrecy forever. Clone Force 99 will get their baptism of fire very soon. Now, follow me. We still have to get to the next factory. After splitting up from the two sisters, and the clones from Doom Legion, they had started planting thermal detonators and explosive charges around the factory, being careful to dodge any patrols, or to destroy them quietly. In a droid factory, no one paid attention to a few more piles of droid pieces here and there. When one of the giant machines, responsible for transporting materials from one factory to another, got close, the group jumped on it, quickly hiding beneath some piles of metal. They were unaware, though, that a probe droid had been following their every move, and reporting it to Count Dooku, who, after knowing where they were headed, started preparing a reception. Yakal, 88, you are up. Roger that, General. Two clones, wearing dark green and yellow armor, sneaked forward, and started planting detonators behind the huge container, filled with liquid metal. Meanwhile, the two Jedis, and the other clones, kept watch for any sign of danger. They too were being tailed by a probe droid. In a distant corner of the foundry, a group of Magna Guards, Droidikas, and B2 Super Battle Droids, were gathering. Hell Squad was having a more troubled experience than the other two groups. They had long left the droid assembly lines behind, and entered dark tunnels. If it wasn't for the small holes in the ceiling, here and there, they would be in complete darkness. However, they didn't dare to turn on the flashlights on their helmets. It would be a dead giveaway to their location, and the fact that they weren't Geonosians. As such, they kept advancing in the pitch-black tunnels. More than once they found Geonosians sleeping inside the walls. Unlike the Jedis, who wouldn't attack unless attacked first, the clones weren't so merciful. Dager finished off every single bug they found, whether they were sleeping or not. Any of them could have eliminated a clone before, and none of them deserved to live. It was dangerous to leave bodies behind like that, but the moment they rescued Ragu, alarms would go off anyway, and Hell Squad preferred to have fewer enemies after them. The few times they encountered droids or awake Geonosians, they either let the Seppis go without warning them, or eliminated them quietly. Finally, after almost two hours, when Dager was already starting to get worried, the tunnels and caves started to become metal corridors and hallways. Soon, they found a terminal from which Tech could access the internal network of the Separatist. The clone started connecting cables from his datapad to it, and typing rapidly. However, before he could discover anything, the sound of metallic footsteps resounded. Exchanging glances, Dager ordered Tech to keep doing what he was doing, and gestured for the others to take position as close to the walls as they could. Hey! What are you doing her? Ah! When the 6B1 units appeared, and saw Tech, they rushed towards him, not paying attention to what behind them. Hell Squad attacked them, trying to take them down silently, 
but one of the clankers managed to fire a laser before being eliminated. Luckily, it didn't hit anyone. Sorry, Commander. He was faster than I expected. We would be discovered sooner or later. Now, Tech, we need you to hurry up. Soon, they will send someone to investigate and discover the patrol we just destroyed. The closer we are to the general when that happens, the better. I need another minute, sir. General Ragu is locked up in this facility, I just need to find out where. Anxiously, the clones waited. At any moment, the separatist could attack them. Meanwhile, Dager warned the other two groups. They found us, generals. It won't be long before they send teams looking for you. After discovering a Republic unit inside one of their main bases, the Sepis wouldn't certainly send search parties to every factory around the planet, looking for any other enemies. Inevitably, they would find the Jedis and the other clones. Can you still go, Commander Dager, or do we have to abort? Hell Squad is only leaving if General Ragu is with us, ma'am. The Jedis gave a small grunt of acknowledgement and turned off their comm links. The less they talked, the smaller the chances they would be heard. I got it. Sector 12, 8th floor. Good job. Come on, lads, let's not keep the general waiting. Ragu was floating a few centimeters above the ground, in his cell. His eyes were closed, but he was paying attention to every sound outside. At first, he didn't understand why the separatist would let him untied, so he could use the force if the wanted. After his first attempts to escape, however, he understood that, at least for now, it was pointless. Ray's shields would be lowered as soon as the door of his cell was opened, and without his lightsaber, he couldn't get through them. The fact that he understood his situation didn't mean he was happy with it. At every chance he had, he would destroy a few droids. It was nothing to the Separatist, and he knew what he was doing could barely be considered throwing a tantrum, but after a few sessions of torture and interrogation, he didn't care. The last weeks had been spent in pain. Two times a day, he would be taken to a room where he was tied up, and commando droids would interrogate him until he fainted. Others would already have given up on life, or giving in to his captors, but not Ragu. He was part of a new generation of Jedis, one that had been raised up amidst death, and tempered in the flames of war. He would rather die than give the enemy anything. Suddenly, his meditation was interrupted when he heard a commotion outside. Because of the thick doors and walls, he couldn't make out what was happening, but it was too much noise for a single change of guards. And he was pretty sure he could hear blasters being fired. His first thought was that he was being rescued. Immediately after, he understood that whoever his to-be saviors were, they were walking into a trap. He didn't know why the separatist hadn't executed him yet, but now he had an answer. He was bait. Getting up, he put his ear close to the door, and heard a woman's voice. And a very familiar one. My dear clones. You have no idea how long I've waiting to eliminate you. Chapter 308 Without the need to be discreet anymore, Hell Squad threw all caution to the wind, and simply advanced towards Ragu's cell. Any enemies on their path, be it B1 or B2 units, Geonosians or Droidikas, were crushed. Dager and his men were good at everything, but what they were better at was destroying their enemies in open battle, without giving them any chance to fight back. In small corridors, where the Sepi's number advantage became more of a hurdle, there was no one who could stand on their way. Especially when they had an objective as important as their general. This is too easy, sir. We are attacking the heart of the Separatist, and that is all they have for us. Maybe we are lucky. When did that ever happen? Making a pause to reload and check for wounds after destroying a small group of clankers, Dager looked at the hallway ahead. It was quiet, and he couldn't hear any droids, even after all the commotion Hell Squad was creating. His brothers were right. It was all going way too well. He wouldn't have survived as long as he had if he couldn't see something was very wrong. Dab is right, Commander. This is a trap, for us. General Ragu is the bait. I know. That doesn't mean we are going to run and leave him. I never said that, sir. What do we do? Bayron, Sel, Dab, 
tech, metal, and 3-4 looked at him, waiting for his orders. The thought of retreating didn't cross their minds for a moment. Clones didn't run. Either they finished the job, or they died trying. A small grin appeared in his face, under his helmet. His brothers couldn't see it, but they knew when their leader was about to come up with a bad idea. Curiously enough, or not so much, considering who they were, a smile also appeared on their faces. We fall in the trap. My dear clones. You have no idea how long I've been waiting to eliminate you. Ventress waited for Hell Squad before Regu's cell, her two lightsabers on her hand. Dajer wasn't surprised. He could feel his scar burning long before they saw her. It always happened whenever he got closer to the Sith responsible for it. His six brothers were standing besides him, glaring coldly at the woman. They hated her as much as she hated them. Differently from a few minutes earlier, though, when they all had been standing straight, Brain was now holding his side, panting, and using the walls to hold himself open. Ventress' eyes flashed in pleasure as she saw the obvious pain the clone was in. One of you little dogs got hurt, sweetie. You will pay for that too, Ventress. Oh, I don't think I will. With a small nod from his head, Dajer ordered Hell Squad to start surrounding the Separatist. Brain hanged back because of his wound, while Tech started moving towards the cell's door, but Ventress didn't make any move to stop him. Free your master, clone. I will make things more interesting. Who will die first? You or him? Tech glanced at Dajer quickly, and received a positive answer. Ignoring Ventress, he knelt near the control panel, and started fiddling with it, but stopped when he heard Ragu's voice through the door. Don't open it. You will be trapped in here. Don't worry, General. We are prepared. Dajer didn't hesitate to answer, surprising Ventress. She knew the Jedi would warn them, and was prepared to attack, taking advantage of their surprise, but the clones weren't shaken. The cold mouths of their blasters kept aiming at her, the fingers on the trigger steady. That made her halt her offensive. So you knew it was a trap, Dajer? I knew I should have sent more units, but I was afraid they would eliminate you, and take my revenge from my hands. Still, what can you do, sweetie? The moment your brother opens that door, you will be locked in here with me. Or you will be locked with us. A lowly republic scum like you thinks you are a threat to me? You are better than your brothers, clone, but none of you are a match for me. This time, I won't just give you a scar. I will eliminate you. No more games. Hatred dripping on her words, Ventress jumped forward, trying to cut metal in half. The clone, however, unleashed a torrent of blue lasers, forcing her to fall back, and hide behind a doorway. Meanwhile, Tech finally opened the door, and Ragu stepped out. He was half-naked, and several bruises and scars adorned his upper body, many still red and swollen. However, he still seemed to be strong and full of energy. You are going to need that, sir. Tech pulled a short metal stick from his belt, and gave it to the Jedi. It wasn't Ragu's lightsaber, but it was better than nothing. At the same time, red energy shields blocked the corridor, trapping the seven clones, plus Ragu and Ventress. If you knew it was a trap, Dajer, why did you come? The clone didn't answer, and only kept firing at Ventress, forcing the Sith to deflect the lasers. I hope you have a good plan to get us out of here, then. Not exactly a plan, General. But we have to deal with Ventress first. You need to keep her occupied for a while. The Jedi didn't question. He trusted Dajer and Hell Squad, and the commander rarely made a bad decision. Spinning his new lightsaber to get used to it, he started clashing with Ventress. Are we ready? Brain, hit it. Hearing Dajer yell, both Ragu and Ventress turned their attention to Brain, and found out that the clone had a detonator on his hand. He was now standing straight, and showed no signs of suffering any wound. Bastards. Dirty tricks. The Sith knew what was happening the moment she saw the detonator, and that Brain was faking his wound. It was, however, too late for her to do anything about it. The moment Brain pressed the trigger, an explosion brought down the ray shields. The clones, followed by Ragu, fell back, and 3-4 shot the panel of the nearest cell, 
making a new energy wall appear between them and Ventress. In anger, she slashed at it, but all she got was sparks, and she was unable to break through it. Let's go. Without giving Ventress another look, Ragu started running, and Hell Squad followed him. It was a pity they couldn't eliminate the assassin, but they had other problems now. How did you know that would work? We didn't, General Ragu. We set it up so we could blow up any clankers that came after us. It was only when we got closer that we saw Ventress was here. It was good thinking by brain to stay back. The rest was improvisation. Good enough for me. What is the rest of the plan? Or did you rescue me just so we could die fighting? It might be what happens, General. We didn't take into account that they were waiting for us. And that means they probably know about General Kenobi and the others. Cell, contact the first group, Metal, the second. Tell them what happened. Clankers incoming. Ragu spun his lightsaber, and a grin appeared in his face before he ran forward, to meet the patrol that was going towards them. You tell me everything later. Now, it's time to fight. Chapter 309 Generals Tip Lee and Tip Lar took a dozen men from their legion, and are planting explosives along some of their key factories. Generals Kenobi and Skywalker have Bad Batch, and Delta Squad, and are doing the same somewhere else. Bad Batch? Who are they? A new unit. We train them. They are shinies, but they are quite skilled. If they survive, we will hear from them again. To have you praise them, they must be good. And, if they were trained by Hell Squad, they shouldn't fare too badly. Dajer only nodded. They had contacted the Jedis a few minutes before, and they had yet to be discovered. After knowing that Hell Squad had walked right into a trap, however, they too had arrived at the conclusion that the Seppis also had something planned for them. As such, General Skywalker had ordered his astromech, R2-D2, to take off with their stolen ship, and to meet them at the extraction point. They hadn't had the time to rig all the factories, but it was better to leave while they still had the upper hand. Of course, it wasn't easy. Almost immediately after that, they received the news that General Tiplar and her group had been ambushed, and lost three men. Simultaneously, General Kenobi said they had been forced to escape after engaging Count Dooku and a bunch of Seppis. The explosives were also deactivated, and although Boss was decisive in blowing them up when he saw what the clankers were doing, all they managed to do was destroy a few conveyor belts and machines. Everything was going wrong, and, to make it worse, Hell Squad and Ragu were forced to battle a considerable number of droids. Clearly, Ventress had given up on trying to eliminate them herself. Dajer dropped to the floor, and hid behind a dead B2 unit. Near him, Tech uttered a curse as a laser missed his head by millimeters. General. We are pinned down. If we don't move quickly, they are going to swarm us. I know it. All right, Brain, Dab, do you remember Umbera? Which part of it? Second Fortress. Oh, no. When I move. Dajer had no idea of what Ragu was talking about, but judging by the two clones' reaction, it was some crazy maneuver. It really was. Up till now, Ragu had been deflecting the lasers fired at him, but suddenly, he let one of his hands go from the lightsaber, and used the force to make a clanker's carcass float in front of him, as a shield. And then he threw his lightsaber. Exactly. Spinning in the air, the lightsaber cut half a dozen droids in half, before making a turn, and coming back towards Ragu, killing two more Seppis, and distracting the others. Dajer wouldn't have been so impressed if it was only that, however. He knew Jedis could use the Force to control almost anything, so it wasn't that surprising. But, the moment the lightsaber returned to Ragu's hand, Brain threw three detonators up in the air, already activated. Pushing both his hands forward, Ragu made the detonators fly towards the clankers. With three lasers from Dab's DC-15X, all fired in less than a second, the grenades blew up, transforming over twenty droids in scrap metal. You had your fun on Umbera, hum? Not as much as you would think, Commander. The 501st and the 212th had it worse, though. That traitorous J.E. The traitor made them fight and eliminate each other. 
Dager didn't need Brain to tell him that. He had received the reports of the cruel acts the Jedi traitor had performed. By lying to the clones, he convinced them that the Separatists were disguised with the armor of their dead brothers. When the scheme was finally discovered, hundreds had died, by the hands of their own brothers. No clone could live peacefully with that. One of them, Dogma, had executed the traitor, going against the orders to capture him alive. Dager didn't blame him. He would have done the same. You two can discuss that later. We gotta keep moving now. Ugh. Being urged by their general, the clones started running again, but suddenly heard Ragu grunt in pain, and stagger. He would have fallen to the ground if metal didn't hold him. General. What happened? Ack. I guess I wasn't as strong as I thought. The Separatists don't have a soft hand when it comes to their interrogations. Dager gestured for 3-4 to have a look at Ragu, while the rest of Hell Squad kept watch. It was pretty impressive Ragu had been able to keep himself awake up till now. Any normal person would already have collapsed after almost a month of torture, whatsoever jumping around, and fighting a Sith while using his supernatural powers. We can't stop now, General. Can you walk? Let's go. However, Ragu had barely taken a dozen steps when he fell again. Seeing that, Dager gestured for Cell to help him walk. If they had the option, they would wait for the Jedi to recover. Unfortunately, what they needed the most now was time, and they couldn't waste any. The group continued, now slower than before, but still as deadly. With cold-blooded efficiency, the clones cut a path through any seppies that stood on their way, and soon, were out of the battle sphere. The darkness of the tunnels, however, only made it more difficult. More seppies coming our way, Commander. Hell Squad stopped, kneeling on the ground, and taking aim. Shadows appeared on the corners, and they almost fired, but 3-4 noticed something before they pressed the trigger. Friendlies. Stand down. Surely enough, General Tiplar and General Tip Lee appeared, followed by Commander Doom and half a dozen other clones. Of the original group, four were missing. I am glad to see you are safe, Master Ragu. Thank you, Master Tiplar. But, why are you here? Dajer told me you were in a foundry to the south. We were. But everything went wrong. The Separatist prepared an ambush for us, and we weren't able to destroy a single assembly line. When they were pursuing us, we jumped on the first transport we saw, and it brought us here. Master Kenobi and Master Skywalker had more luck than us. They managed to evade Count Dooku, and are heading this way. R2 and Hondo are also bringing the shuttle. They can't do that. This was a well-thought trap. They certainly know our ship. Don't worry. Apparently Hondo hijacked another one. This pirate has proven to be quite useful. All the while the Jedis were talking, the clones kept watch. Luckily, they weren't attacked for a while. Even if Geonosis was one of their core planets, the Separatists couldn't leave too many of their forces there. The Clone Wars were in a state where every soldier counted. Besides, who would dare to attack Geonosis? After a while, they went up to the surface, where the clones could fight more comfortably. Ship arriving. Calm down, they are on our side. The new Maxillipede shuttle lowered its ramp, and Hondo appeared. The pirate had a huge smile on his face. Hello, my friends. It looks like you could use a... Ouch. Why did you do that, you pile of trash? A blue and white droid, which was no taller than Dager's waist, bumped into Hondo, and whistled anxiously for the Republic group to board the ship. A few minutes later, having picked up Delta Squad, Bad Batch, and the two Jedis, the shuttle left Geonosis, and entered hyperspace. The meticulously crafted trap by the Separatist failed, albeit not entirely. Their prisoner and his saviors escaped under their grasp. Chapter 310 You let them escape. We had five Jedis, and two of the most hunted clone units, and you let them escape. Count Dooku looked at his apprentice, still locked behind the ray shields. They had meticulously prepared a trap for the Republic, and not only did it fail, but they also lost a valuable prisoner. All because Ventress had a grudge with one of the clones. 
They discovered our trap. Gur. It isn't my fault. Next time I find them. There won't be a next time. You will stay far away from Hell Squad. I need them to be taken care of, and it's clear you can't do it. You can't do that. Ventress spat those words in anger, instantly regretting it, as she felt an invisible hand grab her neck, and lift her up. Her vision started going black, and she couldn't breathe. Finally, when she was almost going unconscious, Count Dooku used the force to smash her against the wall, and let her. I can do whatever I want, my apprentice. While the Jedis talked at the control room of the shuttle, the clones grouped up in one of the rooms. The mission had been a partial success. They managed to rescue Ragu, but failed to destroy the factories, and lost four soldiers. Hell Squad, surprisingly, was unharmed. The members of Doom Legion weren't so lucky, and one of them was in critical condition, while others had light wounds. Scorch had been hit in the shoulder, two times, while Boss was limping after Count Dooku almost severed his leg. Bad Batch's tech had been shot in the back, and the blast padding was the only reason he was alive. How did your men do, Hunter? Pretty okay, sir. Delta Squad got most of the fun, however. I never thought you would be humble now, after everything you said back in Kamino. Bad Batch fought well, Dager. They saved us a couple times back there. The clones all laughed at the somewhat embarrassed expression that their four defective brothers showed. Even Wrecker looked flustered. They certainly didn't expect that after all the scolding that they received from Dager and Boss in Kamino, now they would be praised so much. Congratulations, Clone Force 99. You aren't shinies anymore. You are real troopers now. Dager patted Hunter's shoulder, and was about to say something else when his comlink bipped. Looking at it, he suppressed a sigh, picked up his helmet, and got up. The others looked at him, not too surprised. Duty calls. Doom, the Jedis want you too. The rest of you, take a rest. You deserve it. Dager, Hell Squad didn't suffer any serious injuries. As such, you will come with me and Obi-Wan to Kiro's. It wasn't a warning or a question. It was an order. Dager acknowledged it with a nod. He had no idea where Kiro's was, but as long as he was given a command, he would follow it to the end. Tomorrow, a meeting will take place, to decide the future of this war. By then, we must already be in Kiro's. Gather your men, Commander. Roger that, General Kenobi. Giving a last glance to Ragu, Dager left the room, and went to prepare Hell Squad. Soon, the shuttle was going to arrive at a supply station, and the thirty-odd people would split up. General Skywalker and General Kenobi, as well as Hell Squad, would go to Kiro's. Commander Doom, his men, and the two female Jedis were needed in Dantuin. Ragu would return to Coruscant, to recover from his wounds. Delta Squad still had no assignment, while Bad Batch would be responsible for escorting a fleet of cargo ships. Seeing how fast everyone had received new orders, it was clear to Dager that the Clone Wars had reached a critical juncture. In the command bridge of a Venator-class cruiser, Hell Squad, Captain Rex, Commander Cody, and two Jedis looked at the hologram table. Right now, the second largest meeting of the war was starting. The holograms showed dozens of Jedis, and their respective clone commanders, as well as a few special units. The meeting was presided by the Chancellor Palpatine himself. Right now, the Republic is suffering severe losses. We are losing one system after another, and our support amongst the neutral planets in waning. The Chancellor is being too kind. Everyone here is a veteran of this terrible war, and there is no use in sweetening our words. We are about to lose. After over three years, we are running out of resources. I won't dwell on numbers, but what you have to know is that unless we convince some of the major neutral systems to join us, our troops won't only be outnumbered, but also defenseless and starving. The discussion went on for hours. Most of the clones stood quiet, only saying something when asked. Inside, they were all furiously thinking. And, they all arrived at the same conclusion. The Jedis once again showed why they weren't fit to lead a war. They were too merciful, too kind. They weren't willing to sacrifice anything or anyone. 
The answer to the problem was right in front of them, but none dared to say it. Clones didn't have all those moral problems. In the end, the commanders from over twenty legions all looked at Dager. For a long time now, he was the unelected representative of the soldiers, whenever they had to say something the Jedis wouldn't like. Generals, Chancellor, there is something we can do. A gamble we can take. All the Jedis quieted down, and fixated their eyes on Dager. The clone, however, was looking straight at General Yoda. The powerful being hadn't said a word the entire meeting, which made Dager think he too knew what the solution was. The pained expression on his face further convinced him of that. What is it, Commander Dager? We take our forces from Coruscant, Kamino, Kessel, and other planets, and commit them to an all-out attack. Those are our core planets. If we leave them defenseless, it's the same as giving up. If we don't do so, we will lose the war anyway. Continue, Commander. We take the systems that will make the scale tip to our side. But only the less important ones. We leave Geonosis, Mustafar, and the like alone. They won't dare to move their fleets from those systems. They will think it's a trap. Do you have any idea of how many troops you are talking about, Commander Dager? Dozens of millions. Hundreds, ma'am. If we want it to work, we will have to use our troops on Felucia, Moncala, Dantuin, and so on. That would waste three years of effort we put on conquering those planets. I know. But I don't think there is any other way. And, with all due respect, you don't seem to think so either, generals. A long silence descended in the room, and for many minutes, no one said anything. Finally, General Yoda opened his eyes. Many lives, lost will be. Yes, General Yoda. But we won't falter. The Republic is our home. The clones won't let it fall in the hands of the Separatist, not while we are alive. And, if we are going to die anyway, then we prefer to risk everything in a last offense than wait cowardly. Dager was harsher than any clone had ever dared to be. Before, his blood wouldn't let him talk to the Jedis like that. But everything had changed after Ryloth. He was tired of just listening to orders even when he knew they would lead to death and defeat. Right Dager is. To this war survive, no other option we have. Chapter 311 After General Yoda's words sunk in, all the Jedis looked at themselves, unsure. They weren't children who had seen nothing of the galaxy yet. They knew war was cruel, and that sacrifices were inevitable. They themselves had been to hundreds, if not thousands, of battles, and saw many of the soldiers under them die. However, what Dager was suggesting wasn't a fight that would leave a few hundred or thousand casualties. It wasn't even the sacrifice of an entire legion. It would be more brutal and horrific than any battle the Republic ever partook in. Dager's plan, if it worked, would lead to millions of deaths. If it didn't, it could potentially cause the entire annihilation of the clone army. The Jedis, on their infinite kindness, thought about what Dager must be feeling while he brought up such a plan. To know that your brothers would die, and still go on. But he was right. That was their only shot at survival. They were, however, overthinking. It certainly wasn't an easy decision to make, but any clone would have done it. If they let the Jedis hesitate more because they weren't willing to make sacrifices, more of their brothers would die. What? If we were to proceed with this plan, what would our next steps be? Dager looked at the Jedi, a tree like he didn't know the name, and pulled up a map of the galaxy. What he needed now wasn't specific measures, but just a rough idea of which planets to give up, and which to attack. We would need to take most of our troops on Felucia, Maijido, Mon Cala, Dantuin, Umbera, Christophsis, Coruscant, Kessel, Kamino, and Ryloth. Any legion or fleet that we can spare too. Then, we have to attack and take some of the Sepi systems. Especially those who are close to a neutral group. That will give them more confidence in joining the Republic. And what planets should we attack? Dager looked at the hologram, frowning. He was the one who came up with the idea, but his specialty was fighting. He usually left strategy for the others. Wolf, Tito, take a look at it. The two clones stepped forward, and started analyzing the map. 
In fact, they had already been doing it in their heads before. Kiros, Zygeria, Kadavo, Radonia, Florum, and Onderon. And some other less important planets here, here, and here. They are all important systems, with a strong separatist force. But if we strike quickly, they won't be able to react. And, by taking them, we can control the supply lines of the separatist on three entire sectors. We wouldn't even need to attack Moncala, Ryloth, Umbera, and Felucia again. We could just let the clankers waste their batteries. Some of those systems are neutral. If we attack them, the others might start fearing us. Chancellor Palpatine intervened, pointing at Kiros, Zygeria, and Florum. They are neutral only in name. Our intelligence indicates that they house a good separatist force. And not against their will. General Windu got the latest reports they had, and transmitted it to everyone. Dajer already knew what was in them, because Hell Squad had been the ones to obtain them during the infiltration of a separatist ship. If that tactic works, not only will we be able to avoid a loss, but also make a comeback. I will take my leave, Jedi Masters, and let you make your plans. Good luck, and... How do you say it? May the Force be with you. The Jedis nodded, and the projection of Chancellor Palpatine disappeared. Dejo could swear he saw a slight smirk on his face. The next days were enveloped in heated discussions, even while Hell Squad was fighting on Kiros. They barely got any rest those days, battling for hours without end, and, in the few moments of calm, discussing their offensive. Captain Rex and Commander Cody weren't much better than them. At a certain point, after they had just captured a small town, General Kenobi saw Hell Squad standing guard. Their backs were straight, and they were paying full attention, but the Jedi could feel their exhaustion. When was the last time you slept, Commander? Three days ago, General. But we were able to catch a break here and there. That is not enough. Hell Squad, go get some rest. I need you focused on the next battles, and not falling asleep. That was an order Dajer couldn't disagree with. Even Hell Squad needed to sleep every once in a while, otherwise they would make stupid mistakes, which could get themselves and their brothers eliminated. Still, as always, they didn't sleep much. After about three hours, Dajer woke up, covered in cold sweat. The nightmares were getting worse each day. The thought of having to live with them every day of his life, if he survives the war, was terrifying. Clones feared no enemy, but the ones they saw on their dreams. Since he wasn't on duty right now, Dajer didn't put on his armor, and left his quarters careful not to make a noise. His squad deserved to sleep, even if it wasn't a very good one. Kiros was hot even during the night, and miniature dust storms roamed the streets of the small city. Dajer didn't know the name of it, and didn't care. For him, it was just another battle. Already awake, Dajer. He turned around to find Captain Rex behind him. The shaved clone also didn't have his armor on, for probably the same reason as Dajer. Bad dreams, Rex. Always. They are getting worse the longer this damned war goes on. Dajer sighed. Civilians and Jedis sometimes thought the clones liked the war. Only the troopers knew how badly they wished for it to end. It's coming to an end. Rex. I can feel it. Unconsciously, he touched the scar on his face. He had dozens on his body, but it was always that one that hurt the most. Dajer didn't know why he had the feeling the war was ending, even as Captain Rex looked at him waiting for a follow-up. He just knew it. How long? I don't know. And don't ask me who will win either. If you want predictions, talk with the Jedis. It's just a feeling. If you want to talk about feelings, I am having one right now. We are being watched. Deja nodded, and pointed at a hill about four or five kilometers away. Commando droids. Dab saw them today. He managed to take one out, but they were too far away, and the others hid. The 501st leader nodded, not impressed in the slightest. There were some men on his legion who could take such a shot, whatsoever in Hell Squad. Do you think the Grand Offensive will work? Is that what the higher-ups are calling it? Captain Rex suppressed a laugh, and Dajer made a small grin. 
the seat warmers at the Senate always liked to give mighty names for the battles and operations. None of them knew that there was nothing glamorous about war. If it was anyone else, no, it wouldn't. But we are clones, Rex. The price will be hefty, but that is our chance of turning the tides of the war. It will work. Chapter 312 Ahsoka Tano laid on the ground, using macro binoculars to watch a group of faraway droids load some transports with ammunition and supplies. Besides her were Captain Rex and Dager. What do you think? Too many for us, Commander Tano. We only have forty soldiers. Rex is right. We have to wait for reinforcements. The Padawan shook her head, disagreeing. The droids numbered at about a hundred and twenty, three times the clone forces, but she thought that if they were caught by surprise, they could win. What if Hell Squad and I used the cover of the night to sneak up on them? While we distract them, the others could attack from the other side, and we would catch them between two fires. The plan would be good, kid, if we had thirty more troopers. But with just us, even though we could win, we would lose too many. You know my rank is higher than yours, right, Dager? I keep telling that to Rex. You shouldn't call me a kid. The 501st Legion leader gave a dry laugh. Maybe because she was still young, Ahsoka didn't care if clones were a little more undisciplined near her. And I keep telling you, Commander, that what matters is experience, not rank. I will have to agree with Rex on that one too, Commander Tano. It saw a lot of new officers that couldn't compete with a foot soldier. Seeing how the two clones were against her, Ahsoka sighed, and gave up attacking the Separatist. She might be a good fighter, and had fought many battles, but she knew she would never be as experienced as any of the two clones. Slowly at first, the three people retreated, and joined the rest of their group. They were just one of the many recon groups that had been sent to penetrate enemy lines, investigate, and, if possible, cause chaos. General Skywalker and General Kenobi were both in the lead of other groups. Kiro's was the first battle of the Grand Offensive the Republic was planning. The 501st and the 212th had joined forces once again to attack the planet, since their legions and their Jedi generals had good teamwork, per se. Their objective wasn't only to capture Kiro's, but also to act as a smokescreen, distracting the Separatist from the weird movements of troops the Republic had been making for the past days. A spy clanker found us, General, but we managed to destroy it before it could send anything. One man of your unit is having a look at it, Commander Dager. As soon as they entered the small clearing they had settled in, a 501st lieutenant, named Jesse, if Dager remembered correctly, came up to them. Dager looked over to where Hell Squad was sitting, and saw tech typing in his data pad, from which a bunch of cables were connected to a probe droid. Walking over, he tapped his brother's shoulder, catching his attention. Did you find anything useful, Tech? Not yet, sir. Its core was damaged when Axion shot it. There is something weird, however. What is it, Trooper? When they heard Tech, both Ahsoka and Captain Rex joined them. Hell Squad stepped aside to make room for the Jedi, before turning back to cleaning their weapons. The clanker was set to return to these coordinates, General. Commander Tano. But our intel tells us there is nothing there. Ahsoka frowned, pensive. Possibilities were running through her mind. Are you sure the coordinates are right? I'm positive, ma'am. I checked twice. The probe was to cover this sector, and return there to recharge, and have its hard drive wiped. That was standard procedure for separatist recon droids. They sent anything they investigated to their headquarters, and, when it was running low on energy, it returned home. Not only would it recharge, but also have its memory wiped, to make sure that, even if it fell on enemy hands, it couldn't tell them much. Maybe a small outpost that escaped our search. That area is almost a desert. There is nowhere to hide an outpost. We would have seen it from kilometers away. That leaves two options, then. It's either underground, or moving. I don't know what is worse. If it's an underground base, then we have a problem, ma'am. We would have to check out backs all the time, to make sure sepis wouldn't spill from the ground like they do on Geonosis. But I don't think that is the case. 
it's costly to make those bases, even more in a desert. It's more probable that it's a convoy. The Padawan stood still for a long while, thinking. In the end, she decided she couldn't make this decision on her own. Rex, contact Master Skywalker and Obi-Wan, and tell them about all that. Dager, you and Cell will come with me, to scout ahead. Got it. Cell, we have a job to do. Get the speeders. The clone nodded, and soon, Ahsoka, Dager, and him left the camp, speeding to the set of coordinates. We are only going to watch, understood. After seeing how many they are, and what they are, we decide whether we attack or not. The two clones acknowledged her words quietly. Three people were in no way a proper attack force, even if one of them was a Jedi and the other two amongst the best soldiers in the galaxy. After a few hours, the three arrived at the sector to where the probe droid was supposed to go. They spotted a large dust cloud from a long distance away, and slowed down. Lowering his macro binoculars, Dager analyzed the separatist group. Just like they suspected, it was a small convoy, with about a hundred droids as escort. Batteries and ammunition, Commander Tano. Wait. There is something else in the middle. A vehicle of some sort. Not military. Um. What can it be? Maybe they are transporting someone important, sir. With just a hundred units? It almost escaped our vigilance. We only got news of it by luck. Maybe that was their objective from the start. What Cell is saying makes sense, Dager. The commander nodded. After confirming which direction the convoy was going, the three got back on their speeders again, and left. When they reached their camp, they found General Skywalker and General Kenobi waiting for them. After they passed on the intel they had just acquired, the two Jedis also agreed the best was to strike soon, and capture whoever was in the convoy. As such, they took advantage of their superior mobility and speed, and reached the Separatist group the afternoon of the next day, now having a group of about 150 troopers. The escort didn't withstand a chance. Having sustained only minimal casualties, they eliminated all the clankers, and Dager followed the Jedis to the fancy vehicle's door. The entire fight, the person inside hadn't shown their face. Chapter 313 A blue lightsaber pierced through the door of the transport, and General Kenobi started cutting a circle through which they could enter. After cleaning up the battlefield, and making sure there weren't any surviving clankers, the clones stood behind the Jedis, looking at the vehicle. They too were curious about who the important person inside was. Of course, that didn't mean they didn't take the necessary precautions, such as setting up a perimeter around the convoy. The next few minutes went by quietly as the Jedi cut through the metal slowly. When he was close to finishing, Hell Squad stepped forward, and took position near it. They were always first through the door. Kicking the circle of metal that General Kenobi had cut, Dager waited for a few seconds, but no response came from inside. Lifting two fingers to his men, he pointed forward, and brained through a droid popper, after which Dager and Cell immediately dove inside, weapons ready. Two commando droids were twitching on the floor, thanks to the electromagnetic pulse grenade. After making sure there were no other threats, Dager stepped forward, and executed the clankers with a point-blank laser to the head. One could never be too careful when dealing with commando droids. Clear. You can come in, generals. The inside of the vehicle was empty, apart from the two droids. There was definitely something weird about the whole thing, however. Why hadn't the clankers joined the fight? And why were they traveling in a fancy transport, with mats, sculptures, and paintings? Just two droids? It looks like that, is it, Commander Tano? Maybe it was a decoy? To distract us while the real target escaped? Maybe. But I can feel something. Do you feel it too, Anakin? Yes, Master. I don't know what it is. The two Jedis kept their conversation going, but, at the same time, walked softly towards one of the sofas. With a quick sweep from a lightsaber, the piece of furniture was cutting in half, revealing an Imodian hiding. You could have chosen a better spot, my friend. Get him out of there. Three four and Metal walked forward, and pulled up the green-skinned being, who squealed in fear. 
They dragged him outside, where the separatist showed to be even more of a coward. When he saw all the clones, he crumbled to the floor, hiding behind Cell, who was not at all gentle with him, and threw him forward, dragging him in the sand. If the decision was up to the clones, they would execute the separatist without a second thought. Cell, that's enough. Kicks, Notch, Guard, see if there is anything useful inside the transport. While the three clones entered the vehicle, the Jedis walked forward to talk with the Nemodian. Hell Squad stepped back, to give them room. Who are you, and where were you going? I, I. I will never tell you anything, J.E. Jedi. With a sigh, General Kenobi waved his hand in front of the Separatist, and repeated the question. This time, with his eyes blurred because of the Force, he answered. My name is Kato Talong. I'm going to the capital. To do what? Deliver important information to our forces there. The Jedi's exchanged a surprised glance, while Dager frowned. For a moment, he thought he saw a glint of a cunning light flash on the Separatist's eyes. But then, he was back to having his mind controlled by the Force. Why did you travel with just a small escort? To deceive the Republic. What is the information you had to deliver? Wait. What are you doing to me? Ignoring Cato, the Jedi's moved a little away to talk. They already got what they wanted. Without the need for an order, Dager and Tech entered the vehicle again, searching for the intel the Separatist talked about. What? Stop. Don't shoot. They had barely stepped inside when yells and screams came from outside, General Skywalker's voice was louder than the others. Dejer turned around to find the Separatist holding what looked like a switch or a trigger, his finger already pressing it. The clones all had their blasters aimed at Kato, but couldn't fire. If they did, whatever was connected to the trigger would blow up the moment Kato's finger lifted. What are you doing? You are going to eliminate yourself. Scum. Republic dogs. You think you are better than us just because you can use those tricks of yours. For years the Republic suppressed us, just because we didn't bend our knees to you. Not anymore, Jedis. Get down. The moment the Separatists started laughing maniacally, they all knew he was suicidal. If he wasn't bluffing, then the convoy was rigged with explosives, and no one was willing to take chances. Unfortunately, they didn't have much time to get away. The explosion eliminated the three 212th clones who were inside the transport immediately, and threw Dager and Tech meters away. The two were lucky they weren't inside yet, and had time to run a few meters, before everything was blown to kingdom come. Still, Dager felt pain in his left leg, and knew it was broken. Around him, clones and Jedis were all on the ground, their ears still ringing. But it wasn't over yet. Out of nowhere, a giant crack appeared on the ground, sucking the sand and two unlucky troopers around it. Before anyone could even get up, the rift expanded, leading to a dark abyss. The Separatist was one of the first to disappear inside it, followed by Ahsoka, Commander Cody, Metal, Cell, and dozens of other clones. Dejer tried to get up as he saw the crack approaching him, but he fell again when he tried to put weight on his leg. Behind him, Tech was swallowed by the abyss, and Dejer soon joined him. The light disappeared and came back time and time again, as he spun in the air. His instincts prompted him to try and grab the wall near to him, but all he did was slow his fall a little. At some point, something hit his head, and he fell unconscious. When he woke up again, he realized he couldn't see anything. There was something heavy covering him, and, as he struggled to get it off, he noticed it was sand. After uncovering the top half of his body, he turned on the lights on his helmet, ignoring the pain in his leg. The explosion had broken it, and the fall made it worse, but Dager had long become immune to pain. The first thing he saw when the flashlight was turned on was Kato Talong. The Separatist was a few centimeters above Dager, blood trickling down his mouth, and falling into the sand. Two-thirds of his body were crushed by a giant boulder. Groaning, Dejer looked to the sides, and saw the body of one of his brothers half buried in the sand. With a quick glance, he was able to confirm there was nothing to do for him. Rocks, pieces of droids, and a lot of sand covered the bottom of the rift that he had fallen into. The walls were a dozen meters apart from each other at the bottom, 
but they got closer the higher one went. Still, he couldn't see an exit, and everywhere he looked was darkness. Chapter 314 Generals Ahsoka Brain, Tech Can anyone hear me? No answer came from the darkness around him. They were either unconscious or dead, and he didn't like to think about the second option. What he had to do now was get up, and look for them, as well as a way to get out of wherever he was. Of course, his comm link had broken when he fell, so he couldn't even contact them. Feeling his left leg with his hands, Dager found out it was broken in two spots. His head was also throbbing with pain, and his entire body was sore. Judging by the chest pain he was feeling when exhaling, he had at least one or two cracked ribs, although not broken. Even with his willpower, he wouldn't be able to stand up by himself. The mind wanted to, but the body couldn't. Looking around, all he found were pieces on clankers. Their E5s were too short to work as a crutch. His own DC-15A was nowhere to be seen. In the end, after a lot of stumbling and crawling around, Dager found a cabinet that belonged to the Nimodian. With a few slashes of his vibroblade, the only weapon he still had, since it was strapped to his back when he fell, he made a rudimentary crutch. Ugh. Groaning in pain, he stood up, chose a direction, and started walking. Before leaving, he didn't forget to pick up one of the droid's blasters. He would feel naked without a weapon. Brain grabbed his head in pain. It was still buzzing from the explosion, and following tremors. He had hit his head multiple times, and his helmet was the sole reason he was alive. The result was that it was now all bashed in and cracked. A sharp pain on his back when he tried to move told him that he had either broken or dislocated something. Still, he could be considered lucky. Several of his brothers had died, while many were gravely wounded. Some of the unluckiest ones had ended up under giant rocks, and died shortly after. Stay still, brain, let me have a look. Go see the others first, three four. And don't worry about me, I wouldn't be able to move even if I wanted to. Okay. The medic stepped away, miraculously unharmed after everything that had happened. Meanwhile, Brain was looking around, taking note of everyone who was still alive, and searching for danger. His commander and tech had been the closest to the explosion, and there was no way to tell whether they were still alive or not. Anyone still has a working comm link? Several heads shook negatively. Brain sighed. Of course there weren't. It would be too easy otherwise, and he had long learned that when something could go wrong, it would. All right, then. What about the Jedis? Any idea where they are? No clue, brain. We all got separated when we fell in. Whatever this is. But Commander Cody is here. Gritting his teeth, brain turned around to where Five's voice was coming from, and saw Commander Cody unconscious on the floor, his right arm bent unnaturally, and his head wrapped in a bandage that was already becoming red. Seeing that he was the highest in command there, Brain quickly started yelling orders. He wasn't Hell Squad's second in command for nothing. He told the clones around him to take care of the wounded, which they had been doing from the start, and ordered the troopers who only had light injuries to go searching for others. Be careful. If you find others, bring them here, and if you can't, come back as quickly as possible to call for help. And don't get lost. Seeing his orders being carried out, Brain lay back on the ground, turned off the flashlight on his broken helmet, and closed his eyes to wait for 3-4. Where are you, Commander? Ack. Who is there? Stumbling his way through the darkness, Dager eventually saw a green light. As he got closer, he recognized one of Ahsoka's lightsabers, and her voice. Commander Dager, kid. Thank the Force. I'm stuck here. The Padawan was on the ground, half buried under rocks, pebbles, and sand. One of her hands was holding a lightsaber, while the other, and the arm connected to it, was beneath a piece of metal, from one of the Separatist transports. Let me see what I can do, man. But I'm not in a very good shape. Ignoring the pain from his leg, Dager laid his back against one of the walls, for support, and grabbed the piece of metal. As soon as he moved it, a groan escaped Ahsoka's mouth. Careful. I think my arm is broken. 
Try to push it using your powers, Commander Tano. I will pull. On three. One. Two. Three. Ugh. After a few seconds, the debris moved. Dager's arms trembled, and his vision started going black, because of the effort in his wound, but eventually, Ahsoka was freed. You aren't looking too good, Dager. Are you sure you can walk? You aren't in a good shape either, kid. We each got our broken limbs, don't worry about me too much. I've been through worse. The Padawan let out a dry laugh, and supported Dager with her good arm, letting the other hang uselessly at her side. Do you know where Cell and Metal are? They were near you when that rift. We are here, Commander. He hadn't even finished speaking when Tech's voice rang out. The clone came out of the darkness, following the light that came from Dager's helmet. He too had a broken arm, but apart from that, he seemed okay. How are you, Tech? I could have used your help to lift that thing. Sorry, sir. I only woke up because of the noise you made. Metal, Cell, Rex, KYP, and Aeon are still unconscious. Guts and Harv are dead. Trapper is dead too. And who knows how many others. But at least that separatist idiot died too. Ahsoka was too tired to care about how Dager treated the dead Nimodian. She was more interested in how they had ended up on their current predicament. Do you think he knew that would happen? I doubt it, ma'am. He just wanted to destroy the intel, to keep us from getting our hands on it. It must have been really important, if he was willing to sacrifice himself. This hole was probably just caused by the tremors. If we don't find an exit soon, he will have his revenge. Wounded like we are, I don't think we can climb up. Tech looked up for the first time, to find only darkness. I don't think climbing up is a good idea. We can't have fallen too far, otherwise we would have all been dead. If we can't see any light, not even stars, then this. Rift. Must have closed up again. We will think of that later. Now, Dager, Tech, wake up the others. I will search for my other lightsaber. We can't be the only ones that survived. First of all, let's find the others. Yes, Commander Tano. You heard her, Tech, wake them up. No sleeping on the job. Chapter 315 Wake up, brother. Slowly, he opened his eyes, and was greeted by darkness. Amidst the dark, there were a few flashes of light, which showed him the faces of a few other clones. Ugh. Where am I? I would tell you if I knew it, Jesse. Sitting up, Jesse noticed General Skywalker's Padawan, Ahsoka Tano, was also with the clones. Captain Rex, two members of the 212th, and four of Hell Squad were looking at him. What happened? When the Setpai blew himself up, he also opened some kind of cave system, and we fell in. You hit the sand on your way down. Burnout wasn't so lucky. The one who spoke was Cell. He was limping, and being supported by Tech, who had a broken arm. Following the direction the scout's head pointed, he saw one of his brothers laying face down on the ground. His visor was cracked, and his head. It wasn't a pretty scene. Come on, Jesse. We have to find the others. Can you walk? I think my shoulder is dislocated, though. We will see about that later. Jesse only nodded, not complaining. Dager had a broken leg, and yet, he wasn't even frowning, so how could he? How many fell? We don't know. All our comlinks broke, so we can't enter in contact with them. But I think we all did. Mine is still operational, sir. I don't know for how long, however. It's pretty damaged. When he said that, everyone turned to him. They had seen the cracked comlink, so they thought it wasn't working, like theirs. Give it to me. Master, can you hear me? Obi-Wan. Anyone there? No need to yell, Snips. I'm here. Just. A little battered. Obi-Wan is here too, but I can't get him to wake up. General Skywalker's shaky voice answered his Padawan, and she let out a sigh of relief. Can you activate your tracker? I will try. Hold on, 
Master. I'm coming. Following the increasingly strong signal that Jesse's comlink was receiving, the group found where the two Jedis were. Midway, one of the clones of the 501st sent by Brain found them, but, before joining the others, they decided to help General Skywalker and General Kenobi. The Jedis had ended up buried beneath tons of boulders and stones. It was only by using the Force to create some kind of dome that General Skywalker was able to save himself and General Kenobi. Just wait a little longer, Master Skywalker. We will start removing the rocks. How are you and Master Obi-Wan? I'm okay. Obi-Wan hit his head hard, but he will pull through. Kite and Drum are wounded too. Fluke didn't make it. Delegating the job of removing the smaller stones to the clones, Ahsoka started using the force to make the bigger ones levitate. Luckily, her broken arm didn't affect her abilities with this mysterious power. Deja was forced to stay out of this one, since he could barely stand up. Deciding not to waste time, he started to head to where Brain and the majority of his brothers were, bringing the other wounded with him. When his right-hand man saw how Deja looked, all he did was give a salute. The commander shrugged, unable to hide a grin. Only clones could look at each other in such a battered and wounded state, and think it was normal. How are you, sir? Nothing too much, 3-4. A broken leg and a few fractured ribs. Take a look at Rex, Metal, and Aeon first. General Kenobi will also arrive soon, with a nasty head injury. Roger that, sir. I would tell you to stay still and wait, but you aren't going to do that, are you? The medic knew Dager too well. However, this time he was wrong. For the last hours, Dager had walked with a broken leg, and helped Ahsoka. Even if he wanted to, his body couldn't go any longer, now that it had somewhere to rest. Come here, brain. I need a report. Got it, commander. We have 33 troopers here, most wounded to some degree. 45, with the ones that came with you. How many dead? 65. Make that 69. Fluke, Guts, Harve, and Trapper are dead too. Brain nodded, a defeated look on his face. So many dead, all because the Separatist had decided to do an attack. Putting his hand on Brain's shoulder, to calm him down, Dager gestured for him to continue. 36 are still missing, plus that Separatist scum. Don't worry about him. His body was the first thing I saw when I woke up. He deserved it. Luckily, wherever we are isn't very big. I've sent troopers to do some recon, and they said most paths are dead ends. You did good, brain. Now, we need to focus on finding a way out of here before we run out of batteries for the lights. Or supplies. We already didn't have much to start with, and most of it ended up buried. The filters on the helmets will give us the air we need, but without rations or water, we won't survive very long. The commander nodded. Of course he had already thought of that. However, he hoped they would find an exit soon. The basis of his hope was that the cave system couldn't be too deep, otherwise no one would have survived the fall, even if it was cushioned by sand and tilted walls. Don't think about that for now. There is no danger down here, so tell anyone who isn't occupied to grab some rest. Will do, Commander. I don't know if we will be able to, however. I know, Brain. I also don't like the idea of having nightmares now. But I need the men to stay strong, and they won't be able to do so if they stay awake for days. The Grenadier sighed. Of course the soldiers knew that. But sleeping in this place. He didn't like it. All he could think was of how many of his brothers were buried beneath tons of rocks, never to be found. He knew he would see them on his dreams. But they were all experienced troopers, with hundreds of battles under their belts. They were clear on the importance of resting when you could. Two days went by in the darkness of the underground. Anyone who was still alive had been found, while those who weren't. There was nothing they could do for them. Their comlinks couldn't reach anyone on the surface, and, although search parties were sent after them, there was no result. Seeing that, the higher-ups declared them missing in action, and proceeded with the grand offensive. It couldn't stop because three Jedis and two hundred men were missing. 
And it was about the grand offensive that Hell Squad was talking right now. It was weirdly funny for them that they wouldn't be able to take part in a plan created by Dager. Do you think it already started, Commander? It was set for yesterday. It's a pity we won't be able to see it through. I wouldn't be so sure, Commander Dager. Come with me. We might have found an exit. Ahsoka interrupted the clones, and Dager was on his feet in a split second. Being helped by Baron, they followed the Padawan through dark tunnels, until they joined General Kenobi, General Skywalker, Fives, and Jesse. They were all looking at a pile of rubble. There it is. Our hope of getting out of here. Chapter 316 At first, when the Jedis told him that the pile of rocks was their way out, Dager thought they were going crazy. There were tons upon tons of boulders stacked there. But when he felt the current of air passing through the cracks, he finally understood what the Jedis meant. But how are we going to get all of this out of the way? Hard work, Jesse. Everyone who is able will start removing the smaller stones, while we three will concentrate on the bigger ones. We will have to be careful not to cause a landslide. On it, General Skywalker. I will bring the others. Soon, twenty or so clones arrived. They were the ones who only had light wounds, and no broken bones. The others, like Dager, had to hesitantly lay back on the walls, and just watch. They didn't like to stay still, but didn't have much of an option. At some point, Dager fell asleep, exhausted. 3-4 had no medical supplies to work with, so Dager's leg was just immobilized by a piece of wood. There was nothing they could do about his ribs, other than let it heal on their own. As such, every move he made caused pain, even if his face didn't show it. But, as a veteran soldier, he was used to waking up at the slightest sound, and ready for battle. Only, this time the enemy wasn't someone he could fight. Get away. Huge parts of the cave were collapsing, probably because the Jedis had used the force to move a rock they shouldn't have it was already dark before, and, with the dust that was lifted, he could barely see one meter ahead of him, even with the flashlight. Somewhere in front of him, he heard a yell of pain. One of his brothers had been hit by a falling rock. Scrambling to his feet, Dager did his best to run. There was nothing he could do to help the others, at least not now. He didn't know for how long the landslide went on. The noise was deafening, and he couldn't see anything. Small pebbles hit his armor, and sometimes he would see the white armor of a clone briefly, before they disappeared in the darkness once again. Forcing himself to get up, he walked to the sources of the other lights he saw. The troopers seemed shocked, but mostly unharmed. Clearing his throat, he started calling out names. Three didn't answer. Damn it. Rex, Fives, get some men, and search for them. The two clones looked at him for a moment, knowing fully well that the three clones were already dead and buried. Dager knew it too, obviously. But they still had to try. General Skywalker, General Kenobi, Commander Tano, how are you? Sore, but okay, Dager. But we have a real problem now. Our only shot at leaving this place is now buried, even more than before. The clone didn't say anything. It was the Jedi's fault, and they knew it. They had been too rushed, and caused the death of three more soldiers. Of course, he would never say that out loud. Just thinking about it went against all the discipline and respect for hierarchy on his blood, but it had been a long time since he gave that much importance to those. The last time was probably when he was a cadet, still thinking that winning the war would be easy. We found debt, Dager. He was already dead. No sign of data and not. The commander slowly nodded. Gesturing with his head to Hell Squad, he started walking back to the big cave that had become their temporary camp, and now, their tomb. Help the generals. Tech, you go ahead, and make an inventory of what we have let's see how long we can last. The Jedis didn't contest Dager. They were too tired and guilty to do so. Their only hope was now lost, and they were the culprits. Three weeks passed, painfully slowly. That day was when they ran out of water. The clones didn't have any qualms with dying, since that was a constant threat, but they always thought they would do so with a weapon in their hands. To die like that, 
stuck in a hole in some forsaken corner of the galaxy, seemed wasteful. The grand offensive must be over now. I wonder if we won. For what matters, I believe it worked, fives. The commander's plans rarely fail. But it's a pity we weren't there. I would have liked to eliminate a few more seppies. Several heads nodded, although no one could see them. The batteries had died after one week. However, by now, they were all used to the darkness, and even without being able to see anything, could find their way through the cave system. Dager, Brain, Cell, Tech, Dab, Metal, 3-4, Captain Rex, Commander Cody, Jesse, and Fives were sitting together, talking. That was all they could do. Destroying a few more clankers would have been satisfying, that's for sure. I don't know about that. Do you really want to go back to all the deaths and war? We already did a lot more than it was expected of us. There was a startled silence after Dager spoke. He was the last person they would have expected to say such words. What do you mean? Don't get me wrong. If I had the choice, would also prefer to be put there, fighting. But I can't stop thinking about all our brothers. How many more will die before this hellish war ends? But we were created for this, Commander. Many more will die if we don't fight. And, one day, the war will end. It can't go on forever. And what will we do after? You said it yourself, Dab. We were created for war, and nothing else. And. For us, it will never truly end. It will always be in our heads. An eerie silence fell upon the clones when they heard that. For a long time, no one said anything. It was only when General Kenobi approached them, followed by General Skywalker and his Padawan, that the silence was broken. Gentlemen, I believe it's time we try our last resort. None of the clones said anything. The Jedis couldn't see them, but they knew they all had a resolute gaze in their faces, as they put on their helmets. We waited all this time in the hope that we would be found. It didn't happen, and I doubt it will happen now. So, either we will bury ourselves, or we will die of thirst. Or we will find our way out. All the clones looked in the direction of General Kenobi's voice, and got up. They could have tried their desperate plan a long time ago, but odds were that they would eliminate themselves by doing it. As such, they held back. But now, they would die anyway, and there was no way to avoid the truth. So, every trooper was of the opinion that it was best to try one more time. Brain, Prep the Detonators. Chapter 317 In the total darkness, about forty-five clones followed the three Jedis. In those three weeks underground, more and more soldiers perished due to untreated wounds. Unfortunately, there was nothing 3-4 and the other medic could do. They didn't have enough medical supplies, enough water, enough anything. When they got to their objective, the same place where they first tried to escape, the Jedis turned on their lightsabers, providing a small amount of light. Brain. Grunting slightly, Hell Squad's second-in-command stepped forward, and started feeling the rocks and boulders with his hands, looking for any crevice. It wasn't difficult to find them. After deciding which ones were the best for what they wanted to do, he pulled several dozens of thermal detonators from the backpacks that the troopers behind him handed to him. Of course the detonators, the last thing someone would want to have in an unstable cave system, were what they had the most. But now, at least, they would play an important role in their life or death gamble. In about twenty minutes, the explosives were all attached to the walls. Dager then watched as the three dim lights that represented General Kenobi, General Skywalker, and Ahsoka Tano, moved forward, before disappearing. Their plan was simple use the thermal detonators to blow up the rocks and boulders that had covered the exit, while the Jedis would be responsible for keeping the cave from collapsing. The chances of it working were near zero, which was why they waited for so long before trying it, in the vain hope that someone would find them. No clone was afraid of dying, but they also wouldn't follow a plan that would almost certainly eliminate them, unless they had no other option. Everyone ready? We always are, General. Then, hit it. Brain. Hesitating for a fraction of a section, the grenadier pressed the trigger. The explosions lit up the cave with a blinding light, and a deafening noise left the ears of the soldiers buzzing. 
After the flash of light disappeared, the clones realized that they could still see. Rays of sunlight shone into the cave, as rocks floated, creating a tunnel. More rocks and dust fell from the ceiling by the second, making the Jedi's grunt as they advanced slowly, maintaining with the Force their only path to survival. Cell, fives, go, go, go. Barely hearing Commander Cody, the two clones had already sprinted through the precarious tunnel. They were the contingency plan. In case the others got trapped again, they would seek help as quickly as possible. Luckily, that wasn't necessary. Albeit shaking and sweating, General Skywalker, General Kenobi, and Ahsoka managed to keep the cave system from collapsing on top of them for long enough for everyone to leave. Dragging a wounded 501st trooper with him, Dager put one of his hands in front of his eyes. They had spent three weeks inside the damned underground, and the light of day was blinding. It would take time to get used to it again. When he felt he was on the surface again, and only the sky was above him, Dager let out a sigh of relief. Hell Squad and he had faced countless near-death situations, but none as scary as this one. His relief didn't last long, however. As his vision returned, and the buzzing in his hearing faded away, he noticed they weren't alone. The characteristic noise of metal scrapping against metal, and the blurry outlines of droids made him try to reach for his pistol and vibroblade. Before he could do so, he was kicked in the chest, and fell down, a commando droid aiming a blaster at his head. Republic troopers, stand down. Dager was already moving before General Kenobi's words reached him. He kicked the clanker's ankle, which made his recently healed leg ache, but caused the droid to fall. Despite the pain, he was on his feet in a split second, his vibroblade piercing through the commando droid's head, and into the ground. He was about to pick up his DC-17, but stopped when he heard the Jedi yell. Looking around, he quickly found the reason. Several hundred droids, mostly B-1 units, were surrounding them. For some reason, they hadn't retaliated, even after Dager's counterattack. Searching with his eyes, he noticed Cell, Dab, 3-4, Tech, Fives, Captain Rex, and Commander Cody had also taken down a droid each, and held their bodies as precarious shields. Let go of them. We are in no position to resist. Unwillingly, Dager pulled out his weapon from the twitching clanker, and put it back on its sheath. The others, upon hearing General Skywalker, hesitated for a second before dropping the droids' bodies, and throwing away their blasters. The Jedis also turned off their lightsabers, Ahsoka slower than the two fully-fledged Jedis. Well done, Master Jedi, well done. If you decided to resist, I would have been forced to eliminate you all, which would have been a pity. I am so very interested in how and why do you come from the ground in such ragged state. Smiling and laughing, a co-arrivar, a repugnant species with dark green skin, long nails, and entirely black eyes, pushed aside two droids, to face the Republic group. Dager immediately recognized him as Passel Arjant, magistrate of the Corporate Alliance, and one of the most important Separatist leaders. If you really want to know, Separatist scum, we got trapped by one of your friends. He didn't live long enough to gloat, however. Quiet, snips. Frowning, Arjant gestured to one of the commando droids besides him. Instantly, several droids walked forward, and violently cuffed the Republic group. Dager and his brothers would have liked to resist, but General Kenobi stopped them once again. Bring the Jedis, the two ARC troopers, and anyone whose rank is lieutenant or above with us. Oh, and that squad too. I believe you must be Hell Squad, and you, Commander Dager, right? Count Dooku told me many interesting things about you. The clone didn't answer, and let himself be pushed by the clankers. Not liking the lack of respect Dager showed him, Arjant nodded to the leader of his escort, and the commando droid punched him in the stomach. Already weakened by the month underground, Dager wasn't able to keep his knees from bending, and fell face first to the ground. Still, he didn't make a sound. We are prisoners of war, Passel. We are to be treated accordingly. You almost makes me laugh, Master Kenobi. But you are right. You will be treated accordingly. Just not as you think. Captain, can we continue? The co arrivar smiled maliciously to the three Jedis, and turned around to enter his vehicle again. 
It was by a stroke of luck that he happened to pass by just as the Republic group appeared. He would surely be rewarded when he brought back three Jedis and several important enemy troops. What about the other? Clones, sir. Looking at the thirty or so normal troopers, most of them wounded, Arjant's smile grew wider. He loved that part of the job. We have no use for them. Eliminate them all. No. Idiot. The struggles of the Jedis and clones were useless. The sound of blasters being fired rang out, before everything was silent again. Chapter 318 No. Dajer struggled to free himself from his handcuffs, and from the two commando droids escorting him, but all he got was a punch to the back of the head. Behind him, he heard the noise of his brothers being dragged towards an area of open ground, the wounded yelling in pain as the clankers showed no empathy. For a few seconds, he heard the sound of bones breaking as flesh hit cold metal, but the attempts of his brothers to resist were useless. When the sound of lasers cut the air, calmness resumed. Dajer wasn't even able to look at his brothers as they were merciless executed. After a month buried alive, they had finally found hope, only to have it crushed again by the Separatist. If they had at least been able to fight back, and take a few droids down with them. But General Kenobi's order to surrender had been their downfall. Arg. A clone screamed in agony while a medical droid used all kinds of drugs on him. Even in different cells, the captured troopers could hear him. Eventually, the clone fainted, without saying anything useful to their captors. The droid wasn't phased by it, and moved on to the next victim. He had been torturing them for days now, to no avail. Each one of the Republic soldiers that Passel Arjant captured were battle-hardened veterans, who had been through and experienced everything the Separatist could throw at them. Simple torture wasn't enough to make them open their mouths. When it was his turn again, Dajer simply snorted, which prompted Arjant to punch him. The Separatist leader had always prided himself in being able to recover useful intel from war prisoners, but none of his methods worked against these clones. Especially the seven who used brownish-red armor. No matter how he tortured them, they wouldn't make a single sound. What Arjant didn't know was that Hell Squad could resist even Asajj Ventress and her master, and even force Sith Lords to retreat. Of course, Count Dooku wouldn't let his underlings learn of such shameful facts. As such, the Koarivar kept needlessly interrogating the clones, instead of putting an end to their misery. After using every method at his disposal to obtain intel from Dajer, but failing, Arjant left the room with the medical droid. He would try again the next day. He didn't believe that a simple clone could withstand weeks and months of interrogation. One day, Dajer would crack, and he would be there to listen to it. Are you awake, Dajer? I'm here. It took a few seconds for the commander to regain enough consciousness to groan and answer Commander Cody. How long did you say it would take for them to find us? How many days has it been? Nine. Or ten. Twelve, sir. Less than a week, then. Hunter is good with tracks, he won't lose us. All we gotta do is wait. There was a collective sigh when his brothers heard him. The fact that they could withstand torture didn't mean they were indifferent to it. Another week of this hell would pass slowly. In a well-lit, albeit poorly furnished, room, General Skywalker, General Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano sat on the ground, eyes closed. They were prisoners, but, compared to the clones, their conditions were much better. When the door opened, and Passel Arjant entered, the three Jedis opened their eyes to glare at him menacingly. They had the ability to eliminate him, but didn't dare to do so, not when the lives of Dajer and the other clones were at stake. The ones who had been executed days ago were already too heavy of a weight on their conscience. Comfortable. Humph. None of the Jedis answered him with anything other than a snort. Seeing they remained so arrogant even when they were his prisoners made Arjant angry. If it wasn't because of Count Dooku's orders to leave the Jedis unharmed, he would have already started torturing them. He was sure they wouldn't last nearly as long as the soldiers under their command. It would only take a few rounds of torture for them to fall from their high pedestal. Without saying anything more, the Separatist turned around and left. As soon as the door closed, the three people in the room looked at each other worriedly. 
still no interrogation. Why? Someone must have ordered that we weren't touched. But for what reason? The Padawan's question couldn't be answered by either of the Jedi's. All they could do was wait, powerless. Master, I don't understand why we must keep Kenobi and the other two alive. They are a risk to us. You don't have to understand, my old apprentice, only obey. They mustn't be harmed. I have great plans for them. Especially young Skywalker. Kaka Kaka. With a click noise, the transmission was interrupted, and the hooded figure disappeared. Count Dooku closed his eyes, his face stone cold. His mind, however, was working hard, trying to decipher his master's plan. It was useless. No matter how much thought he put into it, he couldn't arrive at a logical conclusion. Unless. His eyebrows furrowed in shock as he thought of something. It couldn't be. But Darth Sidious' interest in Anakin Skywalker only left that possibility. Impossible. It must be something else. My lord. A droid beside him inched closer, thinking that Count Dooku was talking to him. Quiet. An explosion of force sent the unfortunate droid flying towards the wall, and it didn't get up. Count Dooku, indifferent to what he just did, paced around his room nervously. He pushed his dangerous thoughts to the back of his mind, telling himself it couldn't be true. Unaware of the dark currents moving underneath the apparently simple Clone Wars, a group of four clones was analyzing the location where Dager and the others were captured by the Separatist. What do you think, sir? Hunter didn't answer immediately. Instead, he got down to a knee, and used one of his vibroknives, a weapon Dager taught him how to use, to cut open the torso of a commando droid. Then, he picked up a small device, flashing blue. A tracker. That was Dager's doing. A long time passed already, but I can still feel an interference in the magnetic field around here. There is a cave below us. As he said that, he pointed towards a pile of rocks, the tunnel the Jedi's made, and that collapsed after they quit maintaining it. Wrecker smiled, and got to work. In a few minutes, he had thrown aside boulders bigger than himself, revealing the cave system. After Crosshair and Hunter explored it, and found several bodies, as well as signs that the Republic group that disappeared almost two months ago had been there the entire time, they contacted the higher-ups. How do you know they are still alive? The tracks show that the Separatist convoy that passed by here left with more people than it arrived. Also, we found many of our brothers, all regs. They were executed. No officers, which means they were taken. And Dager told us that they were captured. Um. How? Hunter picked the tracker that Bad Batch's tech threw to him, and showed it to General Windu's hologram. We couldn't pick up the signal before, because it was underground. When they got back to the surface, we started receiving it again, which is why we came to investigate. Deja knew we would do that, but left the tracker here, stuffed inside a clanker's body, so the Seppis wouldn't find it. He wouldn't have bothered doing so if he knew he was going to die. That can only mean he knew he was going to be searched, which leads to them having surrendered. Knowing Deja, he probably was ordered to do so by one of the generals he had with him. Hunter explained everything he deduced in a single breath. Most of it actually came from Tech's brain. Can you discover where they went? They didn't hide their tracks. Then find them, and rescue our people. I will send Commander Apo with two battalions to help you. Got it, General Windu. Bad Batch is going hunting. Chapter 319 Moaning, Captain Rex woke up. It took him a while to remember where he was, and what was happening, but the energy chains holding him made his memory come back quickly. He must have fallen unconscious after another round of interrogation. As he rotated slowly, he saw a black medical droid injecting metal with something. The drug, or whatever it was, must have caused a lot of pain, because the heavy machine gunner trembled and started sweating profusely. Still, the corners of his mouth curled up, and he spat at the droid. You gotta try something better, Tin Can. This trick is getting old. Ack. Holding back a grunt, Metal mocked the droid. The machine, unable to understand sarcasm, continued working unperturbed, but was unable to get anything from the clone. 
Metal was almost as stubborn as his squad leader. Captain Rex lost sight of Metal as the energy chains forced him to rotate. To his other side was Jesse. The ARC trooper was awake, but silent. He seemed fully concentrated on something. Knowing him, Captain Rex was sure Jesse was devising some kind of plan. It was then that alarms started blasting off. The medical droid was confused by it for a few seconds, but then seemed to receive an order. Putting away the syringe he had been holding, he reached out for a blaster pistol, and aimed it at metal. When a base was about to fall in enemy hands, separatist protocol dictated that an eliminate all order was to be instated, for reasons that don't need to be explained. All the clones knew that, and had never had much faith in their lives. When Dager left the tracker, he knew that Bad Batch would find them, but what he wanted wasn't to be saved, but revenge. But, just as the clanker was about to squeeze the trigger, the door of the cell was blasted open, and a clone wearing black and red armor ran in. Using his two vibranives, Hunter cut the medical droid into three pieces, before proceeding to free metal, Jesse, and Captain Rex. You sure took your time, Hunter. Did Bad Batch get the others? Using the sergeant as support to stand up, Metal grimaced slightly. He was very weak, but he felt a lot better when he kicked the droid aside, and picked up the blaster pistol. A trooper without a weapon in hands felt naked. Yep. But we gotta move fast. Wrecker got a little excited, and threw a droidica a tad too far, making the alarms go off earlier than we wanted. Letting out a dry laugh, Metal picked up his armor, which had been thrown in the corner of the cell, and then stepped out of the room where he had been kept for over two weeks. As soon as he did so, he saw Dager, Cell, Tech, 3-4, Brain, and Dab. Hell Squad was already holding weapons bad batches Tech had handed to them. How are you, Metal? Leaving the clone to talk to his squad, Captain Rex helped Jesse, and went to check on Fives, Commander Cody, and the members of the 212th and 501st. He paused slightly to look at the four weird clones that had come to their rescue. He couldn't remember when, but he had heard the name Bad Batch before. Now, however, he was too tired to think about it. All he knew was that they must be as crazy as Hell Squad if they dared to attempt to free them just with four troopers. Ah, that's better. Slashing the air around him with the vibroblade that Hunter handed to him, Dager felt a lot more comfortable. As unorthodox and mostly inefficient in a battle as the weapon was, he liked it. Just shooting a seppai wasn't as satisfying as cutting their heads off. What is the extraction plan, Hunter? Show them, Tech. Nodding, the hyperactive member of Clone Force 99 brought up a hologram of the base they were in. Commander Apo has two battalions creating a diversion on the east side of the facility. Our exit is to the north. But we still gotta find the Jedis. Leave it to Hell Squad. Yeah. We need a stretch. Knowing fully well what Dager would say, Brain and Cell were already grinning. The weeks of torture hadn't dimmed down their spirits. In fact, it only made their desire for revenge stronger. Cody and Rex, you take the others to the exit. Bad Batch comes with us. No time to discuss, Cody. Jesse, Wildcat, and Bronze are too weak. They will need help to walk. The 212th Legion commander sighed in resignation. Dager's tone left no room for any disagreement, and there was something on his words that made others obey him, even a commander. For a brief second, Commander Cody's mind flashed back to a conversation he had with Commander Keeley on the Revanter. It was just after the 303rd leader had decided to nominate Dager sub-commander. Cody, wake up. We have to be quick. The commander shook his head, and gave the hologram a last glance, before leading the others to the exit. Meanwhile, Hell Squad and Bad Batch went towards the center of the Seppai base. Dager had seen the Separatists take the Jedis there when they first arrived, and hoped they would still be there. They had barely left the prison block when they met a patrol. Dager and his men were about to shoot, but Bad Batch was faster. Hunter jumped forward, cutting three droids into pieces, while Wrecker grabbed a B-2 super battle droid, and threw it at the patrol. Crosshair, with Bad Batch's tech help, used one laser to eliminate two droids. 
In less than five seconds, the patrol was annihilated. Hell Squad was slightly impressed. They could have eliminated the clankers as fast as Bad Batch, if not faster, but they had three years of experience, while Clone Force 99 barely had two months. Where did you go after Geonosis? Christophsis and Felucia. Two harsh battlegrounds. No wonder Bad Batch had gotten so much better after just two months. And, hearing about Felucia, Dager finally remembered the Grand Offensive. With all that had happened, he had forgotten about it. But, if there were battles going on in Felucia, it meant the Republic was trying to reconquer the planet, what would only happen if Dager's plan had gone right. Although he was curious, Dager had more urgent matters at hand. Once they were safely in Republic territory, he would receive all the information he needed. He was a commander, after all. When the next group of clankers appeared in front of them, Hell Squad sprung into action. The days without fighting didn't appear to have any impact on them. Dab and Cell fired first, almost at the same time, and took down the four droids in the front row. Brain tossed a thermal detonator, and, taking advantage of the explosion, metal, tech, 3-4, and Dager quickly eliminated the remaining clankers, which weren't able to fire a single laser. Stepping over the bodies, the two units ran towards the center of the base. Most of the Separatist garrison must have been locked in a fight with Commander Apo, because they met little resistance. It came as a nice surprise to them when Hell Squad's tech opened a door, and they saw Passel Arjant on the other side. The Separatist leader, who always had a smug and cruel grin on his face, now looked terrified to see the clones he kept captive, free and armed. Chapter 320 the two commando droids that acted as bodyguards for Passel Arjant were quickly eliminated by Dager and Hunter. Both clones used their cold weapons to pierce the droids' necks and rip their heads off. In the same movement, Dager kicked Arjant's knee, breaking it with a sickening sound. The Separatist screamed in pain and fell to the ground. For a moment, the clone felt pleasure in causing pain to the co arrivar but that feeling quickly went away. He wasn't like the Jedis, who controlled their emotions so they didn't feel anger, but he also wasn't a cruel person. He was just a soldier, and although he hated Arjant, he knew that the Sep Pai also was just following orders. That didn't mean he forgave him for killing and torturing his brothers. Pausing for a few seconds, Dejer used the tip of his vibroblade to make another mark in his armor. He was already in the middle of his forearm. Arjant didn't know what the line the clone made meant, neither why he was doing it, but as he stared at the black visors that surrounded him, he knew it was over for him. It was like looking at a deep abyss, the cold eyes under the helmet staring back at him. Dager stretched his hand to crosshair, and Bad Batch's sniper gave him his DC-17. He pressed the muzzle against Arjan's head, and pulled the trigger. Defenseless or not, the co arrivar was an enemy, and he deserved no mercy. The ten clones behind him exchanged glances, surprised, and worried. Well, Bad Batch was worried. Hell Squad was just slightly surprised by Dager's actions. They had done far worse before, so they got over it quickly. Commander Dager. The Jedis wouldn't approve of that. They would have wanted to take Arjant in for questioning. The Jedis aren't here, Hunter. And it's done now. I will take the blame if needs be. Now, let's go. Seeing that Dager clearly wasn't in the mood to discuss it, Bad Batch let go of the matter. Also, it wasn't like they cared about the Separatist, they were just trying to follow what they learned as cadets, don't eliminate a surrendered enemy, bring leaders back for questioning. Dager lead them through the corridors and hallways, until they arrived at a section of the facility with several well-furnished rooms. It was easy to identify on which one the Jedis were, since six B-2 units and one commando droid were guarding it. Dejer quickly fired three lasers, hitting the commando droid two times in the chest, to destabilize it, and them once in the head. 3-4 and Metal followed him by taking down two B-2 super battle droids each, while Crosshair, Hunter, and Cell eliminated the remaining two. Busting the door's control panel with his vibroblade, Dejer opened it to find the three Jedis. And Hunter. So it were you who made all that ruckus. The clones nodded slightly, and Dager urged the Jedis to move quickly. 
Every second they wasted talking could be the difference between life and death. Wait. We need our lightsabers. General Windu thought about that, Commander Tano. Here. From Bad Batch's tech backpack appeared three lightsabers, which he gave to the Jedis. Theirs had obviously been confiscated, and they didn't have the time to look for them. Better than nothing. Anakin, Ahsoka, Dager is right, we really need to get out of here. So, if you don't have anything else to do. General Kenobi's weirdly polite way of talking, considering their circumstances, brought a grin to Dager's face. He might not agree with everything the Jedi thought, or how he behaved in this war, but he liked him. General Kenobi felt for every soldier under him. In a way, he reminded Dager of General D. A flash of green light cut through three droids before returning to the hands of Ragu. Throwing his lightsaber like some kind of boomerang was a trick he had picked up from Count Dooku after the Sith used it against him on Aline. If the Separatist knew that he inadvertently taught another deadly move to a Jedi, he would surely be mad. In the same move, Ragu used the Force to pull back a wounded trooper, and cut in half a droidica. Without stopping, he ran forward, dodging a blast from an AAT, and jumped on top of it. The unexpected weight addition made the tank tilt to the left, crushing two unlucky B-1 droids. Spinning his weapon, Ragu stabbed the AAT's hatch, breaking it open, and pulled out the two crew droids. He didn't pay attention to where they landed. Almost at the same time, a giant blue laser flashed above his head, destroying a hail fire. The vehicle, however, had time to fire a last salvo of missiles, blowing up two at RTS, and killing half a dozen 501st soldiers. Ragu glanced at the bodies for a few seconds before turning away, expressionless. What once would have left him mortified now couldn't even move him. War transformed kind Jedis like him into stone-cold soldiers, and soldiers like the clones in Merciless Killers. General Ragu, Sergeant Hunter wants to talk to you. Patch him through. The disappearance of General Skywalker, General Kenobi, Commander Cody, Captain Rex, and Hell Squad left the troops in Kiros without leadership. Even Commander Apo, a veteran from the First Battle of Geonosis, couldn't control the battle around the entire planet. As such, Ragu had been sent to take control, partially because he had already proven that he had the capability to do so, and partially because he had worked with the 501st and the 212th many times before. It certainly came as a relief when Dager's tracker became active again. It had been horrible to think he had lost Hell Squad, his oldest friends, and last connection to his late master. He wanted to go rescue them himself, but he couldn't abandon his duties. As such, he followed General Windu's decision, and let Bad Batch and Commander Apo handle it. Master Ragu. We are almost reaching your position. Hell Squad went ahead, with a surprise. Instead of Hunter, he heard Ahsoka Tano, General Skywalker's Padawan. He barely paid attention to what she was saying, though. He had already noticed Hell Squad. It was difficult not to, considering they made their entrance by blowing up three hail fires, one AAT, and a few tens of clankers. They were using three AATs, certainly stolen from the same base where they were kept captive. A barely recognizable Republic crest was painted on each tank, probably Cell's handiwork. That way, their brothers would understand they were friendlies, if the amount of havoc they were causing amidst the Separatist wasn't enough. Ragu had a wide smile on his face when he saw Hell Squad. Only them would be crazy and determined enough to join a battle after having vanished for two months, and tortured for who knows how long. Of course, Hell Squad's little surprise couldn't last for long, and they knew that. As soon as the other AATs started to aim at them, they jumped out of the stolen tanks. At this moment, Ragu was already advancing through the battlefield to meet them. Any clanker on his path was cut to pieces. General Ragu, Hell Squad is ready to battle. And to destroy some clankers, sir. I noticed, brain. What happened? A lot, General. We will explain it all later, with General Kenobi, General Skywalker, and Commander Tano. Roger that, Dager. Now, let's see if you guys are still sharp, or if you got rusty after this vacation. Chapter 321 Seeing a laser flying straight towards him, 
Dager dropped to the ground, just in time to avoid a fatal injury. Still, the laser grazed his chest, leaving him gasping for air thanks to the impact. A loud shot rang next to his ear, and he knew Dab had taken care of his attacker. Rolling to the side, and getting up, Dager stopped for a second to look at the battlefield. 300,000 clones were facing about that same amount in clankers, which was rare. Normally, the Separatist had an overwhelming numerical advantage. However, because of the Grand Offensive, the Sepis had been forced to split their forces, and fallen right into the Republic's trap. Thinking that the Republic was at its last breath, which wasn't entirely wrong, the higher-ups of the CIS had taken the retreat of Republic troops from core planets such as Felicia as a sign of surrender. Taking advantage of that false impression, they had diverted the majority of their troops from less important systems to the big targets. It was all the Republic needed. In one single swoop, nine Separatist planets were completely taken, while sixteen others were still experiencing the flames of war, but the Republic had a clear advantage. To make matters worse for the Sepis, the supply lines for the systems they wished so much to take were cut, just as Dager had predicted. Now, it was only a matter of time before Mon Cala, Dantuin, and such were taken back, once and for all. Kiros was one of those planets that was still an active battlefield. Of course, the 600,000 fighters weren't all in a single place, but all over the planet. Only 20,000 Republic soldiers, and 26,000 droids were fighting at Hell Squad's location. That didn't mean the battle was any less intense than anywhere else. Dozens fell every minute, on both sides, some wounded, some eerily silent. Arg. Ah. No. Ignoring the screams of pain and death, Dager analyzed the battlefield. If he had to guess, the clone army had lost about 4,000 soldiers, between dead and wounded, while the Separatists were down by 9,000 clankers. It couldn't be said that the Republic was crushing them, but they certainly were faring much better. Incoming. Hearing Cell yell, Dager looked up, only to see a cluster of missiles flying over his head. Most of them accurately hit an SPHAT, bringing the enormous vehicle down. A few, however, missed the target, and exploded on the ground 30 meters away from Hell Squad's position. In a very familiar situation, Dager was thrown off his feet, and into the air. When he fell, he hit his head hard, and his vision went dark for a few seconds. His ears were buzzing, and, for some time, the sound of battle faded away. Albeit he knew it wasn't advisable to do so, Dager still took off his helmet. The smell of blood and smoke reached his nostrils almost immediately, but he ignored it. Durr. Commander. Slowly, gradually, as his hearing returned, he heard someone calling him. Turning his head made him feel sick, but his instincts and experience took over. He knew he couldn't stay still for too long, or he would get shot. Struggling to get up, he saw 3-4 and Dab doing the same. Metal was the one who was calling him, even as he tried to pull a dead or unconscious brain to cover. He couldn't see either Cell or Tech, but he had other worries at the moment. Picking up a DC-15A, it was unknown whether it was his or someone's else, he fired some lasers towards the clankers. Not bothering to see if he hit something, Dager grabbed Brain's left arm, and, together with Metal, dragged the grenadier until they were behind the burning remains of an ATE. Soon, Dab and 3-4 joined them. How is he? Let me see. Get out of the way, Metal. Dager hadn't said a word yet, even as the medic brusquely shoved Metal aside, so he could examine Brain. His brother wasn't offended, of course. He knew 3-4 was just worried about Brain. Putting his hand on his head, Dager finally realized it was covered in warm blood. It was only when he touched the wound, a gash about six or seven centimeters long, just above his hairline, that the pain decided to show up. Barely holding back a grunt, he blindly looked for a bandage or cloth of some kind in his belt, and used it to clean up the blood, but more kept gushing out. Dab, wrap it up. Sir. Don't worry about it, and let 3-4 take care of brain. Now, bandage it. The sniper had been so focused on brain that only when Dager called him that he noticed the commander's wound. A single cut might not seem like much to a member of Hell Squad, but any head injury was potentially fatal. He almost called 3-4, 
but danger stopped him. To him, Brain's life was more important than his. Hesitantly, Dab did as he was told, wrapping Dejer's head with a bandage that got red almost immediately. Still, it seemed to slow down the bleeding. 3-4, you stay with Brain. Metal, Dab, let's find Cell and Tech. The medic didn't even lift his head to answer Dejer, while the other two nodded. Together, they left their improvised cover. The battle was reaching its peak, as the two sides' brutality collided. Killing four or five droids as they advanced, Dejer, Metal, and Dab found their two brothers trading shots with a dwarf spider droid. Well, Tech was doing so, at least. Cell was half buried beneath soil and debris. A sharp piece of metal, about 15 centimeters long, had pierced his right shoulder. It must have been part of the missile itself, otherwise it wouldn't have had enough force to pierce through the armor. Metal, it's all yours. Got it, sir. Hey, Tin Can. Over here. The needless provocation didn't get the dwarf spider droid's attention, but the torrent of blue lasers metal's double barrel repeating blaster unleashed did. Coupled with Dab's charged shot, they quickly took care of it. How are you holding up, Cell? It hurts like hell, Commander. How are the others? 3-4 is taking care of Brain, then he will have a look at you. After that, we will get you to the medical center. Come on. Ack. Dager helped Cell up, while the rest of his unit provided cover, and brought him back to 3-4. The medic had already taken care of Brain, and said he only needed a few minutes to wake up. It was just a concussion, sir. Cell, can you hold on for a while? Just let me take a look at the commander first. And don't complain, sir. Dager didn't plan on doing so. He was already getting dizzy because of blood loss. After 3-4 properly sewed and bandaged it, he felt much better. While the clone was treating Cell, Dager contacted the back lines. Sergeant Hyde, I need to evacuate one trooper. Grave wound. I will send someone right away, Commander. While they waited, 3-4 decided to take out the piece of metal in Cell's body. It wasn't advisable to do so if he couldn't stop the bleeding that would ensure, but the scout could barely keep conscious because of the pain. Bite this. Oka. Arg. 3-4, you. Couldn't you have warned me? It hurts less this way. Now, sit still. I need to close the wound before you pass out. Sweating profusely, Cell laid on the ground. The pain was immense, but he had gone through worse before. Hey, sir. Yeah. Eliminate some clankers for me, will you? Will do, Cell. Will do. Chapter 322 Ragu felt a laser aimed at the back of his head, and crouched. Reflecting two other lasers back to its owners, he realized he had gone too deep into enemy lines. Even for a Jedi, it was easy to lose oneself to the emotion of the battle. Now, he found himself surrounded by dozens of B-1 units, and at least 10 B-2 super battle droids. He wasn't, however, considered one of the best lightsaber wielders of the Jedi Order for nothing. Only five or six Jedis, including General Yoda, could face him, and only to a draw. He used the force not to pull or push the droids, because that would be too tiring, but to slightly adjust the direction their blasters were pointing. The lasers that were aimed at him missed by a few centimeters, some even hitting other seppies. As for the lasers that still found their target, he used his lightsaber to deflect them. This was just one of the many tricks Ragu had to learn to survive. War was very different from the usual challenges the Jedis had to face. Many Jedis fell in those short three years of Clone Wars, and a good part of them died because they couldn't adapt quickly enough. Knowing that he couldn't stand still for too long, the Tigruta ran towards one of the clankers that encircled him, while spinning his lightsaber. He kicked the droid, and used it as a platform to launch himself over the seppies behind it. Doing a flip, he cut one B-2 super battle droid in half, and used a force wave to push some clankers to the ground. A laser grazed his left arm, but he ignored it. Two droids lost their heads when he slashed forward, and Ragu finally saw clones again. When the troopers saw the Jedi running to them, they directed their fire at the seppies behind him. 
Many of them fell immediately, but the clones also paid quite a high price. Such was war. The side that held out for longer was the winner. Ah! Ragu let out a low groan of pain when a laser hit his right arm. He was forced to let go of his lightsaber, and the weapon flew out of his hand. Before he could use the force to pick it up, another laser almost hit him, and he had to retreat. Giving one last look at his lightsaber, he saw the droids trampling over it as they marched forward. As much as he hated having to leave it behind, he knew there was no way he could recover it, at least not for now. If they won the battle, then maybe. Captain Inc. Yes, General. Their left flank is faltering. We need to push forward. Get three companies and six at TES on it. Understood, sir. Also, move some troops from the rear to our left flank, and put them under Hell Squad's command. Tell Dager to pierce through their front lines, and advance towards us. We have to pincer them. I will send Tremor Battalion, General. While the captain passed his orders to the others, Ragu let a medic bandage his arm and retreated to the mobile command post. From there, he would be able to direct the battle better, now that he didn't have a weapon anymore. Of course, he could always pick up a blaster, but another person, even if he was a Jedi, wouldn't make a difference in a battle of such proportions. Besides, he didn't like to use blasters. Soon, his orders were carried out, and he watched from his vantage point as thousands of clones advanced like a single entity, crushing the Separatists' left flank. He couldn't see the other side of the battlefield properly, since it was too far, and the air was clouded with dust and smoke, but reports came in saying that Dager had followed his orders flawlessly. The balance of the battle, which was already leaning towards the Republic, now had completely tipped, as the Sepi suffered devastating blow after devastating blow. Lieutenant Yavin at your service, sir. General Ragu's orders are that you take Tremor Battalion and push back the clankers, before cutting through them towards our right flank. Dager barely acknowledged his brother's words. He was more worried about killing a bunch of droids that had been persistently firing at Hell Squad for the last few minutes. Brain, dab. Take care of them. Metal, to our left. Only after directing his unit that Dager turned to the lieutenant. He belonged to the 212th Legion, and his voice was steady. A veteran. Since a battalion usually had a captain as the leader, that meant Tremor Battalion probably lost its commander. Say it again, brother. General Ragu ordered that you take Tremor Battalion, and move towards our right flank, where we are pressing the tin cans. He wants to catch them between two fires. Simple orders, but difficult to follow. Dager couldn't see much of the battle besides what it was right in front of him, so, if Ragu was wrong, or the Separatist made a comeback, they would be the ones caught between two fires. However, he blindly trusted his general. There was no hesitation in his face as he nodded to Lieutenant Yavin. All right. Hell Squad, we got new orders. On me. His unit retreated while firing at the droids, and joined him and the lieutenant behind the burning carcass of an AAT. Only Cell wasn't there, having been taken to the medical center. What orders, sir? We are to advance diagonally to the back of their left flank, while our right flank pressure them. You are better just pointing to us which droids we have to eliminate, Commander. Sighing at Metal's words, Dager patted his helmet, Tech had recovered it, and got up. He knew it was just his brother's way of lightening the mood, even in the middle of a full-on battle. Yavin, Hell Squad will open a path, and you follow suit, understood? Every soldier in the clone army had heard of Hell Squad before. They were legendary. No clone would question what they said, and would follow them blindly. Dager got out of his cover, and ran forward a few meters before jumping into a crater. From there, he aimed at the clankers, and pressed the trigger several times before running again. His brothers followed closely. From the ground what they were doing might just seem like a few hundred clones recklessly advancing more than they should. But, if one looked at it from the sky, they would be able to see the white armor of the clones piercing through the separatist lines, severing it in two. Four hours later, the clones stepped over the battlefield, this time looking for survivors, taking back bodies, and killing any stragglers that remained. Almost 7,000 clones died, and their corpses were scattered all around. 
they would be cremated, and their ashes thrown in the seas of Kamino. But that high number of casualties was the price they had to pay for the entire annihilation of the enemy. None of the 26,000 clankers escaped. Chapter 323 Metal, help me here. Grunting with the effort, Dager and the heavy machine gunner lifted a dwarf spider droid so Brain and Tech could pull the body of one of his brothers from under it. A quick check revealed there was nothing to do for him. Covering his face with his hands, Dager sighed, and got up. That was the worst part of any battle. Not the fear of death, not the lasers flying around him, not the pain of being hit. Worse than all of this was going around the silent battlefield pausing every few steps to check if your brothers really were gone, and then carrying the bodies back. Depending on the proportions of the battle, that could take hours, and even days. Of course, as a commander, Dager could choose to stay away from all of this, but the thought never crossed his mind. Or the minds of any clone, for what matters. Their brothers gave their lives by their side, so the least they could do was provide a proper funeral for them. Over. Over here. Dager didn't know how many trips he had done, entering the battlefield with his hands empty, and leaving carrying a corpse. But he stopped when he heard someone calling him. Looking around, he found a 501st sergeant laying sideways inside a small crater. Dager ran towards him while yelling for 3-4, and carefully turned the wounded soldier. One quick glance was enough to tell him that he didn't have much longer. Two lasers had hit the poor sergeant, one on the left side of his chest, and the other on the stomach. Even without 3-4 telling him, Dager knew that the laser had destroyed the sergeant's lungs. It was a miracle he survived that long. I don't have a chance. Do I? Sir. He could lie, and tell the sergeant he would live. But he didn't have a reason to do so. Every clone went into battle knowing they could die. No, brother. But many of the clankers will make you company on the long journey. I can't. Wait to see their faces. My Bloss. Blaster. Please. Here. You did the Republic proud, Sergeant. His brother couldn't hear him anymore. His fingers, which were holding tightly the DC 15S that Dager gave him, relaxed. Hell Squad exchanged glances when they saw that Dager kept kneeling on the ground, completely still. They had kept company to a brother as they left this galaxy many times, and the pain was always immense. Sometimes it was too much, and now was one of those times. They took a few steps back, and left their commander alone with his thoughts. They knew better than to try and talk to Dager when he was like that. His eyes closed, Dager stood still. He felt like yelling, punching the ground, kicking the droid carcasses, and worse. But he held it all in. He was a commander. If he lost control, what would the men under him think? But, even if he didn't say it out loud, the thoughts were still rummaging through his mind, like an unstoppable hurricane. He was tired of it all. Of the deaths, the pain, of the nightmares. Of fighting a war he didn't choose. Of following orders. Of watching his brothers die. Of giving everything he had to people that considered clones no more than just a number. He envied his brothers that had the courage of deserting, and starting a new life, instead of believing the empty promises that the Republic made. Because that's what they were. Promises that could, and most probably would, be easily broken once this war ended. Dager might be young, but he wasn't stupid. He had experienced more in three years than most people of the galaxy would in their entire lives. He knew that even if they won the war, the Republic would never give up an army as cheap and loyal as the clone army. Those were dangerous thoughts, but Dager had long noticed a lot of things were wrong with this war. He had the feeling it was all being controlled from the dark, and that they were nothing but pawns. Otherwise, why would Jedis, pacifists, become generals? Why would every claim for peace that both Republic and CIS senators made be quickly suffocated? There were many other inconsistencies, and even thinking about them could be considered treason. For some reason, Chancellor Palpatine's cold smile appeared on his mind. Dager never liked the Chancellor. He behaved like a Sertullian vine, putting on a nice facade while it waited to strike. 
more than once he had given secret missions to Hell Squad, ones that even the Jedis couldn't know about. Most of them involved the assassination of key separatist figures, all leading the peace effort. But alas, Dager wasn't brave enough. Good soldiers follow orders, and he was nothing if not a soldier. He didn't have the courage to question his orders, or to abandon the war. Even if that meant watching thousands more of his brothers die before his very own eyes. Ragu was searching for his lightsaber when he spotted Hell Squad. He had already talked to them after the battle, and confirmed Cell would recover quickly. He was about to keep on looking, since he knew the clones liked to be alone while cleaning the battlefield, but something about how the unit was looking at Dager, who was kneeling on the ground a certain distance away, made him worried. He silently approached Brain, and tapped the clone's shoulder with a questioning look. The grenadier turned around, and Ragu suddenly felt a wave of sadness coming from him. Nothing, General. Just. We should leave him be. The Jedi was surprised. He never heard Brain sound so defeated before. By the way, sir, you lost this. The clone had in his hands a short metal stick, with several engravings. Ragu's lightsaber. Hell Squad had found it while combing through the battlefield. Thanks. It was obvious that Brain was trying to change the subject, and make Ragu leave and, if a member of Hell Squad didn't want Ragu near, then Dajit must be going through something really serious. As curious and worried as he was, Ragu didn't want to intrude in what clearly was a clone problem. Sending a small wave of force to calm Brain, he gave Dager a last glance, and left. War destroyed more than just lives. It broke people, even soldiers. No one could go to war and remain the same. Eventually, Dager got up. Hell Squad was one thing, since they had seen every side of him multiple times, but he couldn't let the others see the coward him. It would be bad for morale and for Hell Squad's prestige. Putting on his helmet with unnecessary force, he gestured for Tech and Dab to carry the sergeant's body, and started walking back to his quarters. He couldn't do this anymore, at least today. Tomorrow he would be back to normal, or so he hoped. Chapter 324 The last droid on Kiros fell six days later, by the hands of Captain Rex. Any ship the Separatists sent to assist on the retreat of their troops was taken down, meaning that all 300,000 clankers were destroyed. Even though the Separatists could produce millions of droids a month, they weren't cheap. Losing 300,000 of them and winning nothing pained them. As such, when they saw the Republic was adamant on killing every single droid on Kiros, and letting none fall back, they ordered their units to cause as much damage to the clone army as they could. That order resulted in 80,000 clone deaths, a steep price for the conquest of the planet. However, now that Kiros was finally in Republic hands, they could start the third phase of the Grand Offensive. That is, flood major systems with clone troops. And it was following such plan that Hell Squad and Ragu were on their way to Christophsis. The 501st and the 212th had permanent garrisons there, since the planet was very important to the Republic, for reasons that Dager didn't know and didn't care. The Separatists seemed to think the same, and so Christophsis, like many other systems, had been locked in war for over three years. General Kenobi, General Skywalker, Commander Cody, Captain Rex, and Ahsoka Tano had been sent to Andoran, to train rebels to fight against the Separatist forces trying to occupy the planet. The Republic couldn't send official troops there, because the government of Andoran insisted they were a neutral system, which was obviously a lie. Because of that, Ragu was to command the two legions in Christophsis, at least until their Jedi generals were back. Did you read the reports, sir? Hell Squad was all grouped around Dager while he read a data pad. Having spent almost two months without any news from the Republic, they had a lot to catch up. And many surprising events happened. Which only strengthened Dager's feeling that something big was lurking in the shadows, and that the war was close to ending. What do they say? A lot happened. Jedi younglings captured, Republic and Separatist senators murdered in a bombing, attack on the Jedi Temple, an attempt on Chancellor Palpatine's life, and... And... Two new Siths appeared. From a planet called Dathomir. They already eliminated three Jedis, but it doesn't seem like they are on the Sepi side. 
it looks like they want to take control of the crime syndicates. But that is not all. Ventress left the CIS. Apparently, they tried to eliminate her because she was becoming too powerful. That's what the Jedi's think, at least. But it backfired, and she eliminated a few important seppies. She is being hunted by both us and them now. Oh. There was a stunned silence following Dager's words. Hell Squad had battled Ventress many times, and almost died by her hands. It was safe to say that she was their oldest enemy, aside from the deceased Heige. They hated her, but they always thought of her as a separatist. It was weird to consider her anything else. If we meet her again, what are we to do? The orders changed from, eliminate on sight, to, capture. The higher-ups believe she might want to deliver intel now that the Seppis are hunting her too. The way Dager said it left no doubt that if he could, he would ignore those orders. Ventress had caused much pain to Hell Squad, and eliminated too many of their brothers. Separatist or not, she deserved to die. Tech, everything Hell Squad needs to read is here. Transfer it to your datapads. I need to talk to the general. Dager couldn't be the only one to read the reports. As a special unit, it was important every member knew about all the battles that happened, who died, who survived, and much more. Most of this information would be useless, and never come into play, but you never knows. It might be important someday. His helmet under his arm, Dager walked to the command bridge of the Venator-class Star Destroyer. He had a bad feeling all of the sudden, which was why he left his unit so hastily. His scars started to burn, what only happened when something really bad was about to happen. He quickened his pace, and was almost running when he got to the command bridge. Ragu was looking at the hologram table, but, seeing Dager suddenly barge in, he instinctively put his hand over his lightsaber. What is it? Not sure, General. Captain, check the scanners. Scatter, kicks, and cleaver, make patrols, and search the ship. If anything, anything, is wrong, inform it before investigating. Understood, Commander. As soon as Dager started ordering the soldiers around, Ragu had closed his eyes and focused on any disturbance of the force. Unsurprisingly, he found one. How did you feel it before me? Instinct, General. I know when I'm being watched. They are on the ship, I just don't know where exactly. Any idea of who they are? Maybe, sir. Brain, I want Hell Squad on the cargo bay. Wait for me and General Ragu before entering. Separatist would have attacked our ship immediately, General, and normal pirates wouldn't dare to rob the Republic. They are most probably from the crime syndicates, and are working for those two rogue Siths. If the intel is correct, and they really want to become the biggest underground organization of the galaxy, they need big weapons, and we are carrying lots of those. Deja was talking about the E-Webs, at RTS, at TS, and at APS that they were taking to Christophsis. If the outlaws got their hands in even a single one of those, the damage they could do would be immense. I felt a disturbance in the force, Dager. One of the Siths is here. We have to proceed with caution. Smiling, Dager put on his helmet, and stroked his vibroblade. Don't I always? That foolish Jedi already sensed me, even though I am shrouding myself with the force. And those clones. They must be the hell squad I've heard so much about. Kaka kaka. The galaxy got very interesting during my years of seclusion. Hurry up, slimes. They know we are here. My lord, we need more time. Some of the vehicles are too big to move them quickly. The person looked at his subordinates, and smiled. However, instead of comforting them, the smile made them shudder. There wasn't any warmth in it, only cruelty. I said to hurry up. Or do I have to give you a little incentive? And no, my lord. We will finish quickly. Trembling, the underlings accelerated the process as much as they could. Giving up the huge ATS, they focused on the smaller vehicles and weapons. Several of them were already loaded on the stealth ship they used to escape the scanners when the doors of the storage bay opened, and several clones, as well as a Tigruta, entered. As one, the criminals all looked to their leader, but he was nowhere to be seen. 
Only his dark cloak remained, falling to the ground slowly. Chapter 325 Having felt the strong disturbance in the force, Ragu was already prepared to fight a strong Sith. As such, when they opened the hangar's doors, and saw two dozen criminals stealing their weapons and vehicles, he ignored them. Leaving Hell Squad and the other clones to deal with the outlaws, he closed his eyes to try and sense where the Sith was. However, he felt nothing. The force was as calm as a still lake. Opening his eyes, he scanned the storage bay. Containers created all sorts of shadows on which the Sith could be lurking. However, Regu knew that if he was the one setting up the ambush, there was only one place he would attack from. Already turning on his lightsaber, he looked up just in time to block a red light. With his other hand, he pushed the unknown assailant away. However, instead of crashing on the ground as Regu had expected, the Sith turned midair, and used his legs to grab the side of a container, leaving deep claw marks. Kakaka. Interesting, very interesting. Jedi Master Ragu, right? Jumping down, the Sith waved his lightsaber at Ragu, a murderous glint on his eyes. The Jedi, however, only took a step back, and dodged. And you must be the leader of the Shadow Collective, Darth Maul. Kakakaka. Correct, puny Jedi. Now in the light, Ragu could see that Darth Maul was exactly as the reports described him. A thin but muscular Zabrak, with black and red skin. The crown of bone thorns characteristic of his species was especially big in him, and his eyes were bloodshot. However, what caught the eye about him wasn't any of that, but his lower half. The entirety of it, not just his legs, was an enormous mechanical abomination, which made him seem much taller than he actually was. His silver legs ended in clawed feet, and, based on what Ragu had already witnessed, they weren't any less lethal than his red lightsaber. Stealing from the Grand Army of the Republic is an offense punishable by death, Maul. Your big plans of controlling the galaxy's underworld won't be worth it if you aren't alive to see them bear fruit. Pretty words, Jedi, but useless. I will take what I need, and you can't stop me. You eliminated some of my friends, not long ago. I will honor their memory by bringing you down. Kakaka. A Jedi that embraces revenge. You would make a good Sith, young one. Darth Maul was still laughing when he saw Ragu disappear before his eyes. Almost faster than he could react, a green lightsaber was already smashing down on his head. Barely deflecting it, he found himself locked in a struggle with the Tigruta, each one using all their strength to push their weapons into the other. He was surprised by the coldness on Ragu's eyes. There was no sign of anger in it, only determination to eliminate or capture him. If there was any desire for revenge, as he initially thought, it was hidden deep. Luckily for him, Darth Maul had done his research before making his move. Having almost been eliminated by a Jedi before, he was much more cautious than his younger self. His arrogance was still there, but his sharp thinking was in control. He knew that the Jedi before him, although young, was almost as powerful and skilled as the members of the Jedi Council. Even Count Dooku, the Separatist leader, had to run from him. You know who gave me those legs, Jedi? Does it matter? Kaka. You are bold, I will give you that. It was Obi-Wan Kenobi. When you see him, tell him that a ghost from the past is coming for him, and that I will see him cry before me like he did when I eliminated his master. You can tell him yourself, while you are being judged, Maul. You won't be leaving today. You are too young to face me, Jedi. Kakaka. Now that I think of it, you won't be able to tell Kenobi anything. Having said that, Darth Maul pressed a button on his lightsaber, and another red blade appeared on the other side of it. He took a step back, hoping to destroy Regu's balance, and impale the Tigruta, but was surprised to find that he had dodged already. After discovering that his old enemy was alive, General Kenobi had been quick to tell the Jedi Council everything he knew about him. His weirdly shaped, double-bladed lightsaber was what he put the most emphasis on. And so, having carefully read all the reports, Ragu was prepared for the moment Darth Maul released his second blade. Crouching under it, he brought his own lightsaber up, forcing the Sith to hastily retreat. Before he could regain his balance, Ragu was already pouncing on him again. 
Gur. Die, Jedi dog. Swinging his lightsaber faster than it was humanly possible, Darth Maul used both sides of it to attack, trying to pierce, cut, and sever the Jedi. Ragu was forced to change his aggressive attack to a defensive posture. If he was alone, he would have to fight for a long time. Fortunately, he wasn't alone. Sensing danger, Darth Maul disengaged from Ragu, and deflected three lasers without even looking at what he was doing. Growling like an enraged beast, he turned around to find that all his underlings were either dead or had been captured. The clones that he never even considered as a threat were now surrounding him. He looked around, waiting for them to fire again, but one of them, the one with one horn painted on his helmet, signaled for them to hold their fire. Stunned, Darth Maul realized that he felt danger. He, a powerful Sith, threatened by the presence of a mere clone. That thought angered him. He wouldn't underestimate a Jedi, not again. But clones were just toys for him. Weaklings. General Regu. Open fire. After shooting the last criminal in the leg, Dajer turned around to watch the fight between the two Force users. It was too fast for clones to intervene normally, but, when he saw that Darth Maul had jumped back, he pressed the trigger three times. Unsurprisingly, the Sith deflected the lasers, and Dajer ordered his men to hold their fire. He didn't want them to die to their own reflected lasers. Open fire. Without taking his eyes off Darth Maul, Dajer asked for orders. When he told them to attack, Dajer knew they were nothing more than a distraction. As soon as the first lasers started flying towards him, Darth Maul used his double-bladed lightsaber to defend against them. Two troopers fell near Dajer, one hit on the shoulder, and the other deadly quiet. Before he could cause more damage, however, Regu was already on top of him, swinging his lightsaber. To dodge the strike, the Sith had to let himself be hit by a laser on his left thigh. If it was anyone else, it would have been enough to half their combat capabilities, but not this abomination's. Ignoring the laser, that barely left a scorched spot, Darth Maul kicked Ragu, sending the Tigruta flying, and slashed a clone, almost cutting him in half. Chapter 326 Dajer, Cell, and Metal staggered backwards and eventually fell, when Darth Maul used the force to push them. Rolling, the clones were immediately back on their feet, and just in time to dodge a swing from the Sith's lightsaber. Darth Maul, however, frowned when he saw they survived. He wasn't willing to abandon his prey, and slashed at Dajer. In response, the clone let go of his DC-15A, and pulled out his DC-17, firing it point-blank. Surprised by how Dajer didn't even try to defend or dodge, but instead chose to trade wounds, Darth Maul arched his back, turned off his lightsaber, and retreated. He couldn't give himself the luxury of a wound, especially a grave one. With a Jedi and dozens of clones after him, it would be the same as signing his death sentence. While all those thoughts ran through his mind, Ragu was already on him again. Unleashing a green tempest, the Tigruta forced Darth Maul to fall back step by step. Never had the Zabrik thought that he would face such a tough adversary during a simple robbery. If he had known, he would rather have stayed at his base, and let his subordinates fail and die by themselves. Now his life was truly in danger. Dajer watched as the two force users clashed, once again unable to assist Ragu for fear of missing the target. Suddenly, Darth Maul used the force to pull down a bunch of containers, blocking the view of everyone apart from Dajer, 3-4, Brain, and two other troopers. Then, he kicked Ragu's hand, sending his lightsaber flying, while his wrist bent in a direction it wasn't supposed to. It was too fast for any of the clones to react, even if they were fully focused on the battle. Darth Maul tried to stab Ragu, but the Jedi managed to jump back and dodge. He was sweating profusely, and his face had a deep frown as he held his broken wrist. He wouldn't be able to escape the next attack. Even as the five clones held down their triggers, sending everything they had towards Darth Maul, the Zabrik just deflected the lasers nonchalantly. Seeing that, Dajer made a split-second decision. He threw his vibroblade at the Sith. It was so unexpected that even Darth Maul was surprised. As weak as a vibroblade was before a lightsaber, he couldn't deflect it like he did to the lasers. He was forced to cut it in half with his weapon. 
It didn't even take him a second to do so, but it was enough for Dager to reach out and pick something from the ground. When Darth Maul turned to face Dager, a murderous glint in his eyes, he saw a green flash aiming for him. His instincts made him tilt his body, and dodge by a narrow margin. What followed was a blaster a few centimeters away from his head, forcing him to step back again, and this time even his powerful legs couldn't hold him up. Dager didn't give the Sith a second to recover. No sooner than the Zabrik fell to the floor, he already had spun Ragu's lightsaber like he saw the Jedi do many times before, and stabbed down, trying to impale Darth Maul. Dager was very familiar with the use of blades, thanks to his training with a Viper blade. He had long learned that a blaster was next to useless in some situations, such as battling commando droids. For that reason, he had to master cold weapons, and a lightsaber wasn't that much different from a Viper blade. What surprised Dager was how light it was. He was able to spin it without much trouble. Of course he never would be able to do it as fast as the Jedi's, but still, it was quite impressive. Except for Darth Maul. When the Sith saw that the one wielding the lightsaber was a clone, he was shocked. The clone must have picked it up at the same time as he threw his puny Viper blade. To think a normal person would be bold enough to use a Jedi's weapon. Even he had to admit the clone was a worthy opponent. His desire to eliminate him only grew stronger. Rolling to the side, he blocked the green lightsaber with his own. Having been slightly pushed to the side, the weapon pierced the ground without a hitch. Dager pulled it back just in time to block a blow by Darth Maul. Still, the strength behind the attack sent him flying three meters back. Obviously, he couldn't compete with a Force user. Hearing Ragu yell his name, Dager got up in time to see the Jedi running towards him. Understanding what he wanted, the commander threw the lightsaber back to its owner, who caught it with his left hand. At the same time, there was a loud noise as the containers that Darth Maul had pulled were pushed aside, revealing the other members of Hell Squad, and the clones that had been separated from Dager and the others. Seeing the dozens of blasters aiming at him, and the Tigruta that, albeit hurt, didn't show any sign of weakness or of backing down, Darth Maul hesitated. If he wanted, he believed he could eliminate all of them. However, it would have a price, and one he wasn't sure he could pay. Slowly, the Sith calmed down, and regulated his breath. With a low sound, he turned off his lightsaber. You are far stronger than I anticipated, Jedi. And far more annoying. I will take that as a compliment, Maul. So, have you decided to surrender? Never. But I propose a truce. I will leave the vehicles I stole behind, and you won't go after me. He growled in rage as he said that, knowing that he was putting himself in a lower position than the Jedi. However, that was the best solution to his current predicament. He knew the Republic would never let him leave with the stolen good, even if it meant fighting to the death. You think you can just come and go as you please? Sith SCU. Cell, quiet. Brain, tech, start unloading our vehicles. After that, Maul, you will leave immediately. Do as I said. Now. All the clones looked at Ragu. They knew exactly why Ragu chose to let the Sith go, and they didn't like it. Still, they couldn't go against a direct order. Seconds and minutes passed slowly as Darth Maul and the Republic group stared at each other, waiting. Neither dared to make any brash move, for fear of breaking their small moment of peace. Eventually, all the vehicles that the Shadow Collective had stolen were brought back to the cruiser, and Ragu waved for Darth Maul to go. One day, Jedi, I will find and eliminate you. You will have to wait on the line, Maul. If I were you, however, I would worry more about building that small criminal empire of yours. To think a force user would swoop to such low levels. It looked like the Zabrik wanted to say something, but he held it back. As soon as he got on his ship, it disappeared from the Venator-class Star Destroyer's sensors. Clearly, he didn't want to risk the Republic blowing him up. He was strong. Ragu crumbled to the floor, clearly exhausted. Dager sat next to him, letting Brain deal with the post-battle arrangements. Chapter 327 How is your hand, General? Ragu lifted his arm, and showed his right hand dangling uselessly. 
There was no pain on his face, only a deep frown, as if the broken wrist was an inconvenience more than anything. Nothing much. Also, those were some pretty impressive skills, back there. Maybe I should convince Master Yoda to give you a lightsaber. Hum. Dejo grinned when he heard Regu joking. A lightsaber was an impressive weapon, that's for sure. However, Dejo still preferred his Viper Blade. There was almost no resistance when slicing something with a lightsaber, so it wasn't as pleasant as the blunt impact of a Viper Blade. Oh, I wish I could have seen it. Commander Dejo, of Hell Squad, uses a lightsaber to beat a Sith. Imagine what the others will think when we tell them. Imagine what Hunter will think. He ought to be jealous, that's for sure. Ha ha ha. By the way his brothers were talking, Dejo knew it would be useless to tell them to shut up. Even Ragu laughed out loud when he saw the stern commander shaking his head powerless. You won't let me forget that, will you? Nope. Not a chance, sir. Hell Squad laughed, and Dejo let them have their fun for a few seconds. It was rare for clones to have such carefree moments. Then, he helped Ragu up, and told the Jedi to go to the medical bay. As for the rest of you, clean this mess up. Lieutenant, we probably eliminated or captured all of them, but searched the rest of the ship to make sure. Spear, tomped, with me. While his orders were followed, Dejer picked up the two halves of his viper blade, and stared at them for a moment. This was his fourth one, maybe fifth. Anyway, he needed to find a new one, since this one was now scrap metal. Throwing it to the side, he left the cargo bay. Christophsis was a beautiful planet. Dejer had never thought of anywhere other than Kamino as beautiful before. For him, no matter where, it was just another battlefield. However, with its high buildings, made of dark blue crystal, and the streets made of the same material, Christophsis was a sight to behold. It would have been better if there weren't columns of smoke rising every few hundred meters, collapsed buildings, and dead clones and droids everywhere. Like many others, the planet was in shambles because of the constant bombardments and clashes between the Republic and the Separatist. In fact, it got to a point where a meeting was held between the two sides, and the use of hyena-class bombers and Y-wings was forbidden. Although there were no rules in war, if one side broke this small treaty, the other would retaliate tenfold. And Christophsis was too important to both of them, so none could afford to provoke the anger of the natives more than the countless civilian deaths already did. Land there. Dejer tapped the lot's pilot's shoulder, and pointed to some kind of garden. The plants were all dead, and the ground was covered by clone footprints. The fountain that once adorned the garden was broken in half. Before the gunship touched the ground, Dejer swung the door open, and jumped out. Hell Squad followed him, and Dejer made a circle with his fingers, signaling the pilot to take off again. With me. Quietly, the seven soldiers made their way through the destroyed city. Even though they were in Republic-controlled territory, they were very careful. They were nearing the advanced command center, they couldn't land straight there or their aircraft would get shot down, which was very close to the front lines, so groups of clankers could sometimes appear. We are being watched, Commander. Civilians. Ignore them. Dejer had also noticed it. After so many battles, veterans gained some kind of sixth sense. It was easy to notice when they were being stared at. However, he had long lowered his macro binoculars and found that several natives were peeking at them from their half-destroyed homes. Even if some of them looked at the clones in anger, it didn't affect Dejer. I thought the city had been evacuated. The rich and powerful were. As for the average people, apparently their government thought they weren't important enough. Also, where would they go? The entire planet is a battlefield. Hell Squad was all too familiar with this kind of situation. They had seen it in Mon Cala, Kashyyyk, Ryloth, Felucia, and many other places. While those with power and connections went to enjoy their lives somewhere else, the rest of the population had to suffer the consequences of war on their own. When the battle was over, and things returned to a somewhat normal state, those who left would come back, and grab the chance to take over businesses, properties, and everything else, from those who died or had their lives destroyed. If he was asked, Dejer couldn't tell what he thought about all this. 
it was all another unfortunate consequence of the terrible war, while he was but a soldier in it. All he needed was that someone gave him a blaster and pointed him at the enemy. He has no interest in politics or anything of the like. And he didn't have time to help those who lost something because of the war, no matter how much pity they invoked. Walking through the destroyed city, they started to see more and more of their brothers. They all saluted Hell Squad before returning to what they were doing. Eventually, they arrived at the moving platform that was the command center. A captain named Arbol was waiting for them. I had been informed General Ragu would be with you, Commander Dager. One of the natives wanted to have a meeting with him. A governor or something like that. He will come when he is finished. What is the situation here? Complicated, sir. The Sepis have retreated for the day, but they managed to take back 14 kilometers today. They switched tactics, and we were caught by surprise. Dager frowned when he heard Captain Arbol. Fourteen kilometers didn't seem like much in a battle of planetary scale, but any meter lost was a huge blow to morale. For how long has this been going on? Almost a week, sir. It's always something different, and we don't have enough men or time to prepare for everything. Today they left groups of Sepis ambushed in buildings we had already searched, and they attacked us from behind. Yesterday two commando droids bombed our vehicles, putting four at TES out of use. And the day before that they let us advance a little to then ambush our rear guard. And it goes on. Every day they do something different. Even if we can predict all their options, we can't be sure of which one they are going to choose, and we don't have enough resources to create countermeasures for everything. The captain seemed to be in distress, and his voice got louder as he talked. Dager could understand the pressure he was on. Putting a hand on his shoulder, Dager squeezed it slightly, and told Captain Arbol to go rest that he would take control for now. After hesitating a little, he obeyed. So, what do you think? Probably the same as you, sir. Either the Sepis got better at building tactical droids, or they got a new strategist. Yup. I agree. Sel, when the battle resumes tomorrow, I want you and Dab to take a platoon and clean one of the buildings. It doesn't matter which, as long as you have a line of sight to their front lines. After you get to the top, send the platoon back, and stay put. Don't show yourselves unless necessary. Roger that, Commander. What's the plan? I'm not sure yet. The others, we will try to capture a high-ranking clanker. A captain or something. After Tech hacks it, we will decide our next move. Chapter 328 Hell Squad was woken up by the sound of AV-7 anti-vehicle cannons trading shots with the Separatists' J-1 proton cannons. The loud explosions shook the ground, but Dager and the others only paid attention to it for a second before closing their eyes. Around them, the other troopers did the same, clearly more than used to the noise. None of them fell asleep again, but there was no reason to rush to get up. The real battle would only start over an hour later, after the artillery decided to rest. To charge into battle now would be. Eventually, Dager got up, and poked Brain with his foot. Just lying down was good, but they had a war to win. Don't be lazy, we got work to do. Ouch. You could have just called me, sir. Still complaining, Brain got up, and mimicked Dager by kicking metal. In a split second, the entire squad was up. Around them, their brothers were also moving, putting on their helmets, they all slept with their armor on, so they didn't waste precious time in case they were attacked, and grabbing their blasters. Those who had stayed awake at night, especially the sentries, crumbled to the ground, falling asleep immediately. It was simple for veterans to sleep through an entire artillery barrage. Captain Arbol, how is the battle going? Pretty well, Commander Dager. A lucky shell hit an MTT while they were loading it up. You should have seen the explosion. We also destroyed two J1s, and only lost one of our AV-7. So far, we have yet to have any casualties. We are preparing for the assault now. Dager nodded, and lowered his macro binoculars to look at the enemy lines. Dozens of thousands of droids were entering formation. Amidst them there also were AATs, STAPs, dwarf spider droids, tri-droids, 
crab droids, MTTs, and so on. However, threatening as it may seem, Deja knew they weren't the major source of concern. Urban environments were a logistic nightmare, and Christophsis was ten times worse than anywhere else. Tall buildings, secondary streets, and civilians made focusing on the enemy almost impossible. Sometimes the enemy would see a road blocked, so they would simply go around it, and catch the blockade from behind, slaughtering them. It was impossible to control every street and alley. So, although the majority of both sides' armies would be on the huge main road, there would be countless skirmishes around it, and if even one group of clankers got through, the damage they could do would be immeasurable. Time ticked by slowly, and soon both sides stopped firing the artillery cannons. An eerie silence filled the city, as both groups of combatants just stared at each other. It was the calm before the storm. Let's kick the tin cans back to their ships, brothers. Attack. Suddenly, Dejo's voice broke the silence, immediately followed by the earth-shaking sound of AV-7s, ATS, and SHAPTS firing. Huge portions of the droid army disappeared, replaced by craters and smoke. With a collective yell, the clone army marched forward. The separatists weren't to be outdone, however. They answered with the same intensity, and screams of pain filled the battlefield. Are we going to, Commander? Even as he said that, Cell was already clutching his DC-15S anxiously. It wasn't easy for a clone to stay idle while their brothers went into battle. Arbol, watch our flanks. If the pattern continues, the clankers will try something new today. While we are on the front lines, you will need to keep an eye out for their dirty tricks. All right, Hell Squad. It's our time to shine. Eyes closed and taking deep breaths, Dab hid behind a broken statue. Red lasers hit it incessantly, sending chips and splinters peppering harmlessly into his armor. To his left 3-4 was bandaging a 212th trooper's forearm, while to his right tech was peeking at the droids. 400 meters, a little to the right. There are two B-1s in front of it. Commander, can you help me take care of that? A few meters in front of them were Dager, Cell, and six or seven other clones, all hiding behind one of the barricades the Republic had set up the day before. The commander didn't answer at the time, since he was fully focused on emptying his magazine on the approaching enemies. One of them is down already. Eliminate the other tech. The clone grinned under his helmet, and fired two lasers. The first missed, but the second hit the clanker squarely in the chest. Dab, the show is yours. Without hesitation, the sniper got up, using the broken statue as support for his DC-15X. A single laser left it, and dwarf spider droid that had already mowed down an entire squad blew up twice before crumbling to the ground. The first explosion was thanks to Dab's charged shot, and the second to the Seppi's energy cell. Incoming. Hearing the warning, they looked up in time to see one of the tridroids turning its laser cannon at them. Scrambling to get away, they all looked for a better cover. Still, two troopers received a direct hit, while another one got shot in the leg, and became an easy target. Trigger. The soldier 3-4 had been treating wanted to dash out and grab the wounded trooper, Trigger. Metal and the medic held him back, however. He didn't have enough strength in his body to carry his brother. Sir. I'm going. Brain, with me. The others, cover us. On the other side of the street, Dager could hear the medic through his comlink. With a determined gaze, he gestured for his right hand to follow him. Our turn, Seppis. As soon as they stepped out of their cover, metal unleashed hell on the droids. Usually, one needed to have a stable footing to fire a weapon as big as a double barrel repeating blaster. That's why they always use tripods. Metal, however, was a specialist in controlling the recoil of it. Like Naboo flies facing a gun gone, the droids fell one after another. Twenty seconds later, when the droids finally discovered from where they were being attacked, over a hundred of them were in pieces on the ground, and Trigger had been rescued. Three-four glanced at the two laser wounds on his leg, and ignored it. He had more serious wounds to treat. Aha! Do you like that? Laughing, Metal hit again behind the doorway, and put his blaster aside. He had to let it cool down, 
or the barrel would actually turn incandescent. As the battle proceeded, and the hours passed, Dager decided it was time to set their plan in motion. Dab, Cell, you guys are up. Take Alpha Platoon and clear the building we went by earlier. The one with the high windows. Get to the roof and stay there. Only fire if it's worth it. Roger that, sir. What exactly are we to look for? Anything out of the norm, but especially their new strategist. He must be at the back lines, but he needs to be close to the battlefield. If you see him, ping me, and I will confirm the shot. Brain, Tech, 3-4, Metal, you guys come with me. We will hunt for a set pie. The higher the rank, the better. Chapter 329 Kicking open a door, Dab entered a small apartment. A family of three blue-skinned Christophsians looked terrified at the clone. His battle-scarred armor and raised blaster made him seem scarier than he actually was. Jordi. Kalia Hishila to me. The two parents pushed their child behind them protectively, and one of them grabbed a knife and pointed it at the clone while saying something he didn't understand. Even though he tried to appear strong, he was shaking in fear. Ignoring them, Dab advanced further into the apartment, followed by Cell. The scout wasn't as cold-hearted as him, and tried to calm down the family. Don't worry, we won't hurt you. We just need to check your house. It will be over soon, I promise. He didn't like to intrude upon civilians' homes, but there was no other option. They couldn't risk leaving a bunch of clankers on their backs. If the natives weren't hiding anyone, then Cell would apologize and leave if they were. He wouldn't be so soft. Clear. Dab came back from the back of the apartment, and nodded to Cell. The scout made a small gesture with his hand to the family, and left. He pitted them. For reasons they couldn't control, and maybe didn't even know about, they were caught in the middle of a war. It didn't cross his mind how similar of a situation the clones were in. This was the last one. All right, Bison, it's time you leave. Sure thing, Cell. Good luck. Without waiting, Dab and Cell climbed the stairs up to the rooftop, and set camp there. Many idle hours would pass before they got the chance to do anything, but they were patient. While their two brothers were finally having the chance to rest, Dager and the rest of Hell Squad were locked in a life-or-death struggle. Reloading. That's my last mag, Commander. I'm almost out too. We gotta get out, sir. Hearing Brain and Tech yell, Dager looked over the pile of rubble he was hiding behind, and almost had his head torn from his shoulders by a torrent of lasers. They got two crabs looking at us. We have to take them out first. Besides, the droid captain is still there. Remember he is our target. We won't be able to get anything from him if we are dead, Commander. 3-4 brought up a good point. If they couldn't make it out alive, then capturing the clanker would be of no use. Albeit unwilling, Dager had to give up. Brain, how many droid poppers do you still have? Only two. It will be enough. Metal, tech, and 3-4 cover us. Brain, on go we run to that statue, okay? Roger that, sir. Ready when you are. One. Two. Three. Go. Together, the two clones jumped out of their cover, aiming for the fallen statue fifty meters away from them. Red lasers passed zooming by their heads, and blue ones came from behind them. As the first row of droids fell down, Dager and Brain arrived at the piece of cover. Two consecutive yells of pain marked the deaths of two clones behind them, and Brain let put a grunt as a laser scratched his arm. Luckily, the pain was caused only by the impact, and the laser didn't actually injure him. Peeking over the rubble, Dager saw the crab droids just a few meters away from them. Like the rest of the droid army, they were marching forward inexorably, although they had yet to make the clones retreat a single step. The two armies were locked in what seemed like a standard battle, which left Dager with a bad feeling. After over a week of new and unusual tactics, why would they suddenly revert to the normal? Pushing those thoughts to the back of his mind, the commander focused on the problem at hand. Catching the electromagnetic pulse grenade, or droid popper, that brain three to him, he activated it and launched it over his shoulder. 
He had already memorized the clanker's position, so he didn't even need to expose himself to throw the grenade. Brain mimicked him. Two weird noises, followed by metal falling to the ground, rang. In one fluid movement, Dayjerk and Brain got up and unloaded their entire magazines onto the two crab droids, until their heads exploded. After all, only deactivating them momentarily wasn't enough. All right, boys, we are falling back. To the barricades, and hold your ground. Dager's apparently contradictory orders set a few thousand clones in motion, as they positioned themselves on any kind of cover they could find or had built. As night came, their job wasn't to advance, but to stop the clankers from gaining terrain. And, even though Dager's idea of capturing a Sep-Pi officer failed, the Republic Army managed to maintain the battle in a stalemate until the droids decided to retreat. And it was when night fell, and the clankers left, that the real attack began. Ah! When the first blood-curdling scream cut the night, Dager woke up immediately. There was no mistaking it. The one who just uttered such a noise was a clone. Without worrying about putting on his helmet, Dager dashed out of his quarters, holding his DC-17 in his vibroblade. Hell Squad, apart from Dab and Cell, were right behind him. Countless other soldiers were also searching frantically, trying to find the source of the scream. It didn't take long before they found the bodies of a patrol, all six clones with their throats cut. Arbal, come in. We got Seppis here. They sneaked behind us, and are ambushing our sentries. The commander was so focused on the reports of more and more troopers being found dead that it took him a while to notice Captain Arbal hadn't answered him. When he tried again, there was still nothing. Hell squad, on me. Move, move, move. Lieutenant, keep an eye on the Seppis, don't let them take advantage of the confusion to attack us. The others, search for whoever is ambushing us. Frist, contact our other troops, warn them. Target, I want numbers, and I want every captain or above to enter in contact with me in the next three minutes, otherwise assume they are dead. Understood, Commander. Roger that. I'm on it. Without waiting for his orders to be carried out, Dager led Hell Squad to Captain Arbal's quarters. As the commander of this battlefield, he had a room for himself. When they got there, they found the two guards dead, pierced in the chest by something sharp and powerful enough to break through the Phase II armor where it was the hardest. The door was open, and the control panel broken. Carefully, Hell Squad entered the room, and found Captain Arbal dead on his bed, his throat torn open. There was still blood gushing out, which meant that it had happened very recently. Damn it! We were too late. Arbal was their first target. He was the commander of this battlefield, at least until we arrived, but the Seppis couldn't know that. Commando droids? Dager shook his head, and approached Captain Arbal's body. Examining the wound, he was even more sure of it. Look at the cut. It isn't clean, as a blade would leave it, but ragged. Whatever eliminated him didn't use a vibroblade, but teeth and claws. Chapter 330 This is Commander Dager speaking. Captain Arbal is dead. The attacker is some sort of unidentified creature, possibly more than one. I don't want any trooper alone. I repeat, I don't want any trooper alone. Even as he transmitted his orders to every trooper under him, something only commanders could do, and on exceptional occasions, reports of more clones being found dead came in. There was no way of knowing when or where the unknown enemy would strike, and Hell Squad could only run around aimlessly. However, his orders of grouping up worked. Whatever was attacking them slowed down, since it couldn't find easy targets. Sir, we need you on the south side. We trapped it. Hearing that, Dager gestured for Hell Squad to follow him, and ran to the south part of the base. Meanwhile, he also contacted Cell and Dab, to see if they had noticed any movement by the Separatist, but the answer was negative. Dager was both relieved and worried at the same time. Relieved because that meant the enemy didn't plan a big attack tonight, meaning they could worry about killing the creature or creatures that were attacking them. However, he was also worried about how patient and cold-blooded the Seppai tactician was. 
They knew the Republic couldn't send more troops to reinforce Christophsis, so they were taking their time to slowly chip away at the clone army's forces and morale. Either way, Dejer couldn't see how the Republic would win the battle, unless they found and eliminated that new strategist. He also knew that such responsibility was bound to fall upon Hell Squad's shoulders. But that was something to worry about later. For now, they had to eliminate the thing that had ambushed them. And that was exactly what Hell Squad would do. Arriving at their destination, they found a bunch of clones surrounding a deposit. The building was actually a two-story Christophsian mansion, repurposed for storage of ammunition. Is it inside? Yes, Commander. It attacked us, but we managed to repel it, then it ran inside. Two of them actually. We thought it was better to call you before entering. You did well, Lieutenant. What did they look like? I'm not sure, sir. They were too fast, and it was dark. But I saw that they used their front legs to attack. They were sharp enough to leave an indent on the walls. We gotta be careful. We will. All right, listen up. We got two of them right here, but we don't know how many others are lurking around our base. Until the sun rises, I want every precaution to stay in place. Sparks, you are in charge while Hell Squad goes inside. Split the men into two groups. While one keeps watch, the others rest. You know the drill. Got it, Commander Dager. Leave it to me. Combo, Rack, Alston, Heater, Scar, Bulldozer, and Flint, you are with me in tech. Nerf, Fallout, Dash, Hawkeye, and Drum, you guys are with Metal, 3-4, and Brain. Brain, take the first floor, I will take the second. Keep your guards up, those things are smart and deadly. The chosen clones nodded, and prepped their blasters. At a signal from Dager, the door was opened, and they entered. Two red eyes flashed in the darkness, searching. It knew the prey would come to them on their own accord. However, it was unknown who was the prey and who was the hunter now. And it knew that. It knew it had to be careful. Its instincts told it that danger was nearby, so it didn't dare to be arrogant. It would be cautious and deadly, like it was taught. Eliminate and retreat. Hissing, it contacted its partner. They were brother and sister, and had been raised together. They were the sole survivors of their litter, after they had eliminated all their weaker siblings. Only the strong survived in their world. Somewhere along the wall, its brother answered with a hiss of its own. Silently, it climbed to the ceiling and stood upside down, waiting. Suddenly, a bright light illuminated the building, hurting its eyes. Growling, it dropped down instinctively, and hid beneath a crate. Anger and bloodlust started to emanate from it. It had lost one of its advantages, and it didn't like it. Turning in the lights of the deposit, Dager and his brothers walked forward slowly. It was a labyrinth of ammo crates reaching up to their chest, and it was full of hiding spots for small beasts. With a hand gesture, Dager told his group to follow him, and went up the stairs, leaving Brain and the others to search the first floor. Minute after minute passed, and there was still no sign of the creatures. Dager was starting to think that maybe they had found an open window or something, and got out, when he saw movement up ahead. Without hesitating, he fired, but missed. Whatever the shadow was, it had hidden beneath a crate very quickly. Surround it. Rakran Tech, you are the best shots, so stay back and eliminate it if it escapes us. Brain, do you copy? Yes, Commander. We got one up here, but we don't know where the other is. Keep your eyes peeled. After warning the other group, the clones started to slowly encircle the place where they last saw the beast. At the same time, they pushed some of the crates aside, so it wouldn't have where to hide if it tried to run. What they didn't expect was that the beam didn't plan to escape, but to take the offensive. Ack. Heater screamed and almost fell to the ground when a limb sharper than any blade appeared under one of the crates, and impaled his foot. Cursing, he shot at it, hitting the creature, which let out a screech loud enough to hurt their ears, and retracted its leg. Limping, the clone staggered back, and leaned on a wall, as blood kept gushing out from the wound. It was about five or six centimeters long, and two or three centimeters wide, 
and went all the way through his foot. Ah! Damn thing! That hurts! Stay back, Heater. That thing was able to pierce through the armor, you, and the ground. We aren't taking any risks anymore. Combo, Bulldozer, and Scar, get ready. You are going to push the crate, and we will eliminate it. How are we supposed to push it, sir? If we get close, we are gonna end up like Heater. Dajer felt like cursing when he realized he hadn't accounted for that. They couldn't use grenades, obviously, so the only way would be to move it manually. But whoever took up the task risked ending up with a severed limb. We could try using a droid popper, Commander Dajer. It won't hurt it, but it might scare it enough so it jumps out by itself. Alston's idea was immediately approved by Dajer, who took out one of the electromagnetic pulse grenades, and rolled it under the box. The creates were all raised a few dozen centimeters over the ground, in case of a flood, standard procedure, so the droid popper disappeared under it with no problems. Next thing they knew, a spider-like creature jumped at Combo, its sharp teeth ripping his throat open. Chapter 331 Faster than any of the clones, even Dajer, could react, a green blur appeared from under the box, and jumped on Combo. Scared by the explosion of the droid popper, the creature had attacked the first thing it saw, and sunk its razor-sharp teeth into his throat. The clone couldn't even scream, and all that came out was a gurgling noise. Letting go of his weapons, he tried to push the creature away, but all he managed to do was trip and fall. Dajer watched as two of the six legs of the spider-like being pierced Combo's torso, and he stopped struggling immediately. The Phase II armor, reinforced with blast padding, was weaker than paper before the sharp limbs. Although it was clear Combo was dead, Dajer and his brothers couldn't bring themselves to shoot the creature, for fear of hitting him. Instead, Tech ran forward, and kicked it. The animal, however, didn't appear to feel the blow. Instead, it shrieked at the clone, before jumping towards him. But Tech wasn't just any trooper, and was prepared for it. Pressing the trigger two times in quick succession, he hit its head. Still in midair, the creature was launched in the opposite direction by the force behind the lasers, and, impressively, managed to get up, even though two black holes had replaced the right half of its head. Still, its steps were shaky, and it was clear it was at its wit's end. Not wanting to take any chances, after seeing what the beast was capable of, all the clones fired at it a few times. This time, when it fell, it didn't get up. Alston knelt besides Combo and checked on his brother before shaking his head. Not only had the animal bitten his throat, but it had also pierced his heart with its legs. There was no doubt it was a creature that evolved to eliminate quickly and efficiently. What is that? Finally being able to have a good look at the beast, Dajer couldn't help but ask. He had seen and eliminated many monsters in the galaxy, including the mighty rankers, but he had never seen anything like that. It was light green, and had six long, and extremely sharp legs. They didn't end in any kind of paw or claw, but in a tip that would put any blade to shame. As for its head, it was supported by a long neck, and it was slightly flat. Most of it was completely deformed because of the lasers, but Dajer could make out the rows of sharp teeth. I think it's called an Acklay, sir. I saw it during the first battle of Geonosis. I was on the gunship sent to that arena to rescue the Jedis, and the bugs had trained one of those things to fight. It was trying to eat General Kenobi when we got there, but he managed to eliminate it. Only, that one was about four meters tall, while this one here doesn't even reach my hips. Maybe it's still young. Still, it's as deadly as the bigger ones. And look at the scars it has. I bet you the Geonosians also train this one, only it hunts clones instead of fighting in an arena. Looking closely, Dajer realized Tech was right. Several scars, of all sizes, covered the Acklay. It had been trained to be deadly and savage. But his thoughts were suddenly interrupted when the lights went out without any prior warning. All the clones there were had seen too much to believe in coincidences, so they immediately lowered their night vision devices, which made everything acquire a shade of green. Brain, what is your status? Nothing down here yet, Commander. But we heard a lot of fighting up there. We eliminated one of the creatures. They are called Acklays. 
Unfortunately, they got combo. What about the lights? I was about to ask you if I should send someone to fix the power, sir. There is one of those things still here, and it is smart enough to mess with the power panel. If you go there you are only gonna find cut cables. Keep searching, and be extra careful. We will do the same here. Good hunting, sir. Using its sharp teeth, the remaining Ackley bit off the energy cables. It had heard the dying scream of its brother, and it was angry. But it knew it wouldn't be able to survive if it tried to fight the prey head-on, so it had to bring back one of its few advantages. The darkness. Holding back the urge to throw itself at its hateful enemies, the Ackley started crawling towards them slowly. When one of the clones heard it, the creature was already lunging at them. With an ear-piercing shriek, the Ackley cut up the clone's throat using one of its limbs. Arg! Brain turned around as soon as he heard Hawkeye scream, and found a dark shadow gripping him tightly, as blood tainted the front of his blue and white armor. Night vision didn't mean they had eyes on the back of their heads, and the Ackley was an ambush predator. It had waited patiently for its chance to strike, and, when it did, it reaped a life. Before they could do anything, the Ackley had already jumped back into the shadows, and Hawkeye fell dead. However, the creature had never faced an enemy with night vision devices such as the clones, and had thought that just hiding a few meters away was enough to escape. It was severely wrong. Blue lasers lit up the entire deposit, two of them hitting the Ackley before it would run, screeching in pain. It limped away, and hid behind one of the many crates. At about the same time, Dager and the others ran downstairs, having heard the blasters being fired. Where is it? It disappeared. We lost one. Drum and metal, guard the stairway to the second floor, don't let it go through. The others, we need to search this floor meter by meter. Let's start on this side, and go all the way through. The soldiers barely had time to acknowledge Dager's orders when the Ackley stroke again. Out of nowhere, it appeared and bit Tech's leg, grabbing onto it, and not letting go. One of its legs tried to stab him, but the clone managed to grab it. Arg! Get this thing off me! He tried to pull off the Ackley, and thrown it away, but ended up hurting himself more than anything. Tech, stay still! Stay still, Tech! It should have been a difficult, almost impossible, command to follow, considering the pain he was in, but the clone didn't hesitate when he heard both Dager and Brain yell at him. Ignoring the creature glued to him, he stopped moving. Almost immediately, two lasers missed him by a few millimeters, and hit the Ackley's neck and torso. Shrieking, the beast let go of Tech, and tried to crawl away, but the clones wouldn't be dumb enough to let it hide again. Dager stepped forward, and, wielding his vibroblade, cut off its head, putting an end to it once and for all. For a few seconds, the headless body twitched, then stood still. Chapter 332 Metal kicked the Ackley's body angrily, making it flop around. They had underestimated the two creatures, thinking they were just stupid animals, and that had cost them two more soldiers, as well as a few wounded. Do you think we got them all, sir? There weren't any other attacks reported. It can't be easy to train those things, so unleashing two of them on us is probably all the Seppis could do. They eliminated thirteen of ours, of which three were captains, including Arbol, and two were lieutenants. All from the 212th. They must have learned to recognize their armor. Ouch! Can you be more careful, 3-4? Quit complaining. Dager had already sent back the troopers that had accompanied them, and only Hell Squad waited in the deposit's entrance. Heater needed immediate treatment, while 3-4 could easily take care of Tech. Sharp as they were, the Ackley's teeth were still small, and only dangerous if he managed to bite the throat. An area with a huge amount of muscle such as the thigh would only receive a nasty scar, nothing more. And, for soldiers, scars were a trophy, not a reason for shame. This is gonna match nicely with the one you got from those Blix's spawns in Ando. Now you have one in each leg, Tech. Even 3-4, who was usually very serious when medicating someone, couldn't help but laugh out loud. During one of their many battles, Tech had been bitten in his right leg, and now it had happened to him again, only this time it was on the left one. 
It was as if he had allowed it to happen on purpose. Grinning, Dejer tapped Tech's shoulder as his brother glared angrily at the rest of Hell Squad. They knew each other too well to believe that he actually was angry. Come on, let's sleep. We have a busy day tomorrow. For the next two weeks, the Republic was pushed back kilometer by kilometer, meter by meter. Without reinforcements, their losses were growing exponentially, while the Separatists seemed to have an unending inventory of droids, which wasn't far from the truth. Deja was forced to call back Dab and Cell, their mission of killing the enemy leader ending up in a failure. Even Ragu's arrival wasn't enough to turn the tides. In just a few days, the almost a million troopers had been reduced to just 300,000. Not all of them died, obviously, but many were wounded and had to be evacuated. In other parts of Christophsis, the situation was even worse. Slowly but surely, the clone army on the planet was being decimated. Over a hundred kilometers away from Hell Squad's base, a small clone garrison guarded a town already conquered by the Republic. Since the front lines were almost 80 kilometers from there, there was no need for a large group. Only one sergeant and twenty-something soldiers were responsible for it. At the moment, one of the troopers was looking at one of the many panels, keeping an eye on the radar. Meanwhile, three others were playing a game in a hologram table, four or five were sleeping, and another two were cleaning their weapons. The remaining, including the sergeant, were patrolling. The monotony of their day was broken when the radar and scanner stopped working, and even the hologram table started to fail. As laid back as they might appear to be, the garrison was all made up by veterans. In a few seconds, they all had their armor on, had grabbed their weapons, and sounded the alarm. Sarge, we got a problem. Hey, Sarge. Do you copy? Sarge. After two tries, the trooper gave up. Only static was coming through the comm link, which only reinforced their conviction that this wasn't just a mechanical failure, but an attack. Deck, try to contact our people on the front lines. Tell them we are being attacked, and that they have to be prepared. Already tried, brother. Comms are jammed. Alright, we have to warn them somehow. Zap, take a speeder and go. We will hold them back. What about Sarge and the others? The only way the Seppis could have jammed our comms without us noticing anything weird is if they did it from the inside, and using one of our devices. That means Sarge and the others are gone. His brothers looked at him and cursed. Still, they didn't hesitate, and followed his orders. Before they could even leave the room, however, the door was blown open. Several clankers, including commando droids, marched in, already firing. Two clones fell dead instantly, while the others managed to hide and return fire. They managed to hold on for a while, but, as more droids entered the room, the clone that had taken their sergeant's place knew they couldn't stay there or they would be overwhelmed. We gotta leave. Zap, remember what I told you. You have to reach General Ragu and Commander Dejer. They must know about this, or they will all be eliminated. Shooting and retreating, they managed to reach the room where the speeders were stored. Unfortunately, they lost three more soldiers in the process. Zap, now. Go. But what about? We will be fine, just go. It was an obvious lie, accentuated by another of his brothers getting hit and dropping to the ground dead. Still, clones were decisive and determined. Zap knew that if he hesitated too long, thousands more would lose their lives, and the death of the garrison would be in vain. Clenching his fists, he jumped on a BRC speeder, barely dodging a few lasers. Turning the vehicle around, he fired a few shots of the twin laser cannons, killing three or four droids in the front row, and slowing them down for a few seconds. After that, he gave his brothers one last look, and sped up. As he zoomed through the streets, he saw dozens of thousands of seppis entering what would be the range of their scanners. He also heard his squad members scream as they fell one after another, victim to the red lasers spewed by the E-5s. Several lasers flew past him, losing their accuracy the furthest he got. Still, three or four managed to hit him in the back, and he almost fell from the vehicle. Gritting his teeth, Zap laid down on the speeder, and held on. He knew that if he passed out, he would be as good as dead. 
Now, he only had one thing in mind, reaching danger, and telling him about the danger that approached. One of the Republic dogs managed to get away, sir. Useless. Now they know we are coming. I should trash you. We hit him thrice, sir. He probably died and his vehicle crashed. Breathing heavily, the person talking to the droid let a smile touch his lips. Pulling out a blaster pistol, he blew off the B-1's head. You are the new commander now, Captain. Hurry up, accelerate the pace. I want to be there tomorrow morning. The poor captain, recognizable by the yellow paint on his head and shoulders, looked at his predecessor, and showed what should be a nervous look on his face. Chapter 333 Deja was talking to Ragu while gesturing to some of their broken vehicles when he heard a commotion. Turning to its source, he saw a BRC speeder flying towards them at speeds much higher than it should. Frowning, Deja lowered his macro binoculars, while the soldiers around him aimed their blasters at the vehicle. After so many unorthodox tactics from the Separatists the last couple of days, they were scared easily by anything out of the usual. Hold your fire. It's one of ours, and he is wounded. Get a medic. Burner, help me stop the speeder before it crashes into something or someone. Having said that, Dager jumped on a speeder himself, mimicked by Burner. Together, they zoomed towards Zap, and positioned themselves one on each side of him. With a little bit of trouble, they managed to slow it down, and eventually stop it. Dager had already noticed several black spots on the BRC speeder, certainly caused by lasers. The driver wasn't in a much better shape. A few dozen clones, including Hell Squad, encircled them as Dager and burned lowered Zap. He was barely breathing, having been hit three times. One of the wounds wasn't so bad, only injuring his shoulder, but the other two lasers had hit him right in the back. By the looks of it, his lungs had been perforated, and several organs were completely scorched. It was a miracle he was still alive. The medic looked at him for a second before shaking his head to danger. The commander nodded slowly, before patting Zap's head, to wake him up from his stupor. What happened, brother? Where were you attacked? Garrison. Wiped out. Sixty thousand. Droids. At least. Garrison. Zap didn't hear Dager, his eyes unfocused. He kept repeating the same words, over and over again. Clearly, he had relied on them to hold on for so long, even if he was mortally wounded. He didn't even realize he had arrived at his destiny. I know him, sir. Zap was assigned to the outpost in Sector GH-11. That is almost a hundred kilometers behind our lines. How did they get attacked and we didn't hear of it? How did the Sepis reach them even? While the others were discussing, Dager and Ragu were still kneeling beside Zap. The Jedi put a hand on his friend's shoulder, and calmed him down with the Force. Pass. Message. Warn you. Commander. Don't let. Death for. Nothing. In a last moment of lucidity, Zap grabbed Dager's forearm, his words barely audible. After that, his grip lost strength. I won't, brother. Don't worry. What are you thinking, General? Zap's body had already been carried away, and the troopers had dispersed, leaving only Hell Squad and Ragu. It's pretty obvious. The Separatists managed to sneak a sizable force behind our lines. Somehow, they captured our bases and outposts before they could send out any kind of distress signal. Fortunately, Zap managed to escape and survive long enough to tell us this, otherwise we would be engaged in battle only to then be attacked from behind. Pincered, we wouldn't have any shot at survival, much less winning. Our chances are still low, even if we know about their attack. What can we do? We don't have enough troops to resist one army, whatsoever too. Cell's words sent Ragu into deep thought. Neither he nor the clones were used to fantasizing and lying to themselves about their own destiny. If they were going to die, then they were going to die, plain and simple. But they would only admit defeat when there was no other option. Come. The Christophians swore to fight alongside the Republic, for the liberation of their own planet. It's time they live up to their promises. 
Reluctantly, Ohm let the Jedi and the clones who followed him enter his home. Over the past days, the Tigruta had been trying to meet him frequently, but he had managed to avoid it. Until now. Unfortunately for him, this time Ragu had threatened to cut down his door if he refused to let them in. An uncharacteristic behavior by a Jedi, but, hearing the coldness in his voice, Ohm had no doubt Ragu wouldn't hesitate to fulfill the threat. Master Jedi, what can I do for you? Sit down, Ohm. As we speak, Republic troops are facing 700,000 droids in the front. An unconfirmed number of Sepis is also preparing to attack us from behind. They will arrive tomorrow afternoon at the latest. The clone army is outnumbered three to one. You, however, have over 200,000 soldiers under your command, who had been doing nothing. The Christophian was speechless. As a politician, he was used to hours of small talk and pleasantries before reaching the main topic. His counterparts were never so blunt. But he still had his pride, and couldn't accept a scolding. Master Ragu. This is my home, and I want you to show some respect. Christoph says sided with the Republic, and has been giving useful information and help to you. Several of our people lost their lives. A fraction of what the clone army lost, Governor. And the majority of them were civilians, not soldiers. The only members of the Christophian army that died were those who decided to ignore the orders of you and your friends, and fight for their planet and their freedom. At least they died with some honor, and knowing that they were fighting for what is right. It's a shame I can't say the same about you. Why you? Make no mistake, Ohm. I'm not one of the diplomats and seat warmers of the Senate you dealt with before. If you refuse to pay the trust your people put on you when they elected you, Commander Dager will arrest you for interfering with the war efforts. Ragu had spent more of his training with clones than he did with his fellow Jedis, and it was normal he started to resemble them, and mimic the way they talked. He was, after all, a little more than a kid, and was easily influenced, although the countless scars and the threatening air around him might hint otherwise. Ohm was shaking, horrified, when he heard the Tigruta. He was nothing like the calm image he had of the peacekeepers the Jedis were supposed to be. He was ruthless. The terrifying clone behind him, with a giant scar, only contributed to his fear. Why you can't do that? You don't have the authority. No, I don't. At least not to fully arrest you. But I need the Christophian army tomorrow, and by then, the news of you being imprisoned wouldn't even have reached the ears of your friends yet. They won't follow your orders. Even more if you arrest me. You are missing the point, Governor. We are not your enemy. I'm not your enemy. The Separatists are. I already overlooked the shady dealings you had with the CIS before the war, but, if you continue to refuse to aid the Republic, I will start to think you maintain some old friendships. This time, Ohm was truly scared. He didn't betray the Republic, and he also wanted to save Christophsis. However, he didn't want to lose the army under his command. Still, in the end, he had to concede. He knew Ragu had the means to make it look like he was a traitor. Whether or not a Jedi would really do that, he didn't know, but he didn't dare to test it. Coward. One of the clones muttered something under his breath, barely understandable. Still, Omes' blue skin burned red with shame. Quiet, metal. He is finally doing something right. You will see, Governor. Tomorrow we will either be all dead, and you can push the blame to us, or we will have one, and you can take the credit. Remember, clones don't fight for fame. I certainly don't. We fight for the free people of the galaxy, and for the people of Christophsis. The Christophian was dumbstruck, realizing that in his indignation and anger, he had forgotten what should truly matter to him. Oh, and just so you know, I already talked to the officers of the Christophian army stationed here. With or without your consent, they would have followed us into battle tomorrow. They are fighting for their home, after all. Orders only matter so much when everything you know and love is at stake. Chapter 334 Don't you think you were a bit too harsh with him, General? He almost fainted with fear. Bah! He deserves it. Who knows how many more of us would have to fight and die because of his little schemes. 
he wouldn't last a minute in a battle. Hell Squad laughed loudly, while Ragu limited himself to a grin. The clones knew him all too well. Not for a moment had they believed that the Tigruta would imprison Om based on false accusations. He had too much of his master's righteousness and the Jedi Order's mentality to do so. In fact, of all the threats he made to the Christophian governor, the only real one was that he had already talked to the officers in his army. Commander, what do you think? That we have a battle tomorrow that we are almost certainly going to lose. Quit joking around, and go prepare. Now. Dejo's words were like a bucket of cold water being poured on one of their rare moments of fun. They were so unprepared for it that they had to stop and look at him. The seriousness in his voice, and the darkness in his eyes assured them he wasn't joking. Something had made Dejo very angry, although they didn't know what. Not daring to disobey, Hell Squad left. Before they did so, Brain knocked on his helmet, a worried and questioning look on his face. To that, Dejo only nodded. When there was no one else in sight, the commander turned to face Ragu. He knew that from the moment his mood had taken a turn, the Jedi had sensed it. It was inevitable that he would make inquiries. Something has been troubling you, Dajer, from the moment Ohm opened his mouth. What is it? And don't tell me it's just your normal worries. I know you too well. You really do, General. It's. Say it. Dejo's eyes were on Ragu, but it was obvious to the Jedi that his mind was elsewhere entirely. This is too similar to Ryloth, Ragu. Once again we are outnumbered, outgunned, and about to be decimated. The Twi'leks we fought and died for left us that time, and the Christophians almost did the same. Heck, they did do the same. Two hundred thousand poorly trained soldiers are the same as nothing. The number of times Dejo called Ragu by his name, without his rank, could be counted in one hand. Each time it was when Hell Squad and he were at their lowest. That was enough to show the Jedi how overwhelmed the commander was feeling. And, unfortunately, he was right, like always. What will we do this time, sir? Run again. Leaving my brothers to die. You know Hell Squad can't do that. Not again. Not for a people that won't even fight for their own planet. At least Sindulla had the courage to do that. We won't run. This time we will fight to the very last man. If we are to die, we will do so together, and we will take as many of them as we can with us. A memorable end. Dejo's eyes focused, and he took a deep breath. He was losing control of his emotions more and more often recently. He didn't care if Ragu saw it, but the others couldn't. For them, he had to, and he would, always be Commander Dager, the one recognized as the best soldier in the clone army. Don't you try to convince me to escape once again, understood, trooper. Ha ha ha. I wouldn't dare, general. Where you go, Hell Squad follows. Where you make your last stand, it's also where ours will be. It's good to hear that. And, Dager? I swear to you, I won't let Ryloth happen again. Never. The next morning, the battle started as usual. Republic and Separatist clashed once again, dozens falling every minute. There was no sign of the Christophian army. Surprisingly enough, the Republic was winning. That happened because Ragu had committed all their troops, including the rear guard and the reserve, to the defense. A dangerous tactic, because if even a single clanker squad pierced through their lines, they could cause a lot of damage. But it seemed to be working, since the droids were pushed back, row after row of B-1 units being trashed, and vehicles being destroyed. Still, following Dager's orders, the clone army didn't advance, but held their defensive positions. As for the second separatist army, that planned on attacking the clones from behind, only eight people waited for them. Hell Squad and Ragu waited for the enemy on one of the main roads. It was large enough for several at TES to walk side by side, so when just the eight of them stood there, it looked quite empty. They could feel hidden eyes staring at them from every direction. The civilians inside their apartments must be wondering why they were there, when the battle was raging a few kilometers away. Finally, after over an hour, Sel whistled, and put down his binoculars. Here they come. A lot of them. 
but at least I only see B1S and B2S, no vehicles or anything bigger. 60,000 droids already make a lot of noise, vehicles would be detected easily. Deja and Ragu looked at each other, and the clone let out one of his rare grins. Putting on his helmet, he ran his fingers through the markings on his armor. You know we are probably going to die, right, General? Yep. So what? Nothing. Let's do it. Laughing, Ragu dropped his robe, revealing the Jedi clothes underneath, and his lightsaber. Next to him, Hell Squad put on their helmets. He could feel their excitement, their desire for battle. And so, all by themselves, they started walking towards the enemy army, under the astonished gazes of the civilians, and also from Ohm, who was watching from afar. For the 303rd. A blue-skinned Chiss watched as seven clones and a Tigruta walked towards them. His expression was contorted into a frown. It didn't make sense. Nothing of it did. General Thrawn. Do we open? Fire. Something is very wrong. Send an emissary. I want to hear the Jedi. He was a brilliant strategist, but he couldn't see what the Jedi wanted to accomplish. He already had checked all the buildings dozens of blocks to either side, and no clones were hiding there. He also knew that all the Republic troopers were engaged with his own troops on the front lines. Unless the Tigruta wanted to parlay, he was just walking to his death. Still, that bothered Thrawn. He liked to be in control, and know everything, but this time this wasn't possible. While he was furiously thinking, he first ordered his army to stop, for fear of walking into a trap. A B-1 unit had already reached the eight enemies, and showed his hologram to them. The safest way to talk to a Jedi was over a distance. Master Ragu, I must admit you intrigue me. What exactly do you think you will accomplish by? You are. Thrawn stuttered, not used to being so rudely interrupted. Still, he was a man of culture, and who cared a lot about his demeanor, so he recovered quickly. I am General Mithran Urudo. You can call me General Thrawn. I suppose you are the one who has been giving me and my troops so much trouble this last month. I am simply using some unorthodox tactics, Jedi Master. The soldiers under you aren't easy to deal with. Unorthodox tactics. That was a bit low, even for a Seppai. There is no honor in war, Jedi. You are right on that. Dab. Yes, sir. Shoot him. Chapter 335 Shoot him. If it was any other person saying it, Thrawn would have laughed. He was over five kilometers away from the Jedi. No one could be this accurate, especially when the clone he had called, Dab, was standing, with no support or stable surface whatsoever. But something in Ragu's voice made him freeze. Maybe it was the lack of emotion, or the confidence with which he said it, as if Dab hitting the target was already guaranteed. Maybe it was the fact that he had thoroughly studied Hell Squad, and knew everything there was to know about them. Facts remain, he felt danger. An unbelievable amount of danger, as if his life was hanging by a thread. Which it was. He reacted quickly, and pushed the newly promoted droid captain in front of him. That action saved his life, because in the next second, a blue laser pierced a hole through the clanker's head, exactly where he was a moment before. A second laser, fired shortly after the first one, hit his left arm, sending him staggering backwards. He expected more lasers to follow, but instead, there was only silence. He could see at his hologram projector the Jedi smiling with a nonchalant look on his face. Embarrassed, he realized that he had forgotten how righteous the Jedis thought they were. They would never target a defenseless enemy. Still, the clones besides him weren't so merciful, and Dab had clearly fired to eliminate. Using the force, Ragu pulled the hologram projector that the droid was carrying, and looked at Thrawn. Dajer stepped forward, and cut off the emissary's head. General Thrawn, you sent bombers, monsters, and tried to use poison against my troops. Hell Squad here lost many good brothers because of you. As you surely are thinking, I am different from other Jedis. Many of your counterparts have pointed that out to me. What do you mean? I mean that I've seen too much war, and that I am tired of it. 
Unless you and your troops run back to your hiding holes, we will be forced to eliminate you. I'm not gonna be the one to hold Hell Squad back. Ragu had to admit that Thrawn was quite impressive. Even though he had just been shot, the Chiss had quickly regained his composure, and maintained a stone-cold expression as they talked. If my eyes do not deceive me, you are only eight, Master Jedi. How exactly do you plan on killing all of us? Ragu laughed out loud, and even Hell Squad couldn't help but chuckle when they heard the Separatist. They weren't good or stupid enough to think they could destroy 60,000 droids by themselves. But that never was their plan. I didn't say I would end all the piles of scrap metal behind you, Thrawn. I said I would eliminate you. And I'm sure you read the reports about me and Hell Squad. You know we can do that. Having said that, Ragu threw the hologram projector on the ground, and resumed walking. Hell Squad followed him, three to the left, four to the right. Even though they were walking to their deaths, they felt no fear. Remember, follow the plan. Leave it to us, General. You got the hard part, so try not to die. Thrawn looked at the wound in his arm dismissively, not at all bothered by the pain. What worried him the most was not knowing what the Republic dogs were up to. He liked to be in control, and when things didn't make sense, he got angry. Suddenly, the group that had been calmly walking towards them split up. Dajer and his men found cover on the sides of the road, leaving only Ragu in the middle. He had a grin on his face, and turned on his lightsaber. It was then that Thrawn realized that Tegruta had already achieved his objective, and that he had fallen to the Jedi's trick. Republic scum. All troops, advance. They are just wasting our time. Petty tricks. All Ragu wanted was to give the soldiers on the front lines more time, so they could cause more damage to the Separatist. In other words, the Jedi was a sore loser, who couldn't accept his defeat. That's why only he and Hell Squad faced Thrawn, so he would think there was a trap, and hesitate. But there was no trap, no plan, no nothing. Or so he thought. Even as the clankers under his command fired the first lasers, and Ragu deflected them, Dajer and Hell Squad waited quietly. Thrawn might have an army of 60,000 with him, but since he didn't have any vehicles with him, only 20 or 30 could aim and fire at the Jedi at a time. The front rows of the army blocked the view of the ones behind. Of course, 30 droids firing at the same time was still a huge number. However, it was still doable for Ragu. Dodging and weaving, he managed to survive for a few more seconds, which was all they needed. Whenever you feel like it, Dajer. They are coming, sir. Hold on for a little while more. Having said that, Dajer squeezed the trigger of his DC-15A twice, killing one tin can with each laser. The droids were so closely packed that it would be difficult to miss even if he wanted to. Suddenly, from the windows of the buildings and from the side streets, thousands of blue lasers hit the droid army. Although poorly coordinated, the attack managed to destroy thousands of units in a single swoop. And, from everywhere, the coward Christophsians appeared, to fight for their planet. Taka was the general of the Christophsian army. Allocated under Governor Ohm. For months now, he had been asking to fight, but because of stupid political reasons, he never received permission. When Ragu came to him, he didn't hesitate to join the young Jedi, even if it meant going against the orders of the superior. One of the reasons why he did so was because Ragu was honest with him, exposing the entire situation, and their low chances of victory. Another was that he simply wanted to piss off Ohm, since the governor would rather let his people die than utilize his army. Of course, the main reason was that he wanted to free his planet of the separatist oppression. And so, as crazy and suicidal as he thought the Jedi's plan was, he went along with it. 200,000 clones wouldn't be easy to hide from the Separatist, but 200,000 Christophsians could easily pass by as scared civilians, hiding in their homes. Taka had to admit that his army was poorly trained, and barely better than recruits. For many, that was their first battle. But they did well. In their overconfidence, the droids had neglected protecting their flank, and were crushed. Four and a half hours later, the battle was ending, and the Christophsian general entered the battlefield while letting his subordinates deal with the stragglers. He wanted to find Ragu and Hell Squad, 
if they were still alive. Chapter 336 Taka found the eight people he was looking for holding the enemy commander prisoner. He hadn't doubted that the Jedi would survive the battle, because of his supernatural powers, but he was surprised to find out that all the clones were still alive. Badly hurt, that's true, but alive. It was only now, seeing the veterans covered in new wounds, that Taka associated them with the Hell Squad he heard rumors about. In an army of hundreds of millions, it would be impossible for units not to have similar, or even identical, designations, so when he first heard Ragu refer to them as Hell Squad, he thought they were just a normal unit. But now he was sure they were anything but normal. They had to be the group of clones he heard stories about. It was hard to find anything about them, other than whispers here and there. But those whispers found their way into the ears of those interested in them pretty quickly, and Taka was one of those people. Seven clones, veterans of a thousand battles. Responsible for dozens of thousands of confirmed kills, and who knows how many more. Survivors of a fallen legion. Some said they were metal than flesh. Others said that after so much time fighting alongside the Jedis, they had learned some of their powers. Many thought they were actually a lie, a legend created by the Republic to spread fear in the hearts of their enemies. But on one thing all the rumors agreed. Whoever faced Hell Squad met death. Daedra noticed the Christophian general looking weirdly at him, and frowned. His glare carried hints of admiration, curiosity, and fear. The commander wasn't sure as to why Taka was looking at him like that, but he didn't really care. Most civilians feared clones, because they represented war, and were fearsome looking. The general was a soldier, however, so he shouldn't feel like that. Daedra rarely talked to anyone apart from his brothers and Ragu. He had no idea that the tales of Hell Squad had spread across the galaxy. However, the battle hadn't been nearly as intense as Taka thought it had. Neither Hell Squad nor Ragu were dumb enough to think they could take on 60,000 droids. So, after distracting them for the time it was needed for the Christophians to leave their hiding holes, it was pretty much a normal battle. Obviously, Thrawn had ordered his army to focus fire on them, but there was little they could do when they were being attacked by an enemy almost four times their own, ill-prepared or not. Each of the members of Hell Squad had received their share of injuries, but that was one of the few times they had the luxury of just hiding after being shot, instead of pressing on fighting. Because of that, they were able to avoid any casualties. If the ones attacking were their brothers, instead of the Christophian army, they wouldn't have done so. The cold truth was that they didn't care nearly as much for the natives as they did for the other clones. Family above all else. Still, they had been able to avoid fatal injuries, that's all. For anyone looking, there were more holes in their armor than unharmed spots. Both Dab and Brain had one of their arms immobilized, and were limping hard. Cell still had to recover from the explosion of a wrist rocket, but 3-4 said he would be okay. The medic had been hit on the shoulder, thigh, and left side of his body, but luckily, no organs were damaged. That meant he was in a lot of pain, but no danger. Metal was the one who had it worse of them all. A thermal detonator sent him flying, resulting in a broken leg, and a dislocated shoulder. Three lasers had also found their way to his arm, leaving him with only one good limb. Tech had survived mostly unscathed, apart from two lasers that hit his blast padding. As for Dager, a laser had grazed his side, and another would too put his left arm out of use for a few days. However, that was all. Ragu, even though he was a Jedi, hadn't fared much better than Hell Squad. He was the primary target of every clanker on the proximity. He had a bandage wrapped around his head, and another on his right shoulder and chest. Overall, they were all okay. And, better than that, they had managed to capture Thrawn. Dager had almost eliminated him, but Ragu stopped him. The commander was hesitant, since he had many bad experiences with leaving enemies alive, but orders were orders. Your plan has crumbled around you, Thrawn. Even if we can't win on the front lines, at least we will hold on for a while more. Besides, without their strategist, I doubt the tin cans can plan anything better than marching forward. The Chiss smiled, not angered. He seemed resigned to his fate. Dager didn't like that. 
He was a dangerous foe, and he had already proven that. General. No, danger. He is a prisoner. I can't let you eliminate him in cold blood, and you know that. Dejer knew from the start that the Jedi's convictions wouldn't let him agree with him. Still, he thought it was his duty to point out their options. Thrawn was too dangerous to be left alive. We could simulate an escape, sir. When that happens, we have the right to. That's enough, Dejer. I know that has been done before. That you have done it before. But I do not abide by it. You should know me better than to suggest that. Dejer shrugged, and let go of the matter. He didn't have the morals of the Jedis, but he also didn't want to change Ragu. As a subordinate, he gave a suggestion. It was his superior's choice to accept it or not. I underestimated you, Master Jedi. I studied those lowly Christophians, and never thought they would have the spirit to revolt. However, I didn't account for external influences. That was a valuable lesson, however. Next time I will be more careful. Thrawn laughed even with a lightsaber on his neck, which almost made Ragu regret his decision of leaving him alive. Almost. Bring him in. And make him stay quiet. Dejer nodded, and kicked the Separatist, sending him into unconsciousness. It was brutal, but Thrawn deserved a lot worse for all the inhumane and ruthless tactics he used against the clone army. Ragu, in a very uncharacteristic show of indifference for a Jedi, completely ignored Dejer's actions, and, after nodding to Taka, left. The battle was still going on the front lines, and he was needed. War had changed Ragu, more than it did to any other Padawan. Some, like Beris Afi, with whom Hell Squad had fought alongside before, had fallen to the dark side. Not Ragu. General D's teachings were deeply engraved in his heart, and he trusted the Force to lead him to the correct path. But he had long understood that good manners and mercy wouldn't bring an end to this terrible war. The young Tigruta merged what he was taught with what he had learned. He was a Jedi, but he was also a soldier. If anyone threatened his brothers, he would retaliate, and he wouldn't be kind. Ragu was following his own path, one that the Jedi Order wouldn't approve, but that he knew it was necessary for survival. He wasn't in the light nor the darkness. He was in the gray area in between, and he needed to build his path from scratch. Chapter 337 Two days later, Thrawn was transferred to a prison in Coruscant. During transportation, the convoy was attacked. There were no survivors, and the Chiss disappeared. However, that left both Republic and Separatist baffled, since neither of them were responsible for the attack. With a little pressure from high places, the matter was quickly forgotten. Where am I? Thrawn sounded more curious than anything as the blindfold was taken off of him. He blinked and saw someone wearing a blood-red armor in front of him, carrying an electrostaff. He raised an eyebrow. That was a Senate guard. Where you are, my dear friend, does not matter. What will be made of you should be your main concern. A hooded figure emerged from the darkness, chuckling. Thrawn had already guessed who it was, and was both shocked and impressed. Who would have thought that the one controlling everything was none other than the incorruptible Chancellor of the Galactic Republic? So, what are you? A Jedi? A Sith? Or something else? Chancellor Palpatine smiled knowingly, sending shivers down Thrawn's spine. Black shadows appeared in his mind, craving for blood and death. After what seemed like an eternity, he was left sweating profusely, his composed demeanor nowhere to be seen. He had faced a little of what clones went through every night, and it was too much for him. You. What do you want from me? Kaka Kaka. Your submission, General Thrawn. The Clone Wars are coming to an end. Soon, a new ruler shall lead this galaxy. Republic and Separatist are nothing but children fighting in a playground. Only with an iron fist can one truly command all. The time for the Galactic Empire is approaching. The Chiss felt his blood boil in excitement. He knew he was being partially controlled and influenced by Chancellor Palpatine, who he now was sure was a Sith, but that was also the opportunity he had been searching for his entire life. A chance to be an important piece on the writing of history. 
his name would be remembered, forever. So, are you with me? Are you willing to become my general? Your words will be my commands, my lord. Good, good. Our time is approaching, my general. We will do great things. Kaka kaka kaka. Count Dooku woke from his meditation frowning. The force was unusually clouded these days. He knew Darth Sidious's plans and aspirations from the start, which was why he was responsible for setting up and starting the war. However, things were getting way out of hand. He feared his master might be thinking about disposing of him. One thing was certain, however. The Republic was walking towards its downfall, and he would be there to witness it. And, with it, the time of the hateful Jedi Order was coming to an end. Soon, Sith would rule the galaxy, what they should have been doing for millions of years. In a falling apart deposit in Coruscant, Ventress turned off her lightsaber. Around her, twenty or thirty outlaws had made the mistake of thinking she was an easy prey. They all lay dead, most of them in pieces. It was at that moment that she felt a strong disturbance in the Force. She could feel the dark side calling her, becoming stronger by the minute. However, instead of the smile usually would appear, a frown took her face. There was too much she didn't know, and no one she could trust. Once more she was alone in the galaxy, betrayed by those she trusted. Wrong, something is. But what? I've never seen the Force this foggy before. Into the future pry, we must not. Dangerous it is. Very dangerous, indeed. We must prepare for whatever is coming. Prepare to the unknown, impossible is. Trust ourselves, we will have to. Darth Maul and his companion, Savage Oppress, were observing their lackeys move crates full of contraband around when they felt the surge on the force. A grotesque smile touched both of their lips. Soon the galaxy will be engulfed in chaos, brother. Then, and only then, it will be our time to rule the underworld. On the other side of Coruscant, Ahsoka Tano roamed around aimlessly. After the treacherous Barriss Afi tried to blame her for the Jedi Temple bombing, she was shocked by the lack of trust her fellow Jedis had in her. Even her master, Anakin Skywalker, thought she was the culprit. Like Ragu, she was part of the new generation of Jedis, trained and raised amidst war. She placed a lot of importance on trust and camaraderie, which she learned from the clones. And, if the Jedi Order didn't trust her, she didn't know if she could trust them. Devastated, she left the Jedi Order, searching for her own path, to become something else. Something better. She too felt the waves on the Force, but that wasn't her problem anymore. Ragu spun his lightsaber, and cut off the front legs of a crab droid, crippling it. After that, he used the force to pull three B-1 units forward, which immediately were shot by Dab. Then, as he advanced, carving a path through the Sepis, Hell Squad followed closely, always in sync with him. After so many battles, they knew each other's thoughts and tactics inside out, and were able to work together without even the need of saying anything. Suddenly, the Tigruta stopped, and put his hands on his head, seemingly in pain. Dajer looked at Brain before gesturing with his head. Together, they stood in front of the Jedi, making a wall to protect him while they waited for whatever was happening to end. It didn't take too long. Ragu deflected two lasers to the side, and hid behind the remains of a fallen building. Dajer followed him, while Hell Squad continued clearing the surroundings. What did you feel? General. I I. I saw the future. I think. Dajer raised an eyebrow. Even for a Jedi, peeking into the future out of nowhere seemed a bit unrealistic. Good future or bad future? I saw flashes. Death. A shadow, a laugh. A hand clad in black armor wielding a red lightsaber. I felt. Pain, betrayal but also a child's laugh. Happiness, but after much sadness and destruction. And the clone was stunned. Some of the things his general saw were too similar to the nightmares clones had. Uncomfortably similar. And I saw Master. His face. He was worried, but also relieved. I am not sure what all that means. But we have to do something. 
Deja was silent for a few seconds, and just stared at the Jedi. He seemed genuinely shocked. Most probably seeing the future had unsettled him. Well, it would unsettle anyone. We will worry about the future when it comes, General. Ragu looked at him, and nodded. As always, the clone was right. Whatever everything he saw meant, they would discover later. Besides, the future isn't set on stone. It might not even happen. All right, Dager. But let's finish this quickly. I need to go back to meditate on it. He could feel the commander putting a grin on his face as he spoke. After that, Dager got up, already firing at the droids, and speaking on his comlink. Listen up, lads. I'm tired, so let's wrap this up, and kick the Seppis back to their ships. Uh -huh. Chapter 338 Two weeks after the capture and subsequent escape of Thrawn, Hell Squad and Ragu were preparing to leave Christophsis. The planet was still in a heated battle, but with the Christophsian armies all around the planet joining, the Republic was turning the tables. Jedi Generals Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi had also returned to take over their legions. Dajer found it ironic that Ohm, who initially was doing everything not to have his army act, was the one who took the credit for it. Well, at least it inspired others to do the same. Plus, it wasn't like clones were running after fame or credit. The battle was fought and won, so leave the politics to the politicians. Read this. Ragu threw a data pad to Dajer, who caught it in midair. As he read the short report, a frown took his face, and he clenched his fists. Is that true, General? Unfortunately. I contacted Master Kenobi to confirm it. What is it, sir? Dajer passed the object to Baron, but even as the clone ready it, he was already explaining. Ahsoka left the Jedi Order. That includes the Republic Army. Oh. She got framed for the bombing of the Jedi Temple we were informed about a few weeks ago. Even though she cleared her name, she decided to leave. She did well. We fought alongside the kid countless times. It's stupid to think she would betray the Republic. With all due respect, General. Cell quickly realized he was complaining about the Jedi Order in front of one of their own. The Tigruta, however, shook his head sadly, dismissing his apologies. The scout was blunt and somewhat dense, but he was right. We also fought with Afi, and she turned out to be the traitor. We would never have suspected her either. But Cell is right, sir. You gotta trust your own, even if you are wrong. Ragu nodded slowly, agreeing. Sometimes, he felt like the clones had more to teach the Jedis than his counterparts would ever dare to admit, or allow. After a few seconds of silence, he transferred some files to the datapad. That has nothing to do with our mission, however. I was just letting you know because you were quite close to Ahsoka. We did spend two months trapped in a hole with her. You get to know each other well when that happens. They all grinned. Those two months were worse than anything the Separatist could have thrown at them, than any kind of torture. No matter how lightly 3-4 put it, it was hell. What is the mission, Commander? Dager's frown deepened as he read. After a while, he turned off the data pad, deep in thought. His brothers knew he was analyzing what he just read. This is going to be an interesting one. Our target is to capture or eliminate three high-level members of an organization called Death Watch. Never heard of them. They are an extremist organization trying to overthrow the government of Mandalore, Brain. Not only that, but they also believe that they have to bring back the strength of old, when Mandalore dominated the others through death and violence. That caught Hell Squad's attention. Not the part about conquering the galaxy through violence, but the planet they were going to. Mandalore is a neutral planet, isn't it? Not just a neutral planet, but the neutral planet, right? Which means we won't have to watch out for Death Watch, but also the Mandalorian government. They will hunt and eliminate us without a second thought. That is just great. 3-4 sighed loudly, inciting a smile from the others. Well, the medic wasn't wrong. Mandalore was the leading system of the Alliance of Neutral Systems. It had an amount of power that wasn't any inferior to the Republic or CIS. 
but neutral didn't mean peaceful or weak. The opposite, to be exact. To be able to maintain neutrality in those almost four years of turmoil, Mandalore had to show they were strong. And their way of showing it was by shooting down and killing any Republic or Separatist ship or group that appeared unannounced. Oh, and they hated Jedis. Well, Force users in general. The Mandalorians like to clean their dirty laundry at home, per se. To send seven clones and one Jedi there was the same as dropping them in the midst of a Geonosian nest. Worse actually, since the Mandalorians were deadly and well trained. There was a reason why one of them, although an exile, was chosen to be the genetic base for the clone army. Why are we attacking those three only? Seems counterproductive to send us there only to do that. We could take out Death Watch entirely, and solve this at once. To anyone else who heard it, Metal would have sounded overly arrogant. But his brothers and Ragu didn't think so. Even Dager, who was usually very cautious, was nodding. They had the skills to do so, they only lacked the orders. I don't know details. However, our objective is only to weaken Death Watch, not destroy it. Don't ask me why. This came from the Jedi Council and the Chancellor's office. Hell Squad nodded, and went back to cleaning their weapons. No matter from where they came, as long as they were valid, they would follow their orders. To get to Mandalore without being noticed, they made use of an old acquaintance, Hondo. The pirate wasn't at all happy to see them, but when Ragu promised to overlook any cargo he smuggled out of the planet, only this one time, he quickly agreed. Security from any ships that came from Mandalore to the Republic was tight, so it was too risky to smuggle it normally. With a Jedi's words, however, things were a lot easier. Clone armor would be easily noticed in Mandalore, especially their helmets. As such, apart from Dager, his armor already looked more like a bounty hunter's, with all the markings, they all changed to clothes Hondo gave them. Now, they looked like pirates and bounty hunters, which was more acceptable. To disguise their faces, they also put on scarred Mandalorian helmets. Ragu didn't need much of a disguise. With half of one of his protuberances missing, and several scars, he looked more vicious than any Jedi should. They didn't catch much attention when they landed on one of the worst sides of Mandalore. Outlaws and bandits were cowards by nature, and seeing eight well-armed, and clearly dangerous, people, none dared to attack them. That night, after finding a precarious base, they all sat around Ragu, waiting for instructions. So, General, what's the plan? Our targets are Artis Mill, Thirt Killer, and Vlas Vizhla. Vizhla like in pre-Vizhla. Death Watch's leader? Yep. His cousin, to be more exact. This is getting better by the minute. Dager elbowed Tech, telling the clone to shut up, and gestured for Ragu to continue. The Jedi was already used to the clone's antics, so he didn't mind being interrupted. All we know is that they are in Mandalore, and not on their moon base, so that's something. They are all wanted by Satine Cries, so they will be hiding on this side of the planet. Death Watch's base had been destroyed by General Kenobi, leaving them with no option but to hide in Mandalore. As for Satine Cries, she was Mandalore's leader. Tomorrow, we will need to split up, and look for anything that might lead us to them. Try not to be too obvious about it, and not to get in trouble. Roger that, General. Chapter 339 Four days later, Dager, Brain, and 3-4 were sitting at a table in one of the many bars outlaws liked to go. Metal, Cell, Tech, Dab, and Ragu were somewhere else. For those last days, they had stayed quiet, and not caused any ruckus. However, they still had to hear anything useful. Until now. Although he was looking in the other direction, seemingly engaging in a conversation with his companions, Dager was actually paying attention to two Mandalorians that were sitting at a table near them. Their famous armor was painted red and black, and with a drawing somewhat similar to a skull. Death Watch. I'm tired of waiting. Those scums are all high and mighty on their fancy buildings while we have to stay here with those rats. The Mandalorian wasn't making any effort to lower his arrogant voice, and received more than one angry glare from nearby customers. However, once they saw who they were, they decided to stay quiet. You know the orders. 
Arda doesn't want any more trouble. Cries hunting us is more than enough. So keep your mouth shut. The first Mandalorian scoffed, and got up. In doing so, he bumped on a large caliche behind him. The reptilian species snarled, and pushed him away. Dejer could feel that was all the Death Watch member wanted. An excuse to make some noise, and vent his anger. He pulled out his blaster pistol almost as fast as a clone would, and put it against the Kalisha's chest. Without hesitation, he pulled the trigger. Instantly, all noise in the tavern died down, all eyes focused on him. Anyone want some? Or are we good now? No one answered, and the Mandalorian muttered cowards under his breath before leaving. His companion sighed, and followed him. As soon as they exited the bar, Dajer told his two brothers to get up. That was the first palpable lead they had in days, and they had to follow them no matter what. Unfortunately for them, now that the two Death Watch members were gone, the customers of the tavern seemed a lot more unrestrained. No sooner than they got up, Brain barely touched someone, they had to push people aside to walk, since it was so crowded, and was rewarded with a growl. A Quarren tried to punch him, but the drunkard was far too slow for a veteran like him. Brain dodged and continued walking, as if nothing had happened. They had very specific orders to avoid trouble, and they couldn't lose sight of the Mandalorians. But the Quarren wasn't satisfied, and, with his friends encouraging him, grabbed Brain's shoulder. Dejo's second-in-command frowned under his helmet, and prepared to grab his pistol. Clones weren't used to these kinds of places, and, rather than entering a brawl, it would be much quicker to solve everything with a laser. Anyway, everyone there was a criminal of one kind or another, so the trooper had no qualms about killing them. But Dejer was faster than him. With a swift move, he unsheathed his viper blade, and severed the Quarren's arm above his elbow. Green blood spilled out as he screamed, but the three clones didn't even look at him, and left the bar. This time, no one dared to block their path. They got out just in time to see the two Mandalorians turning around a corner. The clones might not be too good with social interaction, preferring to solve their problems through violence, as Dejer showed, but they were good at tailing others, having done it countless times. Dejer briefly contacted Ragu to tell him what they were doing, and split from Brain and 3-4. Three people together attracted more attention than three on their own. After about half an hour, and several twists and turns, the Mandalorians entered a big complex, having no idea that they were being followed. Dejer joined with his brothers, and kicked open a door that led to the roof of the building in front. From there, they could monitor the movement around the building without anyone noticing. 3-4, stay here, eyes open. I want to know how many people enter and leave that building, and if any of our targets are among them. Brain and I will meet with the others, and decide on a plan. That's how it is, General. 3-4 have been reporting that several people, including our three targets, and what seems like a bunch of high-level members of Death Watch, have entered the building for the last two hours. About ten minutes ago, people stopped entering, and nobody came out yet. Ragu acknowledged it, and was thinking when 3-4's voice came through the comlink. Scratch that, sir. Someone else is entering. That is. It's Pre Vizhla himself. Everyone stopped talking immediately when they heard 3-4. If before they thought it was just some sort of meeting, now they knew it was a lot more. What do we do now, General? They all looked at Ragu, waiting. That was a chance they might not have again. They could take out not only their targets, but many others, including Pre Vizhla. That was their shot at crippling death watch once and for all. The Tigruta hesitated for a long time, deep in thought. He didn't doubt that Hell Squad could do it, only whether they should or not. They had very clear orders of only touching Arda Spnil, Thirt Killer, and Vlas Vizhla. But then again, neither the Jedi nor the Seven Clones had many problems with bending their orders if it suited them. Not a very clone or Jedi-like behavior, but they also weren't normal clones or Jedis. Okay, then. 3-4, keep an eye out until we get there. Any vantage points for Dab? No, sir. All windows are closed and blocked. We all go in together, then. Dager, your vibroblade. 
I don't want to be recognized in case someone escapes. Daedra nodded, and threw his weapon to the Jedi. Any sign of an unauthorized Jedi in Mandalore could ruin the relations between the planet and the Republic, which weren't good to start with. Two hours later, when they arrived at Three Four's post, there was still no sign of the meeting ending. Ragu looked at Deja and the others, who nodded reassuringly, and put on a mask. The chances of him being recognized were slim, since most of his missions were the same as Hell Squad's, secretive and unofficial. The records about who he was, and his face, were few and well hidden in the Jedi Temple's archives. Still, better safe than sorry. There was no need to ask if Hell Squad was prepared. They always were. Metal and Brain stepped forward, and kicked the doors wide open, surprising two Mandalorians guarding it. Before any of them could react, Ragu had already slashed forward, finding the small crevices between their helmets and their armor, and sent their heads flying in the air. Meanwhile, dozens of Mandalorians sitting around a table looked at them in surprise, anger, and shock. After a few seconds, lasers started flying. Chapter 340 Ten or twelve of the Mandalorians fell before they could even muster up a reaction. Before hiding behind a pillar, Dajer quickly scanned the room. There were at least fifty men and women inside, all armed to the teeth, and wearing a platinum armor. At first, Dajer thought they had already eliminated one-fourth of them, but he was stunned to see over half of the dead Mandalorians rise again, rubbing their chest in pain. Only those hit on the head stayed on the ground. What is their armor made of? No one could answer metal. One thing was certain, though, it was way stronger than the blast padding clones had. Even Hell Squad would need more time to get up after being shot. Let's hope their helmets aren't as strong. Brain, dab, time to do your trick. Ragu frowned when he saw that some of the Mandalorians were already flying around with their jetpacks, and using two pistols and rockets against them. From time to time, one of them would fall, their visor broken by a blue laser. Even with Hell Squad's accuracy, it was difficult for them to hit moving targets straight in the middle of the head. If they were just a centimeter to the side, the Death Watch members would only be knocked down, but not permanently. They were tougher than they had anticipated. Still, no armor could resist a detonator to the face. If Brain just threw it at their feet, they would fly away. But, with Dab hitting them midair, the Mandalorians had no time to dodge. Suddenly, one of the Death Watch members tried to flank them by flying around the sides of the room. Unfortunately for him, Ragu was waiting. He gave the Mandalorian an unnoticeable pull with the Force, then ran towards him, and stabbed forward. Dajer's vibroblade, however, only left a puny scratch on the red and black armor. The Mandalorian laughed, and tried to shoot Ragu point-blank. One of his lasers flew by the Jedi's head, missing by millimeters, all thanks to his heightened senses. The man didn't get a chance to press the trigger again. Learning from his mistakes, Ragu found a part of the Mandalorian's left side that wasn't covered with armor, and stabbed it in an upwards motion. Dying immediately, the Death Watch member lost control of his jetpack, and crashed into two other criminals. If Pre Vizsla had seen what Ragu did, he would have noticed something was wrong. After all, he had thought Jedi's before, so he could recognize one if he paid attention. But he was more worried about Hell Squad. The group of seven silent and lethal killers were taking down his top soldiers with scary efficiency. His eyes darted back and forth, but he still couldn't discover who they were. Satine would never resort to such lowly tactics as assassins, and his other enemies were all dead or hiding. That left only the Separatist or the Republic. Both hated him. Especially the Republic. Stop. Retreat. Hearing their leader, the Mandalorians landed next to him, albeit reluctantly. Only then did they notice that almost two dozen of their own were left on the ground, while the enemy hadn't had a single wound. That realization filled them with shook, and then fear. Hold your fire. Seeing that Death Watch had retreated, Ragu told Hell Squad to wait. He was curious as to what Vizhla would say. After all, his terrorist organization was feared by everyone on the planet, but this time, they had hit a wall. While his troops needed just a second to aim and fire, Hell Squad seemed like their hands were guided by something. 
Not every shot was an eliminate, but every laser hit the target. If it wasn't for their famous Mandalorian armor, they would all be dead by now, including him. Who sent you? As angry as he was seeing so many of his high-ranking officers die, Vizhlaw was a man of logic. He knew that if he insisted on fighting, maybe he could escape, but not the others. And Death Watch wasn't just one person. Useless as they were, he needed the others. It doesn't matter. We will give you one chance to surrender, Vizhlaw. If you don't, we won't hold back this time. As for the others. You can go. We are not after you. Only Ragu showed himself, while Hell Squad stood behind cover, aiming at Death Watch. Even after killing almost half of them, the Republic group was still outnumbered about three to one. However, none of the Mandalorians found the Tigruta's exigencies arrogant. He had the skill to back it up. Still, Pre Vizhlaw wasn't scared so easily. His shaved head, scar, and the dark glint in his eyes remained Ragu of danger. Death Watch isn't to be trifled with. I will admit you are stronger than us now, but to capture us, you will need a lot more people. Death Watch, scatter. Back to base. Vizhlaw didn't hesitate for a single second to run. He was angry, and his natural arrogance made him want to eliminate his attackers, but he valued his life more than his pride. That, and also wanted to avoid the unwanted attention their battle was sure to attract. Dajer didn't wait anymore, and aimed at Vizhlo. Unfortunately, the criminal knew he would be targeted, so all Dajer managed to do was damage his jetpack when he turned around. Albeit smoking, Vizhlo still managed to break a window, and fly away. That was one of the advantages of the Mandalorian warriors. Their jetpacks allowed them to escape through the air, quickly getting out of range from Hell Squad. If they were to try and go out through the door, the clones would have dropped all of them in a few minutes. However, now, they only managed to eliminate four or five more Death Watch members. Ragu and Hell Squad were only frustrated for a few seconds before forgetting about it. Pre Vizhla and the others were never their targets. From the start, they only planned on killing their three targets. Anyone else was just a bonus. Check them, quickly. We already wasted too much time here, the Mandalorian police will arrive soon. The troopers nodded, and started taking off the Death Watch members' helmets. One of them was surprisingly still alive, although she was barely breathing. She had been lucky enough to avoid a laser, but crashed into the ground hard, and broke her spine. Without a second thought, Dajer finished her off, while Ragu only stared conflicted, but said nothing. I got Vizhla's cousin here. Killer is dead too. Brain turned over the last body, and popped the helmet off with his feet, finding a blonde woman. Half of her face was burned, but she was still recognizable. I think that's Artis Pnil, General. We got them all. And a lot more. I see at least two other important Death Watch officers here. Ragu nodded and urged them to go. Barely five minutes after they left the building, they saw spotted several Mandalorians wearing the blue armor of the legitimate government flying towards it. There was no doubt they would receive a huge surprise when they get there. Chapter 341 Sitting on her throne, Satine Kreis looked at the hologram projections before her. It showed several different pieces of information, from numbers, to texts, videos, and pictures. The most eye-catching were the ones of 27 Death Watch members dead on the floor. She frowned deeply, uneasy. Pre Vizhla and his terrorist organization had many enemies, that's for sure, but none who could do that. Instinctively, her thoughts drifted towards the Jedi Order, but she dismissed them. Almost all the bodies had laser marks, and exceptionally accurate ones on top of that. Only three or four had been eliminated by a blade, but not a lightsaber. Still, a little voice inside her head told her the Republic had something to do with this. Having learned to trust the voice, she called an old acquaintance. General Kenobi was calmly meditating when his comlink bipped. At first, he ignored it, but when it continued to make noise, he used the force to pull it over. When he saw who it was, he raised an eyebrow surprised, and transferred it to his hologram projector. A beautiful woman, with blonde hair, and a giant crown, appeared. 
she had an angry frown on her face, which eased a little when she saw him. Satin. To what do I owe the pleasure? It's good to see you too, Obi-Wan. I have something to ask, although I'm not sure you can answer it. Once again, the Jedi raised an eyebrow in surprise. He had spent years without talking to Satine, but their latest adventures had brought them closer together once more. Still, it wasn't quite normal for her to ask something out of the blue. The Mandalorian Queen quickly resumed everything that happened, and after that stared intensely at General Kenobi. He had a deep frown on his face, and she knew him well enough to understand the Jedi was organizing his thoughts. You know who they are, don't you? Are they Jedis? I didn't know of this until you told me, which means this mission was kept a secret even from the Jedi Council. Probably only Master Yoda and Master Windu know about it. And? You said there weren't any casualties amongst those mysterious attackers, right? They wouldn't have had time to take away the bodies before my people arrived. Which makes it all more impressive, and scary. Who are they, Obi? General Kenobi was quiet for a few minutes, and then sighed. He shouldn't tell her that, but instead deny any knowledge of it. However, he and Satine were very close friends, and had been. Something else, when they were younger. Satine, listen to me. You can't share this information with anyone, understood? The less you know about them, the better. As long as it doesn't affect the neutrality of Mandalore, I won't tell anyone, I swear. The Jedi nodded, and transferred some files to her. They contained a few pictures and lines of text, barely enough to show the names of the clones. I can't be certain, but I only know one group of people in the entire Republic who can attack elite Mandalorian warriors, and remain unscathed. How do you know they weren't injured? As much as I hate to admit it, Vizhlas lackeys are very skilled. They wouldn't go down without a fight. Besides, my spies tell me Vizhla himself was there. You experienced by yourself how dangerous he is. That's not the point, Satine. All I can tell you is that only Hell Squad could be behind that, unless this attack has nothing to do with the Republic, what I doubt. But you don't need to worry. When Dager has a mission, he focuses solely on it. Your people won't be affected, only Death Watch. If their target is pre Vizhla, then congratulations, you just lost a big source of worry. The woman got angry at General Kenobi, thinking he was joking about a big problem of hers. However, when she paid attention, she discovered that his expression was dead serious. You. You aren't lying, are you? You really believe they can do that? because I know Hell Squad better than most. The only way to win against them is with numbers or a force user. Death Watch has neither of those. After exchanging a few more pleasantries, General Kenobi managed to convince Satine not to dwell on the subject, and halt the investigations about Hell Squad and Ragu. That would grant them an easier time leaving Mandalore. He was sure Ragu was with the troopers, although he didn't tell her that. One thing was a group of clones, while an entirely different one was a Jedi. Even with their relationship, he wouldn't have managed to control her anger if she got to know about it. He tried to resume his meditation, but his thoughts kept going back to what Satine told him. Usually, he wouldn't have cared much, since he couldn't possibly know about everything that happened in a war that spanned the entire galaxy. However, maybe because Mandalore held a special significance to him, he couldn't help but feel worried. This was too serious for General Yoda and General Windu to decide on their own, without consulting the Jedi Council. He felt like this, like many other things in the Clone Wars, had been done without their knowledge. Slowly but surely, the Jedi Order was losing control of the war. Or, maybe, they never had it to start with. What is our next step, General? We completed the mission, didn't we? Don't let this become personal, Tech. Pre Vizhla was never our target. Remember that. Hell Squad was back to their base, talking to Ragu. The Jedi was leaning against a wall, using the force to make three helmets float around. Meanwhile, the clones were cleaning their weapons, sleeping, or eating. There was none of the discipline they should have shown, but they were in an unusual situation. Besides, it was only Ragu. Are you sure about that, sir? 
we could end a future problem right here, right now. The Tigruta nodded, acknowledging what Dajer said. Still, he was set on his decision of leaving Mandalore. Better not to push our luck. It will take time to find Vizhla again, especially now that he is scared. We are leaving. The clones shrugged. It didn't really matter for them. Besides, covert missions like that weren't really their style. Hell Squad much preferred a real battlefield, where all your worries were on the enemy in front of you, and not if you were going to be stabbed in the back. Only four days later they managed to leave Mandalorian unnoticed, hiding in a cargo ship directed towards Askok. There, they received orders to meet the Padawan Caleb Dume on his cruiser, the Uncontested. Apparently, the soon-to-be Jedi would give them their new mission. Like any other Venator-class Star Destroyer, the Uncontested was armed to the teeth, so even if it was all by itself on the Outer Rim, no outlaw dared to attack it. Brain, tech, metal, go get our armors. They should have been loaded on the ship in Coruscant. Dab, 3-4, Cell, the routine. Danger, with me. Let's meet Dume. Chapter 342 Caleb Dume was a young human male, with long brown hair, with several braids. He was just a few months away from completing his training, and becoming a Jedi Knight. He was looking at the door curiously, waiting for Ragu. The Tigruta was a mystery for him and those apprentices near his age. It was an unspoken agreement in the Jedi Order that newly promoted Jedis would interact with the Padawans, and guide them. They would be responsible for helping the younglings mend their problems with their masters, and similar predicaments. But Ragu never did any of that. If it wasn't for the fact that he was frequently mentioned by the older Jedis, few would know he even existed. And the way his master and even members of the Jedi Council respected him, even though he was a Padawan just under two years ago, created an even bigger picture of him in the minds of the Padawans. They were just children after all. Suddenly, the door to the command bridge opened, and Caleb straightened his back. He was surprised, however, to see Ragu. He had imagined the Tigruta differently. Ragu's missing protuberance, and the several scars that adorned his face and arms, he wasn't wearing the usual Jedi robes, made him look more like a criminal than actual outlaws Caleb had seen before. Even though he had a slight smile on his face, he was exuding a dangerous and commanding air. The force around him was calm as a still lake, but beneath it was something just waiting to appear. The clone next to him wasn't any less impressive. Even if the Padawan ignored the scar that covered the entire right half of his face, he easily caught his attention. Especially the markings on his armor. They were a clear sign of how many battles he had gone through. The old colors of the 303rd Attack Legion reminded Caleb of what his master had told him, that Ragu's legion had all perished in Ryloth, aside from a few, Hell Squad included. Young Caleb. How are you? General Dume. He quickly returned the greetings from the two men. Ragu was just three years older than him, but he was much more experienced. As for Dajer. There was no need to say anything. After saluting the Padawan, the commander turned to the clone next to him, who had faint red paint on his armor, and grinned while grabbing his wrist in a greeting. Still fighting, Gray. Always, Dajer. Brain and the others. Alive and kicking, and with a few new trophies. Ragu also greeted Gray enthusiastically, like they were old friends, which once again prompted Caleb's curiosity. You know each other? Yeah, kiddo. I saved Gray's life back at the first battle of Geonosis, when a bug was about to grab him. He paid back the favor at the second battle of Dentuin. He was part of the 184th at that time. Like all Padawans, Caleb flinched when Dajer called him a kid, but decided to ignore it. It was very clear he was different from normal clones, and the way Ragu treated him was proof of that. All right, Dajer, leave the stories for later. Caleb, what do you have for us? My master was occupied with a mission Master Yoda gave her, so she sent me, Master Ragu, to support Commander Dajer. Both Ragu and Clone got a bad feeling at the same time, and any sign of a grin disappeared from their faces. Gray also became serious. Ragu knew Jedi Master Depa Balaba, Caleb's master, well. She was already a member of the Jedi Council when he was just a Padawan. 
It made sense she would send her apprentice in her place, since he was almost a fully-fledged Jedi already, but why would he assist Dager, and not him? Explain. Well. Master said the Jedi Council think it isn't advisable that you take part in this mission, because your emotional connections to it are too strong. They want you to return to Coruscant, while Hell Squad and Commander Dager will be left in command. Truth be told, Caleb wasn't happy with his master's arrangement. He knew Jedis shouldn't be arrogant, but it was difficult not to think that he, as a Force user, was best suited to be in command than a normal person. However, when he complained, all she said was that he would understand with time. Stop beating around the bush, Padawan. What is the mission? Having spent so much time with clones, Ragu wasn't used to small talk. Caleb shrugged inwardly. He had been hesitating because of the rumors he heard, that's all. Commander Dager is to, with our assistance, go to Ryloth, where. The apprentice was suddenly interrupted by a loud noise, which scared him. All eyes turned to Dager, to find that the commander was trembling, his scar burning red. He had punched the hologram table, cracking it. Most of the people on the command bridge were shocked. Caleb because he had never seen a clone lose his calm, whatsoever demonstrate such blatant anger. The clones because they knew of the discipline ingrained in their genetic code. Few dared to even interrupt their superiors. Only Ragu wasn't surprised, because he was going through something similar. He wasn't as expressive as Dager, but a wave of sadness and disgust washed over him. Dager. The commander ignored his general, one of the few times he had done that, and turned around, leaving the command bridge. There was too much going through his mind right now. This. What? Caleb was left confused, uncertain of what had happened. He could feel the disturbance in the force around Ragu, as if he was losing control of it. But when the Jedi turned to him, he was expressionless, his eyes ice cold. Gray, go after Dager, and bring him here after he cooled his head. Don't let him talk to Hell Squad yet. He will understand, he just needs a minute. As for you, Padawan Caleb, leave for now. I need to talk to the Jedi Council. You heard me. Ask Gray to explain it to you later. Bewildered, Caleb walked out, followed by Gray. Even though he was being kicked out of his own command bridge, in his own cruiser, there was something in the Tigruta's voice that left no room for argument. Ragu waited patiently, his eyes closed, for danger. When his old friend came back, he tried to apologize, his behavior wasn't one a soldier, and a clone, on top of that, should have, but the Tigruta stopped him. If anyone understood Dager, it was him. Why now, General? But this time the Council will have to give me some real answers. As they were talking, a hologram of two dozen Jedis sitting in a circle appeared. Some of them were at the Jedi Temple, while others were on battlefields around the galaxy. The Jedi Council. Call us, why did you? To clear some doubts about the task the Padawan Caleb Dume gave us, Master Yoda. Us? Didn't my Padawan tell you that you are to return to Coruscant, Master Ragu? A human, who Dager assumed was General Balaba, frowned when she heard the Tigroda. Meanwhile, General Kenobi, General Plo Kun, General Kiari Mundi, General Windu, and General Yoda all had their gazes fixed on Dager. It was unheard of a clone partaking in a Jedi Council meeting, and they could feel his anger, which was very inappropriate. He did. But I want to hear it from you. Why us? Why Hell Squad? This. This isn't a simple matter, Master Ragu. The death of my master in Ryloth also wasn't. Why now? Chapter 343 Caleb and Gray waited outside the command bridge, the Padawan waddling around anxiously, and the clone surprisingly calm. Gray looked at the soon-to-be Jedi, and sighed. He hadn't known him for a long time, but it didn't take much to understand what was going through his mind. Dager's behavior was wrong, General, but he has his reasons. General Ragu also do, but he is better at controlling himself. There is something more to this story, isn't there? It wasn't simply a lost battle. Gray shook his head. As a clone, he hated to talk about what happened in Ryloth, 
but he figured that if the Padawan was going to lead them there, it was only fair that he knew about it. What do you know about it, General? What have you been told? Master D and his troops, the 303rd Attack Legion, stood behind to protect the Chuilek refugees while they escaped. Master Ragu was just a Padawan at the time, and managed to survive. I wish it was so simple. Now Caleb was looking at him curiously. He had never paid too much attention to this story, but it seemed that there was more to it than he was told. Days before the Sepis reached Ryloth, the 303rd had already received the mission of protecting it. It was, and they all knew it. After their fleet was destroyed, General D organized the resistance on the ground together with Cham Sindulla, the Trilek fighter. The one we are supposed to meet. I don't know the details. Few survived that battle, and now, only Hell Squad is left of the 303rd. They don't talk about it. It's taboo for them. But I know that General D wasn't protecting refugees, or at least not only. Sindulla and his rebels had sworn to fight by our side, and they did, for some time. But when losses became too great, they ran. General D knew that if they escaped too, they would all end up dead, so he stayed behind. And you know what Sindulla did, a few days after the 303rd was annihilated? The Padawan shook his head, focused on the story. He knew Gray was leaving out many details, but what he said was enough to make him think that maybe Dajer had a reason to lose his cool. He blamed General Ragu, Dajer, and the Republic for their loss. He called them cowards, when 30,000 of my brothers had died. And then he led his people to a massacre, wasting all the sacrifices Dajer and the others made. And now they have to go back. Ryloth is under the separatist threat once again, Ragu. Cham Sindulla specifically asked that you and Hell Squad be sent to help. However, Bika. General Kenobi was interrupted by Dajer when the commander snorted, a disgusted expression on his face. Several of the Jedi's frowned, especially the ones who didn't know him. He was just a clone, who shouldn't even be present in such a meeting. On top of that, Ragu didn't make any effort to stop him. Do you have anything to say, Commander Dajer? General Balaba wasn't happy from the start, both because her Padawan would be under the command of a clone, and also because Dajer and Ragu hadn't even let Caleb explain what their mission would be. Dajer looked at Ragu with the corner of his eyes, and, when he saw his general nod slightly, stepped forward. With all due respect, generals, Sindulla is a coward and a liar. He doesn't deserve the trust and respect you give him. He certainly doesn't deserve ours. Maybe, but that isn't for you to decide, Commander. We will ask your opinion when we see fit, understood? No, ma'am. The General is too attached to the Jedi's ways to say it, but I'm just a clone, so I have no qualms. You weren't there. We were. That is insubordination. Master Ragu, how can you let? Dajer is a person, not an astromech, Master Kohler. I don't control him. Besides, he is speaking the truth. Go on, Dajer. Most of the Jedi Council was left speechless by Ragu taking the clone's side. The few that knew the Tagroda well sighed sadly. It was impossible to know what was going through his heart, but he was walking a dangerous path. One of anger and rage. We went to Ryloth prepared to die, generals. I have no problems with that. But Sindulla left us behind once, and he will do it again if it's good for him. He doesn't think for the Trilex or Ryloth. He thinks for himself, and himself only. All the Jedis went quiet, thinking about what Dajer said. They could feel that he believed everything he was saying. Right, could be you, Commander. Ask for help, Sindulla has, however. Answer his plea we must. The clone only nodded. While he felt like most Jedis had no idea of what war was like, although he would never say that out loud, General Yoda was one of the few he respected from the depths of his heart. It was rumored he was almost a thousand years old, and had seen the Old Republic rise and fall. And if there was one thing clones respected, it was experience, of which the green being had plenty. Dajer might be harsh on his words, counsel, but nothing of what he said is wrong. But if it is your wish that they go to Ryloth, I will follow them. 
You have too much attachment for that planet, Master Ragu. I don't think it is a good idea that you go. The Tigruta looked at General Kiyadimundi, understanding why he said so. Still, he wouldn't back down so easily. If I run from my past, I will never have peace of heart, Master Kiyadi. But if your worry is whether or not I will be able to control my emotions, fret not. This war is horrible, but it taught me how to maintain my calm under any circumstance. He looked resolute at the Jedi Council, not forgetting to add to himself that if needed, Hell Squad would help him. Deep down, he trusted them more than his fellow Jedis, although he wasn't aware of that. After a long time of discussion, the Jedi Council finally agreed to let Regu go too. The news wasn't well received by Hell Squad, but when Dajer told them that the Jedi would be with them, they stopped complaining. They would follow their general anywhere, even to the place where they lost everything. Three days later, the uncontested landed near Nabat. As the troops disembarked, and vehicles and supplies were unloaded, a small group of Trileks went to greet them. Dajer didn't know most of the people, presumably politicians that had run when Ryloth was attacked the first time. But two faces amongst the others were familiar. Sindulla and Gobi Chapter 344 Both Sindulla and Gobi had a complicated expression on their faces. After everything they had gone through together with the 303rd Attack Legion, they were well aware of their shamelessness in asking for help once again. But just like they couldn't save their planet by themselves before, they couldn't do so now. The many politicians that formed the delegation with them were governors, mayors, and such. They were all smiling, greeting the two Jedis while ignoring the clones. They also kept some distance from the two freedom fighters, which almost, only almost, made Dajer pity Sindulla. It was apparent that even after everything he had done, and all the mistakes, he didn't receive the recognition he thought he deserved. The politician's smile slowly faded away when Dajer and Ragu passed by them without even looking at them. Caleb nodded at them as a greeting, but since Ragu was the one in command, didn't do much else. The four men stared at each other for a long time, none saying anything. Sindulla and Gobi felt guilt and shame, while Dajer felt anger, pain, and disgust. Only Ragu was calm, his emotions unchanged. He had thought he would feel anger or sadness, but there was nothing. The first to open his mouth was Cham Sindulla, but before the Trilek could say anything, Dajer punched him. Stumbling, Sindulla walked back a few steps under the startled gazes of the others. Surprisingly enough, he, Gobi, and Ragu weren't the least shocked. They had all seen it coming. Commander Dajer. What are you doing? Quiet, Caleb. This is between us. Go entertain the other Trileks. We will be with you shortly. Gray, Mount Camp. The Tigruta had two reasons for sending them away. The first was that he didn't want to deal with politics now. The second was that the conversation between the four of them was a personal matter, that no others needed to see. Albeit hesitating, the Padawan obeyed, while Gray pressed Dajer's shoulder quickly. It was his way of telling his brother to control himself. Commander Dajer, Master Ragu. No apology I make would be enough. Ragu won't be the one talking to you, Sindulla. He is better than that. The freedom fighter shut up, but still stared straight into Dajer's eyes. The clone's anger was palpable. The Tigruta, on the other hand, stepped back. He had already agreed to let Dajer talk, on the condition that he wouldn't eliminate the Trilek. He knew Dajer was inclined to do that. After all, Sindulla's actions were too much. We don't blame you for the deaths of General D, Commander Keeley, and my brothers. That was our choice. Our job. There isn't a day I don't wish I had died here with them. Sindulla shrunk, aware that Dajer wasn't exaggerating. He had seen for himself how strong the feelings between clones were. But Maiwi, Yate, and even Tram and Tay. Their blood is on your hands. You wasted everything the Republic gave you, the time we bought with thirty thousand lives. They were my friends long before you knew them, Dajer. Tay was my son. And you led them to a massacre, all because of your arrogance and blindness. Is it possible that you couldn't see you were wrong? That you still are? Sindulla was trembling. 
whether it was of shame or rage, probably even he didn't know. As for Dager, he was already tired of it. He never was one to make long speeches. The only reason he talked so much now was because he could sense that deep down, Sindulla still thought everything was the Republic's fault. But here he was, asking for help again. I don't know why you asked for Hell Squad and the General, Sindulla. But we will do our job, like we always do. Ryloth is too important for us to let it fall into separatist hands again. Just know that you aren't worthy of the trust your people put in you. You betrayed them once, and you will be the cause of their demise again. The freedom fighter didn't argue. It was clear by his expression that he only agreed to some of what Dager said, but he decided to keep quiet. It was already good enough that the commander didn't eliminate him. Unwilling to stare at Sindulla any longer, Dager shook hands with Gobi, he understood why the Chwilek insisted on following Sindulla, and he respected it, although the trust was misplaced, and turned around. Ragu looked at the two Chwileks for a while longer, and sighed. My master died to protect Ryloth, Cham. So did my entire legion, Commander Keeley, and Admiral Dao. Yate and Maiwi, and countless freedom fighters, sacrificed themselves for their home. Don't let your arrogance blind you to what they left. Gobi, I am counting on you to put him on the right track. The blue Chwilek nodded, and put an arm over his friend's shoulders. A sad, defeated grin appeared on Sindulla's face. Believe it or not, Master Ragu, I learned my lesson. That's why I asked for you. Because I know only you and Dager will fight for my planet as hard as I will. And I promise I will do my best to. Everything. I know you will. Tell your old people we would like to see them. The ones who were with us back then. Hell Squad and I still got many friends there. I will. The Tigruta nodded slowly, and reached Hell Squad, who was waiting for him some distance away. They all looked at Sindulla with hostility, but Ragu had already told them to drop the matter, and so they did. The meeting that followed the Republic's troops' arrival was lengthy and drawn out. At the start the Chwilek politicians insisted on making demands, and showing how badly they needed assistance, in a process Ragu knew all too well. Again, what mattered for them the most wasn't their people, but their money and status. Eventually, he got bored of it. Ryloth was too important to him to waste time thinking about their interests. He gestured for Dager to step forward, and take off his helmet. His anger still hadn't subsided, and it was enough to scare the Chwileks into shutting up. The Sepis took over Nabat and half of the Southern Hemisphere. For now, the 91st was able to hold them back, entering a stalemate. We are here to change that. The plan is simple. Gray and General Dume, you reinforce the 91st and Nao. Meanwhile, Hell Squad and General Ragu will retake Nabat. Just you. We already took Nabat once before, we can do it again. Besides, the Freedom Fighters will be with us. Remember, Sindulla, we are in charge. Got it? The Chwilek nodded. Obviously, the plan wasn't as simple as Dager put it. But Hell Squad had never been good with following the plan. They tended to improvise along the way. Another reason was that they didn't know how much they could trust the Chwileks present. The only two they knew would never betray them were Gobi and Sindulla. Having said his piece, Dager stepped back, and looked at Ragu while putting on his helmet. In the end, all decisions laid on the Jedi's hands. Of course, he rarely disagreed with the commander. You heard Dager. Caleb, this will be your final battle as a Padawan. Consider it a test, but remember that while victory is important, you have to consider the costs. The human nodded, although he was fully aware Regu wasn't talking to him, but sending a message to Sindulla. Still, he promised to make his best. All right, Gobi, lead us to the Freedom Fighters. Hell Squad, let's go. Chapter 345 Mr. Dager You are back. A childish voice greeted Hell Squad as soon as they followed Gobi into the cave where the Freedom Fighters were assembling. Of course, after the first battle of Ryloth was over, they all returned to their homes and their families, but since they were needed once again, what better place to group up than their old hideout? The kid who was calling the clone so excitedly was obviously Shoyuda, 
Gobi's daughter. She, like any child, was very quick to accept the clones when they first met. The stories they told about the war, albeit short and toned down, were enough to entertain the Chuilek children, and were a good distraction from the terrible weeks they faced after the 303rd fleet was destroyed, and before their annihilation. It was difficult not to like the little one, and even Dajer couldn't help but smile at her. He knelt down to pat her head. How are you doing, Shoyuda? Taking care of your father and mother for us, as we asked. You didn't let them get in trouble, did you? If any other clones were watching them, they would have been shocked by how kindly Dajer was behaving. That was very unlike him. Yuum. They are very, very good. Yep. That's great. Go say hi to the general and the others now. I have to talk with the adults. Go, go. The small Chuilek giggled, and ran towards Ragu, who made her levitate upside down. Meanwhile, Hell Squad was busy greeting the freedom fighters they knew. Many had lost their lives during Sindulla's stupid attack, and others were trapped in Separatist-controlled area, but there were still over 2,000 of them there. Too few to take over Nabit using the Orthodox way, but Hell Squad never planned to follow that route. Master Ragu, Dajer, it's good to see you again. Brain, Tech, 3-4, Metal, Cell, and Dab, the same. One of the first to go see them was Shuda's mother, Iva. Using the usual Chuilek greeting, putting two fingers in her forehead, then bowing, she smiled at them. They mimicked her unconsciously, having grown used to it. Weird as it may sound, the Freedom Fighters were the closest thing to a family Hell Squad had after their own brothers. That was a bond created by months of fighting and dying side by side, and difficult to undo. The only one they didn't like, in fact, almost hated, was Sindela. The Chuilek in question was leaning into a wall at the back of the cave, a dark but relieved expression on his face. News of him being punched by Dajer, or what the clone said, had yet to reach the ears of his people. He knew he had to be thankful to Ragu for that. After a few more minutes, Ragu caught everyone's attention. Kids and civilians were sent back home, leaving only those who would really fight there. We are here because Hell Squad and I know better than any other Republic soldier what we have to do to free Ryloth. We've done it before, and we will do it again. But not alone. Freedom fighters, you fought with us before, and you are here because you are willing to do it again. We won't let you down. There wasn't much to say. Ragu nodded to Sindulla before jumping down from the rock he had climbed. He didn't need to make speeches or anything of the like. He knew the hearts and minds of the Chuileks were with them. You heard Master Ragu, my people. Let's take back our planet, and free our home once and for all. Dozens of light years away, on the capital planet of the Republic, Coruscant, a very common scene was unfolding, but in horrible circumstances. The body of a clone trooper, shot twice on the chest, was being carried away. Near him were Captain Rex, Commander Fox, and several members of the Coruscant Guard. If Hell Squad was there, they would recognize their dead brother as Arc Trooper CT-5555, or Fives. Even if Coruscant wasn't a battleground, a clone dying to smugglers, criminals, and mercenaries was normal. However, Fives had died not by the hands of an outlaw, but Commander Fox's, his own brother. For Commander Fox and the others, Fives had gone crazy after his best friend, Echo, died, and one of the members of his legion went insane and eliminated a Jedi. According to Chancellor Palpatine specialists, it was due to a parasite. Since no one was there to contradict him, his version of the story was accepted. The only one who still had some doubts was Captain Rex, with whom Fives had spoken shortly before he died. The truth was quickly hidden, and the news about it, suppressed. No one would know what Fives actually discovered, and why he had been deemed a traitor, until it was too late. It's done, my lord. Did he manage to tell anyone about the inhibitor chip before he died? No, my lord. The end is approaching. Soon, the pathetic Galactic Republic will fall, and a new empire arises. News of Five's death only reached Hell Squad months later. As for the circumstances of it, they would never know. But now, as Five's body was being taken away, Dajer and his men were worried about something else. 
namely, the enormous separatist army guarding Nabat. How are we supposed to get past that? Thousands and thousands of droids stood in formation outside the giant city. Differently from living beings, they could just stand in the same position for days, recharging now and again on their small camps. The clankers surrounded the entire city, and the abyss around it. There was no doubt that there were even more of them inside. As for the Ray Bridge, it was deactivated at all times, unless a very well-guarded convoy was going through it. On a hill about seven kilometers away, Hell Squad and Ragu watched through macro binoculars as the Sepis marched around. This time, the Separatists weren't taking any chances. We won't be able to repeat the trick from last time, sir. Even if we get past them, I bet they have patrols on the abyss, so we can't slide through it. Any ideas, General? Ragu frowned, then shook his head. If we had 20,000 of Caleb's troops with us, maybe we could push through them, and then do as you did last time, and zipline through the abyss. But we don't have them. They are all with Nao and the 91st. I know. The Tigruta looked at the convoy leaving Nabit, and an idea started to get shape in his mind, based on something General Windu once did. But he needed more time to let it grow. Getting up, he patted his robe to get rid of the dust, and gestured for Hell Squad to follow him. Come on, there is nothing more we can do here today. Let's see if our Chwilek friends have some secret tunnel we can use. Chapter 346 The Chwileks didn't have any secret tunnel to Nabit. The only way in and out of the city was through the Ray Bridge, or, if one was crazy enough, through the Abyss. Neither of them were available to the Republic forces. Knowing that, Ragu had decided to adopt the same tactics the 303rd did back then. They knew Ryloth better than any other planet. With their experience, and the Freedom Fighters' knowledge, they knew every possible ambush site, supply routes, everything. They would give the Separatists one hell of a time. The disadvantage of using guerrilla tactics was clear, however. It would take a long time, and the smallest mistake could result in their deaths. But there was no hesitation on their part. Be it for Ryloth, the Republic, or simply their orders, Hell Squad didn't care about dying. Looking at the Seven Clones, and the Jedi, Discussing seriously with Gobi and some other freedom fighters, Sindulla remembered a talk he had with his right-hand man just after the Republic had won the first battle of Ryloth. Gobi had approached him right after they watched Hell Squad embark in a Republic cruiser. He was still limping from a wound he had received during the conquest of Lesu. What are you thinking, Cham? The freedom fighter leader looked at his oldest friend, and sighed. It was only now that he was starting to question himself. Was I wrong, Gobi? I did everything I thought was right for our people, but... But? I only thought of us. I never considered the clones. Look at them. I thought they were like machines. But they aren't. They are people just like us. And they gave everything for us, who they didn't even know. So, was I wrong? The blue-skinned Chwilek looked at him, conflicted. He knew what Sindulla wanted to hear, but he wasn't sure if he should say it. In the end, he decided lies would only make it worse. You were, Cham. We all knew. You knew. The Republic may have abandoned us, but the clones never did. They fought and died for us, and with us. We all understand you were just trying to protect us, but... Yeah, you were wrong. Sindulla said nothing for a long time. He wasn't shocked, shaken, or even surprised. He knew it all along, he just needed somebody to tell him that. But it was too late now. Why did they keep fighting? Why did they refuse to yield, even when we left them? His eyes were fixed on the cruiser leaving the atmosphere. Gobi followed his gaze, sighing. Because they made an oath. Because sometimes whether you live or die isn't the important part, but how do you choose to do so? Because. To them, some things are more important than their own lives. Sindulla had never forgotten that conversation. He had just pushed it to the back of his mind, saying to himself that now it was over, and there was nothing he could do. But, two years later, the Separatist attacked again, and it all came back. Dajer had said he didn't blame him for all the clones who died. But he blamed himself. 
maybe, if he had done things differently. If he hadn't been so angry at everyone and everything. If he had simply listened, instead of thinking he knew better than everyone else. He slowly walked towards the group. Dajer and the clones, and even his own people, just glanced at him before turning back to the hologram map. We can't attack head on. So, we are going to have to take them apart, clanker by clanker. Tonight, Hell Squad will start provoking them. Knowing the mindset of a tactical droid, they will only be able to withstand it for a few days before making a retaliation strike to any small town they think may be helping us. We have to make a big move before they do that, as to not implicate civilians. Ragu was explaining his ideas to the people around the hologram seriously. He had used the force to feel their intentions, and although he couldn't read their minds, he was fairly sure there weren't any traitors this time. Still, he wasn't giving any specific intel. Better safe than sorry. What are you thinking, Master Jedi? Three or four days from now, we will ambush one of their convoys. There are always two or there of them entering or leaving the city each day. However, we will have to fake a mistake, and let the convoy escape. From there, we will simulate a chase with a small group of freedom fighters, until we are in sight Nabit. The tactical Seppai will think we are just a small and unprepared group, and send a large force to crush us, but we will be waiting somewhere to ambush them. If everything goes well, we might be able to take out three or four thousand of them at once. Several heads nodded, including Hell Squads. They weren't new to this kind of plan. However, there was a problem. Are you sure you want freedom fighters to be the ones to draw them out, General? If they aren't careful, they might be wiped out. It wouldn't have made any difference if Dajer had directly said he didn't think the Trilex were skilled enough for this job. Being who he was, the commander rarely held back in his comments. He thought it was better for someone to be offended than dead for not living up to what was required of them. However, none of the freedom fighters complained, even after Dajer's rudeness. They knew that not even fifty of them were equivalent to him, at least in experience and skill. The Tegruta grinned slightly. Exactly because of that, I want them to do it, Dajer. Every tactical droid has intel about Hell Squad, even if it just says you are dangerous. If they spot any of you, they will know something is wrong. But they don't consider the Trilex a threat. The Separatist will think they are just stupid and reckless. We will prove that is a terrible mistake. This time, all the freedom fighters smiled excitedly. With just a few words, Ragu had changed their position from the bottom to someone who could make a difference. It will still be dangerous, however. You will be too few to resist even for a minute if the major separatist force catches up to you. In this case, slowing down by any reason is the same as death. All the freedom fighters nodded thoughtfully, but none said anything. It was a lot of responsibility for one person to take. I will lead it. Without any expression on his face, Sindulla stepped forward. He was the obvious choice. He was the leader of the Trilex, and a skilled combatant. Ragu stared at him for a few seconds, and then nodded. He could feel that Dajer and his brothers had something against, they always would, as long as Sindulla was involved, but the clone said nothing. It's decided then. We will all be depending on you, Sindulla. Chapter 347 Deep in the night, seven shadows crawled towards the Separatist army outside Nabit. They were none other than Hell Squad. Agile and silent, they slipped past all the defensive measures the clankers had set up. After all, they were meant to stop an army, not a squad, especially one such as Dajer's unit. Without any trouble, they reached the base of the wall that encircled the enemy camp. Suddenly, Dab made a gesture with his hand, making them all stop where they were. He had spotted something. Surely enough, a few seconds later, a patrol passed above their heads. Luckily for them, the Seppis were so confident on their defenses that even the droids weren't paying that much attention, but mumbling to each other. After the patrol was gone, Dajer, Brain, and Tech launched their cables, and started climbing. Their first target was the patrol that just passed. Hanging on the outer side of the wall, they waited for them to come back. What is? That? Looks like. Someone climbed the wall. Oh. 
We should call this in. Raja Rag. Ah. Before the B-1 unit could finish, a hand clad in white armor appeared over the railing, and pulled him. The fall was enough to break its joints, and two other clankers suffered the same fate. Deja winced at the noise they made when crashing, but didn't stop moving. Pulling himself up, he kicked the nearest clanker, and swung his vibroblade. The weapon decapitated the two droids that were still standing, and then he swirled it before stabbing the one he had kicked. With the patrol gone, the others climbed up too, and then threw the cables to the other side of the wall, before sliding down. Now, they were inside the enemy camp, all by themselves. Ragu looked at Nabit from over ten kilometers away, and frowned deeply. He wasn't worried about Hell Squad, because he knew they would escape and scathed. What perturbed him was the future. Lately, there had been too much happening, and too many instances where the Force was troubled. He had a feeling something big and bad was about to happen. That feeling was born a long time ago, but it was getting stronger each day. He felt like there was a blade hanging above his head, and he could do nothing to avoid it. Something in the galaxy was about to change forever. Do you care to share why you are troubled, Master Regu? He turned around to see Iva and Gobi looking at him. The one who had spoken was her. The young Jedi sighed, and looked at the distant stars in the night sky. They seemed so close, and yet so far. Maybe it's this war. It should never have happened. I don't think it's just that. Forget it. Maybe I'm just too worried for my own good. The couple exchanged glances, both with a glint of sadness and worry on their gazes. Are you sure the reason you are worried aren't they? Maybe you should have gone too. With Hell Squad. I would only bother them. There are some things that even Jedis can't do as well as clones. Neither of the Twi'leks were too surprised by Ragu's answer. They had seen Hell Squad in action before, and considered the seven soldiers almost invincible. There was this one time, in Karlak, where we were surrounded by almost two thousand separatist troops, a mix between clankers and humans from the CIS. We only had six hundred of our own. I was wounded, and unconscious, so Dager took over. He and Hell Squad went out in the middle of the night, much like they did today. There was a proud smile on the Jedi's face as he spoke. The next morning, they were already back. I woke up to find the Seppis in panic. We seized the chance to carve a path through them, and escape. I was surprised to see that they didn't come after us. Only then Dager told me about their little covert mission. The Tegruta couldn't hide his astonishment, as Gobi and Iva listened quietly. They weren't interested so much in the story as they were in Ragu. They felt the young Jedi only wanted to talk, no matter about what. They pitied him. So young, and so many responsibilities on his shoulders. They had eliminated 37 droids, and 18 CIS soldiers, unnoticed. Plus, all their targets were commanders and officers, from their leader to sergeants. Without their chain of command, they couldn't organize themselves. Dager and the others single-handedly saved all of us. You will see. Tomorrow, the Separatists are gonna be in disarray. Much like how Ragu said, Dager and his brothers were now searching for enemy leaders. Of course, they didn't let any chance to eliminate a droid slip. When the clankers were in a big group, they would hide, but when they were few, Hell Squad silently destroyed them. This time, their objective was to create fear and panic, even droids would get uneasy if they didn't know when they could die, so they didn't care about leaving bodies behind. Signaling his unit to stop, Dager looked over a deactivated dwarf spider droid. A huge metal building, which he recognized as a command center, was just near them. The problem was that there were a few dozen meters of empty ground between their position and the building, patrolled by several B-1S and B-2S. The commander frowned under his helmet, before gesturing for Hell Squad to go back. Then, he pointed at Brain, Dab, and himself, and to their left. After that, he gestured to the remaining three, and pointed to the right. They nodded, showing they understood. Silently, Hell Squad split up, and went around the camp. Dager and the other two stepped lightly until they were right behind a patrol, and then sprung into action. 
the commander had his vibroblade, while Dab and Brain used vibroknives. They didn't usually carry it around with them, preferring to leave it in their quarters, but this kind of mission asked for it. The 5B1 units barely had time to notice something was wrong before Deja beheaded one of them. Dab pierced the side of another clanker, making it fall, and proceeded to stab a second one on the head. Brain performed a very similar motion. Meanwhile, Deja cut down the B2 super battle droid that led the patrol by destroying its core processor in a single move. Without saying a word, they continued on, repeating their actions three more times before they finally managed to reach the command center. They waited patiently for the others to arrive, before Dager gestured to Tech to open the door. The moment the door opened, Dager barged inside, and thrust his vibroblade into a B2 unit, before kicking it and making it fall on top of 2B1S. Then, he spun his weapon, cutting open the chest of a clanker. He was followed closely by his squad, who either used their vibroknives to finish off the remaining seppies, or used their blasters to break their necks. The poor droid captain inside, seeing his guards and officers being slaughtered, tried to reach for the alarm, but Metal grabbed his head and smashed it on the control panel before twisting. Lifeless, the body fell to the ground. Chapter 348 In Coruscant, a human female furrowed her eyebrows tightly. She knew the force had been turbulent these past few years, but now there were ginormous waves appearing randomly. That made General Balaba worry. After a long time of hesitation, she turned on her hologram projector, and called her Padawan. Soon, Caleb Dumay appeared. Master. Caleb, I want you to return to Coruscant. Something is wrong, and I want you by my side. What about Ryloth? Master Ragu will take over your troops. He is a veteran, you can leave it to him. The Padawan only nodded. He too, like all Jedis, had felt the disturbances in the Force, so he wasn't surprised by his master's orders. After informing Ragu, he took a ship to Coruscant. Back at the Separatist Command Center outside Nabit, Hell Squad had just finished cleaning up all the droids. Dajer kicked one of them aside, and started to set up thermal detonators. What is our next step, sir? Now that they were isolated inside the command center, they could talk without worrying about being uncovered. Dajer threw his detonators to Tech, and, while he and Brain planted the bombs, turned on his comlink. General, we are inside the command center. Do you have special orders? Or can we proceed as we see fit? You are free to do whatever you want, Dajer. The more chaos, the better. Oh, and another thing. Caleb was called back by Master Depa, but Gray and the others are still here. The clone only nodded, before turning off his comlink. The less they talked, smaller the chances the transmission would be intercepted. Charges in place, Commander. General's orders are to cause as much damage as we can. We will blow this place up when we are some distance away. The clankers will all come here, so we explode something else on the other side of the camp. After that, we leave. They all acknowledged his words quietly, and went out. After making sure no droid was looking at them, they slipped back into the shadows. They had yet to walk ten meters when a group of seppies appeared out of nowhere. The droidica and 5B1 units that accompanied it were more surprised than Hell Squad. Without wasting a second, Dager went straight for the most dangerous target, the rolling ball of death. He jumped on top of it, and tried to cut its head off with his vibroblade. The droid, however, stumbled backwards, making Dager lose balance, and fall. Still, a nasty cut was left on the droidica, sending sparks flying. At the same time his brothers had attacked the other five tin cans, killing them almost immediately. Both 3-4 and Cell threw their vibroknives at the droidica, managing to blind it, and buying time for Dager to get up. However, even with its sensors destroyed, the clanker fired its twin laser cannons, breaking the night silence. Eliminate that thing. There was no need for caution anymore, so Hell Squad pulled out their blasters, and obliterated the droidica. Let's go, before they come after us. Go, go. Even as Dager said that, droids were already appearing from their recharge stations. He pressed the trigger twice, killing two B1 units right in front of them, and stepped over their bodies. 
Behind him, Hell Squad was also spitting lasers out of their blasters, taking down the Seppies before they had the chance to react. Danger, I see a lot of lasers flying over there. Are you in trouble? We met a destroyer, General. I wasn't expecting it. Now the whole nest woke up. Brain, droid poppers. Talking to Ragu and giving orders at the same time, the commander cut off AB2's right leg, and used his blaster pistol to finish it. He heard the sound of electricity bursting out, and new brain had thrown his toys. Tech, blow the command center. Now. That was a big explosion. All right, go to the entry point, Dager. I will meet you there. Come on, move. A laser scratched Dager's torso, and he returned fire, killing the clanker. Swirling his weapon, he stabbed AB1 unit and lifted it, using it as a shield. Each laser he fired found its target, and the same held true for the rest of Hell Squad. Soon, they reached the same point of the wall where they had entered through earlier. The cables were still there, but they ignored them, they would be easy targets, and used the stairs. It might seem like they were lucky to get there unharmed after all the noise they had made, but the truth was that they faced little to no resistance. Everything, from the moment they left the Freedom Fighters until now had been carefully planned. Any eventuality, such as being discovered, had been covered. Jump. I will slow you down. A voice called from under them, and, without any hesitation, the members of Hell Squad jumped over the wall, to the ground twenty meters below. Dager threw his last few thermal detonators, and emptied his magazine on the incoming droids, before following his brothers and jumping. Jump. I will slow you down. Ragu had barely finished speaking when he saw Metal, Dab, and 3-4 plummet down. Using the force, he created some sort of invisible, but soft, wall, to cushion their fall. No sooner than they touched the ground, Brain, Cell, and Tech also jumped, soon followed by Dager. Using one hand to slow down the commander, Ragu stretched the other towards a group of droids running through the railings, and firing at them. With a pull, they were sent flying. Needless to say, there was no supernatural force to save them. Hell Squad fired upwards, making the clankers duck to avoid their lasers, and ran back. Ragu followed suit, smiling. The operation was a success. How is it, Dab? The sniper was laying low, looking at the droid camp through the scope of his DC-15X. Even without his macro binoculars, Dager could see a lot of movement in the distant army, and dozens of vehicles were leaving and entering Nabit every hour. We really pissed them off, Commander. It's been fifteen hours, and only now they called back their search parties. Dab laughed, but suddenly stopped breathing. Two seconds passed, and then his blaster let out a loud noise as a blue laser left the barrel. Dager lowered his macro binoculars, and saw, six kilometers away, a droid captain lose its head. Good hit. They couldn't stay too long in the same position, since Staps were already zooming towards them. But long before they arrived, the two clones were gone, hiding in tunnels the Separatists didn't even know existed. In the Jedi Council, two dozen Jedis, some present physically, others as holograms, watched as General Skywalker sat down. Under the pressure of Chancellor Palpatine, they had just granted the young Jedi a seat at the Jedi Council. It was highly irregular, but they had more pressing matters at hand, such as finding General Grievous. Hiding in the outer rim, Grievous is. The outlying systems, you must sweep. We do not have many ships to spare. General Yoda had a deep frown on his face as he listened to General Kenobi. After a while, the hologram of General Kiyadi Mundi was the one to talk, bringing more bad news. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees? It is critical we send an attack group there immediately. He is right. It's a system we cannot afford to lose. General Yoda nodded slowly, and waved his hand. Go, I will. Good relations with the Wookiees, I have. Chapter 349 for the next three days, Hell Squad repeated the same actions. They sneaked into the Separatist camp, eliminated droids, and blew up things. Of course, they couldn't do it with the same efficacy of the first time, since now the clankers were actively searching for them, 
but their objective never was to destroy the entire army like that. Finally, on the fourth day, Sindala did as Ragu told him, and attacked a convoy that was going to Nabit. Letting the droids escape, but without they noticing it, the freedom fighters chased them until the convoy reached the city. After that, they faked fear, and ran, followed by a group of almost 4,000 droids, with tanks and whatnot. Clearly, the separatist leader was confident that the despairing Twi'leks would lead them straight to their hideout in their fear. That could have really happened in other circumstances. Unfortunately for the tactical droid, Sindulla executed the plan masterfully, impressing even Dager. He only lost six of his troops, and managed to lure all the droids into a canyon where the other Republic combatants were waiting. No clanker escaped. Get ready. Here they come. The Chuilek lookout that Gobi had positioned at the entrance of the canyon warned them as Sindulla and his people zoomed by in speeders. The Freedom Fighters, plus Ragu and Hell Squad, were positioned at the top of the canyon. As soon as the hunted party reached the end of it, they abandoned the speeders, and started climbing ropes that had been prepared beforehand. It was an elaborate trap, with the sole objective of killing every droid that pursued them. Soon enough, the clankers started pouring in the canyon, unknowingly walking into their own tomb. If they had time, they would notice something was wrong, but droids never were very smart, and they were too worried about finding the Twi'leks. When the last droid stepped inside, the ones in the front row were just starting to feel that something was wrong. The yellow-painted captain leading them tried to order a retreat, but the explosives set at the entrance of the canyon were already detonating, burying three or four hundred sepis, and trapping the others. Before the even more confused droids could react, countless lasers rained upon them, killing hundreds instantly. Hell Squad was purposely picking out the officers, but the Freedom Fighters had numbers. Two lasers hit the rocks close to Dager as the Separatists started to fight back. Two Twi'leks near him were hit, one falling backwards while holding his shoulder, while the other let out a short yell before dropping to his death. All around the canyon, more Freedom Fighters died, victims to the red lasers. Some fell to the ground below, hitting the walls on their way down. Well, it was expected that there would be many casualties. Even if they caught the droids by surprise, there were just about a thousand and six hundred Republic troops, while the droids were over twice their number. Ack! Metal grunted when an AAT fired its laser cannon, and hit the wall near him. Three Twi'leks died immediately, while two others were wounded. The heavy machine gunner was holding his right forearm in pain. It had been hit by a rock launched by the explosion. Ragu quickly pulled the clone back using the Force, to avoid any more injuries. There wasn't much the Jedi could do, apart from helping the wounded and deflecting a few lasers. He took a quick look at Metal's arm, and frowned. It's broken. You stay out of this one, Metal. No can do, General. Commander, give me one of your DC-17s. The tin cans are so crammed down there I can hit them without even aiming. Dager didn't even look back, and threw one of his blasters to his brother. Ragu only shrugged, not bothered by metal disobeying him. 3-4, hit it. The medic nodded, and grabbed one of the RPSSXS that they had prepared. Carefully aiming, he sent the rocket at one of the AATs, blowing it to kingdom come. Dager felt danger all of the sudden, so he instinctively tilted his body to the right. A laser scratched the left side of his helmet, leaving a burning black stripe, and his head buzzing. Falling on his back, he blinked hard, trying to clear his mind. Just to make sure, he took off his helmet, and pressed his hand against his head, but there was no wound. Are you okay, Dager? Just a scare, General. He sensed the Jedi looking at him worriedly, so he forced himself to get up, put his helmet back on, and continued firing. Trapped on the canyon, with nowhere to take cover, the separatist force was like a bandit grabbed by a sarlacc. They struggled, and caused some pain, but in the end, all they did was delay their inevitable death. After five hours of gruesome fight, the last droid was eliminated, and the canyon suddenly fell into silence. Each of the freedom fighters there had fought for Ryloth back then, but even so, they were tired. Mimicking Hell Squad, they sat down to rest. Only the medics were still running around, treating, and rescuing the wounded. 
Acton, get Sindola and Gobi for me, please. The young Tigruta gestured to one of the uninjured Trilex, who nodded and ran to fetch the two freedom fighters. Meanwhile, Ragu helped 3-4 as the medic went around, first immobilizing Metal's arm, and then treating the Trilex. Since the Jedi wasn't able to get close to the droids, he was the least tired of them all. Tech, how long do you think before the Seppis in Nabit notice something is wrong? Pretty sure they already did, Commander. Even though we jammed comms, they must have had managed to relay something. But the tactical droid probably is scared now, since we took out one-tenth of his army in one go. Tex right. It's just a pity we can't repeat the trick. You asked for us, Master Regu. Two Trilex interrupted them while the clones were talking. The Tigruta nodded, and got up, while the soldiers paid attention. How were our casualties? Minimal. We are still counting, but there should be less than 300 dead, and about that same about in wounded. Those were really good news. They had just taken down an enemy twice their size while losing less than one-tenth of their fighting force. That's good. I know everyone is tired Sindola, but the sooner we go back, the better. Please tell them that. There wasn't the need to say much. The freedom fighters might not be exceptional combatants or strategists, but they weren't stupid either. Ragu looked at the bustling and rustling, and sighed. Dajer and his brother stared at their general for a while, but said nothing. They knew very well what was going through his mind. Three months passed by quickly. Ragu, Hell Squad, and the Freedom Fighters had their close calls, but they had succeeded in reducing the Separatist army to just a few thousand droids. Now, they were all outside Nabit, looking at the city. They were joined by Grey and his legion, who had already conquered the rest of Ryloth. Like it happened once before, Nabit was now the last Seppai stronghold on the planet. The Tigruta looked at all the familiar faces, and helmets, around him, and smiled slightly. Let's take back Ryloth, this time once and for all. Chapter 350 Dajer had suggested that they zip line through the abyss, and climbed like they did last time, but as soon as he looked over the edge, he saw countless electromines, all activated. Anything that touched them would suffer a cruel death. Seems like the only way is through the bridge. Fit isn't gonna be easy. Everyone nodded, agreeing with Brain. They had to find a way to turn on the Ray Bridge, and, when crossing it, they would have no cover and little area to run. They would be like sitting tartags. They also couldn't bomb the city, for obvious reasons. I might have an idea. Gray, Dager, Hell Squad, Sindulla, Gobi, and Iva all turned to Ragu. The Tigruta had a faint smile on his lips that sent chills down Hell Squad's spine. Unaware of that, Sindulla looked at him curiously. The Jedi turned to his unit, this time not hiding the wide grin on his face. Grey suddenly remembered some of the stories his brothers had told him, about how over half of Hell Squad's crazy, suicidal plans came from Ragu's mind. How would you like to relive Navarro, Hell Squad? His proposal was received differently by each member of the unit. Dajer and Brain had sighed profoundly, knowing that the Jedi's mind was already set, and nothing they said could change it. Metal, on the other hand, was laughing loudly, while sending a provocative glance toward Cell. Even Dab, Tech, and 3-4 were looking at the scout, both excited and worried. Meanwhile, Cell had taken off his helmet and was shaking his head continuously. No, 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 no. Anything but that, General. Anything. Come on, Cell, we all know that deep down you love it. I don't. I definitely don't. Everybody else was looking at them weirdly. Their image of the stern and serious Hell Squad had completely crumbled. May we know what you are talking about, Master Regu? They don't seem very receptive of it. Grinning, the Jedi looked to the blue sky. We are going to attack Nabit from above. Two days later, Hell Squad was flying above Nabit in a lot, almost at the atmospheric limit of Ryloth. The doors of the gunship were open as they hovered in the air. Each of them had a jetpack on their backs, including Ragu. Ready? I hate heights. I hate heights so much. Can't I just be on the ground assault with Grey, General? 
even though Sel was complaining, he didn't back out. He just looked at the ground kilometers below through the door, and shook his head. His brothers looked at him and laughed. Ready and set to go, sir. Sel, you are first. Why me? No, don't do that. The scout felt what was coming before it happened, and turned around just to see Dajer pushing him. Cursing, he pummeled down, quickly disappearing in the clouds. Of course, his commander had only done that because he knew Cell could easily regain control of his flight. Without saying anything else, the other six clones, and the Tigruta, crossed their hands over their chest and jumped. As soon as he started falling, Dajer felt the air resistance, and heard the wind. In fact, he could only hear the wind. It was smashing against his body, throwing him from one side to another. His comlink bipped, but whoever was trying to talk didn't manage to. Instead of worrying about that, Dajer paid attention to his altitude. When they passed by the layer of clouds, he saw a tiny black spot, growing bigger by the second. That was Nabat. All around it was an unending brownish-red expanse. He briefly saw his brothers and Ragu, but it was difficult to focus on one thing when he was falling at breaking neck speed. Still, he felt no fear or anxiety. He had done that many times before and a lot more. When he reached the right altitude, he turned on his jetpack. The sudden reduction of speed felt like a punch to his chest, and he let out a grunt. Still, now he was much slower, and able to control where he was going. Checking. Everyone okay? Definitely not okay, but alive. Everything good here, Commander. Yuam. What about you, General? I'm fine. The show is yours, Dajer. All right, everyone knows the plan. Land directly on top of the bridge controls, break the windows, and go in. We don't have time to waste. Without wasting any more time, the group directed their jetpacks down, and flew towards the city. All it was needed was that one single droid looked up and saw them, and they would most definitely be eliminated immediately. But machine or not, people rarely looked up. They tended to think that danger only came from ground level. Seven minutes later, they all landed on top of the building that housed the bridge controls. They rested for a few seconds, just to take in the situation, then Ragu warned Sindulla and Grey to be ready to start the attack. The Jedi looked at Hell Squad, and nodded. The seven clones activated their jetpacks again, while Ragu pulled out his lightsaber and started cutting a hole in the roof. Needless to say, all the seppis inside immediately turned around to face the green tip that was appearing on the ceiling. Taking advantage of their certain distraction, Dajer and the others flew down, until they were in front of the windows. Brain and Tech glued two thermal detonators to them, and Dajer flicked the switch. The explosion sent shards of glass flying everywhere, but they couldn't penetrate the Phase II armor, so Hell Squad just ignored it. The clankers, which had been thrown to the floor by the explosion, didn't even manage to get up before the soldiers executed them. Tech, the controls are yours. The mechanic just used a few seconds to to power up the Blue Ray Bridge. As soon as it appeared, the mixed army of clones and freedom fighters outside started marching through it. Many fell victim to the red lasers fired by the droids on the walls, but there was nothing Dajer could do about it. At the moment, he and his brothers had a more important task. General, you go help them. We will defend the controls. Are you sure? The tin can that is gonna eliminate us haven't been assembled yet. The Tigruta laughed, and left the room through the hole he had made in the ceiling. Soon, Dajer heard the screams of the clankers outside, and he could imagine they being torn apart by a green tornado. Smiling slightly, Dajer turned his attention to the seppis that were charging through the door, trying to retake the controls. If they managed to do that, they could deactivate the bridge, dropping thousands of Republic troops to their deaths. Unfortunately for them, Hell Squad had defended that room once before, and they would do it again. If they wished to pass, the seppis would have to step over their dead bodies. And anyone who knew Hell Squad knew that wasn't going to be easy. Chapter 351 Dajer pressed the trigger of his DC-15A, but was surprised to hear a dry sound as no laser came out. Cursing, he realized he was out of ammunition, 
and there was a droid aiming an E-5 directly at him. Without thinking too much, he threw his blaster at the clanker, hoping to divert its attention. He succeeded partly, and the laser that was supposed to hit his head put a hole on his right shoulder. For a split second his thoughts traveled randomly, as he thought about how the seppies always managed to hit his shoulder, or break it. Then, on the next moment, he was back at the battle, and advancing towards the clanker. Grunting, he smashed his left shoulder on the B-1's chest, and reached out for his DC-17. Pressing it against the droid's torso, he pressed the trigger twice. Using his momentum, he launched the droid carcass on top of two others, and pulled out his vibroblade. One quick slash managed to end them both. Panting, he retreated a few steps, until he was once again back to back with his brothers. 3-4 threw a quick glance at his shoulder and then ignored it. They had more important matters at hand, and the pain didn't bother Dager. It had been barely 15 minutes since they had activated the bridge, meaning they still had a long time to go before they could leave the control room and join their brothers at the fight inside the city. Because Nabat was currently a full-on battlefield, with the Republic paying a heavy price for every meter they conquered. They still had thousands of troops on the bridge and more behind it. While they were still there, Hell Squad would have to hold on. Here they are. Eliminate them. Without giving the seven clones a second to breathe, more clankers appeared at the doorway, and were quickly taken care of. However, there were even more behind. It didn't matter. They would just be an addition to the already big pile of bodies that was accumulating at the door and stairs. No matter how many came, Hell Squad would eliminate them all. A flash of green light cut a B-2 super battle droid in half. At the same time, the two symmetrical pieces of droid flew towards its counterparts, pushed by an invisible hand. Without wasting a moment, Ragu ran forward, using the wall as a trampoline to propel himself. Three quick swings later, all the clankers in front of him had been cleared. Groaning and panting, he pressed his hand over the left side of his body. A wrist rocket had thrown shards and pieces of the wall everywhere, and one of them had hit him. Even though the wound wasn't too deep, it was painful, and, unlike a laser, it left him weakened by the blood loss. Looking at the blood in his palm, the Tigruta furrowed his eyebrows. That could be a problem. He ripped a piece of his robes and made a makeshift bandage, which soon was dyed red. However, he ignored it, because he saw more droids incoming. Smiling savagely, he attacked. An explosion shook the ray bridge, and Gray saw two or three of his brothers being launched into the abyss below them. One more fell near him, his visor broken by a laser. The freedom fighters weren't faring much better. Unfortunately, there was nothing he could do other than urge his troops forward, and shoot at the clankers on the wall. Gobi heard Sindulla yell in pain as a laser hit his friend's arm. They had been amongst the first to charge, and were now fighting in the streets they knew so well. Are you okay? Don't worry about me. We have to keep going. The blue-skinned Chwilek nodded, and gestured to his people to keep going. Seeing the freedom fighters battling for them made the people of Nabat find the courage they had buried when the separatists arrived. They came out of their houses, wielding knives and sticks, or anything that could serve as a weapon. For freedom. For Ryloth. Dager didn't know how much time had passed. All he knew was that he was exhausted. Up till now, he had been firing at the seppies that dared to poke their heads through the doorway. But now, it had been a few minutes since the last of them showed up, and he couldn't stand anymore. The commander collapsed to the ground, panting. The rest of Hell Squad mimicked him, and sat down, laying their backs on the control panels or the walls. Do you think we got them all? sir. Ha! Everyone laughed when they heard metal. There were literally dozens, if not hundreds, of dead clankers around them. It came to the point where the doorway was completely blocked by the piles of bodies. The bridge controls, and the room itself, were in shambles. Even though only Dager got slightly injured, their bodies were all sore, and they were sweating profusely. I don't think metal is that wrong, to be honest. I don't hear fighting anymore. 3-4, always the most cool-headed of the unit, pointed that out. Dager quickly noticed he was right, but he was too tired to go check who won. 
well, he was pretty certain of the result already. Surely enough, after a few more minutes a figure dropped from the hole in the ceiling. Ragu looked at his friends, laying on the ground, and smiled. Had some trouble? Nope. But you did, General. That cut isn't looking good. Hee <laughs> hee. Don't worry about it, it's nothing much. 3-4 can take a look at it later. For now. As he said that, the Tigruta used the force to pull the droids that were blocking the stairs, and threw them through the broken window. We have a victory meeting to attend. Ryloth is ours. Half an hour later, with his shoulder properly bandaged, Dajer was standing in the biggest building of Nabit, looking at a hologram table. On it were projections of separatist movement around the planet, and all of them showed that the Sepis were falling back to their ships. Other than Dajer and Hell Squad, Gray, two of his captains, Sindulla, Gobi, and Ragu were all there too. The two freedom fighters could barely hide the excitement on their faces. After all, it was their home they had just freed. The price was great, but we pushed the separatist scum back. Ryloth is free. Yes, Gobi. It is. So let's try to keep it that way this time around. Gray, I want you to put pressure on the droids. No need to make risky moves, but just show them that if they don't leave, they are going to lose all their troops. The clone nodded, and pulled out his comlink to talk to his men. Dajer also nodded to himself, thinking of Hell Squad's next step. Sindulla, Gobi, I want you to arrange a meeting between me and... The young Tigruta kept talking while exposing his plans. Meanwhile, Dajer's hologram projector bipped, so he stepped back to answer it. The moment the image appeared, the commander froze. The hologram showed a hooded person, with wrinkled skin. His voice was rough and low, like he hadn't spoken in years. Execute Order 66 Chapter 352 Execute Order 66 The voice was cold and calm. It incited fear in danger as he had never felt before. And there was one single reason for that. It was the same voice he heard in his dreams every night. Images of blood, destruction, and death drowned his mind. His hand shook, and he almost let the hologram projector fall. But suddenly, he calmed down. It all made sense now. The Jedis he had been fighting alongside for so long, the Republic so many of his brothers died to protect, they were all traitors. Every single one of them. Even. Dajer looked at the young Tigruta that was talking to the two freedom fighters. Until a few seconds ago, he considered him his general. His friend, even. To think he was just another lying Jedi scum. Will be done, my lord. He looked at his brothers. There was no need to tell them anything. Hell Squad, as well as Grey and the two captains, lifted their blasters and aimed at Ragu, who turned around with a shocked expression. Dajer? Brain? What? What are you doing? For treason against the Republic, all Jedi shall be executed immediately. His voice was monotone, almost mechanic. Many emotions crossed Ragu's face in an instant. Shock, surprise, pain, sadness, betrayal, and... Compassion? I see. So that's how it is. For some reason, Seeing the betrayal on Ragu's face pained Dajer's heart. That was wrong. He was the traitor. The clones that should be feeling like that, not scum like the Jedi. Under the horrified glances of Sindulla and Gobi, Dajer let anger take over, and pressed the trigger. In the distant planet of Utapau, the 212th Legion, as well as the 7th Sky Corps, were fighting the Separatist occupation. General Kenobi had just eliminated General Grievous, putting an end to the abomination that had murdered so many clones. Morale was at its highest. Commander Cody watched as his general rode a veritil through the narrow mountain roads and trails of the planet. Then, he picked up his hologram projector, which had been blinking for some time. He had a bad feeling. Commander Cody. The time has come. Execute Order 66. Without any emotion on his face, Commander Cody turned off the hologram projector, and gestured towards General Kenobi. Blast him! An AT-T-E fired, 
the explosion throwing the Jedi and his mount in the abyss hundreds of meters below. Barriss Afi was dragged out of her prison cell by two clones, and thrown on the ground. With her hands tied, and surrounded by over twenty Coruscant guard members, there was nothing she could do. No one answered her. Instead, they just formed two rows, one standing up, one kneeling in front of them. Ready. Aim. Fire. In Majido, General Kiyadimundi and the Galactic Marines advanced through a bridge, pushing back the droids meter by meter. Come on! Seeing an opening, the old Jedi lifted his lightsaber and ran forward, while ordering his troops to follow him. But they didn't. Instead, they formed a line, and fired at him. Confused as to why the men who he had commanded for so long, and fought with, were turning against him, General Kiyadimundi couldn't muster a reaction. He managed to reflect one or two lasers back to those who fired it, but it was all too unexpected. The Marines only looked at his body for a moment, feeling nothing, and then proceeded to continue fighting the Seppis. Cal Kestis watched as his master tried to hold back the troopers that were hunting them. He didn't understand why they were attacking them. They were his friends, weren't they? His eyes widened in shock as two lasers hit his master's chest, and he fell inside the escape pod. The door closed, and they were launched off the cruiser. Trust. Only. In the Force. No. -oh. In the jungles of Felucia, General Secura, Commander Bly, and the 327th advanced through Republic territory, going back to the front lines after a resupply mission. The Jedi didn't notice when Commander Bly stopped to hear something on his comlink. Neither did she notice when he and his brothers aimed their blasters at her back and squeezed the trigger continuously. In the skies of Cato Nymodia, Jedi General PLO Kun flew with two of his pilots, chasing down hyena class bombers and vulture droids. He was unaware that at the moment, Jag, one of the veterans of his legion, who had been with him since the first battle of Geonosis, was receiving new orders. When the Republic starfighters attacked him, he tried to dodge, and controlled his own ship to dive between the buildings. However, before he could escape, his engines were hit, soon followed by an explosion. After confirming the job was done, Jag and the other pilots turned around, returning to their cruiser. Commander Fox, Sergeant Hound, and Lieutenant Thire looked at each other, and nodded. Hesitating for a split second, they lifted their blasters under the confused glare of two Padawans. When the young human and Nikto noticed what was happening, it was too late. The civilians walking on the streets of Coruscant were horrified to suddenly see two kids, Jedi apprentices, on top of that, being gunned down, but, before anyone could say anything, several dozen members of the Coruscant Guard stepped forward and arrested them. Where are we going next, sir? To the Senate. We are to take care of any troublemakers. What about the Jedi Temple? There are hundreds of traitors there. Someone else will take care of them. Caleb Dume and his master, Depa Balaba, managed to escape when their troops suddenly turned against them. However, she was mortally wounded, and wouldn't be able to last for long. While deflecting some lasers, she looked at her terrified Padawan, and smiled. I will hold them. Master. Don't worry, I will be right behind you. He ran. And ran, and ran, and ran. But, after who knows how long, when he turned back, he didn't see her anywhere. Instead, he saw two clones barring his path. Yelling, he cut them down, holding back his tears. And then he ran again. Ahsoka Tano and Captain Rex were slowly walking away from the remains of a Venator-class cruiser. She had managed to take off the chip that controlled Rex. As for the others. The helmets in the snow told a sad story. Fives was right. All this time, we were never supposed to fight for the Republic, but to destroy it. Don't think about that now, Rex. We have to get somewhere safe, and find survivors. That's the galaxy's only hope. In the forests of Kashyyyk, General Undulai was crouching while helping an injured clone. The soldier was groaning in pain while holding his chest. Shoo. Calm down, Cross. You are between friends. She suddenly felt all the deaths, and it was too much. Her head hurt, as if someone was hammering it. So many dead, 
and all at once. Understood, my lord. General Undulai heard one of the troopers speak, and saw a blaster aimed at her face. Behind it was one of her most trusted men. Slowly, she realized she was surrounded by the people was was treating. Sorry, General. It was night, but Coruscant was awake like never before. Dozens of thousands of clones walked the streets, killing any Jedi they saw. Thousands were arrested, and the word on the streets was that the Jedi Order had betrayed the Republic. The rumor was slowly gaining strength, as a hooded figure led part of the 501st Legion inside the Jedi Temple. Fighting broke out as the younglings, some almost Jedi Knights, others barely more than children, tried to defend against the clone army, but failed. No mercy was shown, no matter their age. General Shakti, who had left Kamino to teach the younglings while General Yoda was on Kashyyyk, tried to send a warning to the Jedis around the galaxy. Before she could do so, a blue lightsaber destroyed the panel she was using. She managed to fight back for a few minutes before the weapon pierced her stomach. Looking up, shock filled her eyes as she saw who the person butchering the new generation of Jedis was. Three dozen Padawans were locked in a room, too scared to go see what was behind all the noises. They could feel, untrained as they were, many waves in the force, and many deaths. Suddenly, the door opened, scaring them. However, they soon calmed down when they saw who it was. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? The hooded figure didn't answer. His eyes burned with anger and hatred. With an ominous sound, his lightsaber was turned on. General Yoda let his stick fall, and grabbed his chest. An intense wave of pain and sadness assaulted him. He could fell thousands of Jedis dying, all at once. Even. Even the Padawans. He almost fainted, overwhelmed by his emotions. He was older than anyone else, and had seen the fall of the Old Republic and the ascension of the new one. He had gone to every corner of the galaxy, and faced everything it had to offer. But nothing like this. As the Separatist and Republic forces clashed on the beaches of Kashyyyk, he saw his troops turn against the unprepared Wookiees, and eliminate them, until not a single one was left. He felt the same killing intention behind him, and didn't hesitate. Showing agility someone his age shouldn't have, he did a backflip, and decapitated Commander Gree and another clone, who were about to shoot him. The two Wookiees next to him roared, angered. Still feeling every death, the small Jedi followed the two Wookiees. The galaxy was changing. The Jedi Order was no more. Dajer pressed the trigger of his blaster three times, putting all his anger, pain, and hatred on it. All he could see was the betrayal in Ragu's eyes, someone he had sworn to protect. Without being able to make a sound, Grey and the two captains dropped to the ground, a hole on their chests. Dajer looked at his three brothers, breathing erratically. He had eliminated them. He had eliminated his brothers. Besides him, Hell Squad was frozen on the spot, their hands shaking while still aiming at Ragu. But just like their commander, they couldn't do it, no matter how intense the pain that assaulted their minds was. The room was completely silent. Neither the Trilex nor Ragu said anything. A muffled sound marked Dager's blaster falling off his hand, followed by him dropping to his knees. He couldn't take his eyes off the small column of smoke rising from Gray's chest. And he screamed. Chapter 353 Dager yelled until his throat got sore, and he couldn't make a sound anymore. His eyes were bloodshot, and he could still hear the voice urging him to eliminate. Unable to find any other way to vent his feelings, he punched the ground. Now he understood everything. He had always known he was nothing but a pawn, but he never expected it to be like that. While the inhibitor chip inside his brain yelled that the Jedis were the traitors, he knew very well that the ones who betrayed the Republic were the clones. He didn't know for how long he stared at Grey's corpse. At some moment, he had taken off his helmet and thrown it away. Behind him, Hell Squad seemed to have done the same. They were all on the floor, some crying, some silent. After a few seconds of staring at nothing, Dager took a deep breath, and got up. His fists were bleeding, and his scar was burning, but he couldn't care less. His mind was a mess. Panting, he looked at Ragu. 
The Tigruta had pity in his eyes, but said nothing. Deja remembered that minutes ago, when he almost eliminated the general he had promised to protect, he had a calm look on his face, as if he had understood everything. Sindulla and Gobi, on the other hand, were staring at him shocked. They had yet to understand what was happening. What can you feel, general? Indescribable sadness and sorrow filled the Jedi's eyes. He lowered his head, and clenched his fists, trembling. The dark side took over. The Jedi's. Are dead. Thousands of us. Was. Was it the clone army, Dajer? While helping his brothers get up, the commander nodded slowly. He was still having problems processing what had just happened. And the voice that kept screaming inside his head didn't help. We. I'm sorry, Ragu. It isn't your fault, Dajer. It was Chancellor Palpatine, wasn't it? I feel an immense growth of the dark side coming from him. Dajer nodded, at the same time frowning as another wave of hatred assaulted his mind, and he almost grabbed his blaster again. We can talk about that later, General. Now, we need you to do some things for us. We have a chip inside our brain, which is what is causing all this. I knew it existed, but I didn't know what it would do. If only we had listened. You want me to take it out? A medical droid. It's too dangerous if you are not experienced. But first we need to get off Ryloth. When they find out you are alive, my brothers will hunt you. And us. Sindulla. The freedom fighter was paying close attention to everything they were saying. There was much he didn't understand, but he knew it was important. We need a ship, Sindulla. To get out of here. After that, you and Gobi need to disappear, together with the other freedom fighters. You will be hunted, and eliminated, if you don't. Hunted by who? The Empire. That's what this entire war was about, but only now I understand it. It was all a preparation to destroy the Republic and create the Empire. The dangerous glare Dajer gave him was enough to shut up Sindulla. He knew that if he asked any more questions, the commander would truly lose his mind. Brain, tech, metal. We have to go. Dab, cell, 3-4, you too. What are we going to do, sir? For now, let's get the general to safety, and fix our heads. Surprisingly enough, they managed to get out of Ryloth easily. After all, no one would have expected Hell Squad to resist Order 66. Dajer still had the codes for the clone army channels on his comlink, so he was able to quickly gather news, and pass them all to Ragu before laying down on a bed. He was the last one who had to have his inhibitor chip removed. Brain, metal, dab, 3-4, tech, and cell were sedated near him, with a bandage wrapped around their heads after a successful operation. For now, Dajer had pushed back all his thoughts, and focused on getting out of Ryloth. He would worry about the future later. When he woke up, the first thing Dajer realized was that he hadn't dreamed. Not a single nightmare. Obviously, the chip was what caused the dreams, and he lamented not knowing of it earlier. Looking around, he saw he wasn't on the same ship they had left Ryloth. That meant they must have met with some of the Jedi survivors that Ragu managed to contact. They were Ahsoka, General Kenobi, and General Yoda. Dajer also knew two or three Padawans had survived, but he didn't know where they were. Sir. He turned to see his unit looking at him. All of them had despairing expressions on their faces. Now, their own brothers were hunting them, and they became traitors. There wasn't anything they could say or do that could change that. They had had the same chip on their brain as other clones, so they understood perfectly what they thought. It's useless to say anything now, Cell. What happened, happened. Now we can only follow through with it. But what are we going to do now? You know the answer. Unless any of you have a different idea. They all shook their heads. From the moment Dajer eliminated Grey, they knew exactly where they were going to end. Then let's talk to the general. He needs to understand. Hell Squad walked into the command bridge of the small shuttle with their helmets under their arms, and a determined look on their faces. They had already steeled their resolve. Around the hologram table were Ragu, General Kenobi, 
Ahsoka Tano, and Captain Rex. They were looking at the hologram of General Yoda, who was somewhere in the galaxy. Captain Rex was the first to see them. He and Dager exchanged glances, and nodded at each other. Just by looking at his brother, the commander knew he had also taken out the inhibitor chip. Generals, Commander Tano. Generals, we are not, Dager. Now, criminals is all there is to us. Unfortunately, Master Yoda is right. I trust you are all familiar with what happened. Several heads nodded. Ahsoka was especially quiet, sometimes throwing a glance at General Kenobi. Something he had said had unsettled her, probably. There is something else I need to tell you, however. These are Luke and Leia. Anakin's children. I believe they might be the key to ending the reign of terror Palpatine will ensure. Only now Dager and the others noticed the two human babies next to General Kenobi. On another occasion, they might be shocked that a Jedi had children, but now they couldn't care less. Generals, we have to make this quick, otherwise they will find us. We have a few hours, at most. You need to split up. Dager stepped forward, interrupting the conversation. Discipline and hierarchy didn't matter now. Hide, we have to. And wait for the right moment to strike, we will. The children, under your care will be, Obi-Wan. Yes, Master. For a long time, no one said anything. Then, Dager broke the silence. It's time you go. Rex, you take care of Ahsoka, okay? The previous 501st leader nodded, already understanding what Dager was going to do. As for Ahsoka, she bowed slightly to him. Slowly, she and the clone left the room. General Kenobi, General Yoda, you should get going too. We need to talk to Ragu. They acknowledged his words, now it didn't matter who was a Jedi and who was a clone, and said farewells to Ragu. The Tigruta, who knew Hell Squad too well, was already staring at them, resignation on his face. After General Kenobi left with the babies, and General Yoda's projection disappeared, a long silence ensued. It was only broken by Ragu after a few minutes. You want to stay behind, don't you? To protect me. Again. You could come with me. There will be a lot to do, a lot to fight for. Dager shook his head with a sad smile. He looked at his shoulder pad, marked with a line for enemies he eliminated, and took it off. We are tired of fighting, Ragu. For four years, we never questioned orders. Look at where it got us. You know we can't run from this last fight, but it will be the last battle for us. I'm staying too, then. The seven clones smiled, seeing tears in Ragu's eyes. Now, he wasn't a Jedi or a general. He was just the same kid they had gotten to know and respect. Still, Dager denied his wish. No, you aren't. Remember when General D and that lizard said that they could feel the force around us, Ragu? That we wouldn't use, but influence it? I never understood that. But now I do. His eyes were clouded with memories. There was so much he wanted to say, but he never was good with words. We were never the ones who would change anything. Force or not, our objective never changed. To protect you. That promise we made in Ryloth, to General D, still stands. The galaxy needs you, kid. The Jedi are gone, that's true. But not all of them. If one day the Empire is to fall, it will be because you were there to guide the ones who fight against it. The young Tigruta wasn't holding back his tears. He didn't want to admit it, but Dager was probably right. A Jedi was needed to defeat the Sith, and someone needed to train those Jedis. I understand. We wouldn't be able to live, General, knowing we eliminated our own brothers. We wouldn't want to. You know that. Now, go. We will hold them for as long as we can. The Jedi stared at them for a long time. There was determination, pain, and sadness in their eyes. Do you regret it? The war, the deaths. Everything. For four years, all we did was follow orders blindly, General. Maybe, if we had thought more, instead of just doing as we were told, things would have been different. We regret a lot of things we've done. 
But not this. Ragu nodded, and wiped his tears. Looking at each of the members of Hell Squad, he shook their hands, and entered an escape pod, after destroying its tracker. May the force be with you, Hell Squad. And may it be with you, General. A few hours later, the shuttle shook as it was captured by a tractor beam, and pulled inside a Republic cruiser. By the colors, Deja recognized the 212th. Standing up, he looked at his brothers. Brain, Dab, Tech, Metal, 3-4, and Cell. They had been with him for as long as he remembered, and they had gone through a lot together. They just never imagined that their last battle would be against their own family. Ready? Let's do this. For the 303rd, and for Ragu. The commander nodded to them, and put on his helmet just as the door was breached, and clone troopers ran in. For Ragu. Commander Cody stepped over the dead bodies of some of his best troopers to arrive in front of Deja. He didn't know how many of his men Hell Squad had eliminated, and he didn't want to. One was already too many. On his way, he found the fallen members of Hell Squad one by one, each of them surrounded by bodies. Metal, Tech, Dab, 3-4, Cell, and then Brain. Dejer's second in command was just a few meters away from him. The commander was still standing, under the aim of three dozen troopers. He was wounded in several spots, but still holding his blaster. Commander Cody walked until he was just two meters away from Dejer. His brother could eliminate him easily if he wanted, but he knew Dejer had had enough. They are not here, are they? They left hours ago. He stared at Dejer's visor, and saw his reflection on it. Suppressing a sigh, he looked at his brother. What now? Do you want to keep fighting? Dejer said nothing. Instead, he dropped his DC-15A, and then his pistol. Then, he unsheathed his vibroblade, and stared at it for a long time before putting it on the ground gently. Lastly, he took off his helmet, and looked at it. A single horn, painted a long time ago, and scarred by a thousand battles. His most treasured possession. Sighing, he put it back on. Was it worth it, Dager? Killing so many of our brothers to protect a traitor? Worth it? I did what I had to do to protect my general, Cody. You did the same, otherwise Kenobi wouldn't be alive. The 212th leader clenched his fists, before shaking his head as if to deny it. He followed through with Order 66, but he couldn't help but feel slightly relieved that General Kenobi was still alive. It's fitting, you know. That the one who puts an end to Hell Squad is you. We've been through it since the start. You know things are not as simple as you want them to be. I do. Good soldiers follow orders, Dager. You know that. But I never wish to fight Hell Squad. But there is nothing we can do. My fight. Our fight, is over. Yours is just beginning, Cody. Having said that, Dager gestured to the blaster in Commander Cody's hands. It's time. Do it. He lifted the weapon, and aimed at Dager. A single shot reverberated throughout the ship, signaling the end of the battle. Still, no one felt happy with the result. Many, many years later, in one of the stone peaks of Ryloth. An old Tigruta sat down, legs crossed, and looked at the ball of flames in the sky. It was a sign that the Emperor was dead, and his reign of terror was over. The Empire was gone. Ragu's eyes were calm as he heard the people of Ryloth celebrating. He knew better than anyone the price that the galaxy had to pay. Can you see it? Palpatine is gone. The galaxy will flourish once again. The hope that was born so many years ago will once again fill the heart of the innocents. He looked at the air in front of him, and smiled. To anyone who looked, he was talking to himself. Should I tell them? That the freedom they now feel is all thanks to seven soldiers? No. You are right, they wouldn't want it. Grinning, Ragu got up. He had lived until now, and taught everything he knew to the one who destroyed the empire. Now, it was time he rested. His body slowly started to become translucent, but he wasn't bothered by it. In front of him, three blue figures appeared. A small Jedi, holding a walking stick, 
an old Nikto, with a small smile, and a human with a scar over his right eye. So you are here too. It's good to see you again, old friend. When Ragu disappeared, his robes fell to the floor. Besides it was an old, battered, and broken helmet. It had two brownish-red horns painted on it, and a crack almost split it into two. But, at this moment, the helmet seemed to shine. Its journey had ended. May the force be with you. The End